Adventure. Adventure, intrigue, mystery, romance, starring Humphrey Bogart and Lauren Bacall. Together in the sultry setting of tropical Havana and the mysterious islands of the Caribbean. Bold Venture. Once again, the magic names of Humphrey Bogart and Lauren Bacall bring you Bold Venture and a tale of mystery and intrigue. Ah. Ah. That's enough, sailor. I... I can't run any further. Okay, we'll rest a while. Then we'll go in for a dip. I know. Well, let's just wade this morning, you know. Get used to the feel of the ocean. Tomorrow we'll swim. What happened to this big exercise binge of yours? This morning you were going to start the new life. Run, swim, push-ups, deep knee bends. Oh, I must have been out of my mind. Come on, let's do a deep knee bend. Hands on hips, place. One... Oh, help me up, Slate. <laughs> oh, okay, eager one. Give me a hand. Now, let's get back to the hotel and have some breakfast before I... Shannon, this is all you. I wonder what she wants. I can't imagine. When I said goodnight to her last night, she said everything was fine. But ours was her favorite hotel. She and her husband you were... You always told me you were on the beach. You're going to say I'm foolish, but I just don't know what to think. Well, what's the trouble? I can't find my husband. Well, maybe Mr. Anderson just took a stroll before breakfast. I wouldn't worry about that. But he didn't come back to the hotel last night. Mrs. Anderson? Yes? Last night when I saw you in the lobby, you said you were going to your room and wait for him. You mean he hasn't come back since then? Yes. I fell asleep over a book. I just woke up and his bed wasn't slept in. What frightens me is he left with a good deal of money. You see, he was going to buy me a gift. It's our 20th anniversary, you know. We've never been out of California before. And now, well, just take I... it easy, Mrs. Anderson. How much was a good deal of money your husband had with him? Well, I, I don't know exactly. More than a thousand, I know. Do you think anything could have happened to him? With that much money in his pocket? In Havana? Come on, sailor. Let's look for a man. <laughs> Pobrecito, the poor little one, how he lies here in sleep. And the fingers of the hot sun scratch around in his wound. <laughs> You're a tender man, Garfield. For a man who wears a hook for an arm, you're very gentle with the hurt and the lame. My heart goes out to them. I have a brotherhood with men who have been freshly scarred. <laughs> uh, take it easy going through his pockets, huh? See? And to put this fellow on our fishing boat and let him sleep away his wound and his shame, who would not do this for a tourist, though? Huh? What did you find? In his pocket, a clipping from society column of a Pasadena in California newspaper. Society? Uh, Gee, I always did want to rub noses with society. What does it say? It say, Bon Voyage and a box of oranges to Mr. and Mrs. Ralph Anderson, who live tomorrow for Havana for their 20th wedding anniversary. <laughs> and he celebrates it all along in a jump like Tina. Maybe that's what his wife let him have for a present. And in this pocket, an alligator wallet with gold tips. Let me see it. You can see from there. Gold tips, see? Eh, inside lined with red seal skin leather and with... Ah. <laughs> and again, I... Garfield, oh, don't stick your hook in your mouth like that and keep saying I. If you've got something to say, come right out and sell, Papa. What else can a kindly man say when he finds $2,000 in a wallet of a used-up man? What else can you do, I ask myself? Yeah. Yeah, give me a hand with them, Garfield. I read somewhere that salt is good for a wound. It hurts, but it's good. Come on. Now. See? 
Understand, Pobrecito. This will be better than explain to why. Uh, now, Bruce. Uh, happy anniversary, Mr. Anderson. That's the last shop in the Vedado, sailor. Mr. Anderson wasn't in there looking for presents for his wife, either. Well, let's try another section of the city. You know, I've got a sneaking suspicion. Like what? A man comes to Havana. He's never seen anything like it. His wife gives him a night off, and he's got over $1,000 in his pocket. You know how Havana throbs at night, mambo rhythms out of every doorway. Mr. Anderson might have walked through one just for a look-see. I won't even concede a look-see, Slate. Mr. Anderson was a very... Hey, there's King Moses in our jeep. Hi, King. Looking for us? All over Havana. Now, what's on your mind? I've been uh, asking around at the cab depots for Mr. Anderson, as you said I should. Hey, what did you find out? Guillo, the one who drives the green taxi cab with the yellow fenders, think he picked up Mr. Anderson in front of hotel. Where'd he take him? Guillo said first his fare wished to shop. Then the fair heard music from the place Tina's Parakeet and tapped Guillo on the shoulder. Tina's Parakeet? That's a dive in the barrio. Yeah. <laughs> How do you like your Mr. Anderson now, sailor? Please, girls who are not chaperoned by men are not permitted in my place. I've got a chaperone, honey. The one trying to work his way up front to the mirror. Yeah, how do you like the hairdo, sailor? Jazzy, huh? Your ticket, senor. You're Tina, huh? See, si, I am Tina, and I am a ticket cruncher. Your ticket, senor. You know, if you're a good girl, Tina, maybe Slate will let you crunch through a whole roll of them. Yeah, see, the five peso size and five delicious flavors, one at a time. Ooh, you bought a basket full of dances. Go dance them. Yeah, we like to dance threesies, Tina. Well, dance any way you like as long as it is. Threesies, that means we'll need another partner, like a Mr. Ralph Anderson. But I don't see him around. Is he around, Tina? You're local crazy. Uh, but then maybe tonight isn't Ralph's night to howl. Maybe it was last night. Was Anderson here last night, Tina? Barretto? No, not Barretto, hon. Ralph Anderson. About 5'10", gray at the edges, 50-ish. You're not paying attention, hon. Barretto bounces two away. See, si, Tina. You heard my lady. Walk away or I dribble you away. You have a choice. Now, look, Buster, don't try for a letter. Just tell us about Ralph Anderson was in here last night. Maybe you have monkeys in your ears, senor. I told you... Slate, watch him. Now, look, Buster. Why pull a knife on a friendly cuss like me? Why, I... I cut you. I... I... That's not what I asked. You beg for dying, senor. I give it... I... Should have held on to the knife, butterfinger. <laughs> Well, what do you know, sailor? The man falls down hurt and the dancers keep dancing. On your feet, Barreto. Let's see if we can stir up a storm. Leave him alone. Do not hit him anymore. Convince me why I shouldn't, Tina. Anderson was here last night, wasn't he? And it was like this. See, like this, he was here. The old man tried to put his hands on me. Barreto stuck him with his knife. And killed him. Oh, no, no, only in shoulder. The fisherman took him away. You got kind friends, Tina. What fisherman? Garfio, who wears a hook for a hand, and he's American named Bruce. At Rico Docks, ask them. They will give you Anderson. Oh, Barreto. Oh, he hurt you. Oh, me, Adam, me quarter son. Me hurt most. Oh, yeah. Let's get out of here, Slate. Can't you see the lady wants to be alone with her sick friend? <laughs> boat. Hey. Yeah? Your name Bruce or Garfio? Bruce. You want to talk? Come aboard. All right. Come on, sailor. I'm just fixing this net. A little weight. What do you got on your mind? Nice little boat you've got here. It's a living. You the one who's got something on your mind, lady, or the mister? The both of us. We're looking for a man. I haven't brought one up yet. Just fish. A middle-aged man. A tourist. Just fish. 
Rumor has it when you're not fishing, you while away the empty hours in a joint called Tina's Parakeet. Sure. It's cheap, and it's got a chuckle to it. Sometimes pain. Like what happened to the tourist, a man named Ralph Anderson. Who said? Tina. She ought to keep her mouth shut. She didn't. She mentioned your name. And a man named Garfio, who wears a hook. Yeah, Anderson was kicking up his heels last night. In the middle of a kick, he caught a knife in his shoulder. Garfio and me got him out of there before the cops showed. It supplements the price of fish. You know, pocket money. Why didn't you take him home? His wife was waiting for him. Because his wife was waiting for him, sis. He wasn't stuck bad, but he needed time to make up a story. Where'd he take all this time? Well, we took him. Well, we gave him iodine and gauze and a fatherly talk. Little lean to a couple of hundred yards south of the Maximo Monument on the bay. Can you take us there? You'll find it. I got to finish this net. So long. You better get back to the hotel, sailor, and see if you can comfort Mrs. Anderson. I'll find that lean to. Let's go. Guy's on his way to that shack near the monument. Looking for Senor Anderson? Uh Uh-huh. Get there before he does. Greet him. Anderson, it'll be okay. We'll make up a good story for your girl. <laughs> you could have some Lulu's I use. Come on, open up. Let's not get squeamish about one night out in 20 years. Let's... That's the boy. Hey, wh- welcome to my lean to senor. <laughs> hey, what? Well, I'm clumsy, senor. My hook did not kill with one stroke. This will take away my clutch. Oh, Garfio. Let go, man. Let go. Oh, I tell the hook on him. He got the message. But the man is in pain. I only he want... He wanted to... Anderson, didn't he? Let's give him to Anderson. Eh, uh, see. Si. Pick him up, Bruce Mine. Now he will sleep in the ocean sea, and nothing will wake him. Bogart and Lauren Bacall, and the second act of our story. When a man is married and has a bride for twenty years right by his side, the etiquette is to be not tardy. Come right home, kiss the Mrs. Hardy. Upon occasion, it happens every season, a man gets sidetracked, pick your own reason. Then there rises the old situation, Mrs. Weeps in great agitation. Weeps is right, and not with tears, King. That's the toughest kind of crying there is. Look at her. Sitting over there and staring. And thinking the million worst things that could have happened. Don't knock it. It's a woman's privilege. King, give Mrs. Anderson anything she needs. I'm going out. For Mr. Slate? Who else would I go looking for? Shannon. Uh, how did I get on this boat? Hey, Garfield. See, si, what is it? He's come around. So what do you want I should do, to dance? So he's come around, he knows he was. For how long? We told him before we take the fish home. 
This is what happened to Anderson, isn't it? Uh huh. Rolled him, got rich, fed him to the fishes, gave him to the ocean. Try rolling me. Maybe we can make a deal. <laughs> I've heard tell of you, Shannon. In port. No doe Shannon, they call the man. I said we could make a deal. With money in it? Are there other kinds of deals? Hey, Garfield. What? Come here. Shannon wants to make a deal. And why shouldn't he want till the dead men and lovers promise the moon with quick words? Look, I've got a boat. I could raise some money on that. Canoes are a drug on the market. Uh Uh-uh. I've seen this boat, Garfield. Mm -hmm. Twin engine job, about 45 feet. Trim. Nice. I could get Mr. Val to raise some money on it. Bring it to you. Now, look, be reasonable, Garfield. Why not? You'll still have me even if she can't raise the dough. And any time I wish I could put this hook in you so you could squirm and beg if this is a trick. You know what? I'd enjoy watching that. Lady Sailor, you have come back without Mr. Slater on your arm. You noticed it too, huh, King? Where's Mrs. Anderson? Sleep in her room. I go wake her. Let her sleep. There may not be much sleep left for her. You have not found them? They were not there in the place where you searched for them? It was empty. All I found was a blood stain on the floor. Lady Sailor, do not believe this thing that you do not know. This thing that builds a tear in your eye. This... Ah, the phone has ringed like that ever since you were gone. When I say hello, I get the hang-up bang in my ear for answer. Maybe because a man answered. Let's see how a lonely girl makes out. Hello? Shannon's place. You're finally in, Mr. Val. Fella here just dying to talk to you. Where have you been, sailor? Why don't you watch the shop? Answer the phone. You could have talked to King. Where are you, Slate? What's the idea? Here's my nickel. Let me chat, huh, sailor? Go raise some money on the boat. Every buck you can get. What's the matter? You lose at Lotto again? This I don't know yet. It's what you can get on the boat against my life. Like the odds? Hate them. I... Where do I bring the money? Just the dough. No chummy cops. The lean-to south of Maximo Monument. Remember the... Fi- get out the papers on the boat, King. Again, Lady Sailor? Yeah. Some days it's hard to keep a man alive. <laughs> told you, Miss Duvall. Such beautiful advice. Miss Duvall, I advised Mr. Shannon, save your money. Save your money. If you don't lend me something on the boat, Slate will die. Oh, now you needn't be so melodramatic, Miss Duvall. I'm a sensitive man. A more modest, truthful approach could move me far more deeply. Melodrama embarrasses me. Gee, how's a girl to know about sensitive fellows like you? Crevy, I lied. Oh, that's better. Now, come now. What did you really want the money for this time? Well, Crevy, old boy, it's just that I've got a chance to invest in an oil well. Comes a time in a girl's life she needs an oil well. Oil? Where? Well, they told me not to tell. They said, uh, let's keep it among ourselves, huh, girly? Ah, and very shrewd, very shrewd, too. Well, my dear, seeing it's something as sensible as that, uh, six, th- uh, no, uh, five thousand is all we can manage. Now, if you'll sign here, please. Uh, there, now. See how rewarding it is to tell the truth? I'm so ashamed I could cry. Bye, Crevy. You are a linda beggar, senorita. Beautiful. I watch the performance. You ought to catch me on a matinee. Hey, you're wearing a... See, see, a hook. My name, Garfio, means hook. That is why you come with me. So my name will not spill blood on our proud streets. What does it say in your book about helping a man with a hurt, Bruce? It says, for the promise of a promise of dough, he could be persuaded. Bothers you, huh? Yeah. If I could only... 
Move over to my other side. I could groan a little more for me. Make me believe it. I tell you what. Uh, man doesn't like to lie in his own blood, mate. Yeah. Besides, it messes up the deck. From fish you don't mind so much. Here, yeah, I'll roll you over. Easy. Easy. That's a little more pain to a rich boy like you. Or you. Why, you stupid. Maybe if I use my feet. Oh. That makes me smarter, huh? Uh, now all I got to do is drag you, baby. Throw you in the hole with the rest of the fish. Garfio. Ah, uh, what is it you want? Just answer one question for me. I gave you the money. Why did you make me come out here with you? Is a manly question for which a manly answer. To get rid of you once and for all and forever. You and Slate Shadow. Why kill us? You've got your money. That should be the end of it. Let Slate go. Let both of us go back to Havana. And we won't say a word. <laughs> we won't say a word. Hermos, do you think I'm stupid? Up ahead in our boat is Bruce and your Shannon. They wait for us. You're a bitter man, Garfio. Why? Because of your arm? The hook? Why should I be bitter about the hook? It's a souvenir of a woman who loved me. Over a lover who did not. I'm sorry for you. I really am. Do not try your sympathy with me, senorita. Without this hook, I would be half the man. Without it, perhaps I would not have the courage to kill you. You, senorita, you first jump over to the other boat. All right. Slate. Slate, are you all right? What has happened here? I left your Shannon lying there, right on this spot, with Bruce standing over him. Bruce! Stop playing games with me! What are you trying to do, Bruce? Are you going to? <laughs> What are you doing up there on the cabin top, Pigeon Shannon? Were you going to jump on Garvio? Jump! Just get out of the way, sailor. Don't do a thing. Just get out of the way. Slate, his hook. Into my arms, Pigeon. Jump! Yeah, feet first. <laughs> Pigeon, huh? Who will have it on the hook? <laughs> ah, ah, is this a pretty picture? I sit on your chest. And feed you my hook like this. <laughs> so, so my pigeon ducked his head. Bueno, we will try again. <laughs> What's the matter, Garfio? Dug your hook too deep in the wood? Can't get it out. Let's roll over, shall we? I will get it out. I will... <laughs> Sailor. I was a coward, Slate. I turned my back. Couldn't watch. Uh, I'm a hurt sailor. Help me. Throw your good arm around me. I'll take you home. Here, sailor. Five thousand dollars. Give it to me. I'll take it down to Mr. Crevelin. He'll give me back the note I gave him on the boat. Uh, I don't know. What do you mean you don't know? Well, I'm... I'm wounded. I have to convalesce. Five thousand bucks I could convalesce in style. Like a for instance? I could relax, have a pretty girl wait on me, hand and foot. My wish, 
a command. You can get that for nothing. Me. Let's try, huh? Come here. Like that, slave. I don't know. That's not exactly what I had in mind. You said you wanted to be waited on hand and foot. What do you want me to do? Wait on your foot? I want you to scratch my back. All right. Ah. Oh. Yeah, that's right, sailor. A little further down. And to the right. To the right. More to the right. Yeah. Take your five grand and go get convalesced. Hang up a shingle, sailor. You just scratched a man well. Come here. And so our two stars, Humphrey Bogart and Lauren Bacall, have brought to a close our latest Bold Venture story. Special music was composed and conducted by David Rose. May we invite you to listen again next week at this time for another exciting adventure starring Humphrey Bogart and Lauren Bacall together in Bold Venture. Adventure, intrigue, mystery, romance, starring Humphrey Bogart and Lauren Bacall. Together in the sultry setting of tropical Havana and the mysterious islands of the Caribbean. Bold Venture. again, the magic names of Humphrey Bogart and Lauren Bacall bring you Bold Venture and a tale of mystery and intrigue. Give me another handful of confetti, sailor. Yeah. Street Carnival really brings out the jazzy in you, doesn't it, Slate? <laughs> Why not? Where else can a fellow rid himself of the cares and toils of the day? Where else can he wear a funny hat? Well, he could wear it on the top of his head like the other funny fellow. What's the matter, Sailor? Are you jealous because I fandangled around his brim? In Cuba, that's the thing to do at a fiesta. The hat dance. With a beanie? Three propellers makes it daring. <laughs> you know, sometimes I don't know about you, Slate. Sometimes I can't figure it. Slate, uh, I was saying I can't figure you out. Yeah, I'll help you with your homework later. Right now, I want to concentrate on... Yeah, just as I thought. There are six of them. Six dancing girls on that platform. How'd you ever work it out? Simple. I counted their legs and divided by two. Is there any other way? Some fellows I know add a column of figures from the top. Uh... Hey, look, Sailor, the girls are throwing flowers at us fellas. Among other things. Now watch this catch, Sailor. Ah, what a snazzy shortstop was lost to the world when I chose the sea. So you made a shoestring catch of a paper camellia slate. I yawned. Performance oh. toward me, too, lady. Hand over the camellia shortstop. The pathetic little souvenir was meant for me. You kidding, Buster? I call for a fair catch. Uh, we were all dazzled by it. Let's not let it go to our head, huh? The little blossom. Pin it on my lapel, flower boy. Go shag your own flies, kid. This one got to impress you, huh? You impressed me. But not for long, huh, kid? Gosh. Hat dancers, fellows fighting over a paper flower. It's been a real fiesta slate. What do we do with a prone fellow? We just dance around him. Watch you don't trip over his chin. Come on, Quimby. Get in. Quick. Yeah. 
You must be out of your mind, Mr. Packard. I'm talking to you. I'm talking about your mind. I heard you. Making me meet you like this. The two of us together. Suppose the cops get your fast wink of us together. Nothing had happened. The police had shake us down, make clucking sounds, shake their heads and tell us to keep moving. We're blocking traffic. Yeah. Go ahead. Keep telling me. Look, Quimby, I set up the whole thing, didn't I? I said keep telling me. I had that clerk in the jewelry store believing I was really interested in that stone. I keep going in there for three weeks, every day. And I couldn't make up my mind whether to buy it or not. I touched the dashboard with my nose. I bow, Mr. Packard. The clerk had the stone out yesterday. Then you came in and pulled a switch while I diverted him. So far, simple. Yeah, real, real. With my record and the cops knowing by this time that you were casing the place, all they have to do is find us together. Find us with a stone. No stone, Quimby. I didn't get it. What? But I gave it to Velma. I put it in that paper comedian. I gave it to her. Then she tossed it to you? She tossed it. A guy named Slate caught it. Slate? Slate Shannon? I guess. Trouble, Mr. Packard, if it's Slate Shannon. He's different? Maybe not. Maybe not at all. Slate Shannon. A guy lives, dies, just a guy. He can be taken care of. You got all your loot, Slate? Yeah, the camellia from the dancing girl, the cane from the guy who couldn't guess my weight. And the Cupid doll from the girl whose weight you could and did. <laughs> yeah. Now I've got a Cupid doll I can call my own. You can put her alongside that picnic ham you won at Venice Pier five years ago. No, this Cupid is... Hey, sailor, look. It's Pilar, the peddler. Hi, Pilar. Oh, Slate, it's two o'clock in the morning and I'm tired. You can sell your old clothes to Pilar some other time. You kidding? Pilar is my beloved. She and that old horse are among the fondest memories a fellow can cherish. Hey, towel, Pilar. How goes it with my old friend? Oh, oh, El Dobbin. Oh. Oh, oh, it is late Shannon. With his hermosa senorita. The beautiful senorita. Tasting the moonlight. Make him go home, Pilar. I'm worn out. I've got something for you, Pilar. A kiss for an old peddler, perhaps, to bring back a faraway yesterday, when Pilar did not drive a junk car. Better than that, Pilar. A camellia for El Dobbin's hat. <laughs> <laughs> now, don't thank me, El Dobbin. There's nothing really. Hey, look at my cupie. Oh, come on, Slate. <laughs> Bye, Pilar. Adios, senorita. Slate, my lover fellow. Get up, El Dobbin. Andale. <laughs> Ah, that Pilar. If I was only 40 years older. You may be by the time we get home. Please come on. Sailor, tonight I've lived. I've danced in the streets, met an old love. No, oh, you're just the Havana Flash. That's what you are. Hey, wait a minute, Sailor. There's a guy crooking a finger at me from a doorway. You lost, friend? No, I am very much at home, senor. It is you who are lost. And that gun is for showing me the way, huh? If you wish it. If you do not, I will settle for a paper camellia. The one that was went for me at the fiesta. My beloved Mia Alma, a minute for me. Can I help it if you're awkward and butterfingers? We will not discuss my personality. The camellia, por favor. Sure. Sure, I've got it right here. <laughs> you say something? <laughs> oh! <sighs> Ah, I was wrong. You didn't say a thing. Slate, what happened? Why did you hit him over the head with the doll? Pointed a gun at me and wanted a camellia. Hey, hey that's the second flower lover I've had to fight for a camellia. Now, don't get fat on it. There might be a third. Let's get out of here. King, did you get him? Yes, Mr. Slate, a whole dollar's worth. A whole bouquet. I'll wrap them. Thanks. Taylor, come here. What do you want? What are you looking so sheepish about? I bought you something, a bouquet of camellias. Here. Like them? Gee, and they're artificial, too. 
What girl wouldn't go out of her mind over a bunch of artificial flowers? I thought you'd like them. They're to make up for last night. I'll put them on my dresser. King, will you go into my room and empty the water out of the vase? I wouldn't want these blossoms to get wet. <laughs> I will, Lady Sailor. But it is not whether a gift is... Now look, King, if she doesn't want them... Slate Shannon. I threw you a flower last night, Slate Shannon. Care to come over to my place and pull petals? Why not? I got nothing to keep me here. Oh, I'm glad. The Castillo Apartments, 4B. Ask for me, for Velma. You can't miss me. I'll be all that's there. Going someplace, Slate? Be back in a... Uh, I'll be back. Some guy trying to sell me insurance. Mm. Tell her you're only interested in a short-term policy. Huh, dear? Buenos dias, Slate Shannon. Hello. Your name, Velma? Uh-huh. Come on in. You like my place? Comfy. Well, then, why don't you get that way? All right. Uh, one of these days, I'm, I'm going to get myself a sofa like this. What for? You can use mine any time you want. Here. I'll slide the hassock under your feet. You feel like talking? Not especially. I could just sit here like this and fall asleep. I'll rock you to sleep if you want. <laughs> Velma, we reached the stage in our great romance when a guy is forced to ask a question. I hate to louse up this deathless love of ours, but if I just let myself go like this, you'll think I'm a, well, I don't know what, maybe a cad even, and you wouldn't want... Look, Slate, I, I, you know why I wanted to see you. No, no, I don't. Go ahead, break it to me. Well, you caught a paper camellia at the carnival. Oh, oh, you like the way I shag flies, huh? I want that camellia. Are you kidding? Do you have it with you? You sure you're not kidding? If you don't have it, I'll go back to your place with you and get it. You need a camellia to make you happy, kid? That's right, yeah. I want to look good for you. I want to put it in my curly hair. Look, baby, it's not your hair that's curly, it's your head. A fond farewell to you. All right, get out of here. You and your fat grin, out. You don't know what you just bought yourself. Gee, and I, I thought I'd get out of here with at least that hassock. Well, that's the way it's got to be. So long, Velma. Hi, Mr. Slate. Hello, King. Where's Sailor? In her room, making herself the loveliest for you. The way a good girl should. Mind if I ask you something, Mr. Slate? Sure, go right ahead. Where have you been? Um, horseback riding. <laughs> Must have been a tall, blonde horse, Mr. Slate. Left some hair on your lapel. Where did you... Slate, come here. Something's happened. Why? What's the matter? Look, I'm my dresser. I'm looking. You mean my picture in the frame? Why don't you dust it once in a while? I'm talking about camellias, the ones you gave me. I put them right here on my dresser. Oh, where are they? I'm trying to tell you. They're gone. Someone came in through that window and took them while I was out. A camellia heist. Ah, this is something new in the annals of crime. Suddenly all of Havana's gone berserk over paper flowers. What would anyone want with artificial flowers? Yeah, that suddenly worries me, too. Because I've heard there are times when they're used at cheap funerals. stars Humphrey Bogart and Lauren Bacall, and the second act of our story.
When a girl throws flowers, it's time to duck, unless you're a darling of lady luck. I offer this advice, I offer it for free. It comes to you gratis, courtesy of me. Two men get clobbered so far to date For a paper camellia by Mr. Slate As if it's worth it, I'll tell you that The flower now reposes on a horse's hat <laughs> And that's just where it's going to stay Have you ever thought about it, Mr. Slate? That maybe there's something sinister about that paper camellia? Something strange, as if it were touched by dark kisses, as if some fingers of evil... King, uh, have you ever considered a saying the role of Hamlet, the unhappy prince? I was just wondering why somebody stole those flowers out of Miss Sailor's room. A gentleman is ringing for service at the desk, Mr. Slate. Yeah. Sorry, mister, no more rooms. We're full up. Mr. Slate, we got 16 rooms. Seventeen. Mr. Greeley ran out on us this morning, leaving us a suitcase full of interlocking, no mortar necessary bricks. I don't like that guy's looks. Besides, he's wearing a chameleon in his lapel, and I've had enough camellias for one day. Let me handle this. Your name is Shannon, isn't it? That's right. I can't help who recommended you, friend. No rooms. We're not taking any reservations. That's fine. I'd like to see a lad make a living. So I'll make this real short. I was going to ask you to. You got a camellia that looks like this, only in paper? Why? Because then you'd win first prize. One thousand bucks. Because I did what? Hey, don't I know you? The light was bad last night at the fiesta, but I could... That's right. You slugged me. So I just now forgot it. And I just now set a grand for the camellia. You got it? The last camellia I had was stolen out of this lady's room. Even for a thousand, you say that? Because that's the way it was. If it wasn't, get somebody to shed a tear over you. So long, Shannon. What's the matter, killer? You run out of bullets? Your boyfriend, Velma. He can't ever cry on your shoulder anymore. Why'd you kill him? Ricardo wouldn't double-cross you. Yeah, I remember. His dying words were how he wouldn't double-cross me. What'll yours be, Velma, dear? He tried to tell you. He didn't steal that camellia from Shannon's girl. The poor guy. All he was trying to do was make the time of day with me. And you told him, Ricardo, bring me a jewel. Bring me a ruby. It'll light up the sky for us. Isn't that what you told the dead lover boy? You've had a big day, killer. Why don't you go someplace and die dreaming about it? The ruby, Velma. Give it to me. I haven't got it. I haven't got it. I threw it away. The night of the street dance. I threw it to you. You forgot I was there. You forgot it wasn't me you tossed the posy to. I'm sorry, dear. You're grieving for the dead. That's what makes you forgetful, huh? <laughs> Is it my fault that Shannon caught it? Is it my fault we can't get it away from him? You can't get it away from him. A sweet, unspoiled, girly girl like you, and you can't take a paper flower from a man. I tried. Ricardo tried. You tried. How come you flipped it, killer? And I made it so two and two for you, dear. Plant the ruby in the flower, I said. Toss it to me while dancing. And nobody knows how a poor little jewel got lost. How simple it was. Well, you changed all that, killer. The boy lying on the floor says you changed it. Get the ruby, Velma, dear. Or for you and the boy, I'll arrange a two-body grave. Here, look at this picture, Senor Shannon. Senorita. Uh, no, he's not the one, Inspector LaSalle. Well, let me see, Slate. I said he wasn't the one. What do you have to look at a picture for? Because I like to look at pictures. No, that's not the man who offered a thousand dollars. Here, look at this photograph. This man will probably not... Uh... Yeah, that's him. Let's see. That's him, all right, Inspector. Hmm, what you say is very interesting. Because this is a man who has no record on the blotter of the police. Well, how did he get his picture in the pile with these thugs? This is a man whose name is Fred Packard. He is not a hundred percent thief. He is a suspected thief. A thief of what? Of a ruby of inestimable worth. This we think. This we do not know. Now, uh, permit me, Senor Shannon. Here is another picture. Have you seen this man ever? Uh, 
No, I don't think so. Senorita? No, I haven't. Why? This is a man named Quimby. We suspect he was in complicity with Senor Packard in the theft of the ruby. Again, we have no proof. I've got some advice for you, Inspector. And this advice is... Pick up this guy, Quinby. <laughs> that is already done. He languishes on an open charge in an empty cell. We give him questions, however, receive no answers. Keep at it, LaSalle. I think I can deliver this whole thing to you, ruby and all. Come on, sailor. Come on, he says. Come on where? To knock on a door. To get back some junk. <laughs> junk someplace else. Pilar the peddler is closed for business. Open up, Pilar. It's Slate and Sailor. Let's watch that billing, huh, kid? Sailor and Slate, Pilar. Aha! It is my very godmother's. Come into the junk pile of Pilar. <laughs> You're a doll, honey. Wouldn't patronize any other junk dealer. <laughs> you have come to give me more souvenirs for El Dobbin, huh? Take something away, Pilar. We want the camellia I pinned to your horse's hat. The camellia? I, I gave it to the viejo, the old man Cortez. Who? Cortez, the junk man. All day he competes with me. At night he courts me. Plays old bottles under my window. <laughs> Last night he was so beautiful, I threw him the paper camellia. And where do we find this beautiful man? Oh, in his little tin shack on Calle Rosa. Ah, you should hear how he plays those bottles. It makes a woman shit. Look, Slate, through the window. The old man's asleep. With a grin on his face and the camellia on his... Yeah. I told you that Pilar is a wonderful woman. Here, Sailor, I'll hoist you in. What? We don't want to wake the old man out of a dream he may never have again. Come on, I'll hoist you through the window. Just take the flower out of his ear and kiss him good night. Okay. How do you? I got the flower, Slate. Did you kiss him? Yeah. You know, he kissed back. Why, that sly old junk man. Come on, sailor. Get back to the jeep. When did you put a photoelectric cell on the jeep door, Slate? Don't worry your pretty head how doors open, dear. Just get in. You and Shannon. All right, flower lover. If you have trouble starting, I'll use this gun as a choke. Get going, Shannon. <laughs> Well, this is a pretty boat you got, Shannon. The Bold Venture, huh? Pretty name. Yeah, I don't think I've got enough gas to get you to Key West, Packard. You have. It's been taken care of. You're on the boat, both of you. Mr. Packard. What do you want? Would you give a girl a peep at your ruby? Uh, just take my word for it. It was in the camellia. It has a perfect star. It weighs 35 carats, and it's flawless. Okay, Shannon, start her up. You just about have this all figured, haven't you, Shannon? Sure. The cops are scratching at your back. Me too. What? Don't turn around, Shannon. You make a good shield. Velma, what do you want? What are you doing on this boat? I heard you give orders to gas up this boat. You didn't think you were going to run out on me, did you? Slate, who's that girl breathing on the back of your neck? Velma? Sailor. Sailor? Velma. Hi, Velma. I don't want to be a cat, dearie, but your gun's showing. Does it show to you, too, Fred? Look, I was going to send for you once I got to Key West. Sure, sure you were. What are you going to do now that you'll never get to Key West? Velma, don't be crazy. Listen to me. Fred! Fred, come back here! Fred! I'll kill him! He won't get away! I'll... I'll... Let go of me! I'll take that gun, Velma! He'll get away! He'll swim! Give it to me! Yeah. Here, sailor, cover her. Let him go, Slate. The cops will pick him up. Maybe, maybe not. He's headed for that breakwater. If he makes it, maybe nobody will pick him up. 
Keep your eyes on my shoes. That Velma's a tricky one. Packard! Packard, you, you won't make it. I'll make it. There's an undertow at that breakwater. Okay, Packard. Back to the boat, Packard. You're crazy. I said back. We're both drowned. Maybe. Let's go under and see. Uh. Taylor. Taylor, throw me a line. All right. Uh. Uh, how do you feel, Packard? Just get me aboard. I saved your life. Aren't you going to say thanks? No? Haul us in, sailor. Hold tight, Slate. I'll drag you home. Bless you. Stop saying that. I've got a cold swimming around in that cold ocean. Here, I made you something. Drink it. What is it? It's good for fellas with a cold. Go ahead, drink it. Drink it all down. All right. What was that? A fish broth. A fish broth? Uh Uh-huh. A little haddock, a pinch of rock cod, dash of swordfish. Where'd you get a remedy like that? I invented it. Fish never catch cold, and they live in the ocean. Genius. Didn't you like that remedy? Try this one. Cut it out, sailor. I've got a cold. Cut it out. Did you like that? Nice, huh? (gasps) It's you! Bless you. (gasps) It's you! Bless you. No, I've got a cold, too. What have we got to worry about? Come here, Slate. And so our two stars, Humphrey Bogart and Lauren Bacall, have brought to a close our latest Bold Venture story. Special music was composed and conducted by David Rose. May we invite you to listen again next week at this time for another exciting adventure starring... Humphrey Bogart and Lauren Bacall, together in Bold Venture. Doc, get the scissors busy. Get the bandages off. Took weeks of work to give you a new face, Joe. A few more moments won't matter now. Now that the job's done. Well, they matter to me. I want to see myself. I want to get outside and see people again. Four weeks. Nobody to look at. Nobody to talk to. Nothing to read. Just sitting here waiting for this minute. Uh, That's the last of the bandages, Joe. Just this one across your eye. There. Uh. Where's the mirror, Doc? Where's the mirror? Oh, here, I'll get it. Uh, no, wait. Wait a minute, Doc. Never mind the mirror. I don't want to look at my face. Not just yet. Scared, Joe? A little. Doc, how do I look? Did you do a good job? The best. You, you should have been a doctor, Doc. That's what you should have been. Too bad the medical school I was thrown out of didn't agree with those sentiments, Joe. No, I am rather proud of that face of yours, though. Nobody'd ever know it was you. Uh, uh, that's what I wanted. Uh, 
I got $50,000 I lifted from my firm's safe. And the police will be looking for Joe Harvey. Only there ain't no Joe Harvey, not anymore, huh, Doc? That's right. Want to look at yourself now, Joe? No. Nah. Not for a little bit. I want to talk a little. You know, Doc, I scared you when I crashed in here a month ago, didn't I? I scared you into working on my face. Mm, yes. As a matter of fact, you did. Uh, well, I'm going to give you five grand for what you did for me. The police never had my fingerprints. They'll never know me now. They won't, will they, Doc? No. They'll never know I'm Joe Harvey, huh? I'll give you the mirror so you can see for yourself. But I'll promise you this. Nobody in the world will ever be able to recognize you. Give it to me. Give it to me quick, Doc, now. All right. There. Yeah, take a look. Yeah. Doc. Doc, is this me? Me, Joe Harvey? Oh, I ain't very good looking now, Doc, am I? <laughs> but I am very rich. And I'm free... Clear and loaded. Thanks, Doc. Nobody's ever going to be able to prove anything on me from now on. And now to the latest adventure of Boston Blackie. Enemy to those who make him an enemy. Friend to those who have no friend. Okay, Doc, you can leave me here. I'll grab a cab. Yeah, sure you're all right, Joe? Sure. After I got over the shock of seeing my new face. Thanks for taking me downstairs, Doc. And thanks a million for what you did to my kisser. It's all right, Joe. We're square. Cab! Hey, Cab! Thanks again, Doc. So long. You won't be seeing me. No, I don't believe I will. Where to, Johnny? Grand Central. What are you staring at? Huh? Nothing, nothing. Hey, what's been going on in town for the past month, driver? I've been kind of out of touch with things. Not much happening. Police are still looking for that Donald Tate guy for a cop killer, but that's all that's exciting. You think they'll get him? Can't miss. They always get a cop killer, you know. So I just pick this man in the papers every day. They'll get him. I hope they do. So you missed it? Hey, what'd you stop here for? Traffic light. Well, the light's green. Is it? Oh, that's right. Hey, here comes the traffic cop. Come on, get started. I'm trying to have fun. Well, now, what's going on here? Get that bus out of here. You're holding up traffic. Officer, officer, look at the back. Oh, I'm right here. And who should it be now, the president? Donald Tate. Okay, Tate, don't you even blink or I'll shoot you here on the spot. Tate? You think I'm Donald Tate? Sure he's Tate, officer. I recognize him the minute he got in my cab. That's why I stole his hat. Of course he's Tate. I couldn't miss knowing him. I've been studying his picture every day for a month. This will mean a promotion for me, sure. But I'm not Donald Tate, officer. I'm Joe Hart. Uh, who? I'm not Donald Tate. I don't care who I look like. I'm not Tate. Keep talking, killer. Only I won't be listening. You're Tate, all right. Drive down to police headquarters, kid. We got a real prize package to deliver. So, this guy, Tate, we got locked up. There's nothing but scream for Boston Blackie, eh, Rollins? That's right, Inspector Faraday. So, let him scream. It'll do him good. Now, what about Blackie? He's on his way down, Inspector. You gonna let him see Tate when he gets here? Why not? That guy's still yelling he isn't Donald Tate. Well, he's calmed down now. Hey, we never did have Tate's fingerprints, did we, Inspector? What difference does that make? We got his picture, didn't we? A dozen witnesses saw him like that cop. A couple of them knew Tate personally. I don't need another thing. Oh, <laughs> yes, you do, Inspector. You need me. Yeah, sure. Like, I, I need a hole in the head, Blackie. Anything in your head would be an improvement. Hello, Rollins. Hello. <laughs> Glad you're here, Blackie. What did you say, Rollins? I said, <clears throat> what are you doing here, Blackie? That's better. Blackie, you know, we've got Donald Tate, and he's screaming he wants to see you. Well, I'm here, but is that all he's screaming about? No. In between times, he's yelling that he isn't Donald Tate, and that you can prove it. I don't see how. I never met Tate, and I don't know what he looks like, except from seeing his pictures in the paper. Quite a publicity job you did on him, Friday. Got him picked up, didn't it? Come on, Blackie, if you want to see him, I'll take you over there myself. Don't bother. I can find my way to jail, even though you have tried to escort me there several times in the past, Inspector. You've got five minutes with him, Blackie. Yell if you want anything. Right. Well, Tate, what's this all about? Oh, Blackie... I made them get you here. You're the only one that can prove I'm not Tate. Don't count on this. You're Tate, as far as I'm concerned. I've never seen you before, and I've never seen Tate before. 
You sure look an awful lot like these pictures, though. I don't care what I look like. I'm Joe Harvey. You remember Joe Harvey. Half of it is right. I remember Joe Harvey. Only you're not Joe. But I am Blackie. I know I don't look like him. I can explain that. But first, I gotta convince you I'm Joe. Now, look. The last time you saw me was about six weeks ago, right? It was on a Saturday morning. Well? It was in a barbershop, Blackie. You got a trim and a shine. I was getting a shave and working on a scratch sheet, figuring out Monday's races. That's right, ain't it, Blackie? So far. All right, listen. I ain't through yet. We got in a cab together. I dropped you at Mary Wesley's apartment. No, no wait, wait. First, you stopped to pick up some food. What color suit was I wearing? Well, let's see. Blue? Brown? I don't know, Blackie. Good. Harvey wouldn't remember that. But somebody who was trying to prove he was Harvey would have all the details, including the one about my suit. Oh, you believe me, Blackie? Not yet, I don't. What happened to your face? I'll tell you. I grabbed 50,000 bucks from my firm. I went up to Doc Weaver's to have my face changed so nobody'd know me. And the rat crossed me. He gave me a cop killer's face, Donald Tate. A likely story. Why would he do that? Why? He figured I was going to bump him after he operated on me. He wanted to make sure I'd be picked up. He knew any cop in the city would grab me on sight. I get it. You coaxed him into operating on you, huh? Ah, maybe I did get a little tough, but I paid him, Blackie. I paid him five grand right after the operation. Your timing was bad, kid. I was too late. If you're telling the truth. Of course I'm telling the truth, Blackie. Listen. I'll confess to that larceny rap if they'll believe I'm Joe Harvey, but it's the chair if they keep believing I'm Tate. I'm sorry, but there's nothing I can do. But, Blackie, it means the real Tate goes free. Does that sound right to you? What do you want me to do? I talked to reporters this morning. My story will be in the papers any hour now. I want you to go see Doc Weaver. He'll tell you the truth. He's got no right to be sore at me now. Then you can tell the cops who I am. Did you mention Weaver's name to the reporters? Yeah, yeah, I did. Yeah, that was smart. I better get to Weaver's fast. If the real tape sees that story, he's going to kill your alibi, kid. And very simply, too. Merely by killing Doc Weaver. Hello? Mary, this is Blackie. Well, I'd be ashamed to admit it if I were you. Do you know that you've kept me waiting half an hour? Well, it couldn't be helped, honey. I'll explain when I get there. Where have I heard that before, and how is it you never do? All right, where are you, Blackie? I'm in the apartment of a character named Doc Weaver, and you've got some work to do. What's the connection between your being there and my having work to do? When I see you, I'll explain that, too. What you mean is you won't explain that either. However, what do you want? Well, Doc Weaver had a visitor before I arrived here, a visitor who I think was a killer named Donald Tate. I want you to get bandages and iodine and whatever else you'll need to treat a badly shut-up guy and meet me at Shorty's place. Shorty's? Why there? Because I don't want Faraday walking in on me while I'm working out a plan. And he'd be sure to look for me at your apartment or mine. Now, get that stuff for me, Mary. Please, and rush it. I'll... I know. Well... You'll explain why when I see you. Okay, Blackie, I'll do it so long. Uh, say that again and say it slow, Miss Howe. And say it before we get to Donald Tate's cell. Okay, from the beginning. Well, it's just what I told you, Inspector Faraday. I'm Joe Harvey's girl. I've been out of town for a month, and I read in the papers this afternoon about this man you're holding who claims to be Joe. I can tell. I don't care what his face looks like. I can tell if it's Joe or not. That's what I thought. Only it's ridiculous. The guy is Donald Tate. Hey, how are you going to tell whether this guy is your boyfriend? You going to take his word for it? Well, hardly. Only Joe's got a birthmark on his arm. If I see that first... Maybe I'll listen from then on. Well, we'll listen together. Daddy, Daddy, baby, you're here, you're here. Faraday, she'll tell you I'm not Tate. She'll tell you I'm Joe Harvey. Well, Miss Howe, never mind. Wait till we get in the cell. Well, Miss Howe? I don't know. It's not Joe's face. Uh, which arm, Miss Howe? Which arm's got the birthmark? Birthmark? The right one, Inspector. Roll up his right sleeve. That's what just going to lay off. What's the matter? Well, see anything? Because I don't. What are you looking for? For the birthmark. If you were Joe, you'd have a birthmark on your right arm. Only you haven't any birthmark. So you're not Joe. That's what I thought. This guy's Donald Tate. Dottie. Dottie, baby, I'm Joe. You know I'm Joe. Do I? Let's go, Inspector. This isn't Joe Harvey. I don't know who he is. All I know is who he isn't. (laughs) 
Yeah, Faraday. Say it nice and sweet now, Inspector. Maybe I'll have some news for you. Blackie, where are you? What do you want? And who cares? You care, sweetheart, don't you? No. All I know is you came back from seeing that Donald Tate guy and insisted he was Joe Harvey. Only that was two hours ago. He is Harvey, and I can prove it. Well, before you go making a complete jerk of yourself, let me tell you this. Joe Harvey's girl was here an hour ago. She talked to the guy we got in jail, and she swears it isn't Harvey at all. And believe me, she ought to know. She certainly should. But maybe she had a reason for not telling the truth. Listen, Faraday, I've got a guy who operated on Joe Harvey's face and made him look like Donald Tate. Huh? He's shot up pretty bad. Blanky, bring that guy down here right away. Oh, no, pal. He's staying where he is, and I'm staying with him. You see, only two people actually know that Joe Harvey isn't Donald Tate. One of those two people is Doc Weaver, and the other is the real Tate. I'm going to keep the doc with me and see what happens. I'll tell you what'll happen. You're in the market for trouble, Blackie. Plenty of it. That's what you're going to get out of this. I doubt it. I think I'm going to get something much more tangible, Faraday. You see, the real Joe Harvey has 50,000 stashed away somewhere, and the real Donald Tate would pay a lot of dough if I deliver Doc Weaver to him. I'm going to hang around and wait for the best offer. <laughs> And now, back to Boston Blackie. While the police are searching for Donald Tate, the cop killer, they pick up Joe Harvey, whose face has been made over by Doc Weaver so that he's Tate's double. Boston Blackie knows that Inspector Faraday does not have the real Tate in jail, and after a visit to Doc Weaver's, calls Faraday, refuses to disclose his whereabouts but insists that Faraday is holding Harvey and not Tate. As we return to our story, Faraday and Rollins decide to visit Blackie's apartment. He doesn't answer the bell, Inspector. Maybe he isn't home. Rollins, you're getting to be a genius. Did it ever occur to you that Blackie might be home and not open the door if he knew it was me outside? Come on, we'll break it down. <laughs> Hey, Inspector, isn't breaking down a door against the law? Well, we'll say it got in our way. There's a law against obstructing justice, isn't there? Come along, help me. Okay, here goes. Don't look like there's anybody here, Inspector. No, it doesn't. Check the other rooms. Yes, sir. Like he's not at Miss Wesley's. Apparently he isn't home. He's not at Doc Weaver's. All we found there was bloodstains. Blackie told you he kidnapped Weaver, didn't he? He didn't say that exactly. Just said he had him. I'm going to fix that guy once and for all. Weaver? Blackie. I'm going to call the papers and tell them a whole story. That Blackie's got Dark Weaver and that he's hiding out somewhere. And that I want him for withholding a vital witness. Well, what good would that do, Inspector? Well, it'll show everybody that Blackie isn't such a big hero. And maybe it'll bring him around. So he'll cooperate with us a little bit. be all, Miss Wesley? Uh, yes, I believe so. Four boxes of bandages, two rolls of adhesive tape, iodine, sulfadiazine, sulfathiazole. Yes, that's all. Thank you very much. You're welcome. You bought the same stuff yesterday. You doing hospital work again, Miss Wesley? Not exactly, but that's pretty close. Well, goodbye. Goodbye, Miss Wesley. I'll see you tomorrow. Yes, I'm afraid you will. I wouldn't be in a hurry to go nowhere, Miss. Uh... No? No, just get in that car. Don't do no screaming. Don't do no nothing. No, anything. Don't get cute, Miss Wesley. I got a bottle of acid in my hand. Your face won't look so pretty as some of it should kind of spill out. Um, what do you want with me? I've been waiting for you to show up here. Get in that car, park the curb. I, uh, uh... Go on, go on, get in. Put that package down the seat start driving. I'll tell you where. I... Go on, get in. All right. Only, what are you going to do to me? Nothing if you behave yourself. Start it up and go straight up the street. Not too fast either, sister. I don't know why I should. The acid, sister. Remember the acid. Oh, now I know. I'm Donald Tate's sister, and I'm wanted. Not by me. By the cops. Only they think they got Donald Tate locked up. I want him to go on thinking that. Well, that's all right with me. I'll call Inspector Faraday and tell him. As soon as we get away from this traffic, you ain't going to talk so cute. Turn right at this corner. Uh, yes, sir. Now, look, Miss Wesley, one man knows the guy in jail isn't me, and that's Doc Weaver. I tried to get the doc, but maybe I'd bungle the job, and the papers say your boyfriend, Blackie, has him stashed away. He's hurt bad. 
That's why you bought them bandages and junk. What about it? This about it. I fixed Joe Harvey's girl so she wouldn't say the guy in jail was Joe. I'm clean if I can take care of the phony doc. Well, I'm really not him, you know. Stop the car, kid. There's nobody around this neighborhood at this hour. Stop I... the car. Now, start listening. I want to know where Blackie's got the doc. Now, talk. I'm sorry. I don't remember. Ow! Oh, oh. My, my arm, please stop that. This ain't nothing to what I'm going to do. Oh. Tell me that, that address. Tell it to me fast. I won't. I, I, I won't. You're practically begging for this please. acid. Okay, it suits me. One more chance before I spill this over your kissy. Where's Blackie and Doc Weaver? Don't throw that acid at me, please. And don't. start talking. All right. All right. I... Blackie, at his friend Shorty's hideout on Water Street. He's there along with Doc Weaver, and, and, and he's waiting for me. Now, please, please let go of my arm and let me out of the car. I've, I've, I've told you all I know. Yeah. Oh. You're about Boston Blackie's girl. He's just as yellow as any other dame in town. Go on, get out, scram. Got all I want out of you. You know what was in this bottle? Water, sister. Just plain, ordinary water. <laughs> Boy, did I cross you. Mary? That's right, little Mary. Come on, open the door, Blackie. Hi there. Well, I did it. I did it. He was there just like you thought he'd be. He practically carried me off in his arms, and I broke down and told him this address. So then I waited an hour, and here I am. Well, where is he in jail? He isn't here, and he's never been here. But... Oh, but, but he has to be. He had to come here. Everything worked out just, just as you planned. Wait a minute. You mean to tell me that Tate did grab you at the drugstore, and you told him I was here, and he didn't fall for it? Well, well Blackie, he seemed to. Cute guy. You had to figure this was a trap, or he intends to wait until night to bust in here. Well, you hop home. I'll call you if anything develops. All right. Only, Blackie, if you do catch up with Tate, I want you to know this. He twisted my arm. He did, did he? Now, just for that, I'm going to personally wring his neck. Wait just a minute, can't you? Just just hold the phone until I get the door open, please. Oh, everything happens to me. Goodness gracious. Just a minute. Hello? That's you, Miss Leslie. I've been calling you for two hours. Oh, hello, Inspector Faraday. I've been busy. What did you want? Well, not you. I want Blackie. Where is he and where is he hiding that phony Doc Weaver? Well, gosh, Inspector Faraday, I really don't know. Oh. What's the matter? I cross my fingers a little too hard. Goodbye, Inspector Faraday, and don't call back, please, ever, at least until tomorrow. Miss Wesley, I... And that is that. Not quite, oh. Mary. Oh, uh, not, not, not you again. Why not? You didn't want me to walk into a trap, did you, kid? Well, yes, as a matter of fact, I did. Yeah, I figured that. I figured you gave in too easy in the car, so I came here. I came up the fire escape and got in that way. Now, get on that telephone, sister. Hurry up. Oh, that's a fine way to treat a sister. All right, what do I do now? Pick up the phone. Okay. And call Blackie. Oh, no. Pick it up, kid. I'm not falling. I wouldn't mind killing you if I had to. You don't have to. What do I tell him? Nothing. I'll talk to him. Don't tell him who it is. I want to surprise him. Hello? Blackie, this is Mary. I'll Somebody here it. wants to... I... Blackie! It's Tate. Tate? You're at Miss Wesley's? For a while. And I'm going to meet you and make a swap with you. What kind of a swap? Your girl for Doc Weaver. And if you deliver him, I deliver her. Alive. Catch you on? Vaguely. Where will I bring Doc Weaver? Get in your car with a Doc. Park it way out on North Woods Drive. I'll come past. You two are alone in the car, I stop, and we switch cars. You get funny, I don't stop, and you don't never see a girl again. I don't have very much choice or a chance to get cute, do I? That's right. You better leave now, Blackie. We ought to both be in there close to the same time. You're a little nearer than me, so uh, don't get too lonesome waiting. Just make sure you'll be there, Tate. I've never been so anxious in my life to see another guy with my girl. You know, sister, this could be your last five minutes of living. You ever think of that? Not till just now. If it's all the same to you, though, I'd 
rather it weren't. Oh, oh, that, that's Blackie's car up there. Yeah, parked and waiting. Well, I'm going to drive past and see if the doc is in it. There's no cops are in it. Take a good look, kid. It may be your last. Well? All right. It's Blackie and the doc and no cops. Okay, you stay in here. And what are you going to do? Get out and head for that car while Blackie walks up to this one. And if any cops do try to stop me once I'm in that car, they'll have to shoot it out with me. And if they do, they might hit the dock, so they won't. Cops are so nice that way. Hey, Blackie. Yeah? Start walking this way slowly, on the other side of the road. I'm coming towards your car, and I've got my gun out, so keep your hands high. Got that? I get it. All right, start walking. Nice weather we're having, Tame. Shut up. Well, it was nice weather, I know, because I read it in the papers. Well, so you're here waiting for me, huh, Doc? Well, I gotta take you somewhere and finish a job I started. Move over. Okay, Rollins, the Tommy gun. Sure is. Roll him over, Rons. Okay, Inspector. Guess we got him. So the other guy in jail is really Joe Harvey. Well, what do you know? Who's this guy in the car here? Who's he? He was Doc Weaver, Faraday. And he's been dead for quite a while. Well, what's his body doing in your car, then? Good old Faraday. Much mouth, little listen. Try and get this, Inspector. Tate killed Weaver right after he found out that Weaver had fixed up Harvey's face. Only Tate wasn't sure he was dead. So? So, when the story got in the newspapers that I was holding Weaver, Tate figured he'd have to find the doc and knock him off. I get it now. Well, Blackie, I'm glad you called me and told me about this little trap. We got Joe Harvey on a last knee wrap, and Tate's dead. So everybody's happy. I guess that's right. So I've heard of people getting into trouble because they had a change of heart. But Joe Harvey wound up in jail because he had a change of face. I don't know what you can tell, Mr. Kingston, sir. His credit manager insisted we pay him the money we owe his firm and pay it immediately. I'll tell him something. If he ever gets on this telephone, I've been holding the line waiting for him for five minutes now. I tried to tell the credit manager we'd take care of the matter, Mr. Burton, but he wouldn't listen. And frankly, sir, I've run out of excuses. I understand. I think... Oh? Yes, Kingston, now. Oh, Charlie. Charlie, this is Ralph Burton. Oh, hello, Burton. I have a memorandum on my desk to call you. Yes, I know. I called because I want to explain about that money we owe you. Well, the amount is $30,000, isn't it? Yes, and Charlie, I don't have it. I'm up against a brick wall right now. I'm pressed for cash. You've got to give me time. 
Well, I, I'd gladly give you another 30 days, Burton, but, but the board of directors turned me down. They insist on immediate payment. And I wish there was something I could do for you, Ralph, really, but, but there isn't. I have no control over my directors. Uh, they're insisting that you pay what you owe or they want to put you in bankruptcy. Well, I won't kid you, Charlie. There's no way I can pay you now. Bankruptcy will only ruin me permanently. Give me time, please. Yours isn't my only obligation. Everybody wants money. I don't want to appear hard, Burton. There's nothing I can do. I guess it's your problem, and it's up to you to solve it. Yes, yes, I suppose that's right. This isn't your fault, Charlie. There's only one solution to my problem. Yes, I'm afraid there's only one way out for me. And now, meet Dick Calmer as Boston Blackie. Enemy to those who make him an enemy. Friend to those who have no friend. Coming. Well, hello, Mary. Come on in. Thanks, Blackie. Are you spending a quiet evening at home? I was, till now. Mm Mm-hmm. I wasn't supposed to pick you up for half an hour, right? Yes, but I had to do some shopping, and I found myself near here, so I thought I'd drop in and save you the trip. We can go to the movies from your apartment just as well as from mine. Suits me. I was just finishing this newspaper, anyhow. Kind of dull. Not an interesting murder in it. Oh, murders aren't interesting. They're practically deadly. (laughs) That's Mm. the general idea of the murderer. Glad you like it. Um, Just before I left my apartment, I was reading the story on the suicide of Ralph Burton. Did you read it? The Burton, the textile man? Yes, here it is on page one. Faraday gets billing in it. Seems that the good inspector, after duly inspecting the body, the gun found in Burton's hand, and a suicide note, quite expansively announced Burton as a suicide. And despite the fact that the inspector thinks it's suicide, you don't think it is? Oh, Blackie, don't you feel well? Feel fine. But Faraday's right most of the time, Mary. Only time he isn't is when he doesn't agree with me. Said he modestly. Well, somebody has to say it, and if I don't, who would? Well, let's talk about the movie we're going to see. Shall I find out what's playing? That might be an idea. Ah, uh, well, let me see. It's the uh, Dorian. Uh-oh. Well, we have a visitor. Could be no movies tonight, if it's the right kind of visitor. Come in. Uh, hello, Blackie, Mary. Charlie hello. Kingston. Come in, Charlie. Charlie, Blackie and I are going to a movie. Want to come? Well, some other time, perhaps, Mary. Uh, Blackie, I must talk to you. Well, of course, Charlie. Go right ahead. What's the trouble? It's the suicide of Ralph Burton. Uh, Have you read about it? Yes, of course. Well, he owed me a lot of money, Blackie, and he called me today. Uh, Perhaps I was a little too rough. I I didn't realize his back was up against the wall. Oh, I'm sure you didn't, Charlie. Well, what about it? Suppose you did pressure him a little. You're not censuring yourself because he killed himself, are you? Well, yes, I am. I want you to do something about it. What could Blackie do? Well, he could find the real reason Burton killed himself. A reason that maybe wouldn't be connected with me. Go ahead. Well, go ahead, I'm listening. Well, Inspector Faraday, it's all in the formation of the letters. Uh, here's how we know the Burton suicide note was genuine. Absolutely and unquestionably. Uh, Here are dozens of letters we know he wrote. Uh, Here's his suicide note. Mm. They sure look the same to me. They are the same. I've been handwriting expert on your staff for 20 years, Inspector, and there isn't any doubt that one man wrote the suicide note and the other letters. Absolutely and definitely. Okay, Flynn. That's what I thought when I said Burton's death was suicide. Thanks for agreeing with me. I guess this case is closed up tight. What's closed up tight? Apparently it isn't your mouth. Blackie, what do you want here at headquarters? In, for one thing, Faraday. Who's your friend? He's our handwriting expert, Joe Flynn. And I've really got to get back to my office, actually and positively, I mean. I'll see you later, Inspector. Well, Blackie? Faraday, why did Burton commit suicide? How should I know? And there's no way of asking him now. Well, I want to know why he killed himself. And I've got news for you. I'm going to find out. You're going to find yourself out. I'm on the sidewalk if you don't lay off this case, Blanky. It's closed. Sealed and solid. Sounds like a description of your head. Uh... It was closed, sweetheart, but I'm reopening it. And I'm warning you, Faraday, stay out of this case. I don't want any interference from you. Ah, uh, interference from me? Don't be silly. I'm through with Burton. He's a suicide. He probably had a reason to kill himself, and as far as I'm concerned, I don't... 
Who are you telling me to stay out of a case, me? See how silly that sounds? Now, maybe you'll stop saying it to me whenever I come around to help you. Make your bets, please, ladies and gentlemen. Deal draw at 16, stop at 17. All ready? I guess you're the only one who cares for blackjack, Mrs. Burton. I'll have a card. Yes, yes, of course. Slide it right out of the box and to you. Uh, six. Another? Mm-hmm. One more. Right. A uh, eight. Uh, another? Um, no. No, I'll stay with these. Very well. I turn my bottom card over. That's a queen. That's ten. I take mm-hmm. a card. A uh, three. Thirteen. I draw one more. Jack, I'm over. Yes. You win, Mrs. Burton. Mm-hmm. Kindly turn your cards up. Yes, of course. I have uh, a four, a six, an eight... Eighteen. Right. Right. Play again? Um, yes, I think so. Make your bets, please, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, Mrs. Burton? Yes? Uh, somebody would like to see you in the boss's office. See me? That's right, ma'am. Who is it? I, I don't know, Mrs. Burton. He didn't say, but it must be okay with Tony. He wouldn't be using the office. That doesn't mean it's all right with me, but uh, I'll find out in a minute. I'll show you the way, Mrs. Burton, if you want. No, never mind, thank you. I know the way. You uh, might tell Tony, though, that I want to see him, if you can find him. I'll tell him, Mrs. Burton. You uh, wanted to Close see him. Close the door, me. Mrs. Burton. Yes, I wanted to see him. I'm Boston Blackie. I want some information about your husband. By the way, you don't look very heartbroken. You uh, should have given me more time. I'd have put on an act for you. Mrs. Burton, why did your husband kill himself? As if you cared. I don't know. He just did, that's all. What are you snooping around for? The reason. And the reason why you suddenly could pay your gambling debts with him dead. You see, Tony told me that you and he were all square. Now. Oh, hello, Tony. Hello, Blackie. I see you got Mrs. Burton okay. Yes, thanks, Tony. I think I got a very okay. Tony... What's the idea of allowing this man to practically accuse me of killing my husband? Blackie, you said you... You wanted to see Mrs. Burton on business? Well, I did. And I do. That isn't exactly like I figured you meant, Blackie. Maybe you hadn't better insult my customers. Especially a lady like Mrs. Burton. I don't insult ladies. He uh, certainly insulted me, Tony. I don't insult ladies. Oh, kid. I don't like that kind of cute talk. I let you use my office, Blackie, because I'd rather you was on my side than against me. But maybe you're better for most now, huh? Oh, I don't think so. I'm not ready to leave yet. No? Uh, uh-uh. I take it back. I'm ready. Put the gun away, Tony. I'm liable to explode. Only I told you that I was here on business, didn't I? Well, I am. Only now, apparently, it's... Unfinished business. Just saving over once, Mike, like always. Yes, sir, Tony. Once over this. Yes, sir. Ain't out of my eye, Mike. Keep the weather out of my eye. Yes, sir, Tony. Out of the eye it is. There we are. Sorry. How do you like being my own private barber, Mike? Aces, sir. Aces. Working up here in my apartment instead of the barber shop. Working at my gambling tables at night. Like that? Yes, sir, Tony. Sure like that. Well, step on it, then, if you like it so much. I got a date with a young punk who worked for that Burton guy that knocked himself off. You ought to be here in five minutes. I want to be through that, then. Yes, sir. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, Tony, uh, you ain't going to the fights Friday night. Uh, they got a good card. I ain't. But you can. You got the night off. Tony? Oh, Tony. And there's that punk George that worked for Burton. Be on the minute, George. Wipe the ladder off, Mike. I'll be back. Uh, yes, sir. This minute. There, there you are, sir. Yeah, that's a good boy. Uh, maybe when I get back, you'll give me a massage. Sure, I'll do it. What was that? Uh, I said, uh, yes, sir. That's different. Hi, George. Hello, Tony. Well, you... You said to come here, and here I am. Good. A little dough for you, sonny. One grand for being a good boy. Gee, thanks, Tony. One grand. 
Tipping off the late Mr. Burton's creditors that his business was going to fluy. One grand. So he knocks himself off and his wife winds up with a hundred G's and pays me the 15,000 she owes me. Hmm. Good business. There you are. Three hundred. Four. Six. Eight. A thousand. They're all yours, kid. Well, thanks, Tony. Oh, well, you, you know something? My conscience is bothering me a little bit. <laughs> Forget it, kid. Just think of Mr. Burton. Nothing's bothering him anymore. Blackie, tell me, have you found out anything? I haven't slept now in two nights. I'm sorry, Charlie. Apparently there's nothing to find out. I did locate Mrs. Burton and did find that she isn't terribly broken up over her husband's death. That, that means nothing. I know it doesn't. You see, Charlie... If this weren't such an obvious case of suicide, perhaps it'd be something I might uncover that might make you feel better. Oh, it's suicide, all right, Blackie. That note Burton left leaves no doubt about that. It's, it's obvious. All right, you are. Say, wait a minute. Maybe everything is too obvious. Well, what do you mean, too obvious? I mean a lot of things. Listen, Charlie. I know Burton left his wife a sizable fortune. That could be a motive for murder. Oh, Blackie, I wish what you were saying could possibly be true, but it can't. Burton was a suicide, all right. In fact, as I remember things now, he tried to kill himself once before, to, to ten years or so ago. I, apparently, the thought stayed with him all these years. That could be part of the murder plan. And if this is a murder plan, Charlie, if it is, it's a beauty. You honestly think that Burton might have been murdered? I'm hoping that's what it is. Well, then do something about it, Blackie, please. I can't go on like this, believing I was responsible for the man's life. Take it easy, Charlie. I'm going to find out who was responsible for the man's death. And now, back to Boston Blackie. Boston Blackie's friend, Charlie Kingston believes he is responsible for the suicide of Ralph Burton. Blackie, in trying to ease Kingston's conscience, finds that Mrs. Burton is seemingly unaffected by the death of her husband, that she is an habitué of Tony's, a gambling house, and that she has been left a fortune by her husband. The police are certain that Burton was a suicide, principally because of an authentic note indicating his intention, which they found near the body. But Blackie thinks it's murder. As we return to our story, Inspector Faraday calls at Blackie's apartment. Come in. Hi, Miss Resley. Hi. Blackie here? No, I'm waiting for him, too. What's up, Inspector? Balloons. Oh. How should I know what's up? Well, at least I didn't ask what's new. You'll have to admit that that's in my favor. I couldn't answer that either. All I know is I got a complaint from a Mrs. Burton that Blackie was bothering her. And I came up to tell him to lay off. Mrs. Burton? The widow of the man who committed suicide? Yeah. What's Blackie want with her? Well, I don't know, but... Oh, here's Blackie now. Ask him yourself. Hi, Mary. Come on, Inspector. I'm Hi. sorry I didn't know you were coming, or I would have ordered something for you. Uh, poison, probably. Not probably. Preferably. Is this a business visit, or uh, won't there be any laughs? I'll laugh, you. Blackie, stay away from Mrs. Burton. She doesn't like you. Thank goodness for that. The Faraday, I've just come from Charlie Kingston's. You know, I don't think Mr. Burton committed suicide. Uh -huh. I suppose somebody put his hand on a pen and forced him to write that suicide note. No, that note has me stopped, I admit that. But your handwriting expert, Mr. Definitely and Positively Flynn, is getting me some information on it. He's getting it for you? Well, he thinks it's for you. I told him I was calling for you and that you wanted to find out what kind of paper that note was written on and that he was to call you at my place. He said he would. Say, I should have been a confidence man. You should have been an ape. Go ahead, boys. I'll keep score. And mark up Faraday's bright remarks on the left-hand side, Mary. You can't write with your left hand. Well, then again, you won't have to. Uh, is that so? I could write... Uh, the world will have to wait for the conclusion of your latest epigram, Inspector. Oh, uh, yeah? Well, I'll take that call. It's probably Flynn. <laughs> Hello, Blackie. Oh. Yeah? Hello? Inspector Faraday there. Speaking. This you, friend? Why, yes, Inspector. Well, what did you find out? About the uh, suicide note? I found out something very interesting. Uh, don't entertain me. Give me the facts. Well, the paper that note was written on was Maxwell Bond, number 78. 
made by the Maxwell Bond Paper Company. And that's interesting? Absolutely and unquestionably. When did Mr. Burton write that suicide note? Well, just before he died, naturally. Yesterday. Why? Why? Because the Maxwell Bond Paper Company went out of business nine years ago. Goodbye, Inspector. Blackie, did you hear that? The paper the suicide note was written on was made by the Maxwell Bond Paper Company, and they went out of business nine years ago. Hmm, you know, that makes me think, Inspector. Blackie, Blackie, maybe if that note paper was made by a company that went out of business a long time ago, well, maybe that suicide note the police found was the one he wrote when he tried to kill himself ten years ago. No, maybe about it. You think somebody picked it up at that time and then kept it from the police? It's possible. Then, when it was expedient to murder Burton... The ten-year-old note was dropped alongside the body after a gun was put in a dead man's hand. That means it was Mrs. Burton. That seems relatively reasonable for you, Faraday. Where are you going? Out to Mrs. Burton's house. Why? You going to try and beat me there? Me? Ah. Uh, I may be there later, but I'm going to take a chance and drop in at Burton's office first. I'm... George Anderson. I was Mr. Burton's assistant. You wanted to see me, Blackie? Uh, yes, George. I want some information. I want to know why Mr. Burton was murdered. Murdered? The police said it was suicide. Forget that. Listen, kid. My friend Charlie Kingston said that he got a telephone tip-off that your late boss's credit wasn't too good. Well, how does that affect me? I had nothing to do with it. No? Well, Charlie said he thought he recognized your voice. Now, if it was your voice and you got Kingston to be tough with Burton, you're in this thing up to what passes for a chin you've got there. Blackie, I had nothing to do with any phone call. No? Maybe if I worked on you a little, your memory would start getting better. No. Yes, I think that's a pretty good idea. I think I'll take you apart a little bit. No, no, don't. Don't come near me. I made the call. I had to make it. Tony paid me. Tony? Yes, Tony. So he's in this thing again, huh? He doesn't know it yet, but he's got something coming to him. Something and somebody. And the somebody is me. Get the wheel going, Davey. I'll stick around and watch for a while. Okay, Tommy. Make your bets, ladies and gentlemen. There's got to be a winner. One of the numbers always... I think maybe it's your number that's turned up this time, Tony. Blackie... Didn't I tell you to lay off this joint and me? Yes, but I don't hear very well. Come on into your office, Tony. A friend of yours is waiting there for you. A fellow named George. He used to work for Burton. Get the game going, Davy. Right. How'd you find George Blackley? I'm the curious type, Tony. I got a little tip on him and coaxed him to open up to me. He sang? Like a nightingale. And your name was his top note, Tony. Come on in. This is your office, remember? I know, I know. All right. Now, start talking, George. Just say what you told me. Tony, I didn't mean to do this to you, only... Blackie said he'd go to work on me, so I only told him that you paid me to... Oh! You talk too much. And you don't talk enough. Come on, Tony. You've got a long speech to make. Think so? No, so. I took your gun out of the desk drawer, so don't talk too tough to me, kid. You can't back it up this time. What is it I'm supposed to talk about? The reason Burton was killed. And don't give me any of that suicide talk. Burton was murdered by his wife, I think. Very cutely, too. Very brilliantly planned. She's a smart gal, that Mrs. Burton. And if I prove this a murder, she'll find a way of throwing the heat on you. Tony, you I... Shut up. You talk too much. So, Blackie, you think it was murder? And you think if the police find out it was murder... Mrs. Burton is going to try and put the finger on me. That's right. What are you going to do about it? I don't know. I know that dame a long time. Ten, fifteen years. She gets what she wants most of the time. So do I. And I got what I wanted from you just now, Tony. A little information. You know, I think I'm going to stay here for a while. You know, Mrs. Burton, we could do a lot of things. We could sit here and look at each other, or we could get down to business. 
What do you mean by uh, getting down to business, Inspector Faraday? You could tell me what you know about your husband's death. That's what I mean. And don't think I'm still working on the idea that he was a suicide. Because I'm not. You uh, think it was murder? How would you guess? I think a lot of things more, too. Only I'm a police officer and i got to have proof. But you're going to admit that you knew you'd come into a barrel of cash with your husband dead. That you didn't want him to know you were gambling. And that you owed that, that Tony guy a lot of money. I admit all of that. Well, now we're getting somewhere. Now I want you to admit that when your husband tried to knock himself off ten years ago, you were in the house and could have picked up the suicide note he wrote at that time. I was in the house, and I could have picked up the note. Good. So you had a motive, you had a perfect alibi, and you killed him. Admit it, Mrs. Burton. You killed your husband. <laughs> oh, no, Inspector Faraday. I said I could have picked up the note, but I didn't. That's what you say. I say you did. I say you're in this thing with both feet. And I say that you're going to admit that you killed him right now. Oh, well... Oh, no, you don't. Stay right where you are. I'll answer that. Hello? Is that you, Faraday? Oh, it's you, Blackie. Who do I sound like? Let's not go into a routine, Faraday. I've got news for you. You've got news for me. Look, Blackie, I'm here with Mrs. Burton. She admits everything about her husband's murder, except that she did it. Now, get off this phone so I can wind up this case. Oh, so you have Mrs. Burton all ready to confess. Five more minutes and it's a cinch. She knows she can't fool me. Well, she's the only one who can't. Faraday, I want you to listen to a friend of mine named Tony. I'm in his office right now, and he's got something to say to you. Blanky, what are you trying to pull? Quiet, Faraday. Come on, Tony. Start talking. You've got an audience on the other end of this phone that's just dying to hear what you've got to say. Now, go on, talk. All right, all right. Faraday, this is Tony. I killed Burton. What did you say? I knew him for a long time. First time he tried to kill himself ten years ago, I was in the house. I caught the suicide note. Then I got this big idea a couple of weeks ago when his wife couldn't get up the dough she owed me. You killed him? But you couldn't have. I haven't all figured out that it was Mrs. Burton here. How could I be that wrong? How, Faraday? Well, that's easy. You've had so darn much practice. <laughs> You know, of course, don't you, Blackie, that I still don't know how you got Tony to confess. Oh, it was nothing really, Mary. When he found I was talking to Faraday on the phone, he just had to speak to him. But he couldn't make up anything on the spur of the moment, so he told the truth. But he killed Mr. Burton. Well, Charlie Kingston certainly is happy about it, but what put you on Tony's trail? One little remark he made. He said he'd known the Burtons for a long time, which means that he knew them when Burton first tried to kill himself. Now, I never knew that before, and that got me thinking. Wonderful little that to be able to do a thing like that. (laughs) Mary, don't you want to hear about this? Oh, it's this now. It was that a second ago. How things do change. (laughs) Yes, don't they? Well, Mary, here's the way I reasoned it. If Tony was around ten years ago, maybe it was he who grabbed the original suicide note and thought up this murder plan. Maybe don't count, though. No, no, you're right. I needed proof, so I sat down with Tony... Very nice and comfortably. And I said, uh, Tony, my boy, won't you please tell me that you killed Mr. Burton? And then he sipped his tea, looked up and said, well, yes, old man. Matter of fact, I did. Rather unsporting of me, what? (laughs) Something like that. Anyhow, I asked him if he'd mind terribly telling that to Faraday. And he said, uh, of course not, old fellow. Uh, Love to do it and all that sort of thing, and he did. You mean to say you just asked him to do it and he did it? That's all, Mary. I believe it, Blackie, completely. Only I'd better put another piece of adhesive tape on your knuckles. They're bleeding a little again.
Box 13, with the star of Paramount Pictures, Alan Ladd, as Dan Holliday. Two, Box 13, care of the star times. Carl! Carl! What are you doing? Nothing. I ain't doing nothing. It's just a book, Holiday. Somebody sent a book to Box 13. Why? And now, Box 13, starring Alan Ladd as Dan Holiday. Susie. Susie, come here a minute, will you? You call me Mr. Holiday? How did you guess? I heard you. All right. Now that we've cleared that up, how about this book? That one? This one. It came in the mail for box 13. You sure? Sure, I'm sure, Mr. Holiday. The wrapping paper's right in the wastebasket there. I- I'll get it and show you. Here. Address printed. Block letters. Shaky hand. Susie, did any letter tell me this? Mm, just a book. Ex Libris. Robert and Chase. All right, Susie, we've got a problem. Somebody sends me a book from the library of Robert and Chase. Why? Maybe it's a bestseller. Yeah, and its day it was. Still is. The poems of Sir Walter Scott. Do you like poetry, Mr. Holliday? Love it, Susie. Just love it. Listen. If thou wouldst view fair Melrose aright, go visit it by the pale moonlight. The gay beams of lightsome day gild the deflout the ruins gray. Pretty, huh? What's it mean, Mr. Holliday? Susie, you're asking the jackpot question. The book's broken to fall open at this poem. Why? We're in a rut. Uh, there's one way to get out of it. If anyone calls for me, I'll be in the morgue. Star time. Sure, sure. Robert N. Chase. We've got plenty about him, Holiday. Well, let me have it. You ought to remember him. Vaguely, I do. All right, Mac, what have we got? Headlines. Lots of them. Headlines, huh? What's he been doing? Same thing he's been doing for the past ten years. He's in a rut, too. Six foot deep. Dead? Here. You read all about it, Dan. Socialites dead in tragic blaze. Oh, sure, I remember now. But ten... Ten years ago, I was cutting my reporter's teeth on a police beat. <laughs> yeah, that's right. A cop wouldn't get a juicy story like this to cover. Son near death. Daughter at school escapes tragedy. Last night, fire swept the Robert N. Chase mansion... Blaze unnoticed until too late, spread rapidly. Injured son not expected to live. He did, though. Uh Uh-huh, I see. Mildred Chase, 18, was attending a college function when the flames took the lives of her parents and swept rapidly through the palatial country estate, Fair Melrose. They were... Fair Melrose? Yeah, that was the name of the estate. Fair Melrose. Mac, the uh, Chase girl, got anything on her? What paper didn't have? What do you mean? You know, too much dough, spoiled kid, wrong company. She ran smack into the gossip stuff almost every week. Oh, where she is now? Well, she dropped back after the fire. It kind of cooled her off. Mm, you've been a good girl ever since, is that it? Well, that's it. I tell you what, Dan, drop upstairs to see Moore in society. She can give you the dope. All right. Thanks, man. Say, you must come and visit my morgue sometime. Uh, I like this one. I only read about characters. I don't have to bump into them. Ah, but mine move around, Mac, and sometimes too fast. Oui, monsieur. Ah, free French or engaged. You wish to see someone, monsieur? Yes, Miss Chase. Miss Mildred Chase. You have an appointment? Is that an offer or a business question? <laughs> monsieur, if you will tell me. Well, what... what is it? There is someone here, mademoiselle. I don't wish to be disturbed. I'm sorry, monsieur. 
But Mademoiselle Shea, she is not home. Oh, I see. Then you've got a talking piano. Oh, please, monsieur. I cannot let you in. You are Mademoiselle. Yes, I did. But if you will go in and tell Mademoiselle that Sir Walter Scott is waiting to see her, I'm sure she'll listen. What do you say? Where? Vive la France. <laughs> All right. You wait here. But I cannot promise. Yes? What is it? What do you want? Oh, I'm sorry, Miss Chase. I, I have to see you. Well, I don't know you. I've never seen you before. Well, lots of people haven't. But my name's Dan Holliday. The name means nothing to me. It means everything to my mother. <laughs> what do you want? I'm sorry, Miss Chase, bursting in like this. But I've come to see you about Fair Melrose. Who... who are you? Oh, I told you. Dan Holliday. Occupation. Fiction writer. And are you writing now, Mr. Holliday? Maybe. Oh, uh, is this yours? Mine? That book? Here, take it. Where did you get this? You don't know. No. Where did you get it? But you do recognize it. Yes. It... It was part of my father's collection. I asked you, how did you get it? Through the mail. It was addressed to Box 13, care of the Star Times. Or doesn't that mean anything? No. Nothing at all. You should read the classified ads, Miss Chase. Box 13. Adventure wanted. We'll go anywhere. Do anything. But you thank see, I... you for bringing the book back to me, Mr. Holliday. You don't have any idea why the book was sent to me? Oh, I, I don't know any more about it than you do. Maybe you don't. <laughs> That's right. Colette will show you Was there anything now. suspicious about the fire that destroyed Fair Melrose? Mr. Holliday, I don't know what you have in mind, but that was a cruel thing to say. A hateful thing. You're not proud of it, are you? I'm nothing one way or the other, Miss Chase. But that book was sent to me. It was broken to fall open at the poems about Fair Melrose. I'd just like to know why. I know nothing about it. All I know is that Tyre took my mother and father. It's very sad, Miss Chase. And my poor brother was left a hopeless invalid, completely paralyzed, unable to speak, to move. Where is your brother now? At Fair Melrose. The place he always loved. But I thought it was destroyed by fire ten years ago. Yes. But one wing remains standing. Your brother is there alone? Yes. That's where he would want to be. And I arranged for someone to care for him. Oh, I see. Now, Mr. Holliday, I'd like to forget all this. Well, I'm sorry to have bothered you, Miss Chase. I was merely curious about that book. I know nothing about it. All I want to do is to forget. To forget. you want this hour of the night? I'm looking for Fair Melrose. Eh? What for? Will you tell me how I can get there? I'm lost. Stay lost, then. Just a minute, please. Get your foot out of the door. Get you. Don't be afraid. I'm not going to harm you. I just want to know the way to Fair Melrose. Eh, what for? I've, I've got business there. You're lying. Nobody's got no business there. Nobody. All right, I'm nobody. Is your house on the ground? Well, it should be. Been here for 30 years. Oh, Nice little cottage you've got here. What you want to go up there for? To look at it. Huh? What for? Huh. Nice waltz we're having. Young fella, I asked you a question, and you ain't answered. All right. I want to find out about the fire. Well, ain't nothing nobody needs to find out about it. It was a visitation of the Lord. It was a judgment on the sin that was going on. Heaven rained fire that night and wiped out the last of Babylon. I'm not sure I got all that. Oh, the wages of sin is death. Now you know. Wait a minute. Were you here that night? Me and Carl. Carl? And my husband. He was down here and seen the fire eating up like the vengeance of the angels. We seen it, young fella. It was a judgment. A judgment for the years of sin. <laughs> we didn't have to do no more caretaking after that night. Providence took care for us. You and Carl uh, caretakers, is that it? That's right. <laughs> only, only one wing to take care of now. Only one wing and him. 
Oh, the brother. Yes, yes, him that can't move or talk or hear. And that's where they brung him. And that's where he stayed. Now, you get. I, I talked enough. I wonder. How do I get up there? You're still going up, huh? More than ever now. Which way? Uh, straight up the canyon. Turn left. It's top of the hill. Thanks. Well, maybe you should have picked a lighter night. Yes, one with a moon. <laughs> maybe she's right, Holiday. This is definitely no night for a picnic. Now, who said it's going to be a picnic? <laughs> Feathers on. Hello. Oh. Light a match, Holiday. Don't be so stupid. Is anyone here? Chase? Oh, Mr. Chase. Holy mackerel. Who are you? Answer me. You are listening to Box 13, starring Alan Ladd as Dan Holliday. Back to Box 13, starring Alan Ladd as Dan Holliday. Oh. Nice barrett's on voice you got there, Holliday. Clean. Inspector Clean. Where am I? Hospital. What for? For your head. There's a little dent in it about two inches deep. Oh, I remember. Where is he? He? Who? The body. Oh, the body. What body? Wait a minute. Wait a minute. How did you get in? Who found me? Who told you all about this? The old girl, caretaker's wife. She found you. Oh. Clay, I saw a body in Fair Melrose. Holiday, I don't know what merry go round you're on, but keep up this way and you'll get the brass ring through your nose. How do I get out of this place? Walk out. Thanks. What are you going to do now? Why? I want to know where to pick up the body. Keep in touch, Clint. What have you got in mind? A date. A date with a beautiful young lady. Slightly hysterical and more than a little mysterious. But interesting. What do you want here again, Mr. Holliday? More to the point, what do you want? Will you please leave? Every time I come here, I get invited to leave. I don't know what you're doing, Mr. Holliday, but it's none of your business. You ought to... I went to Fair Melrose last night. What for? I wanted to see it. And your brother. You mustn't see him. Why not? What do you do, Miss Chase? Please leave him alone. All right. Did you go to Melrose last night? No. I haven't been there for ten years. You weren't there the night of the fire either, were you? No, no, I wasn't. All right, all right. I'll take the word for it. Now, mind if I ask you one more question? If you'll go, I'll answer it. It's a deal. What are you afraid of? Nothing. That's your answer? Yes. I, I'd almost forgotten that horrible night until you came here. For ten years, I've lived away from it, keeping it away from me. Now you've brought it all back. Don't you have any pity? Lots of it, Miss Chase. For a lot of people. Particularly you. <laughs> What do you want to see him for? I got to. I want to talk with him. He can't talk. He can't hear. He's in the only wing left by the fire. Well, that he is. You 
Do you still want to go up to see him? Yes, I do. Oh, the chases. Devil's brood, all of them. Devil's brood. The young and with her temper, screaming at her mother and father. And him that's upstairs now, always fighting with his sister. The fire was a visitation and a judgment of providence. Ah, uh, ah. Uh, there he is. Oh, no. Well, that's him. You stay here. Mr. Chase. Mr. Chase. Can't hear you. Can't hear you. Can't, can't. Shut up. Mr. Chase, I'm... I'm Dan Holliday. Box 13. Box 13, do you understand? Not in his head. That's all he can do. Mr. Chase, you wanted to see me. You sent me that book. You had Carl send it to me. Is that right? Nod your head if that's right. Good. Now, why? He can hear. You can hear me a little, can't you, Mr. Chase? Good. Why did you send me that book? Why did you want me to come here? He wants me to look around, Bertha. At what? At what? Ain't nothing in here. Ain't nothing. Look, Mr. Chase. I'll walk around the room. I'll watch you. When you want me to stop... Nod your head. Understand? Good. Now watch me. Here? This trophy case. Is this it? What about it? What do you want me to see in... This? Good. Bertha, come here. I ain't coming in. I said come here, come on. Take a good look at this trophy case, Bertha. A good look. Uh, I don't see nothing. There's a plaque missing from its place. There's heavy dust around behind all those cups and trophies, but there's a clean spot here where a plaque stood. No dust, Bertha. No dust. Someone took a plaque from here not more than a few days ago. Did you? I ain't touched nothing. Never touched nothing. Mr. Chase. That plaque. Whose was it? Yours? No. Your father's? Mother's? Mildred's. It was hers. But someone took it. Mr. Chase, try to understand. Try to answer. Please, you've got to... He can't... Mr. He... Chase, try hard. Try hard to hear me Let again. Let him alone. He can't do no more. Stay with... Stay with him, Bertha. Don't leave him for a minute, do you hear? Hello there. Hello, Holiday. Inspector, I'm in a hurry. No, it looks like it. But you can spare a poor cop a couple of minutes to explain something, can't you? What? That body. We found it. In a ravine about a mile down the road. All right, you found the body. Now I'm in a hurry. I gotta go. Not so fast, Holiday. There are a couple of questions I'd like to ask you. Later, Kling, later. You know where to reach me? Holiday. Come back, Holiday. I say come back here. I'd be care of box 13. <laughs> saw my brother, Mr. Holliday? Yes, I saw him. Oh, please keep playing. I don't know why I let you in here. I do. Can't you leave me alone? Please, the piano. I like to hear it. What did you find out? So you don't know why anyone would have taken that plaque from the trophy case? No! No! Your brother managed to tell me it was yours. He was... Where was it? In the lower right-hand corner of the trophy case. Lower right-hand corner? Lower? That mean anything? Well, it... It was a plaque I won for dramatics at Merrifield Academy. I don't get it. What value does it have? It isn't worth anything except... Except what? The plaque was presented to me at a dinner at Merrifield. So, go on. The dinner was the night of the fire at Melrose... And the plaque would prove you were at Maryfield the night of the fire. Yes. But somebody... Somebody wants people to think you were at Fair Melrose. 
were you? No, no, no. How many times do I have to say that? That's enough. Who hates you, Miss Chase? My brother. Your brother? They all hated me. My mother, my father, my brother. Sometimes I think I hated them. Watching me, picking my friends, cutting me off from the friends I'd take. I couldn't stand it. I see. All right, Miss Chase. We'll forget it for now. But can I come back this evening? Why? I said before I wanted to help you. That still goes. Miss Chase, it still goes. Please sit down, Mr. Holliday. Thanks, Miss Chase. Do, uh, do you have anything to tell me? A few things, yes. But first, uh, is there anything you want to tell me? Tell you? Why, no. You sure? Positive. What could I tell you? A story. I don't know what you mean. All right, I'll explain. Must you play the piano? No, but I'd like to. Miss Chase, let me tell you a story. What about? Well, I don't know whether it's exact or not. You see, I have to guess a lot. Fill in details myself. But this story is about a girl, an 18-year-old girl. That is, she was 18 ten years ago. And what's that got to do with me? Oh, you might be the girl, Miss Chase. Wild with a temper. Bad temper. She had a lot of fights with her parents. Mostly about the friends she had. The way she ran around. What are you trying to say? That one night this girl set fire to her home in a fit of temper. After a fight with her parents. Maybe she didn't mean to do what she did. But the fire destroyed her home almost completely. It meant the death of her parents and it made her brother a You're making this up. You're guessing. I said I'd have to guess. I was at Maryfield the night of the fire. For a while. I checked. Found out you left early enough to get to Melrose. And you brought a plaque with you. The one you'd won for dramatics. Well, I I brought it to Melrose later. The, the next day or the next. I, I, I don't remember. No, that's no good, Miss Chase. It's too hard to believe that anyone would walk into a ruined home and put a plaque in a trophy case. I say you took it to Melrose. Then had the fight with your mother and father. You're lying. I don't think so. I took it there after the fire. And why is it missing? Want me to look around your apartment for it, Miss Chase? Or send for the police to look for it? No. Why not, if you haven't got it? Why are you afraid to let me look for it? So I am right. Now let's get on with the story. For ten years you held the secret. There's nothing to connect you with the fire at Melrose except that plaque. For years that fire's on your mind. Day after day you have to live with the secret, wondering if there's anything that will connect you with that night. But there's nothing. There's nothing. Then you remember that plaque. It will prove that you were at Melrose. Because the date engraved on it is the same as the date of the fire. No, I tell you it's not true. So there's only one thing to do. Get that plaque out of Melrose. But you didn't count on one thing. Your brother. Day after day he saw that trophy case. Day after day it was the same. Never changing. Like the four walls he had to stare at. But suddenly it's different. There's... There's something missing. He racks his brains and he remembers. He remembers the plaque that was there. When he was able to read, he must have read about the fire. How you escaped the tragedy by being at school that night. How lucky everyone said you were. He read how you were presented with a plaque for dramatics. And his tortured mind puts two and two together. And he arrives at the conclusion that you were at Melrose. Home. The night of the fire. Well, Miss Chase, did you like that story? There's nothing you can prove. Maybe not. But how about Carl's murder? You killed him. Because you thought Carl was me last night. No. What what are you doing? Calling the police. It's for them now. I think they'll prove you killed Carl. They're good at that sort of thing, Miss Chase. Very good. No, no, please. What do you want? Money? I'll give you money. Anything. Only don't call them. Why not? Please, please. Hello, Inspector. They hated me, all of them. I hated them. And you, I hate you. Look out. Oh, no. (laughs) Hello, Kling. 
Holiday. <laughs> Come to the Sunview Apartments now. I, uh, I just rang down the curtain on a ten-year dramatic act. <laughs> Thrilling, Mr. Holliday. Yeah, sure, Susie. About as thrilling as throwing dirt in a guy's face. Oh. Well, here's some more mail for Box 13. Later, Susie, later. But here's something maybe you ought to look into. What? If you subscribe to this book club, you get a free set of Sir Walter Scott's poems. Oh, fine, fine. Good night, Susie. Next week, same time... Alan Ladd stars as Dan Holliday in Box 13. Alan Ladd appears through the courtesy of Paramount Pictures and may currently be seen in Wild Harvest. Box 13 is directed by Russell Hughes. Original music is composed and conducted by Rudy Schrager. With an original story by Frank Hart Towson. The part of Susie is played by Sylvia Picker. This is a Mayfair production. Box 13, with the star of Paramount Pictures, Alan Ladd as Dan Holliday. Box 13, Care of Star Times. I know my life is in danger. I think you can help me. I'm desperate and don't dare go to the police. Please, if you want to help, call at the Tivoli Theater box office for the ticket left there. Our handbill will tell you more. Our handbill will tell you more. Yeah, that's the way it started. The note from the girl, Maria. The theater ticket. And then, murder. And now, back to Box 13. It was Thursday when I received the letter from Maria through Box 13. Some of the letters I get are from cranks. Some from people who are just curious about a reporter-turned-fiction writer who advertises Adventure Wanted will go any place, do anything. But with this one, it was just like Susie said. Gee, Mr. Holliday... It doesn't look like one of those crank letters or somebody that's just curious, thinks you're crazy or something. How can you tell, Susie? Oh, I don't know. Maybe it's just female ignition. There's a dictionary over there, Susie. Look up ignition. Don't you know what it means, Mr. Holliday? Hmm. It's, it's when a woman... Skip it, Susie. Skip it. Oh, okay. I'm supposed to pick up a ticket for tonight's show at the Tivoli. Take a look at this handbell. Torino. The great Torino. Like his look, Susie? Well, hmm, I don't know. That's what I thought. Okay, Susie, close up shop for the day. You're going to follow it up, huh? That's the general idea, yes. I want to see what Maria has on her mind and why she's afraid. This was it. I pick up the ticket at the Tivoli. A big poster told me this was a charity affair with the axe doing a two-night stand. Tickets? Ten dollars a throw. I circled around the lobby, looked at the axe advertised, singers, dancers, a dog act, and then... There it was. A big life-size cut out of the great Torino. Complete with mustache and goatee. Nice-looking guy. Maybe too smooth-looking. But it was what he was doing that made me take a better look. He held a rifle to his shoulder and was aiming it across the lobby at another cutout. And this one? This one was a girl. Pretty? Mm Mm-hmm. Big eyes. Maybe a little scared looking. And looking straight across at the great Torino. And right into the barrel of that rifle pointed at her head. Well, if this was Maria, she had a right to have something on her mind. Anybody who stands up and lets a rifle be fired at her is earning a living the hard way. I was thinking about it when the call buzzes in my ear. 
and ditched in with the crowd during the overture and took my seat. First for all right on the aisle, easy to get at. And Usherette shoved a program in my hands. The great Torino was scheduled next to closing. Okay, that meant I'd have to sit through the rest of the acts. I did. It was skipping. But the great Torino was something different. He had two assistants, a girl and a good-looking young guy. It was a magic act with class, and Torino was clever with his hands. He did a trunk effect that was really great. And the girl who helped was the same girl whose cutout was in the lobby. Torino tied her with a rope, slipped the big canvas bag over her, and locked her in a trunk. He fired a shot, and bang. The girl came running down the aisle. And the trunk she was put in? Well, empty. All done in a split second, too. The great Torino took his bow. But I noticed something. When he reached out to take the girl's hand and bow with her, she managed to be busy at something else. Okay. She didn't like him. He gave her a funny look and walked to a rack and picked up a nice nickel-plated rifle. I sat up in my seat because the girl threw a quick look at me and a tiny nod. No one would have noticed it, but may I? I looked back at Torino, who was speaking. Ladies and gentlemen, I wish to call your attention to my final effect. A most dangerous one. So dangerous that few illusionists will attempt it. The history of the magician's art has recorded several deaths during the feat. My assistant will go into the audience now and select a committee of volunteers who will please come upon the stage. Maria, if you please. So the girl was Maria. I guess my cue was to be selected as one of the committee. I raised my hand. She picked me. I went on the stage with four others from the audience. Stood there while Torino went to the footlights and spoke again. Uh, please, the music. No music. Please, no music. Thank you. Now, ladies and gentlemen, I shall give the gentlemen of the committee this rifle. It may be examined thoroughly. Also, three bullets, which they may mark later for identification. Gentlemen, the rifle. And here... The bullets. Uh, please mark the lead in any way you choose, unmistakably. We took the rifle and the bullets. And the great Torino, well, he had the audience sitting on the edges of their seats. No one knew exactly what was going to happen, and Torino wasn't going to tell them until the right time came. And one of the other men on the committee spoke to me. Uh, bullets look okay to you? Yeah, as good as any bullets can look. 22s, huh? Yeah. How do we mark them? Initials? Yeah, yeah, good idea. The three of us cut our initials in the lead. That all right with you, mister? Good. How about the rest of you? Suits me. I've got a knife here. Yeah, let me see the rifle. Yeah, sure, here. Rifle look okay, no gimmicks? Well, not that I can see. All right, my, my initials are cut in the bullet. Uh, you want to cut yours? Oh, yes. I cut my initials, D.H., in one of the bullets. So we had three bullets with initials cut in the lead. No chance for a substitution. Then Torino took the rifle and the bullets. Thank you, gentlemen. Grazie tanto. You are satisfied? Uh, sure, I am. Yes. Good. Now, if you will all watch closely, I shall load the bullets in the rifle. So, and uh, what is your name, sir? Holiday. Good. Then, uh, Mr. Holiday, if you will please hold the loaded rifle until I am ready for it. Oh, sure, sure. In this way... There can be no trickery. Ladies and gentlemen, you saw me load the market bullets, yes? So, and you have the loaded rifle. Good. Now, ladies and gentlemen, may I introduce once more Maria. Maria? The young lady is as courageous as she is lovely. Maria, you will take your place, please. Mr. Holiday, would you care to shoot at Maria? Oh, no. No, thank you. <laughs> then that leaves it up to me. No. The rifle, please. Oh, here you are. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, I shall ask for complete quiet. Thank you. Maria, you are ready? Yes. I'm ready. The great Torino walked to the other side of the stage. 
He raised the rifle to his shoulder, pointed it at Maria. She was pale as death. Her arms were tense, tight. Perspiration stood out on her forehead. And on mine. And on everyone in the audience. Then... So help me, this is what happened. A bullet appeared between Maria's teeth. She let it drop to a plate she held in her hands, then... And two more bullets popped between her teeth and fell to the plate. No one in the audience moved. No applause, just that tense feeling. Torino walked over, took the plate. His hands never touched the bullets. I'll swear to it. He walked to me and the other three men with me and... Gentlemen... You will please to identify the bullets, yes? This one. Initials P.G. Uh, that's, that's me. Yeah, yeah, that's mine, all right. Thank you. And uh, this one, K.R. Mine. Thank you. And the third, D.H. That's mine. <laughs> Maria managed to get a note into my hands. When I read it later, it asked me to meet her at a little coffee shop about three blocks from the theater. All right, that's what I did. We sat in the booth, back out of the way, and Maria talked. Thank you for coming, Mr. Holliday. That's all right, Maria. I, I saw a great act, but what am I doing in it? You can help me. Please help me. How? Doing what? You can keep Torino from killing me. More coffee? Didn't you hear me? Oh, sure. Sure, but I don't get it. You saw the act. The rifle trick. Yeah, it was great. Then you must see how easy it would be for Torino to kill me while doing it. Slow up a little, Maria. Let's start from the beginning. All right. You saw the other assistant. You mean the good-looking kid? That's Billy. I love him and he loves me. Then what's your problem? Torino. He hates Billy. And he hates me for loving Billy. Jealous? Insanely. Well, quit then. I will. After tomorrow night's performance. But why wait if you're afraid? I won't be afraid if you're there. What could I do? Be on the committee again. If I think any, anything's wrong, I'll signal you. And then? Do anything. Drop the rifle, but don't give it back to Torino. Now, wait a minute. How could he kill you? He'd claim it was an accident. Three magicians or their assistants have been killed accidentally doing the trick. The mechanism of the gun goes wrong. Giving away secrets, Maria? I have to. There's a mechanism in the breech of the gun. It drops the real bullets down into Torino's hand when he closes the breech. Oh, then I get an unloaded gun. There are blanks in it. The mechanism substitutes them for the real bullets. Hmm. That's good. And he slips the real bullets to you? Yes, when he takes my hand to introduce me. And you slip them into your mouth? While the audience is watching Torino and the rifle. I see. Maria? Yes? Why don't you go to the police? Torino would know. He'd know. How? He watches me. Then aren't you afraid he's watching now? No, not tonight. I slipped away. I don't think I could manage it again. Don't you see, Mr. Holliday? You're my only chance. I saw you had in the paper, Box 13. You mean the police would ask him questions and he'd lay low until he got the chance to... Yes. Will you be there tomorrow night, Mr. Holliday? Look, I have a ticket for you here. The same seat. Please. Please. All right, Maria. I'll be there. Thank you. Thank you. And we'll try to keep the trick from being trumped by the great Torino. And now, back to Box 13 with Alan Ladd as Dan Holliday. Well, it sounded like a great assignment. And from the way the setup looked from where I sat, it gave the great Torino a perfect chance to kill Maria. I checked on Maria's story about the accidental deaths during the trick, and Jonesy at the Star Times verified it. A smart cookie like Torino could fake an accident, and who's going to pin the black ribbon on him? Nobody. Okay, it's up to you, Holiday, to figure it out. <laughs> Next night, I sat in the same seat and watched Torino go through his act. 
The trunk thing, still great, knocked the audience off their seats. Me too. Couldn't figure it. But the big stuff was still to come, the rifle trick. I went on the stage, kept my eyes on Maria. I marked one of the bullets again. Oddly enough, Torino didn't seem to recognize me. That was all right with me. And now, ladies and Torino went through his same spiel, word for word. I kept my eyes on Maria. But it was as though she'd never seen me before in her life. She looked... Well, it sounds silly, but she looked hypnotized. Then I heard Torino saying to me, Mr. Holliday, would you care to shoot at Maria? No, thank you. <laughs> Torino looked at me hard. My name and my face together might have tipped him. There was a funny look in his eyes. I stared at Maria. Not a sign from her. Maria, you are ready? Yes, I'm ready. I relaxed a little. She hadn't given me a sign. Everything was all right, and then... Maria! Maria! She dropped. Maria dropped. And right between her eyes was a little round hole. Look, Holiday. Is that straight, that story? Sure it is, Kling. She was afraid she'd be killed. But you say she didn't give you a high sign. No, she didn't even look at me. But she told you if there was anything wrong, she'd tip you. Yes, but she didn't tip me. Okay. Sergeant. Yes, sir, Lieutenant. Get Torino over here. Yes, sir. All right, you. Lieutenant Kling wants you. Got any ideas, Holiday? Uh, I'm dry. Bone dry, Kling. And what about this guy, Billy, she told you about? I told you. Okay. You, it was accident. Accident. Something she was go wrong. Please. Quiet. Now look. It's accident. Yeah. She's wrong accident that happened. You so I am an artist. You tell me I do something wrong. No, no, no. It is wrong. Holy accident. mackerel. Sergeant. Yes, sir. Put it's this guy in his dressing room. Europe, and keep him there until he blows off that head of steam. Wrong, you know. But now, watch his door. Please listen to me. And the window from outside. Yes, sir. Come, Come on, Hootie. Come on. Get it's funny. I'm hysterical. I don't think. What's funny? The girl, Maria. I don't think she knew me tonight. She looked right at me. Didn't give me a tumble. Yeah? So? She told me she'd signal me if anything was wrong. I... I don't get it. But it looks as though she... She what? She deliberately let Torino fire a gun she knew was set to kill her. Okay. Well, that makes great sense. I know. No sense at all. And besides that, they're... Get away with it. You're going to let him tell you it's all an accident. Well, don't believe him. He killed her. That's Billy. Cling. What? Let me ask him a couple of things. Now, look, Holiday, I'm in charge of this case. You're in on a rain check. Okay, but I'm in, huh? Yeah, for the one reason that Maria told you about it, and he I... He killed her. It wasn't an accident. Oh, I'd better go help the sergeant. Any objections if I mosey along with you? None. Just keep your mouth closed, that's all. Sure. So I listen while Cling asks questions. But there was something knocking at the back of my head. Asking to be let in. Something I'd seen, heard, remembered. I didn't know. But what bothered me was Maria not giving me a signal. When she said she'd know if Torino was up to something. Billy answered Kling's questions. No, no. All I know is that Torino bluffed Maria. He said he'd kill her if he saw me hanging around her. Who loads the rifle with blanks? Maria. Maria. Does she do it tonight? She always does it. Maria loaded the rifle herself. She did. Before the performance. So I got an idea. I left the stage where the investigation was going on. And I walked backstage toward the dressing rooms. I wanted to talk to Torino. But there was a large blue cop sitting at the door. He looked at me and... Well, Holiday. Oh, hi, Murph. I feel lousy. No, oh, that's too bad. Uh, say, I uh, think I could talk to Torino? No. Oh, now, look, you can watch and listen, tell Kling everything that goes on. <laughs> playing detective holiday? Nope, uh, playing a hunch. What about? Why not listen and find out, and if you learn anything, tell Kling. And you might learn something good. You mean something that might break the case? Yeah, might. Well, well uh... What's the matter, Murph? Can't you use a couple of strikes? Hi, sure. Oh, okay. But I'm standing right here, understand? Sure. Right. Hey, you, get up and... Oh, brother. Look. Eh. Ain't nobody gonna ask him no questions. No, I 
Don't think he's in any shape to answer. A promotion, you say? A promotion? I'll be lucky if I ain't fouled up for good. This guy's been knifed right under my nose. That's right. Somebody stabbed Torino. He was as dead as Maria. And nobody saw anybody go in or out of the dressing room. There was one window. It was open. But the officer outside swore he had his eye on it. Hmm. Nobody in or out. And nobody in the room but Torino. And the knife was in his back, so suicide was out. Clegg and his boys turned the room upside down. Torino's apparatus and trunks were shoved around. Still nobody. And it turned out nobody had a motive for killing Torino except Billy. Me? Me? Are you crazy? I never left the stage. I was talking to you. I was answering questions. I can't be in two places at once, can I? He was so right. Kling was tearing his hair. Then more questions. The rest of the acts were strangers to Torino. Knew nothing about him. I was thinking about it when something hit me. Something Billy had said. While Kling was still firing questions, I got to a phone. Hello? Oh, hiya, Kenny. Still running that private eye? Swell. Do something for me, will you? Hmm? Okay. Put a man on the Tivoli Theater right now. And get him to tail a guy named Billy. Huh? Here's what he looks like. About 5'9", stocky, light complexion, wearing gray suit. Good morning, Mr. Holliday. Hiya, Susie. Any messages? Uh-huh. The detective agency called. And what? What's the message? Oh, oh I wrote it down shorthand. Here. Uh, trail Billy in shoe. No, wait a minute. Oh, terrible ink. Uh... Oh, I got it. To insurance company this morning. He placed claim for double indemnity policy for his wife, Maria Baker. Hey, hey, wait a minute, Mr. Holliday. That's not all. That's enough. I'll see you later, Susie. Torino, Torino. Step on him, Jonesy. Oh, you want hard facts? It takes time to find them. Even in the morgue of the Star Times. Okay, Jonesy, okay. But hurry up, will you? Ah, uh, here we are. Torino, born Italy. Skip that. How long has he been in the country? Uh, six months. Noted magician in Italy and Europe before the war. Only six months. Now, Jonesy, if you were a magician, you wanted assistance. How would you get them? Advertising a billboard. Magazine for show folks. What else? Hmm. Where can I see the last six months' copies of the billboard? Right, I got a local office in town. All the copies you want. Hey, where are you going? Thanks, Jonesy. Be seeing you. I've got a lot of reading to do. <laughs> Six months' copies of the billboard. I looked through every one of them, and when my eyes were falling out of my head, I saw it. An advertisement. The one I wanted. And the one that tied up was something Billy said. And something I saw during Torino's act. I tried to get Kling on the phone, but no dice. He was out. I left word for him to meet me at the Tivoli, and I went there myself. There's nobody there but the watchman. The five dollar bill got me in. Oh, there's no place gloomier than backstage in an empty theater. I headed for Torino's dressing room because I had a good idea how someone got in and stabbed Torino, then disappeared. I opened the door, stepped inside. It was dark. The shade on the window must have been down. I was fumbling for the light switch when somebody pulled the shade on me. Oh! Got any idea who slugged your holiday? Yeah, Kling, I have. All right. Who? Billy, maybe. No dice. He didn't come near this place. We had a tail on him. Did you know about the insurance? Sure. But he couldn't have killed his wife because she loaded the blanks into the gun. Uh-huh. And the medical examiner's report on the bullet that killed her? What about that? Twenty-two. No initials on it. No, none. So it looks like this Maria deliberately planned her own death. It wasn't an accident. If it had been, the bullet in her head would have been marked. 
Kling, put out a dragnet. Uh, for who? For the one who slugged me. I'll cut it, Holiday. If you know anything, spill it before I lose my temper. Who do you want to pick up? Here's a description. Young woman, about 26. 26. Brown hair. Brown hair. Lovely blue eyes. Blue eyes. About five foot two. Five foot two. Worked as a magician's assistant. Hey, what are you giving me? That's Maria. Uh Uh-huh, Maria. She's dead, you dope. You mean her twin sister's dead, Kling. Twin sister? What are you talking about? The chunk of fake Torino work could have only been done with twins. Billy tipped me off on it. Billy? Sure, when he said nobody could be in two places at once. And Torino advertised in the billboard for twins. You are dreaming this. Put out a dragnet for Maria. Who stabbed Torino? Maria. She got her twin sister to take her place in the rifle trick last night. That's why I didn't get a signal from her. The sister didn't know me from Adam. Now look, Holiday, we searched this dressing room. There was nobody in it when Torino was stabbed. Maria was here. Look. False back in this cabinet. Good old magician's gimmick. She was here all the while. Maria and Billy took out an insurance policy on her and planned to make me the patsy. Because I'd testify that she told me Torino hated her, that she was scared. Torino was knifed to keep him from spilling about the twins. Billy was in the clear on that. Because he had an alibi when Torino was killed. Okay, Clint? I, uh... Okay. We'll put out a dragnet. Yeah, Susie. They got her. Gee, sounds just like a story. Uh Uh-huh. Only nobody will believe it. Look, I've got a knot on my forehead to prove it. (laughs) Does that make you hysterical? No, but I was just thinking. Don't be reckless, Susie. What about? I was just thinking, with that bump, you'll have to wear off-the-face hats for a while. (laughs) You're a great help. Good night, Susie. Next week, same time, Alan Ladd stars as Dan Holliday in Box 13. Alan Ladd appears through the courtesy of Paramount Pictures and may currently be seen in Wild Harvest. Box 13 is directed by Richard Sandville with original story by Russell Hughes and original music composed and conducted by Rudy Schrager. The part of Susie is played by Sylvia Picker. This is a Mayfair production. Box 13, with the star of Paramount Pictures, Alan Ladd as Dan Holliday. Thirteen, care of Star Times. They said my son was killed in a drunken brawl. I know he wasn't. He was a good boy. He was murdered. Why, I don't know. If you come to 733 Winsham Avenue... If you'll come to 733 Winship Avenue any time and listen to my story, I'll be grateful to you forever, Mrs. Catherine Daly. And that was the letter to Box 13. Just a few lines. But, brother, what those few lines led to. And now, back to Box 13. I get some funny letters through Box 13. Some don't mean a thing. Others are from people who answer all the ads. But this one from Mrs. Catherine Daly. It had a real ring to it. I get so I can spot the letters from cranks and curiosity hunters. They're full of big phrases. It's the simple ones that count, like Susie said. Well, it's short, Mr. Holliday. Uh-huh. What are you going to do about it? Well, what would you do, Susie? Mm, well... You know, Susie... I don't know how you managed to get right to the point of things so quickly. Oh, it's easy. Hmm. Okay, you talked me into it. 
I don't know what I'd do without you. I try to make myself indisposable. The word Susie is indispensable. What's the difference? None, I guess. All right, Susie, I'm on my way to 733 Winship Avenue. Mrs. Catherine Bailey was a little woman, maybe about 50, 60. It was difficult to tell because gray hair was pushing hard against the brown. It was her eyes that got me. Maybe not too long ago, they'd been able to smile. But now they were dead, lifeless. Something had been taken away from, from well inside. She led the way to a little living room, furnished cheaply but neatly. She sat down, pointed to a chair for me, and then... Are you serious about that advertisement, Mr. Holliday? Well, yes, I am, Mrs. Daly. I, I haven't any money. That is not much. I can afford something, if it's not a whole lot. Oh, now, look, Mrs. Daly, I'm a writer, and sometimes Fox 13 leads me to a good plot. You see, I don't take money because I get paid very well for the stories I get. You see, I used to be a newspaper reporter. And... Newspaper reporter? Anything wrong with that, Miss Daly? Arthur, my son, he was a reporter. Oh? What paper? The Evening Record. Your, your letter said that your son was killed. He was. They said he was drunk, that he got into a fight in a cheap saloon. Arthur was never drunk in his life. And he hated fighting. That his picture on the table? Yes. In uniform. That's the Distinguished Service Cross, isn't it? Yes. Okay, Mrs. Daly, start from the beginning. Tell me how you want me to help. I'm sure Arthur was murdered. Murder's a tough word, Mrs. Daly. Tough to say and tough to prove. But for a week before he was killed, he kept telling me that we could get out of this house soon... That he was going to make a name as a reporter. But he didn't tell you why? No. Then, the night he was killed, he got a phone call. From whom? I don't know. He hurried out and... The next time I saw him was when they asked me to come down and identify him. That's as much as you can tell me. It's every word. Mrs. Daly, this may sound brutal, but... But your son's dead now. Why would you rather have it said he was murdered? I want to show everyone he couldn't have died in that cheap, shoddy way. Well, that was that. I believed her. Maybe it was the way she talked. Maybe it was her eyes. I don't know. Anyway, I left her house with nothing to go on but what she had told me. And that was little enough. Just that he was on to something would make a name for him as a reporter. Anyway, I went to see what Lieutenant Kling knew about it. About what, Harvey? About the kid that got killed in the saloon brawl. Well, that's what the records show. They show anything else? No, no, they don't. You know, I... I like you. Thanks. You can have the next dance. I'm serious. Okay, so you're serious. What about? You're not satisfied with the daily case either. What makes you think I'm not? Just the way you talk. You don't believe it's right. I believe what the witnesses in that dive said. The Daly kid got drunk. Somebody said something to the girl he was with. Nothing bad, but Daly got mad and started swinging. And? Then he ended up in the red. You didn't arrest anybody? Look, we get a dozen calls a night from down at the hill places like that. Somebody's always getting pushed around, roughed up, killed. Some of the things don't even hit the newspapers. Run of the mill stuff. Sure, sure. But look, Kling... What kind of guys get killed in places like that? Bums, winos, characters who hang out in those joints. But not a kid like Daly. And you're an honest cop. What was that crack for? For a compliment. The Daly thing bothers you because you know as well as I do that something's wrong about it. Then you tell me. I'll try. Later. Now, look, Holiday. I'm not on the case anymore. Homicide's got enough to do without running down a fight in a saloon. But, uh... But what? But... Uh, I don't like it. You're right. I knew I liked you. Okay, I'll marry you in the morning. The place you want is 183 River Street. Oh, nice neighborhood. You're right. The cops go in quartets down there. Thanks. See you later. And for the love of Mike, don't end up on the meat wagon like Daly did. Kling was right. It wasn't a neighborhood to raise kids or anything else. 
And the place I wanted was called the Riverview. Fancy name. Oh, a great place. I stepped over a couple of boarders spending the night on the doorstep and walked inside. There was a tinny piano played by a guy mechanically banging out a tune that its own composer wouldn't have recognized. The bar was set at the back facing the door. I went over to it. The bartender took a long, good look at me. I must have looked strange. I was wearing a necktie and a shirt. He walked over. Yeah? What's with, bud? How are you? Awful. You? Practically dead. Okay. Now that we know each other, what's on your mind? What do you got to drink? Arsenic. Want some? Straight. Water on the side. <laughs> Funny man, ain't you? Sure. Look, what do you want? A drink, maybe? No, you don't. That suit you got on cost maybe 150 The tie, five bucks. Any cook he comes in here dressed like you don't want a drink. All right. You win. Swell. Slumming, huh? No. Looking. For what? Last week there was a fight in here. A kid got killed. Arthur Daly. I didn't see nothing. My back was turned. Did you ever see the girl who was with Daly? I told you, I didn't see nothing. Oh. All through the fight, you just kept your back turned. Yeah, I hate fights. Can't stand the sight of blood. That what you told the police? Same thing. Who are the witnesses? Look, when a fight starts in here, there ain't no witnesses. Everybody's blind. That makes it easy. You a friend of this Daily character? Yeah. Yeah, a good friend. Uh-huh. I still don't know nothing. Now blow, mister. Out. Get it out. He knew something all right, but he was clammed up tight. I left and walked up the street. I was close to the spot where I'd parked my car when I heard something. I stopped. Somebody was tailing me, following me from the saloon. Okay, somebody didn't like me nosing around. I walked past my car. Just ahead of me was an alley, and pulling out of the alley was a truck. I walked a little faster. I got to the alley, skirted around back of the truck so my trailer would lose me for a couple of seconds. Then I stepped inside a doorway. It was dark. The truck pulled away. I waited. Then I heard the steps. He didn't know where I'd gone. But if he was going to pick me up again, he'd have to pass the doorway where I waited for him. Oh, Come here. Oh, oh, let go. Let go. You hurt me. Shut up. Oh, please, mister. I ain't no crook. I wasn't going to put this thing on you. It's the idea of telling me. I heard you talking to Barkey back there. I wanted to talk to you, honest. That's all. You should have caught up with me before this. Oh, gee, mister, I didn't want anybody to see me, honest. All right, talk. Oh. You want to know something, huh? Come on, come on. What do you want to say? Well, honest, I might get in trouble. Look, I, I got to know I'll get something out of this, eh? So what you've got, and we'll see how much it's worth. Uh, maybe a fiver? Maybe. Go on, talk. Look, I could get in bad trouble. You are right now. Oh, all right. Oh, all right, make it a fiver. What do you know about Arthur Daly? I saw the fight. I saw the whole thing. Did you tell the police? Me? I don't get nothing to do with the cops. All right, tell me. This guy that was bumped, he didn't start the fight. Who did? A pug. Ex-pug named Billy Connor. The Daly guy didn't have nothing to do with starting it. It was a frame. Was Daly drunk? No, no, he had one drink. The girl slipped something in it. I saw her. She was a good looker, so I was watching her. Do you know her? Me? <laughs> me know a thing like that? Nah. All right, well, here's your five. Now, keep your mouth shut, understand? Oh, sure, sure. Uh, uh, maybe you'd like to know something else, huh? What? Well, mister, it ought to be worth something. I... All right, here. Oh, thanks. Uh, you ain't been out of the joint down the street more than a couple of seconds when a barkeep goes to the phone. So? I heard him tell somebody that you was nosing around. Mister, something tells me that you're in bad trouble right now. <laughs> A 
And now, back to Box 13 with Alan Ladd as Dan Holliday. Well, I had a few facts now. First, Daly knew something that might have got him killed. Second, the girl who was with him put something in his drink so he'd look drunk. Third, an ex-pug named Billy Connor started the fight. Why? The answer to that would put me on first base. So I asked around a little and found out that Billy Connor, a third-rate fighter down at the heels, suddenly came into money and right after the fight in the saloon. I found him in a second-rate nightclub. You the guy that wants to see me? If you're Billy Connor, I'm the guy. Who are you? Knowing that won't make any prettier. Hey, you're a smart boy, huh? Maybe. But you're not acting smart. What? What are you talking about? You're making too much splash, Connor. The, uh, the boss doesn't like it. People might start asking questions about the money. The money you got for killing Daly. Me? Oh, no. I just started the fight. Then I ducked. Somebody else banged his head for him, not me. Ah, uh, that's the way it was, huh? Sure, you know. Who are you, anyway? Forget it, Connor. Wait a minute, fella. Why'd you say that's the way it was? Didn't you know? Sure. Sure I know. You, you ain't from them. From home. You dirty sneak. You, you a copper? Maybe. Think it over, Connor. Hard. I left him standing there with his mouth open. I thought I'd found out what I wanted to know. But Kling told me... Doesn't mean a thing. You can't prove anything, Holiday. What if I get proof? How? You've got the name and address of the girl Daly was with the night he was killed. And you want him, is that it? You could get hurt. Meaning you won't give me the girl's name? Meaning that if I do, you're on your own. I'll take that chance. Do I get a name and address? Eileen Simmons, 4674 Roberts Drive. And I hope you get more out of her than we did. I hope so, too. I didn't like walking up a blind alley with murder at my back and maybe in front of me. I got to the girls' home, a boarding house in a shabby section, and took a look at the mailboxes downstairs. While I was walking up to her flat, something tingled the back of my neck. Something that screamed a warning. I got to her flat... She didn't answer. Then I smelled it. Gas. I stooped down and one look at the crack between the door and the sill was enough. It was stuffed with newspapers. There was only one thing to do. Eileen Simmons wasn't going to talk to anybody. The room was heavy with gas. The window I broke let in some air. Scared faces stared in at the door. I smashed open, then I yelled at him. You call the police. Ask for Lieutenant Kling. Go on, hurry. I took a quick look around before I left. In one closet was a fur coat. And from what I knew about fur, this one took money to buy. It had her initials embroidered in the lining. But it didn't fit with the cheap flat. Well, I thought it was about time to make a trip to the evening record where Daly worked as a reporter. Some of the boys knew me, so it was easy to get to talk to Daly's editor. I don't know, Holiday. All I know is that Daly promised me a big story. Something he was working on. Now, look, Charlie. Any idea what it was? None. The kid was close mouthed. Oh, but you must have some idea. Didn't he give you any hint? Just that it was big and would blow off the top of the building when we printed it. How long did he work for you? Oh, about six months. No more. What big assignments did you give him? None. Routine stuff. He didn't have enough experience. Just out of journalism college when the war broke. Mm-hmm. Went through it. Then served at the war trials in Germany. And in the six months with you, there wasn't anything important enough to get him killed, huh? No, no, there wasn't. Oh, let's see. We sent him on a routine assignment to San Carlito and... San Carlito? What's that? Just one of those little islands in the West Indies. The paper's doing a series on Latin American neighbors and we... Anything there that might have been the big story? You mean what he was talking about? Yeah, that's it. How long after he got back did he begin to talk about the something big? Hey, just about the same day he walked in here. Where's his desk? Just outside this office. Oh. All his stuff in there? Well, most of it. We were going to send it to his mother, but, well, you know how things are. It was too soon. We figured we'd wait. And... Come on, let's take a look. Oh. 
Just the usual stuff. What are these photographs? Never saw them before. Full face, profiles of men. You know them? Not from Adam. Oh, uh, Charlie, can I have these? Well, I don't know, Holiday. One ex-newspaper man to an editor. Come on, let me have them. Okay. I didn't see you take them. Uh, thanks. Now, mind if I go through the rest of your stuff? No, help yourself. I'll be at my desk. Right. I went through Daly's papers. There was one little notebook with an entry in it that read, Got to be careful. Never be alone. They won't dare make a try for me unless I'm alone. I've got proof on film. Photos of the men I recognized. Okay. So Daly's notebook gave me another lead. But where to? Well, maybe Daly's mother would know. I looked at my watch, but it was after midnight. So I figured it was too late to see her, and I decided to wait until morning. I wish I'd have gone right then and there. The next morning, I went to see Daly's mother, and I found her in the middle of an excited bunch of neighbors. When I got her alone, she told me what was up. There were burglars. They ransacked Arthur's room. Well, let's take a look. But there's nothing missing. Well, let's look anyway. They went through all the drawers. You didn't hear them? No, I slept right through it. Uh-huh. Mrs. Daly, what could they have wanted? I, I don't know. There's nothing of value here. Look, uh, when Arthur came back from San Carlito, did he uh, bring anything with him? Why, I don't think so. A camera, maybe? His own, but he took that with him when he went. Now, now think hard, Mrs. Daly. Did he take any film out of that camera when he got back? I think he did. Yes, I remember. He hurried out with some film to have it developed. Where is it? I don't know. Did he get it back from the shop where he took it? I don't think so. I think he'd have shown them to me if he had. And the roll of film he took out of his camera is still in the shop. It must be. Mrs. Daly, we've got to find a check for that film. The kind you get when you leave film to be developed. Come on, let's look. We looked and looked and looked. No check. It began to seem as though whoever ransacked the room found the check, and if he had, well, the thing was over. After half an hour, we gave up. But there was still one more thing to find out. Mrs. Daly, would you mind taking a look at these photographs? Do you know any of these men? Why, well, I'm not sure. They look familiar, but... <gasps> His scrapbook, the one he brought back from the war. There are pictures like those in the scrapbook. Well, show it to me, will you? It's in my room, right next door. Here it is. Here they are, the pictures. But I don't see. I think I do. But I'm afraid to believe it. Look, Mrs. Daly, whatever you do, stay with your neighbors. Don't be alone for a minute. I left the house, and the idea I had was buzzing around inside my head. If I was right, then the whole thing was fantastic. But the pieces began to fit together. Maybe I was thinking too hard. I didn't see the big black car that turned down the corner. I didn't see it until I was almost staring between its headlights. I jumped back and up, and the fenders of the car took the skin off my legs, and the car roared away. That big black buggy had my name for a license plate. It would have looked just like an accident. But it told me something. That whoever was doing the dirty work didn't have the check for the film. Because the proof of what Daly knew was on that film. And if Mr. Accident Maker had it, he wouldn't have risked another accident. I called Kling, got him on the phone. Check every Photoshop in the city for a roll of film mailed just before Daly was killed. How do you know he mailed it? Because he wouldn't have been fool enough to take it to a Photoshop. He knew they were tailing him, waiting to grab that film. So he mailed it, with a note that he'd called for. it. Okay, I'll pick up the film, if I can find it. Oh, no, Kling, don't pick it up, please. But you just said you were... Kling, tell me where it is, call my office, and I'll pick it up. Look, you're asking for a cray breath in your door. If those babies are what you say, they'll cut your little pieces. You want them, don't you? Sure, but I don't... The only way to get them is to make them come after that film. And they won't call it headquarters for it, Kling. But they will try to get it from me. I waited. 
Finally, Kling gave me the word. I picked up the film and printed the little finishing shop. Kling had given orders that I was to have it. I got in my car, looked in the rear vision mirror, and saw a big black sedan pull in behind me. This was it. I couldn't spot Kling in the squad car he said would be handy. Maybe something held it up. I didn't know. I got to my apartment. The sedan pulled up behind me and parked. I walked up to my apartment, went over to the window, and saw a man get out of the sedan. He walked slowly and disappeared into my apartment building. I sat down with a film and prints burning a hole in my pocket. Then... Who is it? The holiday. I'd like to talk to you. I took one more look out of the window. The street was empty except for the sedan. No squad car, no clink. Brother, if ever I wanted to see that big guy, it was now. I walked to the door. Mr. Holliday? Uh-huh. Who are you? My name is, uh, we'd say, Stefan. Okay, you're Mr. Stefan. So what? I shall be brief. You have a roll of film and some prints. I am a, a camera enthusiast. I shall pay you a good price for the film. Hmm. How much? <laughs> you're going to be reasonable. That's fine. Shall we say 10000 That's big money for a strip of celluloid. I am very enthusiastic about photography. You know, uh, I like pictures myself. Especially pictures of some nice little Nazis who got out of Germany with a lot of money. Oh? You guessed, huh? Yeah, but Daly wasn't guessing when he recognized them in San Carlito. He wasn't guessing that San Carlito is a little island with lots of deserted coastline. Easy to land on. <laughs> yes, very handy. And they paid well to escape the trials in Nuremberg. You just talked yourself out of $10,000. Oh, now that's very funny. You would have killed me anyway, as you killed Daly to keep him from spreading the story. <laughs> You're so right. Now, Mr. Holiday. Oh, that gun didn't look nice. He had it right at my head. I sat still. Stefan came slowly toward me. The black hole in the barrel of his gun looked like the business end of a cannon. Then... Get the floor, Holiday! Come! Cling, at this particular minute, you're the most beautiful thing in the world. Well, at that moment, Susie, Lieutenant Kling landed and took over. Sorry I drew it so close, Holiday, but I had to let Stefan talk a while. Yeah. But by the way, where was that squad car? <laughs> well, there wasn't any. The squad car would have scared Stefan away. I had to make it look safe. The boys and I were right next door. Had been for an hour. Now, he tells me. <laughs> well, it's up to the Federals now. We're clean on this end. Gee, I sure... Oh, Mr. Holliday, you might have been killed. Oh, it's okay now, Susie. It's all over. But but you might have been killed. And I like this job so much. <laughs> What'd I say? Very funny, Kling. Nothing, Susie, nothing. <laughs> Good night. Next week, same time, Alan Ladd stars as Dan Holliday in Box 13. <laughs> Alan Ladd appears through the courtesy of Paramount Pictures and may currently be seen in Wild Harvest. Box 13 is directed by Richard Sandville with original story by Russell Hughes and original music composed and conducted by Rudy Schrager. The part of Susie is played by Sylvia Picker and Lieutenant Kling by Edmund MacDonald. This is a Mayfair production. <laughs> Box 13, with the star of Paramount Pictures, Alan Ladd, as Dan Holliday. Hey, look, boss. Look at this. An ad in the Star Times out of town newspaper. Yeah. 
Box 13, Adventure Wanted. We'll go any place, do anything. <laughs> well, this looks like the right answer, Tony. Yeah. I think I'll write a letter to Box 13. The letter was postmarked from a city in Nevada. It came airmail, special delivery to Box 13 and me. It sounded like a great chance to grab a change of scenery and maybe a little fun. <laughs> fun? Brother, how wrong could I be? And now, back to Box 13. And Dan Holliday's newest adventure, Triple Cross. Just run an advertisement in the Star Times, one that reads, Adventure Wanted will go any place, do anything, and see what you get. A lot of them can be interesting, like the one I listened to Susie read. The one that came airmail, special delivery from Nevada. And closed is enough money to buy you a plane ticket to Los Maros. You want adventure? All right. Come to Los Maros. Register at the Paradise Hotel. Wait in your room until you're contacted. And that's all it says, Susie? That's all, Mr. Holliday. There's not even a signature, even. It's what's called an ominous letter. What kind of a letter, Susie? Ominous. Uh, you know, that means it's not signed by anybody. The word you mean is anonymous. Oh. But you could be right after all. Well, Susie, lock up the office and look for me when you see me with a new plot and a nice tan. <laughs> A new plot and a nice tan, I said. Hmm. I got the plot, but the tan almost turned into a beautiful white pallor, the kind that goes well with lilies. The plane trip was smooth. The trip from airport to the Paradise Hotel was nice and easy. And the hotel itself? Well, it was the only one I could remember that looked like the ads in the travel folders. Oddly enough, there was a room reserved for me in my name. Okay, somebody checked and found out who I was. I explored the suite, thinking maybe I'd get a lead on what this was all about. But it was just a fancy set of rooms, all newly decorated. I sat down, and then about a half hour later... Come in. Message for you, Mr. Holliday. Oh, thanks. Here you are. Oh, thank you. Uh, just a minute. Who gave this to you? A man, sir. What kind of a man? What do you look like? Oh, just a man, sir. Oh, I see. A head, two eyes, nose, two ears, and a mouth. That is description? Yes, sir. That's exactly what he looked like. Good. But I'll know him when I see him. <laughs> oh, did he ask for an answer? Uh, no, sir. He just told me to bring the envelope to you. Will that be all, sir? Huh? Oh, yes, yes. Thanks. Well, two $100 bills and a message that said, buy a red carnation in a flower shop and put it in your lapel. After dinner, go to the casino roulette table, buy $200 in chips and put them on number 18. If you win, walk away, wait 10 minutes and put half the winnings on number 22. After you play, wait in the casino. So with a carnation in my lapel, I bought $200 in chips and walked to the roulette table. There weren't many players. It was a little too early for the big crowd. So I waited a minute and watched the play. Took a look at the croupier, but I might as well have been in Timbuktu. He didn't give me a tumble. Okay, the best way to see what was going to happen was to see. I shoved the whole 200 on number 18. One or two of the other players placed bets, and then... No more bets, please. No more bets. Number 18, red and even. Your chip, sir. The croupier shoved the winnings across to me. I, I watched his face. If he had any expression, it was on the soles of his shoes. Well, maybe $7,000 win was coming around here. I left the table, sat down, and did a little problem in arithmetic, which figured out to be $126,000. That's what I'd have if number 22 came up. And brother had looked from where I sat as though it would. The ten minutes went by and I walked back to the table. Waited until the wheel stopped. 
Number 16, red and even. Place your bets, please, ladies and gentlemen. Slowly, I shove 3,500 in chips to number 22. This time, the others around the wheel did look. 3,500 to 35 to 1. Then the wheel began to slow up. No more bets, ladies and gentlemen. No more bets, please. That croupier was as cold as the floor of a mausoleum. Somebody dropped a pin and I heard it hit the floor. A white ball clicked, clicked, clicked its way until... Number 22, the black and even. Your chip, sir. I cashed in the chips and there I sat, with $126,000 tucked away in my inside coat pocket. Somebody had that wheel fixed for a killing... I began to wish I was back in my office. I didn't like it. A crooked play. Why? Who? I made up my mind to go to the owner of the place and wash my hands of the whole thing when... Oh, there you are, Mr. Holliday. I've been looking for you. I have a message for you. Yeah? Well, it's verbal this time, Mr. Holliday. Oh, what is it? You're to go into the bar and wait. Is that all? Yes, sir. The same man gave you this message? Yes, sir. Did he still have a head, two eyes, a nose, and two ears? <laughs> yes, sir. Hmm. All right, here you are, kid. Oh, thank you. You know, if this keeps up much longer, you'll be able to retire my tips alone. Thank you, Mr. Holliday. Will that be all? Oh, uh, how much did this character give you to forget what he looked like? Well, nothing, sir. Nothing at all. And a smart boy like you should have taken a good look the second time. Huh? Especially since I asked about him after the first message. Oh, he was big, dark, a little mustache, and... He had a little white scar over his right eye. Would you take $5 for that information? That's all right, Mr. Holliday. No charge for that service. Mm. Good boy. I'll see you later. Yes, sir, Mr. Holliday. I walked toward the bar, wondering what was coming next. I didn't like that fortune burning the cloth in my pocket. The bar was like my suite. Fancy, rich, and expensive. I climbed up on one of the stools, and the bartender came over. And... Yes, sir, may I serve you, sir? Got any ginger ale? Yes, sir. What with, sir? Oh, by itself. Just a glass of ginger ale. Just a ginger ale? Oh. You see, I like the bubbles. <laughs> Champagne has bubbles, too. Ah, uh, but they're still around the next day. Just a ginger ale. Yes, sir. Of course. Excuse me. Is someone sitting here? Hmm? Oh, no, no. I don't think so. Thank you. Here you are, sir. Ginger ale. Thanks. The usual, please. Okay. Yes, sir. May I? You got a light? Of course. Thank you. Don't mention it. Here you are. Thanks. Why do you drink ginger ale? I like it. Why do you drink martinis? Same reason, I guess. <laughs> it's a brilliant conversation, isn't it? Well, I've heard better. You're not very friendly, are you? A uh, boy scout is always friendly. And does good turns. So I hear do you want to be helped across the street? <laughs> All right. I'll shut up. I took a good look at her. There was something scared looking about her. She was nervous. Well, so was I because the minutes were passing and I still had that money. And I wanted to get rid of it. But I wondered about the girl, whether she had any part in this. I watched her out of the corner of my eye. She picked up her bag, reached for a lipstick, and then... Oh, oh clumsy. So it's true what they say about women's handbags. You get the stuff on the bar, I'll pick up the kitchen sink off the floor. I'm I'm so sorry. Did the powder spill on you? No, it's all right. Yeah. Here you are. The, the mirror didn't break, did it? Nope. You're still good for seven years more. Thanks. Thanks ever so much. I told you I was a good boy, Scott. You have a nice smile. Want a toothpaste commercial to go with it? No, don't be nasty. I'm sorry. I guess I'm just as nervous as you are. I... Let's talk about something else. She chattered away. And it really is. I listened with half an ear. Once in a while, through in a yes or a no. And the clouds began to gather. The mirror at the back of the bar went back and forth. The people got bigger and shrank to midgets. Somebody drove a plane through my head. It buzzed around and made a bad landing on my brain. And... Oh. There you are. Feeling better now? 
Oh. You'll be all right. Just lie there and take it easy. Sure, I... Hey. Hey, I'm in my room. Of course. We brought you here. We? I'm the hotel physician, Mr. Holliday. Oh, what happened? And just a fainting spell. Nothing serious. Fainting spell? What are you talking about? They're fainting spells. Your wife told me you get them. My what told you what? No, no, no. Just lie back. Whose wife said what? Your wife. She's got to have a prescription told. Now, listen, Doc, I... Hand me my coat, will you? Uh, it's better if you lie here. It's better if you hand me my coat. Give it to me. Oh, very well. There you are. What's the matter? Was my wife in this room? Of course. She came up with me. Uh-huh. Doc, what would you do with $126,000? What? A hundred... <laughs> That's an odd question. What would you do with it? I don't know. Because I haven't got it anymore. Now, back to Triple Cross. Another Box 13 adventure with Alan Ladd as Dan Holliday. So there I was, 126000 in the red. If it was meant to be taken from me, then somebody was working it the hard way. Sure, the girl slipped something in my ginger ale when I picked up the stuff that fell out of her handbag. She took the money. All right, I want to know more of it. I was going to head for the nearest exit, running, not walking, when... Come in. You Holiday? Yeah. Do I know you? Call me Tony. I'm the guy who wrote the box 13. Oh. All right, goodbye, Tony. Sit down. What's the idea? Funny, I was going to ask you that. We're playing 20 questions. Let's skip the other 18, Tony. I got a big one left. Where's the dough? You tell me. Give it to me. Well, I didn't like him. I didn't like the gun he was playing with either. And I didn't like the little white scar over his right eye or the little black mustache. I was willing right then and there to cross him off my friendship list. But I told him what happened. It's a great story. Ain't heard one like it since I read fairy tales. Well, I don't care if you believe it or not. You got no regard for your health, Holiday. Look, Tony, I'm leaving this place You'll now. You'll be too heavy to carry out if you take one more step. That's better. Now, what kind of a frame is this? Once more, you tell me. I played a crooked wheel downstairs. I don't like that. You got adventure, didn't you? I don't want anything that's crooked. Now, look who's talking. Who was the girl? Believe it or not, I never saw her before. What did she look like? I don't know. Yeah. Ever try to take a good look at anyone in that bar downstairs? It's too dark to even see a lighted match. You're smart, Holiday. The game with the girl is neat. Awful neat. You get the dough, play doggo. Act like the girl slipped your mickey. Later she turns up with the dough and you two split. Now talk sense, Tony. I didn't know why I came to Los Morris in the first place. I didn't know how I was going to get that money. How would I have time to dream up that frame with a girl? Yeah. Yeah, I never thought of that. Okay, Halliday, maybe you're telling it straight. Okay. Now can I go? No, no. You get that money back first, then you can go. I don't think I'll stay for the ninth inning, Tony. The game has not started yet, but you get that dough. How? That's your problem, but get it. Look, Tony, I'm backing out of this. You know I can go to the sheriff. Oh, no, you won't. Because there'll be a tail on you from now on up. One move like you're going to the law. Understand? Okay. Okay, I get it. And there'll be somebody in this room to see that you don't use the phone. You'll be covered like a pool table, Holiday. What if I can't find the girl? What if I can't get the money back? The boss will be awful mad. And? There are worse places than Los Moros to spend a lifetime. If you live. Ever have one of those dreams in which you try to run away from something and can't? Well, this one, with my eyes wide open, was really something. Tony and I went downstairs. Two other characters detached themselves from chairs when Tony nodded at them. Brother, I was covered. It looked hopeless. With Tony not far behind, I asked the doctor if he'd ever seen the girl who said she was my wife. Well, there was no dice there. Then I remembered something. I told Tony I was going back into the bar. Bar? What for? Now, look, Tony. Let me do it my way. I'm the one that's on the spot, so let me play it the way I want. Okay. I'll watch, and don't try for a quick steal, because the boys outside know who to look for. Go ahead. Thanks. 
What would I do without you, Tony? I don't know. Because you're not going to be without me. Remember, I'll be watching. Yes, sir. May I serve you? Well, feeling better, sir? Well, much. Where were you when, uh, when I fainted? At the other end of the bar, sir. Oh, yeah. yeah, yeah. So you were. It wasn't our ginger ale, sir. <laughs> No, it wasn't. I just have a loose head, and when I shake it, it comes off. <laughs> May I serve you something, sir? Yes. An answer to a question. Well, what's that, sir? Who is the girl who sat down next to me? I don't know, sir. Oh, yes, you do. I beg your pardon, sir. Quit the sir business. You knew that girl. Why do you say that? Because when she sat down, she asked for the usual, and you brought her a martini. And you said okay when she asked you. What does that prove? The martini proves you knew who she was. The okay means she wasn't a guest of the hotel. No bartender as polite as you are would say okay to a lady guest. That makes sense? Why do you want to know who she is? Does that make any difference? Yeah, because I wouldn't want to see her in trouble. I'll try to keep her out of it. I won't tell you. Ever see a picture of Alexander Hamilton? Hmm? What are you talking about? Well, here's one. And funny enough, it's on a $10 bill. In fact, his picture's on all five of these bills. Yeah. Her name's Kathy Lee. I think she has a place at the Las Palmas courts. Thanks. Put these pictures in frames, will you? I found the Las Palmas courts. And, of course, Tony behind me all the way. The name list in front said Kathy Lee lived in number eight. I looked around before I turned in the walk. Yeah, Tony was closer to me than varnish on a tabletop. I found number eight and stopped for a second. Looked for a phone line, but there wasn't any. I knocked at the door. No answer. I tried it again. Then I heard Tony whisper from the shadows. Try the door, Holiday. I did. It was unlocked. Tony coached from the sidelines. Go on in. I went in and closed the door behind me. It was dark. I decided to risk a call. Kathy? Kathy? Kathy Lee? She wasn't there. I fumbled my way to what felt like a dresser and a lamp. Turned it on and... What I saw made me turn that light off fast. What's the matter? She's dead. What are you talking about? You heard me. She's dead. You sure? Well, go in and look. You go back in and look for that dope. Go on. Now look, Tony, I don't know any more of this. That poor kid's dead. Murdered. I want you to call the sheriff. No, you don't. I said you go back in there and look for that dope. You look for it. Leave my fingerprints all over the place. Now you go back in there and hunt. Don't be a sap. Whoever killed her took the money. Don't you see that? Maybe. But we'll play this angle all the way. Now stop talking and get in there. I hated to turn on that light, but I had to. I didn't look at her. I looked through the room. Then I found something. A plane ticket to San Francisco. Leaving that night. And a boat ticket for South America. They were in an envelope, but the information on the envelope said there would be two reservations. I put it back where I found it because I didn't want Tony to find it on me. And there was something else. A locket with a man's picture in it. I took it off his chain and shoved it in my pocket, and I left. Well, Helen Lee? It's not there. I told you it wouldn't be. Stand still. Back toward me. <laughs> a frisk, Tony? You don't trust me, do you? Shut up. No, I told you. Who killed her? Find that out, and you'll know where the money went. Come on. <laughs> What's so funny? Helen Lee... Right now, I wouldn't want to be in your shoes. Tony was right. People at the casino saw me win that money, and somebody must have seen the girl with me. Then I got the mickey. The money was taken. The girl killed. Who did it? Mm Mm-hmm. Me, Dan Holliday. Because the girl clipped me for the money. Well, this was a beautiful frame. Any art gallery in the country would be proud to hang it. 
But I knew something Tony didn't. The plane and boat tickets. Two seats. One for Kathy and her murder. Somebody who left her tickets in her bungalow to make it look as though she was in on the $100,000 job by herself. Sure. Now her killer was taking a plane. In one hour. And a boat to South America. I could have told Tony, but I wanted to wrap it up myself. Besides, I wanted to get the whole thing to the law. On the way back to the hotel, I figured something out for myself. But I'd have to see the boss of the casino, and I thought I knew how to do that without Tony tagging along. The casino was full. I stopped. Tony stopped. What's the idea? What now? I've got to think. Up to your room. No. You want to get hurt? Sure, go ahead. Shoot me. Now. In front of all these people. You know, Tony, you, you wouldn't get ten feet. Smart, ain't you? Okay, what's now? I'm going to play blackjack. What? Want to watch? I sat at the blackjack table. I had as much interest in the game as Aunt Mamie back in Iowa, who never saw a deck of cards in her life. But I had an idea. And I played it for all it was worth. Look, uh, dealer. Yes? I didn't like that last deal. I beg your pardon, sir. I said I didn't like that last deal. Well, we'll return your money, sir. Never mind the money. Who runs this place? Hey, what is that guy trying to pull on over there with him? It worked. In three seconds, I was surrounded by muscle boys, and Tony was hotter than a New York sidewalk in August. But he couldn't touch me. A minute later, I sat across the table from the owner of the casino. I told him what happened, and when I finished, he stared at me and said, You're trying to tell me somebody let you win that money on my wheel? I am? You're crazy. The wheel's straight. But you know I won that money. Sure I do. Any time a hundred grand slides across, I know it. But... Uh... But this time it was fixed. The croupier was tipped I was to win. Wait a minute. Marty, send Frankie up here right away. Huh? Oh. Okay, forget it. What's the matter? Frankie, the croupier. Went off duty just after you won. It's not back yet. And he won't come back. Now, somebody planned to take the house this evening for that money. Somebody who couldn't risk getting it himself. So I'm the logical one. No one knows me here. I'd look like just another player. Later, Mr. Fixit plans to pick up the money and beat it. Who? Someone besides yourself who could get to the croupier and bribe him to fix the wheel. Got any ideas? Yeah. One. My partner. Well, that's it, then. It's got to be. But the girl, she doped you. That was a hard way to get the money from you. Listen, I've got an idea, but I'm a little cramped for room. Some of your partner's boys, particularly a guy named Tony, are glued to me. Get some of your boys to shake them off, and I'll bring that money back to you. How do you know where it is? I know. Okay, Holiday. Remember, fast play, and I'll find you if it takes the rest of my life. It's a deal. Now, uh, how about the boys? They won't follow you. Marty, a guy will leave my office. Some mugs are telling him. Stop him. Got it? Good. All right, Holiday, you're on first base. Go ahead. I was sure he'd be at the airport, and I wasn't wrong. He was sitting in the shadows on the outside. I walked over to him, and he looked up. Holiday. I thought you would be... Thought I'd be framed, huh, Frankie? What are you doing here? I've got a message from Kathy Lee. Kathy? She's... You ought to know you killed her. Ah, <laughs> you're crazy. Not only that, you've got $126,000 in that bag. $126,000 that looked like easy money. Shut up. That money doesn't mean a thing. It's the girl who counts, the girl who was willing to do what you told her to do. The girl you triple-crossed and killed after you double-crossed your boss who bribed you to fix the wheel. It's too bad you're so smart, Holiday. It's too bad you led with that right, Frankie. Somebody call the police to uh, come and clean this up. was... Oh, please hurry, Mr. Holliday. I, I want to hear the ending. All right, Susie, all right. What do you want to know? Well, how did you guess that Kathy Lee was the croupier's girl? Well, her locket had his picture in it. Oh, 
Oh, they should have given you the money as a reward. No, thanks, Susie. They can have it. But there's one thing I don't understand, Mr. Holliday. And that's? You didn't get a tan at all. You're just as pale as when you left. Oh, $126,000. A murder and a tan, too, she wants. Good night, Susie. Next week, same time, Alan Ladd stars as Dan Holliday in Box 13. Alan Ladd appears through the courtesy of Paramount Pictures. Watch for him in his new picture, Saigon. Box 13 is directed by Richard Sandville with original story by Russell Hughes and original music composed and conducted by Rudy Schrager. The part of Susie is played by Sylvia Pickard. Production supervision is by Vern Carstensen. This is a Mayfair production. Broadway's My Beat, from Times Square to Columbus Circle, the gaudiest, the most violent, the lonesomest mile in the world. Broadway's My Beat, with Larry Thor as Detective Danny Clover. Broadway, it's the end of the dream and the start of a wilderness, the dumping ground of odds and ends and beginnings and leftovers. It's a place to stop and take the kind of pleasure you need. It's a street of neon names that beckons to your loneliness. And you better hurry, kid, because it's a street where your name is written on water. It's Broadway, my beat. At 11.45 on a January night, you look down on Broadway and watch it generate its own heat. Like I was doing from my office window at headquarters. Then a call came from a shy caller. He preferred to be anonymous, he said. And he gave an address and he said I'd better come there. He said not to knock, to walk right in. And his disguised voice couldn't disguise the urgency in it. So I went. The address was on 116th Street, just off Amsterdam, a section where the posters are in Spanish and furtive laughter mixes lightly with a dimly heard tango rhythm. The street was dark and there were no house numbers. I beg your pardon, where's number 212? Hmm. Thanks. Open up, it's the police. Okay, I'm coming in. sat there, like death almost. Only her fingers moved, whipping the strings of a guitar. Black hair spread over her shoulders, and frozen eyes, and a single tear. And near her, sprawled on the floor, a man. A man and the knife in his heart. A dead man. What happened here? Who are you? Who is this man? Her hands lost the guitar, searched for it, then her body twisted slowly to the floor. Even in the moment of her final embrace of shock and nothingness, the movement was somehow exquisite and dance-like. And the pattern they made, the girl and the boy, was a pattern of torment and death. Then the cold cycle of murder began. The dead boy's wallet established him as Roberto Segura, and this room was his home. Dr. Sinsky reported that the boy had been dead for three hours, probably killed at about nine o'clock. The girl was Christina Perez. She was in extreme shock and should be taken home. She was. I waited until morning to go back to her. You desire something, senor? I'm Danny Clover of the police. I want to talk to Christina Perez. Please, come in, senor. Thank you. It's necessary first to be granted the permission of Don El Puerto. Oh? The father of Cristina. I see. And you, you're... Cristina is the child of my body also. I am the mother of Cristina. 
Wait here for a moment, please, senor. Of course. Don Eduardo. Si, senora. Una persona del policía, senor Flover. Él quiere hablar con Cristina. Ah, si. I am Don Eduardo Perez, senor. The heritage of my forefathers demands I say you are welcome in my house, but I will not say it for the reason that I abhor your presence. I was told I needed your permission to talk to Christina. See, I'm asking you for it. Have you observed, senor, that your feet are standing on the tiles of the immortal artist Goya? Everything else in my house is at least of equal value. Some possessions are even more extraordinary. I'm happy for you, Eduardo. Christina, where is she? Even more extraordinary, more delicate, more fragile. Christina is such. You mean I can't see her? I think I have made it plain. No, Eduardo, it's all cluttered up. Explain it to me. Your own doctor said my Christina was in shock. You do not believe your workmen like doctors? Yeah, I do. Dr. Sinsky's a good workman. He said Christina should be over it by now. My physician says no. And now you must go, senor. You must have many official duties. I'm glad you said that. I do, Eduardo. Like the murdered boy, Roberta Segura. Did you know him? He was not permitted in my house. Still, Christina was in love with him. She was not. She was not not with that. But she was with him when he was dying and dead. Maybe she was with him when someone put a knife into him. This you will have to wait to find out, senor. Only until my Christina is well. Until you are permitted to see her. I'll wait. Keep watching over Christina. I don't want her to get lost, Eduardo. She's in your custody. Is that plain, Eduardo? Don Eduardo Perez smiled his finest Castilian smile to make it known that it was plain. He made it even plainer by looking my hat onto my head, then staring me out of the door. I called headquarters. They had a couple of things for me. They'd searched Roberta's room and noted that the only bright spot in the otherwise drab walk-up was a color photograph of Christina Perez... And then they may be important thing. Roberto had a roommate, one Johnny Martinez. A dishwasher, they told me, because they'd checked. In a restaurant on 112th Street. That's where I went to see Johnny Martinez. Your name Martinez? Johnny Martinez? Uh huh. Well, I'd put down these dishes. Yeah. I'm Johnny Martinez. Haven't I seen you before? Maybe my back was turned, because I don't remember you. You're a boxer, aren't you? I've seen you at the fights. You must have come early to see me. Never fought better than the first four round prelim. I got yellow in one fight. Never left me. I'm from the police. My name's Danny Clover. What have you been doing? I've been doing in jail for a year and a day. Tuesday will be an anniversary of my being out three months. What'd they get you for? Attempted robbery with a weapon. I stuck a shiv at a small man with glasses. He hit me over the head with a briefcase and knocked me cool. I lost that like I lost everything else. You roomed with Roberta Segura. You know I did, else he wouldn't be here. Know any reason why he should be murdered? Sure. Somebody hit him. You? No. Mm -mm. Not me. Papers say Roberta was killed at 9 last night. I was here till 10.30. For eight hours all the time. Ask the proprietor. Yeah. Tell me about Roberta, Johnny. What was he, Clover? A guy with long sideburns, a family trade in Guadalajara, and maybe a buck thirty-five in his pocket. Like me. You're a bitter boy. No. No, not bitter. I read the right papers. Roberto never would. Do you know Christina Paris? I'm not trying to stall you, Clover. It takes a second to gather up all the nice things about her and turn them into a smile. That way, huh? Do you know her, Clover? Have you talked to her? Have you looked at her? Only she loved Roberto. I know. Now what? Roberto is dead. Now I can try my best. Now I'll get haircuts and be a gentleman. And in a week or so, Christina will smile. Because I'll say something that'll amuse her. Anything else, Clover? Yeah. What did Roberto do last night? What were his plans? Same as always. He spent the evenings at Papa Candelario's place. I guess last night, too, part of it. Papa Candelario, huh? What's that? Upstairs private club for the natives, Clover. Try 1203 116th Street. Upstairs, but legitimate. They open at 9 and a p.m. Thanks, Johnny. I'll see you. Yeah, sure. I'll look for you. Hello, 
cheat. Who sent you? <laughs> Hello. What's your name, kid? Joe. Joe Candelaria. I am 11 years old. I am in the seventh grade. And when I'm a case, I am allowed to stay up until 12 o'clock at night. Hmm? What's your name, Keith? Danny. Danny Clover. Danny? I like that name. <laughs> then you won't mind that I'm from the police, Sancho. Mine? I am delighted. You are my brother. Huh? Positively my brother. I myself am a private ojo. What? Private ojo. He's Spanish for private eye. Oh, oh, I'll bet you're good, Joe. The best, sweethearts. Nothing escapes from my keen eye, my keen intelligence. Only last night, I saw a big black car with two hoodlums sitting in it with dangerous machine guns. Uh, Joe, I... The other day, I found a lady's glove. One glove. And I knew she was in desperate trouble because she left behind one glove. And this to Joe Candelaria was a clue. I hate to break it up, Joe, but i got to get in there into the club. Is it all right? Oh, you are on a case, too? Yeah, Joe, that's the way it is, a case. We understand, as a fellow professional. Don't speak further. I understand. It's a room at the end of the hall, brother. Thanks, pal. Good luck, sweethearts. I'll go back to my post. The room at the end of the hall was without windows. Its walls whitewashed to better display the posters of gypsy dancers in scarlet, of bullfighters in gold, and of wounded bulls on yellow sand. The shadows of the men that filled the room were black and of great depth. Over it all hung a veil of cigar smoke and the odor of licorice. And in the center, in a cleared space, dancing to savage music was Christina Perez, like some animal in fury. Watching her at a little marble-topped table was her father, Don Eduardo. Your physician, Eduardo. He prescribed this for Christina. I am fool. Christina is dancing. Flynn. If we talk now, Eduardo. Christina is a sublime artist. Makes me ill to be distracted when she dances. What do you want, senor? I put Christina in your custody because you said she was too sick to talk to me. She got better fast, didn't she, Eduardo? As you say, senor, she got better fast. You still wish to speak with her? Yeah, I still wish. My Christina is in her dressing room. It is through those curtains and down a hall. Yeah. Hey, what? What? Whoever it was didn't answer me. Whoever it was was pounding on me. Over and over. Whoever it was. Listening to Broadway's My Beat, written by Morton Fine and David Friedkin, and starring Larry Thor as Detective Danny Clover. Benny and Bergen, Crosby and Groucho, Luigi and Irma. There's a lot of sheer exuberant fun around on CBS in the nighttime. But don't forget that every weekday, Monday through Friday, some fellows who are very good at being entertaining are right here. Reading from right to left, left to right, and right down the middle, they are Gary Moore. Art Linkletter, and Arthur Godfrey. Yes, every day, Monday through Friday, over most of these CBS stations. Broadway is a place that hardly ever gets excited. It takes the winning of a war to do that, or the opening of a musical comedy. The best response you can expect for a murdered boy in a cheap room is polite applause. This for maintaining the violent death rate of the city. And a man can lie in an alley in a tortured, painful sleep, and Broadway tiptoes right by him. And the next morning, the man can walk down the subway steps, wiping blood off his face, and Broadway will turn its back. It's a tired movie they've seen before. I know all this because it happened to me. No one gave me a backward glance until I returned to headquarters. Then I got clucked over by two mother hens at the infirmary, Dr. Sinsky being efficient and Sergeant Tartaglia being nervous. Does, 
Does it hurt much, Danny? It hurts too, baby. Well, now, don't you worry about a thing. Just that you should get okay again. Just that your head should look symmetrical. You know, Danny, this is an interesting formation you got on top of your head here. The bump on top of a lump. Mm. I could write it up for the journals. <laughs> Take it easy, Doc. Read me what you got so far, Tataglia. Yeah, sure, Danny, sure. Now, in the matter of suspects, we have none for the following reasons. The deceased, Roberto Segura, being deceased at 9 o'clock, that lets out Johnny Martinez, who was at his place of business until 10.30. Check. Senor and Senora Perez in each other's company until 10 p.m. Check. And about the girl, Christina... Grab hold to the table, Danny. This might hide her. Yeah. <laughs> oh, what was that stuff? Uh, here's the bottle, Danny. Yeah, but what is it? Uh, a doctor's free sample a commercial laboratory sent me this morning. First time I tried it. Hey, it's, a, it's a good sign. The girl, Christina, Danny. Not only don't we get an alibi from her, we don't get her either. She's missing, Danny. What? Hey, get back on the table, Danny. Where do you think you're going? I got only one place to go, Doc. Get me a squad car to Taglia. Papa Candelario. Si, senor. I was here last night. You must have seen me. You know who I am. No entiendo, senor. You mean you don't understand English? No English. No entiendo. Uh, try hard, Papa. I'm of the police. Police, understand? No entiendo, senor. Uh, try this. I was beaten up here last night. This could make trouble for Papa Candelaria. Big trouble. Papa Candelaria? Yo soy Papa Candelario. ¿Qué quiere, senor? <sighs> Cristina Perez, Papa. What does that do to you? Cristina Perez? Yeah, Papa, yeah. Christian Perez, that's right. Where is she? She was here last night. She's disappeared. Oh, look, who is here? My brother, Danny Clover. Joe. Joe, am I glad to see you. And I am glad to see you, said Beatheart. You know that big case I was working on? A big black car with a gun source? I think it is all solved. Joe, Joe, listen. I, I want you to do something for me. Anything, Danny. You are my brother. I want you to translate for me. Huh? I have to ask your father some questions. He doesn't understand English, so I want you to translate for me. Papa, please. Danny is my brother. Please speak to him. All right, Jose. I, I will tell him. Oh, then you do. Si, senor. I do speak English. I only tell you this because it is the wish of my son, whom I love. You will find Cristina Perez with her mother at the convent of Santa Cecilia. That is all I can tell you. Oh, Papa, you are my brother. Papa is now a brother to both of us. Huh, Danny? Yeah, Joe. Thank Papa for me and you too, kid. Thanks, brother. The convent of St. Cecilia stood high on Morningside Drive. A sister led me through a courtyard and into a gray stone building and into a room. A large room, simply furnished. She told me to wait. And she left. It was 15 minutes before the door swung softly open again. Senora Perez and his daughter, Christina. They didn't seem surprised to see me. They walked to a cast iron bench and sat down and folded their hands and waited. Senora Perez? Who was it that sent you to us, senor? Papa Candelaria. This is difficult to believe. No, mother. It isn't difficult. You must realize, like I do, that it's useless to hide from the police. Why are you hiding, Christina? My mother thought it was the best way. Now it doesn't matter. Well, that still doesn't explain very much. You were in Roberta's apartment when I found him dead. You were dancing when you should have been sick. You ran away when you should have been available. Let's style up top and see why. I was supposed to meet Roberto. A rendezvous, Mr. Clover. On the night he died. He was late. I went to his place to look for him. I found him dead. Go on. I danced because my father wished to look at me dancing. I do not disobey my father. Under any circumstances, never, Christina. Mr. Clover. Mr. Clover isn't a fool. He'll find out. Christina, enough. You have said already too much. And I ran away because my mother wished me to run away. I do not disobey my mother either. Tell me something, Christina. Tell me about Roberto. I love him. Your father. What was his reaction to Roberto? 
My father hated him. Roberta had a roommate, Johnny Martinez. What about him? My father hated him. I'm getting the impression that your father hated anyone who had an emotion about you. Senor Perez, he is evil. I tell you this because you should know it. I tell you he is evil. You will never return to Senor Perez. You understand why, Senor? I'm beginning to. What now, Christina? What are you going to do now? That depends on you, Mr. Clover. Am I arrested? Not if you stay right here, you're not. It will be like that, then. Good. Don't worry about anything, Senora Paris. If what you say is true, your husband had his own type motive for killing Roberto. Except for one thing. And that is what, Senor? He just couldn't have done it. You're his alibi for nine o'clock. He was with you when the murder was done. Maria Perez sank to her knees, drew the black lace shawl close about her head. With the fingers of her clasped hands moving endlessly in a kind of torn pleading, began a voiceless prayer. Christina looked at me for a long time, her eyes empty and staring. At the door, I turned back for a moment, and Christina had not moved, had not changed. It was hard to believe that this was the girl who had danced with fury and like flame. At headquarters, nothing added up. Nothing took shape. Motives were there, but alibis were there, too. Hard, cold, unbreakable. No one, it seemed, was around when Roberta Segura was murdered. They had reason to be there, but they hadn't made it. They were somewhere else. I don't like busting in, Danny. What but... do you want, Tartaglia? Well, you have a visitor. Tell him I'm busy. I'm out. Anything you think of. Oh, I tried, Danny. I tried, but it's no use. Your visitor is... Uh, now, wait. Let me see. Uh, Don Jose Miguel... It's me, yeah. sweetheart. Joe. Joe Calendaria. Hello, kid. <laughs> Hi, Joe. Look, kid, I'm pretty busy right now. I... Oh, sure. Okay, Danny. But look, Joe... How would you like to have Sergeant Tataglia show you around police headquarters? Oh, that would be super keen. Do you mean it, Danny? Sure, kid. Take Joe around, Tataglia. Everything. It works. Sure, Danny, sure. Come on, let's go, Don Jose. Wait a minute, Sergeant. First, I must tell Danny he's all solved my case. The black card, the glove, he's all solved. Let's go, Sergeant. Wait a minute. What's this about the black card, Joe? You're always talking about it. Very mysterious, Danny. This black card was standing there for a long time. With all its windows open. Well, that's bad, huh? I don't know about that, but it is very mysterious. Because it was so cold that night. So cold, I wore my hoppy shirt and my hoppy jacket and my hoppy hat. Where was this car, Joe? In front of the house of Don Eduardo Perez. Oh? When was it, Joe? Night before last? That's right. Night before last. 11 o'clock by my Mickey Mouse watch. Who was in the car, Joe? You said there were two men. Did you recognize them? See, si, see. Si. Who were they, Joe? Who were they? Do not ask me, Danny, because I cannot tell you. Why? A good detective should tell other detectives, Joe, when he has something important. I cannot tell you, Danny, because I am not a good detective. I am only an afraid detective. I cannot tell you. Now I cannot see police headquarters? Oh, sure, Joe. Sure you can see it. Go on, Tataglia. Take my brother Joe around. <laughs> Senor Clover. Yeah, Eduardo. Senor Clover. Invite me in. You have come to tell me you have found my Christina? Yeah, that too. Let's go inside, shall we? It's warm in here. Not cold like outside, Eduardo. Where is she, senor? You have no right to torment me. It can go badly for you. For all of us. You and me. Where is she, senor? I must go to her. She's at the convent of St. Cecilia with her mother. Ah. Don't bother with your coat and hat, Eduardo. You won't need them. What? You won't need them. We'll bring Christina to you. If she wants, we'll let her visit you in her cell. What are you trying to tell me, senor? I'm not trying, Eduardo. It's easy to say. You're under arrest for the murder of Roberto Segura. You are insane. It had me fooled, Eduardo, for a long time. Such an airtight alibi. All because we thought the boy was murdered at 9 o'clock. You have a reason to believe it was at another time? Yeah. 
say around 11. That was neat, Edwardo, killing him, then letting his body sit in your car in the cold air so that rigor mortis would set in quickly. You talk with the mouth of a babbling idiot. And you brought him to his room, and because it was warm there, Dr. Sinsky figured the boy had been dead for three hours. Because that's how long rigor mortis might take in a warm room. But in the cold, in a car with open windows, it doesn't take so long, huh, Eduardo? No. You are right, senor. It is a good way to kill. A good way to deceive the stupid ones of the law. Yeah. Yeah, we're pretty stupid, Eduardo. We don't understand how it means to possess things like Goya tiles or a daughter like Christina. Your Christina. You killed her to keep her to yourself, didn't you, Eduardo? No one good enough for Christina but you. It is as you say, senor. No one good enough. So I had Roberto killed. You had help? Of course. I do not soil my hands unnecessarily, senor. Johnny Martinez helped me. Why should he do that? Because I promised him Christina. <laughs> but you, senor... For you, I need no help. I will kill you with my own hand. Give me the gun, Eduardo. <laughs> it frightens you, brave, senor. Yeah, it does that. Give it to me. Drop it. Now I've got the gun, Eduardo. What does it do to you? Frighten you, huh? You will not kill me. You will not. Let's go, Eduardo. You gotta be booked for murder. I can get to Johnny Martinez later. You got to him already, Clover. Well, Johnny. Welcome. Eavesdropping, huh? No, no. Don't turn around, Clover. Now that you've peeped at my gun, just keep in mind. Sure, I've been eavesdropping. The next room. I don't mind. You can come to headquarters, too. Shoot him, Johnny. Kill him. You should have killed him last night when you knocked him unconscious. Kill him! All right, all right. You say so, Senor Perez. All right. Just this before you do, Johnny. Eduardo would like to know about it. Know about what, Senor? The, the gun I'm pointing at you. If Johnny shoots me, I'm just liable to react. I'm liable to grab onto something when Johnny's bullet hits me. The trigger of this gun, maybe. Then you're liable to be shot, Eduardo. Killed, maybe. He's got a point, Senor Perez. Uh, well... I... Johnny! You know what? What do you want me to do? Grab that gun! Grab it! Grab that gun! <laughs> like I was saying, let's go get booked for murder, huh? Broadway. It's an enchanted island or a desert of dust. A crazy dance that starts off wild and winds down to a dirge in bluest time. You look at it one way and it's a magician's pitch with golden mirrors and jeweled fountains. Then you blink and the whole thing dissolves. Your hands are bloody from beating against a wall corroded with pain. It's Broadway. The gaudiest, the most violent... The lonesomest mile in the world. Broadway, my beat. Broadway's My Beat stars Larry Thor as Detective Danny Clover with Charles Calvert as Tartaglia. The musical score was composed by Alexander Courage and conducted by Wilbur Hatch. And the program was produced and directed by Elliot Lewis. The cast tonight included Tony Barrett, Jeanette Nolan, Herb Butterfield, Jack Crucian, Michael Ann Barrett, and Armando Corral. Dinah Shore, Jack Smith, Margaret Whiting, Dick Hames, the Andrews Sisters, Beulah, Edward R. Murrow, Lowell Thomas. These top names in radio are all on CBS regularly. Not once, but five times a week. Top news, top color, top reporting. Lowell Thomas and Ed Murrow each are heard for 15 minutes every Monday through Friday in the early mo mo evening hours. 
And then there's the wonderful comedy of Beulah, the tops and pops with the Jack Smith, Dinah Shore, Margaret Whiting show, the grand singing of Club 15's Dick Hames, the Andrews Sisters, and Evelyn Knight. You can hear them all on most of these same CBS stations Monday through Friday evenings. Listen tomorrow night. This is Joe Walter speaking. This is CBS, where Wednesday night is Bing Crosby night, the Columbia Broadcasting System. Broadway's My Beat, from Times Square to Columbus Circle, the gaudiest, the most violent, the lonesomest mile in the world. Broadway's My Beat, with Larry Thor as Detective Danny Clover. Broadway, it's a mob and a big voice that darts from doorways and screams in your face, then scurls off into the quiet streets. It's a panic in neon where misery and packaged pleasures are commodities, sometime on installments. It's a place that dares you. One way or another, it'll rock you to sleep. It's Broadway, my beat. Early on a January morning, you get up and turn on the heat against the cold of the day. Then there's coffee in the newspaper, the warming things to buffer your shivering at the thought of going out into your own world. I didn't have it that good. I didn't have time for the coffee and newspaper. A call came. It said, get down to St. Anthony's Hospital. I did, and the nun at the information desk said Sister Angela was waiting for me right over there. Sister Angela? Yes, you're from the police. I'm Danny Clover. Headquarters said there was some trouble about a man dying. About Jimmy's dying. Jimmy Hunt. Please, this way. Jimmy was a patient here at the hospital? Yes. And he died. Then I don't see the police, I mean. The manner in which he died, Mr. Clover. Father Clarity said it must be reported to the police. Jimmy committed suicide with a steak knife off his food tray. I see. He was that sick. No. No, he wasn't, Mr. Clover. Jimmy had been a soldier. He fought in a war and he was having trouble forgetting about it. That's all that was wrong with Jimmy. This is the room. Oh, Father Flaherty. This is Mr. Clover, Father. From the police. Mr. Clover. Suicide is always deplorable, Mr. Clover. And to attend death with the police, even more so. However, I understand, Father. This is Jimmy. He was found like this? Yes. The attendant found him. Fred Owen, the attendant's name. Owen found him and called me. I'd like to talk with Fred Owen, Father. Uh, of course. Uh, sister. I'm afraid that's impossible, Father. Fred must have gone home for the day. This finding Jimmy dead by a knife, it undoubtedly made him ill. Fred is a very sensitive boy. Surely. Did Jimmy have any visitors? Why, yes, I, I have them here, Mr. Clover, a list. I called to tell them of Jimmy. If you don't mind, sister. Yes, here. I, I don't understand. Routine, sister, simply to complete a file. Uh, is... Uh... Is that all, Mr. Clover? A few more things. I'll want the attendant's address. Of course. And a question. Could uh, anyone, anyone at all, attendant, visitors, anybody, could someone have come in here and murdered Jimmy? What are you saying? Please. Uh, yes. Uh, it could have been done, Mr. Clover. What are you getting at? Jimmy was stabbed in the side too close to his back to make him a suicide. Jimmy was murdered. You can say rights now, Father. <laughs> A man who has slept on the beaches of death so many times is struck down finally in the ultimate screeching brutality of violence. And a nun's silent, gentle hands, the whispered chant of a priest, try to ease the pain of his journey into the shocking chasms of darkness. All a cop can do for the man is to find out why he had to die in this way. So the cop calls at the address of one named Fred Owen, finds him not at home, hasn't been home, don't know when he'll come home. Then the cop sends out an all-points bulletin on one named Fred Owen. Then the cop calls on the first of a murdered man's visitor's list. Who is it? It's Danny Clover of the police. 
You're here about Jimmy? Please come in. The girl was slender, her face delicate, with an almost wistful expression. But it was her eyes, gray and soft, as if the color had been strained through gauze. Please sit here. Thank you. They called me from St. Anthony's. They told me about Jimmy, Mr. Clover. They told me. Then you're Virginia Scott. Yes. I'm glad you came to me, Mr. Clover, because I can tell you things about him no one else knew, not even the doctors. I understand why he killed himself. Shall I tell you why? Jimmy didn't commit suicide, Miss Scott. He was... he was murdered. Who... who would do that to my poor lost Jimmy? Jimmy... Miss Scott... Jimmy was brave. He was kind and innocent. He was my child and my love. All he ever did wrong was to get lost. Will you help me find his murderer, Miss Scott? Yes. Yes. Who would kill him? Who kills Mr. Clover? Who searches out a wounded boy and kills him? Are there such people? How long have you known him? We met at a dance. His company was going overseas. I didn't know anyone there. But Jimmy asked me to dance. And I fell in love with him. He kept in touch with you? Every day. We wrote each other every day. Did he ever mention anyone in his letters? Anyone who could... Who hated him? Who wanted to kill him? Yes, Mr. Clover. All the nameless ones who had to kill other nameless men. He was a soldier. Virginia, I... Don't... Don't try to find words, Mr. Clover. The words that heal pain, are there such? You can do one thing for me, though. Anything. The letters I wrote Jimmy in the hospital, they were love letters. Every day I couldn't visit him, I wrote him one. May I have them? Letters? There weren't any. What? But they were all I could ever give Jimmy. I know he'd keep them. They have to be there. I'll find them, Virginia. I only ask this. I know you'll understand. Why didn't you marry Jimmy? Why? Why burden him with more? Didn't you notice, Mr. Clover? I'm blind. She said it gently and smiled and offered me her hand. Then I left. Then I found a crowd and walked into it and stuck with it. That way I could clutter my mind up with other faces. After a while, I put my hand in my pocket and took out a piece of paper. It had names on it and addresses. Under Virginia Scott's was a man's name, Mickey Bianco. The address was a pool room on 16th Street off 8th Avenue. Where do I find Mickey Bianco? You're in my way. Oh, sorry. Hey, nice shot. You should play for money. I'm Mickey Bianco, mister. You know Jimmy Hunt? You like that shot? I'm quivering with excitement. Where'd you know him from? The Army? Yeah, the Army. Where I picked up an eight ball and parlayed it into a two-table pool room. About Jimmy Hunt. I'm from the police. Ah. What about Jimmy Hunt? What do you want about him? Did you kill him? Oh, he did? (laughs) Dead, huh? (laughs) Jimmy Hunt, dead. Lieutenant James Hunt, a civilian casualty. Hip, hip, hooray. Makes you patriotic. Yeah, like the Lieutenant Hunt taught me, be patriotic. Point yourself forward at the enemy when you die, men, he said to us. And he meant it. You were in his outfit? Sure, his platoon. We were murdered being patriotic at Inouitak, but not the lieutenant, and not me either. Uh, everybody else, but not us. Fortune's a war. Did you visit him at the hospital? It was my pleasure, believe me. Oh, don't pat me on the back for going to see my old lieutenant. You know why I went? I made him feel worse. I reminded him about what he did to his platoon, and that would make him pull his knees up to his chest. I like to watch. Yeah. Did you see any letters just lying around the room? Letters addressed to Jimmy when you visited him. Letters? What letters? Uh Uh-uh. But that other question, did I kill Jimmy? You know, I should have thought of doing it, but I didn't. Hand me the chalk, policeman. 
The shaded lamp that hung over the pool table gouged a cone of saffron light out of the shadows. And trapped in the twist of light were frayed banners of smoke and whispers and aimless dust and the silhouetted outline of Bianco's face and hands. Then the sharp click of wood on ivory. The pleased titter spilling out of Bianco's mouth. <laughs> and this, too, can be the requiem for a dead man. It stayed with me all the way to headquarters where a report was to be filed, where questions were to be asked. And questions you ask of Sergeant Tartaglia. Sometimes he has answers. Well, the answer to that one is in the positive negative, Danny. Uh, be kind to me, Tartaglia. Sometimes I don't understand things. What is a positive negative? Oh, easy. Positively, we have found no trace of Fred Owen. The reports from the boys looking for Fred Owen are negative. This makes valid the use of the double... Uh, the, the double... Yeah, what about the letters? The letters Virginia Scott wrote to the boy in the hospital. Have you found them? Oh, no, Danny, no. No, we haven't found the letters. We searched the effects of the deceased. We checked with Sister Angela and with Father Flaherty. No letters. Does it make a difference, Danny? Danny Clover speaking. Mr. Clover, I'm sorry to bother you. Oh, I told you any time, Virginia. Something strange has happened. A phone call just came, and a voice said I would die. What? It said if I didn't want to die, I'd better get some protection. What does it mean, Mr. Clover? It means lock the door and bolt the windows. I'm coming right down. Danny? Get a squad car to Taglia. Don't stand there. Get it. It's me, Virginia. Open the door. You came so quickly, Mr. Clover. Has anyone... No, there's been no one. I've just been sitting here listening to the sounds of the street... You know, Mr. Clover, when night falls, it has a sound. Shall I turn on the light? No. Is there any other entrance to this apartment? Yes, the kitchen. It has a door opens onto the hallway. Is it locked? Yes. You told me, Mr. Clover. I'll unlock it. What? It'll be all right, Virginia. We'll leave this one open, too. Where were you sitting? Over here, near the window. Sit there now. I'll stand over here. Why would anyone want to kill me, Mr. Clover? I don't know. Maybe because you're all that's left of Jimmy. If they want to kill me, why did they tell me to get protection? It doesn't seem logical, does it? Maybe it's not. Shh. I hear someone, Mr. Clover. Don't move. Mr. Clover? heading for the fire escape at the back, Mr. Clover. I can tell by the sound. You'll have to come with me, Virginia. I can't leave you here. Just hold my hand. There he is, down at the bottom of the fire escape. He got away, didn't he, Mr. Clover? In a car. He got away. Yes, Virginia, he got away. Give me your hand, Mr. Clover. Suddenly it's darker than it's ever been. Listening to Broadway's My Beat, written by Morton Fine and David Friedkin, and starring Larry Thor as Detective Danny Clover. CBS invites you to hear Senator Brian McMahon on the Capitol Cloakroom over most of these same CBS stations later tonight. Senator McMahon is chairman of the Joint Congressional Committee on Atomic Energy, and when he is interviewed tonight by CBS newsmen Eric Severide, Bill Shadell, and Griffin Bancroft, this will be the first detailed discussion of the hydrogen bomb and its implications by a high government official since President Truman's historic announcement earlier this week. That's CBS Capitol Cloakroom, later tonight. There's this about Broadway. It has a bag full of free illusions. In every color, every size. Guaranteed against fading. Warranted against shrinkage. Want an illusion, kid? Just reach in the bag. There's more where that one came from. There's the illusion that Broadway can break its heart. And here's one in the classy, all-plastic 1950 model. Laboratory tested. The illusion that Broadway can shed a tear. That's the one you'll want for the murder of a sick soldier boy. For the girl of his heart and his dreams... 
The song of a girl with sightless eyes. Hug it close to you, kid, because it's fragile. Danny! Danny, what's the matter? Danny, you look sick. No. Well, it's something different from sick. Hey, Danny, can I get you a glass of water or something? What do you want, Tagley? Well, Danny, I just want you shouldn't look like that. What else do you want, Tagley? Ah, oh, now, Danny, don't be like that. I know how upset you are because of the boy, because of how they tried to kill that blind girl. Ah, I, I don't figure it, Danny. If they wanted to kill her, why did they tell her to get protection? Maybe it wasn't her they wanted to kill. No? Hey, then that means it was... Danny, I got it. The killer set it up that way because it was you he wanted to kill. Hey, Danny, we got to do something. We, Answer we... the phone, Tartaglia. What? Oh, oh, yeah, Danny, yeah. Danny Clover's office, Sergeant Tartaglia speaking. What? Yeah. Yeah, right away. Danny. What was it? That was Dan Dobin, desk sergeant, the 29th precinct. They got Fred Owen. He gave himself up. He's confessed to the murder of Jimmy Hunt. Hey, Danny, take your overcoat. You catch your death of cold. <laughs> Fred Owen. <laughs> You killed a man, Hal. <laughs> you killed Jimmy Hunt. Why? Killed him. Tell me about it. That's why you came here, wasn't it? You want to tell someone about it? Tell me. You... I'm Danny Clover. I'm a policeman. I'll tell you. You're a policeman. You'll make me suffer for what I did to Jimmy. I killed him, and I've got to suffer for it. I've got to feel what Jimmy felt. I'll take it easy, Owen. Just tell me how you did it. With the knife? With the knife. Go ahead. Mr. Clover, did it hurt him much? I don't think so. I cut up his food for him so he could feed himself, so he wouldn't have to use a knife. The doctor always warned me not to let Jimmy use a knife. You see, the doctor was afraid that Jimmy... that Jimmy would do what he did to did he do, Owen? I was feeding him, and then I suddenly remembered something I had to do. Yeah, what? Something I forgot. It wouldn't have happened. It didn't have to happen. Then you remembered. Is that when you stabbed him? <laughs> As if it had been with my own hand. <laughs> you see, Jimmy... Jimmy liked me to read to him while he was eating, and I forgot to bring a book. And so I left to get it. I left Jimmy with the knife. <laughs> Are you trying to tell me that Jimmy killed himself and you left him alone with a knife? As if it had been with my own hands. I killed him. It was my fault that Jimmy's dead. My fault. I killed him as surely as if I'd plunged the knife into him. I tried to break through the wall of tears he'd built around himself, but it was no good. I tried to ask him about Virginia's letters. He didn't know anything about them, he said. And it was another lash of the whip he held over himself. I finally broke his heart by releasing him from the dismal, bitter shadows of the cell he'd begged for. Then I took a long walk in the cold, unspoiled air. Then I knew I had to get back to it. The third name on the visitor's list was Madge Taylor, whose address was a brownstone between other brownstones on West 53rd. I climbed the steps that led to its doors with the cracked stained glass. Hey, man, looking for someone? Yeah, Madge Taylor, is she here? Come in, ma'am. Well, come in. You want me to freeze? You're a match, Taylor? Yeah. Right in there. What the old battle axe that runs his flat don't know won't hurt her. Anyway, it's cuddlier with the door closed, huh, man? Such a nasty draft in that hallway. Madge, I'm Danny Clover, the police. Huh? Let's have a drink on it, shall we, Danny? They told me you visited a man in the hospital, a man named Jimmy Hunt. Friend of yours? <laughs> it's funny what I said. It kills me. I thought you were... Uh... <clears throat> All you want to know is, did I murder Jimmy Hunt? Isn't that it? Why did you visit him? I'll tell you why. You see me, how I am? Charge it up to Jimmy Hunt. Send him the bill. You were in love with Jimmy Hunt? The lieutenant? 
The wonder boy with the loose marbles? Are you kidding? I never saw him in my life till I found out he was brain sick in that hospital. I don't... I'll draw you a diagram. I was in love once with a kid, a soldier kid, my husband. Lieutenant Jimmy Hunt killed him. Killed me, too, at the same time. Because the lieutenant thought it was dandy, kids should be killed. This the lieutenant liked. You still want to know why I visited him? No, no, Madge. I've heard it once. When you saw him, did he have any letters? How would I know? All I care about Jimmy Hunt was that he should die. Slow, slow, a long time dying. Yeah. Stick around, Madge. Don't go away. You out of your mind? I love it here. I never had it so good. It's a free ride on a roller coaster, man. Hi, Danny. Hey, I got news for you. Yeah, what is it? There's a guy in your office waiting for you. Who is he? Uh, name's Scott. Says he has a daughter named Virginia Scott. Uh, hey, ain't that the girl? Danny? Your name's Scott? It is. And you're Danny Clover. Virginia described you to me. Well, don't look surprised, Mr. Clover. My daughter is a perceptive girl. Nothing about Virginia surprises me, Mr. Scott, except the fact that she has a father. I didn't know that before. Because Virginia didn't want you to know. She'd have a reason for that, Mr. Scott. Oh, well, it's all bound up with the kind of person she is. Her love for people who love her. The reason why she insisted on living alone without me. The reason why she didn't want me mixed up in this affair. She thinks you had a motive for killing Jimmy? She knows I did. That's why I'm here. Well, perhaps you'd never have found out. But that's why I'm here. To tell you I had a motive for killing Jimmy. Which was what? I hated that boy. Hated him for what he was. For what he could do to people. His arrogance. His snobbishness. The play acting he did to cover his cowardice. By his very existence, Jimmy Hunt was a liar. Mostly you resented his making love to your daughter. Yes. My daughter is blind. Whatever she can do on her own, sew, cook, turn on lights, dial a telephone, it doesn't alter the fact. Virginia is blind. It's her burden. She didn't deserve another awful one like Jimmy Hunt. A sick boy who willed himself sick. Virginia knew you felt this way? She knew I was prepared to kill Jimmy that very day. But you didn't. Is that what you're telling me? That very day, I went to the ward to kill him. That's what was on my mind to do. But an attendant saw me, asked me my business there. When I couldn't answer him properly, he made me leave. No, I didn't kill Jimmy. But there's this. There's what? I'm glad he said. He got up and walked away, and I let him. But because I'm a cop, I had a man follow him. And because I'm a cop, I had to check on his story, whether he had actually left the war the morning Jimmy Hunt was killed. That meant I had to talk to Fred Owen, the attendant. I called the hospital, and they told me Owen hadn't showed up, and as far as they knew, he was home. So that's where I went, too, to the home of Fred Owen. His landlady was a kind woman. Fred will be right back, Mr. Clover. Would you like to wait in this room? Yes, please. Next room down on your right. Thanks. I'll find my way. Oh, wait, wait. I'll go with you. Turn on the fire. Sometimes it gets cold here in Fred's room. Can't understand it. A nice gas fireplace like this, and Fred likes to sit here in the cold. There. Don't that make a nice fire? Yeah, cozy. Yeah, this is a real cozy room. Now, Fred decorated it himself. I allow him to hang pictures. Lots of landladies don't allow hanging pictures. Nice pictures. All girls. It's a man's privilege. Girls with veils over their eyes. Girls with their eyes closed. Sightless girls. Yeah, and here's one with a man on it with a girl holding his hands over her eyes like he's going to surprise her. <laughs> Fred... Oh, hello, Fred. I was just telling Mr. I'm happy Mr. you're here, Mr. Clover. I'll make some coffee. Thanks, but I don't care for any, Fred. <laughs> I'll just leave you two gentlemen alone. I know how gentlemen like to talk sometimes without ladies. You like my room, Mr. Clover? I was just admiring your pictures. Yeah, I like them too. But all these girls, their eyes covered, they can't see you. I know. 
Some men hang pictures of girls. Well, you know, because that's the kind of men they are. What kind are you, Fred? I'm an ugly kind of man. My face, I mean. I know I am. Girls never look at me on the street. Even when I stare at them and set my mind that they should look at me. They look away even when I talk to them. Virginia doesn't, does she? No. Oh, no. When she comes to the hospital and I say good morning to her, she smiles and, and talks right to me. When she doesn't come to the hospital, she writes you, doesn't she, Fred? Oh, yes, of course she does, because she loves me. She... Maybe you don't believe that, Mr. Clover. But I'll show you. Here. This will show you that she loves me. Her letters to me. Go ahead. Take one of them out of the envelope and read it. I'm not ashamed of our love. Yeah. She loves you all right, Fred. But look. Look at this. Yeah? You've crossed Jimmy's name out wherever it's mentioned and written in your own. Well, of course I did. Don't you see? Virginia's very clever. She wrote those letters to Jimmy, but she knew I'd get them. I knew Virginia wanted it like that. And Jimmy... <laughs> Jimmy was sick, you know. He thought Virginia really meant them for him. So you stabbed him. You really did kill him, didn't you? Oh, I had to. He was getting worse and worse about Virginia all the time. Why didn't you tell me that when I talked to you in the cell, Fred? Because I'm clever, too. Yes, you are. That was a clever trap you set for me in Virginia's apartment. No, you're wrong. I wasn't clever then. You got away. Put down that knife, Fred. It won't hurt, Mr. Clover. It didn't hurt Jimmy. You said it didn't. Now give me my letters. I don't want blood on Virginia's letters. Here are your letters, Fred. He lay there, his body taut, as if unwilling to accept what was happening to him. His mouth hung open in disbelief, and the spasm in his fingertips groped for the fireplace and the ashes of his letters. But the final, the complete rejection was in his eyes, open and staring at me, empty of passion, of insanity even cold and empty, his eyes staring and sightless. Broadway's having itself a time. It's cocky, and it's needling people to step over the line. It's making a big muscle and daring the nighttime. And before it's over, it'll gouge chunks out of itself and laugh at its own agony. It's Broadway, the gaudiest, the most violent, the lonesomest mile in the world. Broadway, my beat. <laughs> Broadway's My Beat stars Larry Thor as Detective Danny Clover with Charles Calvert as Tartaglia. The musical score was composed and conducted by Alexander Courage and the program was produced by Elliot Lewis and directed by Gordon T. Hughes. The cast tonight included Peggy Weber, Ted Von Elts, Mary Jane Croft, Georgia Ellis, Jerry Hausner, and Jack Edwards. He's a jack, he's a knave when it comes to spending a nickel. He's an ace in the business of making America laugh. And now... He's a king of hearts. Yes, the name is Benny. And this Sunday night, Jack Benny will formally be named America's King of Hearts for 1950. Mary, Dennis, Phil, Don, and Rochester will be on hand. And no king ever had such a group of jokers. Join us on all of these CBS stations this Sunday for The Jack Benny Show. Joe Walter speaking. This is CBS, where the Goldbergs are every Saturday night... 
the Columbia Broadcasting System. Broadway's my beat. From Times Square to Columbus Circle, the gaudiest, the most violent, the lonesomest mile in the world. Broadway's My Beat, with Larry Thor as Detective Danny Clover. Broadway, it's the journey you have to make, because all the other streets you ever walked never paid off. But Broadway's different. It twists you into the nighttime, and you whirl your puppet dance with the spinning lights. It rocks you and throws you up in the air and beats you against the wall. And you can't quit because Broadway never does. That's how it is on Broadway. My beat. People go to wrestling matches for a variety of reasons. For a change of pace from their own domestic strangleholds. For laughs. For motives which make footnotes in textbooks. And at the bout between Max Magnificent and the Panther Man, the faces and the reasons were up to par. I was there because pressure from upstairs ordered me to be there. They said a man was there who was trying to keep a big secret. They said to drop everything, to see him right now. Right now he was sitting on the aisle near the tunnel entrance. I walked up to him and nodded. What do you want, Danny? Just talk, Melvin, that's all. And I'd like to watch this Max Magnificent, Danny. He's... The first fall's not due for ten minutes yet. You'll be back before then. Come on, we can talk in the tunnel. All right. Well, what do you want? Julie Dixon. What about her? What about her? Forget you're a big criminal lawyer, Melvin. Make believe you're not quibbling in a courtroom. Make believe that's just you and me. Where's Julie? Forget it, Danny. You know better than that. Forget it. I can't do it that way. The papers are screaming about a Cinderella girl named Julie Dixon. They waste a lot of type about a poor, poor girl getting engaged to a rich, rich lawyer named Alex Melvin. You. Now Julie's gone. In a puff of smoke, they say. Today they've coined a new phrase. Foul play. She's around. She'll be back. Maybe. Only the foul play phrase bothers the police department. You going to help us? Danny... Danny, forget it, huh? Lay off. I'll find Julie. I've got friends. That's why I've got to say it again. Danny, lay off. I mean it. Uh Uh-uh. Cinderella girls are always public property. And the public's screaming. I thought you'd help, Melvin. Now it's got to be done my way. My way was to a penny arcade on Broadway. The sharpest little stool pigeon I had, named Marty... I told him to sing it around that I knew a lot about Julie Dixon's disappearance. But I was primed to make an arrest. And with Marty saying the words I'd put in his mouth, someone might believe them. And that someone might make a move. And I needed that to help me find a lost, strayed, or stolen Cinderella girl. At headquarters, I waited for Marty's call. And I fell asleep waiting. And then a bell exploded. At two o'clock in the morning, it couldn't stand it anymore, and it exploded. Danny Clover speaking. Marty? No, it's not Marty. I'm inviting you to a party, Danny. Want to come? Who is this? A girl. Pier 38. East River, Danny. 3 a.m. an hour from now. You're the guest of honor. It's for Julie Dixon, the party. So you'll make it, huh, Danny? All alone? Wouldn't go any other way. Thanks. I didn't wait for three o'clock. I left for the East River docks right away. Maybe I was going to be a little early, but I was being a little eager. Pier 38 occupied about 50 front feet of the darkness and lent its own quality of shadows to it. Toward the river, a couple of tugs huddled together. To my right and left, equipment shacks. I should have been looking toward the stern, because that's where it came from. I 
beg your pardon. Come, 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 come. Wake up. Oh, for, uh, I say you're quite unintelligible, you know. Now, there, now, open your eyes. <sighs> now, then, isn't that better? Good morning. Huh? I said good morning. I greeted you. Oh, I greet you. Good morning. Good morning. Where's all this greeting taking place? At the Ashton Hotel, room 312, New York City. And you're... Rupert. Rupert. How did I get here, Rupert? I found you on Pier 38. Did you hit me first on the back of the head, Rupert? Oh, no, 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 no. But I did kick you. That is, I stumbled over you. That's what made me know you were there. I brought you here in a cab. What were you doing on Pier 38, Rupert? Well, sir, every night, every night after the matches, I go to the waterfront and look toward England and make a wish... The same wish, sir, that I was back in Crofton on Willow. Why aren't you back there, Rupert? Because I'm not. Max Magnificent doesn't wrestle in England until the summer. Max Magnificent? Yes, of course. I'm his valet. I spray the ring for him, carry his robe. Rupert. Where's Max? The Magnificent is in the next room, having his hair done. Thanks, Rupert. Uh, will you be staying to breakfast, sir? Kipper's in ten minutes. Well, well, I see you're up in her arm. Glad to see it. Max Magnificent wishes he could sleep that well. How do you like it? No, I don't mean Mabel the hairdresser. I mean my hair. The Flamingo Bob, I call it. Fancy, huh? Fancy. Huh? Here it is. I got it all ready for you. Autographed photograph of Max Magnificent. Look what it says. To an all-American lad from your idol, Max Magnificent. Fancy. Can I talk to you without the hairdresser? With my hair half up in curlers? You kidding, baby? Go ahead, talk to me. Mabel doesn't understand nothing except hair anyway. Talk. Talk to me. Maybe I'm being coincidental, Max. Oh! Mabel, comb the curls. Don't yank them out of my head. Uh, you're saying? A man I know came to see you wrestle last night when he was supposed to be worried, Max. A man named Alex Malvern. Oh, Max Magnificent welcomes him to the ever-growing list of his staunch admirers. Hey, I did that good. Yeah, and Alex Melvin worries because his fiancée, one Julie Dixon, is missing. I talk oh, to him. Oh, worried, huh? Then I got slugged. Then I wake up in the tender care of Rupert, valet for Max Magnificent. Hey, that makes a circle, huh? Go ahead, go ahead. This is real goose pimply talk. What's with Julie Dixon, Max? You know? Oh, asking me questions with no sense. Finish me, Mabel. This guy just got boring. What about Julie Dixon? Mabel, hand me the mirror. Julie Dixon. Oh, the flamingo bar. The fans will eat it up. You know something, you, mister, standing there? I can't hear you no more. You better go, mister. Mabel's got to sent me. The lavender, Mabel. Max Magnificent swept up the train of his magnificent brocaded robe. With a hairy paw, swept up Mabel, his lady barber. With his other hairy paw, motioned me magnificently to the door. And through it all maintained the magnificent grace and delicacy of a quaffed and perfumed gorilla. All that magnificence deserved some historical research. So I put a call through to Sergeant Ottaglia to get on it. To bring me up to date on how and why and when and where Max and Rupert got so magnificent. So regally considerate of a poor beaten up policeman. And then I went back to the beginning... And the beginning was the lawyer, Alex Melbourne. Sure I can't offer you a drink, Danny? A noon cocktail to take the bitter taste out of your mouth? You've come a long way, Melvin. I can remember when it was a toss-up who'd get to where mayhem was first, you or me. <laughs> you mean I was a shyster, an ambulance chaser? It doesn't shame me, Danny. We all have to grub for nickels one way or another. Here's to you, Danny. I told you at the wrestling matches, it bothers us police about Julie Dixon. Gets worse all the time. So I see. Those black and blue marks, Danny. They hurt, don't they? I know they hurt, because I know. A girl you were going to marry. The papers said the brightest torch you ever carried. The papers said true. She disappears. You don't even cry. You don't even ask for help. Is that how it gets when you're big, Melbourne? You see the walnut paneling in my office, Danny? It cost a fortune. This private bar upholstered in Florentine leather. A fortune. Those golden girls, my secretaries, 
who wait on me hand and foot like I was a king. Also a fortune. None of this I got by asking anybody for help. So we've got nothing more to say to each other, huh, Danny? Glad you dropped in, though. I enjoyed that, Melvin. I speak only as a jury of one, but it was very impressive. I really enjoyed it. Out, Danny. I'm busy. You're going to throw me out, Melvin? Because that's how it'll have to be. There are lots of ways. One way, I could pick up the phone, talk to a friend. This friend listens when I talk. And because he listens, they could put you in the middle of Fifth Avenue, helping visitors dodge the terrible traffic. Do that, Maverick. Maverick. Do it. Danny. Now you've got a good reason. Danny. A better one. Do it. Danny, Danny, take it easy. Here's the phone, King. Call your friend. Forget it, Danny. Forget it. Forget I ever said it. I, I only thought it would be better if I found Julie in my own way. That's all there is to it, Danny. I swear. When did she disappear? Five days ago. We were in a cab going to a theater. The cab slowed down for a light, and all of a sudden, Julie jumps out. I, I haven't seen her since. She didn't say anything? Leave anything? Just a bag with all the money in it. She didn't even say goodbye. She'd been acting funny for days. She was... Where's the bag? Well, we're here. We're right, right here, Danny. Take it if you want. Yeah. Lipstick. Compact. Money. Hey. What, Danny? This newspaper clipping. This picture of Max Magnificent. You didn't tell me about that. Why should I? It doesn't mean anything. Julie liked wrestling matches. Maybe Max Magnificent was a hero. She made me take her to see him once. Yeah. Fix your $20 tie, Malvern. It got wrinkled somehow. It deserved a social call on Max Magnificent. But I was polite. I phoned first. Which was the proper thing to do because he wasn't at his hotel. The Magnificent had gone to the armory early, they said. He needed time to perfume his person in his dressing room before his performance tonight, they said. However, I could talk to his valet, they said. I said, no thanks. At the deserted armory, I followed Max's spoor down a long cavern and into a whitewashed dressing room. That brought me face to face with Rupert. Oh, Mr. Clover, how very nice of you to be here when I need you so desperately. Later, Rupert. Where's Max? Magnificent. He's there. There on the floor in the corner. He sleeps on concrete because he's so rugged. The Magnificent is not asleep, Mr. Clover. He's dead. What? You see, Mr. Clover? Yeah. Yeah, I see, Rupert. I didn't touch him, Mr. Clover, so you police would find him just as I found him only a moment ago. That is the custom, isn't it, Mr. Clover? Yes, Rupert. <laughs> that knife in his back. That means he was... Murdered. Murdered. The Magnificent is dead, Mr. Clover. Long live the Magnificent. <laughs> Listening to Broadway's My Beat, written by Morton Fine and David Friedkin, and starring Larry Thor as Detective Danny Clover. The cream of the fun and songs on Arthur Godfrey's daytime shows are now brought to you in a half hour special Godfrey Digest every Saturday night on CBS. So if a date with the dentist, the hairdressers, if a traffic ticket in court kept you from hearing one of the daytime shows this week, or if you want a fast half hour of humor and songs by Jeanette Davis, Bill Lawrence and the Mariners, listen in this Saturday night to the Godfrey Digest on most of these same CBS stations. Broadway is a place that can fool you, can walk by the lost and the broken and the dying without batting an eye. But when one of its own lies dead, Broadway tears its collective breast, dons the sackcloth and ashes, and sends up a shrieking lament that can be heard round the world. And for a little while, you believe it. You believe Broadway is heartbroken because death came on a man who called himself Max Magnificent and stuck a knife in his back. You believe Broadway has found torment because it lost a Cinderella girl named Julie Dixon. 
Then you take a good look at Broadway, and you know you're out of your mind. But you stay with it, because you're a cop. And as a cop, you're Broadway's conscience. And as a conscience, you've got a helper, namely Sergeant Gino Tartaglia. Danny, sometimes when I can't go to sleep nights, I analyze my relationship with you. And? And I have come to the, inclu- to the conclusion that I am what is technically known as a mother's helper. <laughs> and I'm very proud of you, Gino. Ah, Danny, stop it. <clears throat> well, item one. The boys in the lab say that after a detailed check of the fingerprints of Max Magnificent, he turns out to be an ordinary human being with a name as common as Clover or Tartaglia. Oh? Yeah, honest, Danny. Max Magnificent was none other than Joe Warner. Joe Warner, huh? And Joe Warner was none other than, than who, Tartaglia? Oh, a guy who we once picked up for attempted blackmail, Badger Game. Who was the girl? Uh, that we don't know, but we're still working on it. Item two, the missing girl, Julie Dixon, is known to have withdrawn her entire savings from the Corn Exchange Bank the day before said Julie Dixon disappeared. How much savings? A goodly sum, $3,000. Yeah, as you say, goodly. Maybe that explains why she didn't need her bag when she jumped out of Melbourne's cab. Yeah, possibly, Danny. Well, may I continue? Oh, please do. Item three. Detective Mugovan is even now on the tail of the famous and renowned lawyer Alex Malvern. And Detective Kinney is even now on the tail of Rupert the Valet. And Julie Dixon's description? The description? Description, Tartaglia. It's out. Any reports on it? But no, no, Danny. Well, get on it, Tartaglia. Check again. Every railway station, every pawn shop, every everything. You'll remember, won't you, Tartaglia? Oh, I promise, Danny. Oh, I, I just remembered. I forgot something. Oh, I'm glad for you, Tartaglia. Oh, thank you, Danny. I just remembered you got a call from someone named Sophie Wojcikowski. Huh? Yeah, Sophie Wojcikowski. She skates on roller skates at the roller derby at Madison Square Garden. She says, come meet her at uh, 8 tonight. There's something about Julie Dixon. She said, uh, Danny, Danny, can I help with him? I forgot. I got so much on my mind. Mrs. Tartaglia, the kids, I don't see <laughs> If your name's Sophie Wojcikowski, I am. Well, you don't have a scorecard, huh? Else you'd know. Everybody knows number 12 is Sophie Wojcikowski. I'm Danny Clover. Oh. What about Julie Dixon, Sophie? Oh, Julie and me used to borrow our skate key from the same guy. How long ago was that? Oh, years and years and years. I mean, we grew up together practically. Then we grew up, then she got married, then she went away, then I never heard of her. Then yesterday came. Yesterday was something special? Not especially special, except a guy called me upon the telephone and asked me if I knew the whereabouts of Julie. I told him no, because I don't. And the guy said a bad word and hung up. What guy? The guy I was talking to upon the telephone. Oh, you mean his name. Uh-uh, he didn't say. Now, let's go back a little bit. You said Julie was married to a man named Joe Warner? That I don't know. Except I heard from sources close to the roller rink that he deserted her. Ran away to Texas, I heard. This was about... Three years ago. Then the reason you called was to tell me about the phone call. Well, not exactly. You see, I saw Julie yesterday. Later, after the guy called upon the telephone. Huh? Sure, she said she was broke. She came to borrow some money. How much did you lend her? Not a cent, because that's how much I had at the time. She said thank you and walked out of my life again. (whistles) Oh. The woman's team will take their places. One minute. Hey, look, I gotta go now. That's all I know, Mr. Clover. So long. I watched Sophie clatter onto the track, watched her rabbit punch one of the contenders, trip another, sharp right cross to another, and then Sophie Wojcikowski had a clear field. It wasn't fun anymore, so I got out. And I began to add it up. Julie's husband had deserted her, Sophie said. And in Julie's bag had been a picture of Max Magnificent, who was Joe Warner. And Julie had gone through $3,000 fast even for a girl like Julie. And the sum could be blackmail and murder. Except one factor was missing from the equation. Julie Dixon. And at headquarters, Sergeant Tataglia was being mother's helper like anything. Danny, I think what we boys got on is Julie Dixon will help you like anything. Oh? Yeah. Now, sit down, Danny. Sit down. This is big. You ready? 
We have discovered that Julie Dixon was married to Joe Warner, later Max Magnificent, and there is no indication that the divorce happened in the family. Uh, you're right, Tataglia. You've made a big discovery. Uh, thank you, Danny, thank you. But uh, I have here another item that is not so happy. Rupert the Valet has disappeared from the tale of Kenny the Detective. What? Don't go away, Tataglia. Oh, where would I go? Danny Clover speaking. Uh, Mr. Clover, I am Howard Jones mentor of a sanctuary you people call a pawn shop. Yeah, we'll try to do better. Is that all you want? <laughs> Not what I want, Mr. Clover. What you people want. Julie Dixon. She was in my uh, place not an hour ago. How do you know it was Julie Dixon? She fits the description. Lots of women might. True, true. But uh, she pawned a platinum and diamond bracelet with her initials on the back of it. I gave her $50, but only because I'm a friend of Pam. Okay, okay. What name did she give you? Mary Smith. Address? Hotel at 2617 East 8th Street. Thank you, Howard Jones. Tartaglia. Yeah, Danny. Don't go away. I won't. Uh, hey, Danny, don't forget your hat. <laughs> You the desk clerk? No, I'm the scrub lady, Mac. But I got word there's no vacancy, so go try another flea bag, huh, Mac? This one suits me fine. I'm looking for a girl. Oh, in that case, you want the Lonely Hearts Club. Three blocks down, up two flights, tell them I recommend you for membership. A girl, Julie Dixon. What room is she in, scrub lady? For this, I got two answers. I doubt if one of our guests, if she has a name, Julie Dixon, would sign this same name on the register. Answer number two is why should I answer you at all, Mac? Good question. Good answer? Plain clothes, Dick. With badge to match. Eh? Oh, impresses me. Tell me how much. This much, Mac. I am a room clerk in this hostelry. We have a guest, a gorgeous doll occupying our diplomat suit. It's possible this girl could be the girl whom you of the John Dombrey... What room? Try number 18. That's the suit with the washstand. If you want room service, just scream, huh, policeman? Get away from here. Your name, Julie Dixon? I said get away from here. Get away before I make it real tough for you. Go ahead. You ask for it, mister. Help! Help! Somebody help! Such a pretty dress. Ripping it won't help it at all. Somebody, please! 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 That's me, police. What? Badge and all. Look. Okay, let's go inside. Police. That's right, Julie. Do you want to tell me now or later? Doesn't matter a whole lot. No. No, it doesn't. Nothing matters anymore. What do you want? Not so much. Just fill me in. You were paying blackmail. To whom? To a nursemaid. To a nursemaid to my husband. A nursemaid who called himself Rupert. He had something to sell you? Like this. My husband, Joe Warner. Joe Warner, a Max Magnificent, whatever you want to call him. I thought he was dead. We were never divorced, and I thought he was dead. What made you think your husband was dead when he wasn't? Papers. Joe was in Texas at the time. You know the time the tanker blew up? Texas City? A disaster in 47, huh? Papers listed a man named Joe Warner dead. I was certain it was my husband. He was in Texas City then. Yeah. They still don't know how many people died there or who. So I met Alex Melvin. And I fell in love with him and he fell in love with me and we were going to get married. That's the way I am when I fall in love with a man and he falls in love with me. So Joe changes his name to Max Magnificent, becomes a wrestler with a hairdo and hires himself a valet named Rupert. Max, hairdo and valet show up in New York. Right? Yes. Rupert came to me and said he wanted money to keep my first marriage quiet. More than that, Julie. It was the kind of marriage you had, wasn't it? A partnership for blackmail. A partnership to work the badger game. That's why you paid him the $3,000 you drew from the bank. That's why. It was worth that to keep Melvin from knowing what I used to be. But it was no good, so I ran away. I ran away and I've been running ever since. You've got nothing to worry about anymore, Julie. Except one thing. Whether Alex will have me now? That? Maybe that. 
But the other thing. Your husband's been murdered. You had the motive, the opportunity, maybe. And you're running away. Murderers do that. I've been terribly impolite. I've been listening. You don't mind that, do you, Mr. Clover? Glad to have you aboard, Rupert. Your name was being bandied about. I'll kill him. So help me, I'll kill Take him! Take it easy, Julie. Please. Thank you, sir. Else I would have killed her before your very eyes. Like you killed Max? Yes, of course. He had the body of an ox, but his insides were not fortitudinous at all. Yellow is the word for Max Magnificent. <laughs> I laugh at the name. <laughs> Why did you come here, Rupert? I've been following you, Mr. Clover. I want you to be happy before you die. Now that you found Julie, you'd find me. Then you'd try to have me executed for murder. I just couldn't stand that. One more thing, Rupert, just to make me a happy man. You said Max was yellow. I said it because I meant it. He suddenly changed his mind about blackmailing Julie. Let the kid alone. She deserves a break. Those were his very words. <laughs> I tried to argue him out of his faint heart. There were words. He had muscles. I had a knife. <laughs> I won the argument. Julie, you have such poor taste in husbands. You ruined it. You ruined everything. Julie, watch out. You fool. <laughs> I told her! Yeah, you told her? Good. <laughs> Rupert crashed into the washstand. The gun clattered out of his hands. And then, like some crazed animal, he scurried for it in the half-light. So there was only one thing to do. Then I bent over Julie to try to help her. To somehow ease the pain of the wound in her shoulder. And she did something strange. She shook her head and motioned me away. And in her eyes, there was something that could have been agony or happiness or something I didn't know about. When the ambulance came, she walked into it and lay down and fell asleep. Rupert was different. He screamed and tore at my face. So I had to give him the anesthetic once more. <laughs> Broadway's wearing its harlequin clothes, and it winks an eye and beckons. And a pale and hungry girl walks its pavements like a queen, because Broadway's a dream street. And a fat man stands with begging eyes, because he just found out his last dream didn't come true. It's a laugh or a cry, with nothing in between. It's Broadway, the gaudiest, the most violent, the lonesomest mile in the world. Broadway, my beat. Broadway's My Beat stars Larry Thor as Detective Danny Clover with Charles Calvert as Tartaglia. The musical score was composed and conducted by Alexander Courage, and the program was produced by Elliot Lewis and directed by Gordon T. Hughes. The cast tonight included Vivi Janis, Bill Johnstone, Virginia Gregg, Jay Novello, Junius Matthews, and Larry Dobkin. Molly Goldberg's being visited tomorrow night by an old flame, and Jake's really burned up. Yes, romance has flowered in the Goldbergs' apartment this week, and this Saturday night, Jake takes action against Molly's old bow. Be listening when the Goldbergs come to you on most of these same CBS stations in their new Saturday night time tomorrow night. Joe Walters speaking. This is CBS, where you find Broadway is my beat every Friday night. The Columbia Broadcasting System. Broadway's My Beat, from Times Square to Columbus Circle, the gaudiest, the most violent, the lonesomest mile in the world.
Broadway's My Beat with Larry Thor as Detective Danny Clover. Broadway, where the measured screaming of the spectaculars echoes into the wilderness of the night, and their cadence is the beat of a metallic and mechanical heart. This is the rhythm of the life you're assigned to on Broadway. There's nothing you can do about it. You challenge it with a whisper or a plea or a cry, and there's no one to hear it. Because Broadway's ears are tuned only to the throb of the mechanical heart. It's Broadway, my beat. It came at noon, a transcript of a phone conversation requesting the extraordinary pleasure of my presence at the apartment of one Dion Hartley, but urgently, but immediately. So I put my presence in a squad car, brought it to the apartment of Dion Hartley, and placed it therein. It was an experience. The apartment seemed to contain everything exquisite that had been fashioned or dreamed by men, all in crystal glass cases all tagged with little golden medallions, and all ruled over by Dion Hartley, but exquisitely. This excruciatingly lovely Grecian statuette, Mr. Clover, you want to know what it cost? No, not particularly. Of course you do. It cost me my most precious emotions, even a few pennies of my soul, if I had one. A devastating price to pay, Mr. Clover, for a lousy statue. If you say so. You're delightful, Mr. Clover. You want to know why I sent for you? Fatally, inevitably, you. Now I'm here, I might as well know. For a very simple reason. I am going to be murdered. Don't look at me that way, Mr. Clover. I'm quite, quite serious. Tell me about it. Look about you, Mr. Clover. My apartment, my possessions. All these reveal a man. Me, Dion Hutley. Satirist for the magazine satire. Revealing, no? Up to a point. Exactly. Only to a point. You would not know, for example, that I am abysmally weary of all this, that all these are only toys, that I have played with them, caressed them, and quite had my fill of them. Up to here. So? So I have gone on to playing with other things, more variable, more thrilling, more impassioned. You're out of my depth, Mr. Hartley. Like what things? Like human emotions, to be exact. An exquisite hobby, Mr. Clover. Humans and their emotions. I get my kicks that way. That's the kind of man Dion Hartley is, huh? That he has become. Mr. Clover, I have tuned a certain group of people up to such an emotional pitch that they have no recourse but to murder me, either individually or collectively. These lucky people, who are they? That's for you to discover, Mr. Clover. Wait a minute. You tell me you're going to be murdered. You know the people who might murder you. Still, you won't tell me who they are. I'm suddenly part of the hobby, huh, Mr. Hartley? Exactly. How discerning of you. But you'd better explain it to me anyway. It gives me profound pleasure. This is an exquisite game I have created, Mr. Clover. You are now a part of it. I have made these certain people want desperately to kill me. I shall now make you want to stop them from killing me. And what do you do during all this? Nothing. Precisely nothing. I have set marvelous passions in motion. It's like a play. And I am dying to know what happens at the final curtain. Does it interest you, policeman? No. I shall make it more interesting. A proposal, my policeman. If I am not murdered and lying in the blood of my death at the end of this week, say, I shall pay off with $50,000 to your favorite charity. Will you save my life, Mr. Clover? His fingers reached out and lingered on my lapel long enough to capture a piece of lint. Then they fell away. From him it was a gesture, a smirk. But it was something else. It was his way of making terror and pride a single emotion. Dion Hartley wasn't kidding. So it began, the inquiry as to why a man had to die violently. A man who dared me to stop his dying. Dion Hartley. Broadway knew him as a brittle sophisticate who wrote brittle bits for a six-bit magazine called Satire. 
I went there to the magazine's offices. They opened doors for me and supplied long cigarettes and short coffees until the editor could see me. Then the editor could see me. Sit down, please. Thanks. I'm Danny Clover. Shake, Danny Clover. I'm Sybil Raynard. I was just wondering that suit you're wearing. I like the way that fits across the shoulders. Who's your tailor? I bought it off the rack. Well, that's a twist I never thought of. Now, tell me why we're chatting. Because of Dion Hartley. You're his friend, I suppose. Then we shouldn't be chatting at all. We should be screaming at each other. You hate him, huh? How pulpy. I love him. It's just extraordinary what Dion can do to a person. Now, tell me why I'm answering you. I've got an interest in Hartley. He's afraid he might die. That would make you a doctor who I wouldn't talk to. An insurance agent who I'd have thrown out of here. A policeman who I wouldn't talk to, or... A friend of Dion's. A good friend. Oh. <laughs> you too? Well, you never know. Welcome, Danny Clover. People want to kill him. What people? Me. I'd want to kill him. I said I loved him. On odd days of the week, starting with Tuesday, I hate him. You can follow me around and see if I'd kill him. I could do that. However... There's Camden. Yes, there is. The one in New Jersey, you mean. How pulpy can you get? I mean Camden Drake. Camden the writer. The Greenwich Village Camden. Camden Drake will kill Dion someday. You want to make a wager? I could make you a fine, interesting wager, Danny Clover. <laughs> It was weird. It made no sense. A policeman tracking down a crime that hadn't been committed. A crime wanted and willed by a man who knew its shape was his own death by murder. And who had called in a policeman to prevent it, if the policeman could. Any setup as insane as that takes special handling. So I handled it in a special way. Sybil Raynard had given me the cue. She wouldn't talk to a policeman, she said. So I stopped being a policeman. I became just the good friend of the good Dion Hartley. And then Dion's other good friends talked to me. Camden Drake was no exception. Dion sent you to me? Yes, Camden. Dion said you and I'd have a lot to talk about. Dion is never wrong. Uh, you're a writer, he said. I write. That must be very interesting to write. Most of the time, it stinks. Huh. Dion said you have great talent. He said you were... Promising. Promising. That's funny. He never told me that. Oh? Is that the lot we have to talk about, Mr. Clover? No, I've heard other things about you. You have? Like what? Like if Dion should be killed, murdered would uh, be more exact. It would be you who murdered him. Ah, that makes for interesting talk. You don't want to know who told me that? Not especially. But that kind of talk could get back to Dion. It could even break up your friendship. Doesn't that bother you? No. And I'll tell you why, Mr. Clover. Because the friendship between Dion and me can't be destroyed by the ugly mouth of Sybil Raynard. You knew all the time, Camden. What's this, Camden? A manuscript you were working on? Yes, and put it down. You won't mind if I glance through it. Dion said... Put it down, I said. Put it down! Take it easy, Camden. It's not polite to slap friends. Friends of Dion. If you read a word of that manuscript, I'll kill you. It's that good. It's huh? only for Dion to see. Only for Dion! Do you hear me? Yeah, I hear you, Camden. Maybe Dion will never get to read it, because he'll be dead. Because maybe you'll kill him before you finish it. Is that why he sent you here? Because he thought I'd kill him? Maybe. Oh, he's so wrong. So wrong. He's got it mixed up, that's all. He should know it's Joan. It can only be Joan. Joan? He didn't tell you about her? About Joan York? No. Then I'm telling you. Go talk to her, Dion's friend. Ask her why she wants to kill him. I'll do that, Kent. Where do I find Joan? In Gramercy Park. 1712 Gramercy Park. Well, it's been a nice talk, Mr. Clover. Promise me you'll never come back. Yes, who is it? 
There was something about her, something like the promise a man makes to himself in some dark part of his life. And the promise had the name Joan York. Her dark hair clouded to her shoulders, and her eyes were soft. The planes of her face, her mouth. The promise had the name Joan York. Who is it, please? I'm Danny Clover, a friend of yours. Camden Drake said I might speak with you. Camden? Of course, Mr. Clover. Come in. Sit down, please. How is Camden? Why are you staring, Mr. Clover? Huh? Oh, he's all right. Why are you staring? Was I? I'm, I'm sorry. I don't want to be rude. I was busy. You were busy? At what? Illustrating, Mr. Clover. I do that for the magazine for satire. You wanted to speak with me? Uh, yes. We were talking, Camden and I, uh, about a man, about Dion Hartley, about Dion's manner of living, his manner of dying. That's when your name was mentioned. Who are you, Mr. Clover? Another of the charmed circle? A worshipper at the shrine of Hartley? Another of Dion's errand boys? It's a way of stating it. Go back to the great Dion, Mr. Clover. Go back and tell him you had your fingertips on my brain and you beguiled me with your charm. Miss York... Tell him you did all that and you finally learned that I wished that Dion Hartley were dead. I wished him dead, Mr. Clover. Tell him that. Why do you hate him so much? That's a searching question. I hate him because of what he does to people. To Camden Drake? To him. To others. But to him. I don't want Camden to disintegrate. To be a friend to Dion Hartley is to sow the seed of your own destruction. But you know that already. I know. Then you know the disenchantment that Hartley causes. Hartley sneers at the world and passes it on to all who touch him. That's death to a talent like Camden's. And you'd wish Hartley dead for that? I've already told you that, Mr. Clover. Take it back to your Mr. Hartley. Sit by his feet and look up at him, adoring, and tell him I said so. You'd better go now, Mr. Clover. Can I talk to you now, Danny? Oh, Danny. You've been sitting here for two hours now. Your face looks like it's all thumbs, Danny. You want something to tell him? Oh, you got a problem? Well, I am ready to receive it, Danny, and give you my utmost opinion on it. Try this. A man says he's going to be murdered and makes a game out of it. And three people in their own way have a motive for killing him. An editor, a writer, and... And, uh... uh... uh what, Danny? You never saw such a girl, to Hey, it ain't spring yet, Danny. Danny Clover speaking. This is Dion Hartley, Mr. Clover. Your charity has lost. What's the matter with you? You've lost the game, Mr. Clover. Mr. Hartley. Don't you see? I've been murdered. You are listening to Broadway's My Beat. Written by Morton Fine and David Friedkin. And starring Larry Thor as Detective Danny Clover. Money, music, fun, and action. Whatever you want, CBS has it for you this Saturday night. Money, 53000 in cash and prizes in Sing It Again's Phantom Voice Jackpot. Fun, a full measure with the Goldbergs, with Arthur Godfrey's Digest, with the campus kids of Young Love. Music. How can you beat that hour with Vaughn Monroe and Gene Autry? And action! You'll get it with Gangbusters. They're all heard every Saturday on most of these same CBS stations. So be listening. Broadway's a street that'll give you anything you want, any way you want it. All you have to do is set your mind to it and be looking in the right direction at the right time. If you look one way, Broadway's liable to wink at you and nod its head. But look another way, you're liable to get a newspaper shoved in your face. That's so you'll see the headline up close, Dion Hartley shot to death. Then you keep on investing in later editions to find out what juicy set of circumstances made Dion Hartley a murder victim. It was my job to gouge out the facts. 
At headquarters, Sergeant Gino Tartaglia summed it up tersely. Oh, we got a murder mystery on our hands, Danny. You think so, huh? Yeah. And you would have nothing to worry about if he was just Frisbee Novotny. Look, Tartaglia, I've got troubles enough. Huh? Well, what troubles? I haven't done this for a long time, Tartaglia. Pass myself off as something I'm not. Oh, that is the duty of a plainclothes detective, Danny. Yeah, but I don't like the circumstances. This one time, I feel like I'm lying by not telling people I'm an officer. It's a feeling I don't care for. But, Danny, like I said, this is your duty. I don't understand, Danny. What people in particular do you feel like you're lying to? To a murderess, maybe. A girl. A girl named Joan York. Huh? Sounds funny, huh? Danny, you shouldn't let certain things blind you to other certain things. Sure, sure. I'll wait till I'm a little older, huh? I guess it's like this. I've just got a strange idea. Joan York's got the best reason for killing Hartley. I hate the idea. I'll see you, Tartaglia. I'm going someplace where I can get the whole thing out of my mind. Joan. What is it? What do you want, Mr. Clover? I wanted to talk to someone whose wish came true. Mine came true. Dion is dead. Is that what you mean? That's part of it. And the rest? Tell me the rest, Mr. Clover. May I come in, Joan? I want you to. That music, it's... Lovely. Haunting. For you. Is it like that for you, Mr. Clover? Like that. But more like... Where's it coming from? man in the apartment across the air shaft. He's a student. He plays like that four hours a day. Four hours? To the minute. But we can't let it stop us, can we? We have to talk about Dion's murder, you and I. Why do you say that? Because that's why you came here to me. Because you were Dion's friend. Because you were Dion's friend, you want to know if I killed him. There could be another reason. Joan. Joan, listen to me. Why do you do that, Mr. Clover? Was I doing something? You're different today. The way you say my name, it's... It's gentle. Makes me want to run to you like a child. I I didn't mean... No, please don't be embarrassed. It's me. It's the way I talk. Words have no meaning unless they say what you mean. That makes it easier. You were right, Joan. I want to know if you killed Dion Hartley. I have to know. I have to. Listen to me, Joan. You wanted him dead. You had a motive. At least the police would call it motive. I hated Dion for destroying people, people I've loved. Is that motive for killing a man? Yes. A good one, don't you think, Mr. Clover? You tell me, Joan. I'll tell you. But not now. Not now. When? Later. Take me to dinner, Mr. Clover. The Casca. It's a little restaurant with music. Just down the street. Eight o'clock. Is that all right for you? Nine o'clock? I'll be there, John. Thank you, Mr. Clover. You're late, Mr. Clover. I was beginning to be afraid you wouldn't come. I'm sorry. I had some things to take care of. It doesn't matter. You're here. Hungry? Only to talk to someone. You. Are you hungry? No. Then we can just sit and talk. I've been thinking, Danny. What? What were you thinking? That we're very much alike, you and I. How, John? There's a kind of terrible loneliness in you. I know it. I... No, don't stop me. I know it's a loneliness... Because you couldn't understand so well all that's empty and lost and frightened in other people. I know nothing about you, Danny. How did you get so far along so fast? You're frightened, aren't you, Joan? No, not that. It's not the right word. Released. Free. Lonely. Are those the words? It depends. On what I may have done with my life? Or someone else's life? On that... Will you dance with me, Danny? I want to. (laughs) 
Could you kill Danny? What? A man like Dion Hartley. Could you have killed him? I don't know. I think you could have a man like that. Did you? Somewhere, somehow, he must have given you motive, too. No, I didn't kill him, John. I know you didn't. I just wanted you to consider it for a moment. The thought of killing Dion. It didn't revolt you, did it? Did it, Danny? Dance with me, Danny. Dance with me. Well, well, well. If it isn't Joan, girl, complete with nothing. Hello, Camden. Goodbye, Camden. Camden, please. Please. I like that when you say please to me, John. It's like the old golden days before Dion Hartley. Whatever it is, take it somewhere else, Camden. That cut it, didn't it, John? That shining thing we had, you and I. Dion loused it, didn't he? Didn't he, Joan? Yes. He made it rotten. He made it filthy. He made me want no part of you or of him. So you killed him, huh? You killed him! You killed the best thing that ever happened to me! You killed him! Take it easy, Camden. Take it easy. The people are... Take your hands off me! Take them off! Easy, kid. Easy. I told you! Maybe now you'll believe me. Yeah, yeah, that's twice now, Camden. I owe you something. Uh, Break it up, break it up. What do you two bums want, all right? Hey, What's hey, the matter, officer? You want something, officer? Keep away from me. But, but, but I... I said keep away. Okay, but it shall be as you wish. Are you coming quiet or do I use this stick on you? All right, that's better. Come on. Thanks, Patrol Nomeshikov. You did great. Look, look, I'm only a stupid ox, Danny, but I don't get it. You, I should arrest. Yeah, exactly that. I didn't want those people to know I was a cop. Oh. I want this to look legitimate. Call me a paddy wagon officer. I want to go to jail. Hey, Danny. Hey, Danny, wait for me. What is it, Tataglia? Well, word has it you got tangled up last night, Danny. Barroom brawl with a guy named Camden Drake. So? Well, I was just talking to Demchuk, the ambulance driver. He just brought in Camden Drake. Oh, no. Yeah, Danny. Shot. They found him in an alley off Bank Street in the village. I only kidded myself for a couple of hours longer. I told myself maybe Sybil Raynard, the editor of Satire. I told myself that and had her checked and found out she'd flown to Florida immediately after my interview with her and had been confined to her room with the flu since she got off the plane. Airtight. Then I stopped kidding myself. I set everything up with headquarters and walked to where I had to go. And all the way there, the streets were gutters. And where I walked, people looked away. Danny. Come in, Danny. So early, Danny. It's hardly noon. You mind, Joan? Oh, you know I don't. Sit down. All right. Joan. Wait a minute, Danny. I'll fix some coffee. No, don't. No? Joan. Joan, after I was arrested last night... I went right home. Is that what you were going to ask me? Yes. Camden Drake's dead, Joan. He was shot dead. I don't believe you. He's dead. But who... It doesn't matter much, does it, Joan? Does it? Look, Danny, I'll get... Wait, the door... Hiya, baby. Hiya, Johnny. Johnny, baby. Say, oh, Johnny, baby. Come here. Danny. Take your hand off. Hey, hey, who you shot? Who is this guy, Johnny? Outside. I said outside. Johnny. Danny. Danny, he's got a gun. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. Danny. Danny, what did you do? Don't worry about it, John. I'll get him out of here. But you, you've just... He's dead, isn't he? Get away from him, John. You don't have to look at him. Look, listen to me. I'll get him out of here. This doesn't have to concern you at all. You understand that, don't you? Where will you go, Danny? I've got some money. Europe, maybe. I don't know. Take me with you. What? Take me, Danny. I just killed a man, Joan. You don't deserve to share that. Danny. You just stay here. I'll get rid of him. Danny, I I killed Dion Hartley. Don't stare at me, Danny. Yes, I killed him. I think you knew that, didn't you, Danny? Now you know. Now it makes everything all right. You can take me with you, Danny. Both of us. Joan. Yes, and Camden Drake, too. I killed him, Danny. Now you can take me, Danny. Now we've got two awful secrets we can share. It's better. Why? Why did you do it, Joan? I had to. 
I thought I was in love. In love with Camden. Dion was squeezing Camden's soul. I killed him. And the boy. It was easy. You heard Camden. He didn't want me. Camden knew what I'd done and said he was going to the police. It didn't matter after that. After you... Didn't you know, John? No. No what? I'm a policeman, John. Danny. Get up, Markovan. You can get up now. Uh, yeah. Okay, Danny. Danny! Danny, no! No! Danny, you! No! No! Hi, Danny. Uh, nice morning, huh, Danny? I'd glad to run out and get you some coffee, uh, if you'd like some coffee. Danny. Danny? These things. I'm sorry, Danny. stretches out in front of you, this mirage called Broadway, this street that offers you dreams then laughs in your face, its crowd and cruelty, its sound and sorrow, its fury and a teardrop, its Broadway, the gaudiest, the most violent, the lonesomest mile in the world. Broadway, my beat. Broadway's My Beat stars Larry Thor as Detective Danny Clover with Charles Calvert as Tartaglia. The program was produced and directed by Elliot Lewis. The musical score was composed and conducted by Alexander Courage. The cast tonight included Anne Stone, Virginia Gregg, Elliot Reed, Ted Osborne, Bert Holland, and Jack Crucian. America has always been known as the melting pot of the world. All peoples of all races and color and religions living together within the boundaries of a free democracy. The melting process has been long and difficult, but as each year passes, it becomes much easier because part of the mixture now is tolerance, and tolerance can bind a nation together. Help America to always retain her democratic reputation through your tolerance. Accept or reject people on their individual worth and for no other reason than that. Joe Walter speaking. This is CBS, where you'll find Broadway is My Beat every Friday night. The Columbia Broadcasting System. Personal notice, danger's my stock and trade. If the job's too tough for you to handle, you got a job for me, George Valentine. Write full details. Greetings as always, Mr. Lover. Time for another Let George Do It adventure, which carries the intriguing title of The Treasure of Millie's War. Now, of course, you're wondering what exactly could be so valuable around that old jetty. 
but mark my words. There's a buck to be made. George Valentine will smell it out, even if he has to tie a sardine to it. Nothing ever happens in Millie's Wharf. At least not since my last husband died, and that was years ago. Nobody of any importance lives here anymore, but here we are, situated on the historical old bay of Ireland. Yesterday, when I was gone picking blueberries, my parrot, whose name is Cupid, and who steals things, and whose wings ain't clipped so he can fly, stole something. I don't know where he got it or how, but it's a map. Here in this place where the Spanish ships used to come, and on the map is a mark. But why would anyone put a mark at a place underwater? Yes, out behind one of the islands where it's easy two fathoms. On this map, there are arrows and directions and a great big red X. Shut up! Oh, a map, Mr. Valentine, and something underwater, and an X to mark the spot. You are listening to Let George Do It. Our adventure will continue in just a moment. Now back to Let George Do It and George Valentine. Well, but it's only a torn piece of notebook paper, the kind you buy in a five and ten. I know, I know. And the red is just pencil, just ordinary pencil. I know, I know, I know. I certainly don't see anything to get excited about in just a... <laughs> Mr. Valentine, why should anyone draw such a map? Well, to locate a shoal, maybe. You said it was shallow out there. Twenty or thirty feet, but no, no, maybe no, Maybe no. somebody wanted to remember a place to anchor. Hasn't been a ship in the bay bigger than a snipe since my second husband went to the bottom in a lumber scow. ha, ha, ha. Exciting, ain't it? <laughs> uh, now look, Millie, so your bird wanders around the wharf picking things up, so he gets a piece of paper with scratches and arrows. That... Azimuth readings, compass bearings, so whoever drew it could find the place marked X again. <sighs> oh, that's the way it looks, but... Now, Mr. Valentine, tell me, why would anyone draw such a map, huh? So maybe somebody was out fishing and lost his wristwatch and wanted to mark the place, that's all. Just because there's a lot of legends about this bay. There are ships sunk here, lots of ships. Miss Brooks, now, when Henry Morgan sacked the city of Panama in the year 1600-something, there were Spanish ships that fled to the north, and lots of them, big galleons, was just simply loaded down to the hey, gunnels Hey, with... Millie, look, I've heard how the suckers used to come flocking to this place looking for buried treasure. And so did you, didn't you? The minute I wrote the letter... Just cause I need the help of a red-blooded man who... I come... came here to tell you not to spend time and money trying to get in on whatever somebody else has already found. There, now. You said it yourself. Somebody's found something. That's what the X is. Somebody's found something and marked the place so they could come back. But we're going to beat them to it, you and me, Mr. Valentine. What? It's fine as keepers, ain't it? So here's what you do. Now, there's a long drink of water, owns a little store and hotel down the road. Now, his name's Uriah Jenks, and he's about as wide awake as a bonnacle. But he owns a little rowboat, you see? Only one around here, and he never uses it. But you're going to borrow that boat, and oh, we're hey, just going Oh, hey, wait a minute, wait a minute. Slow down, Millie. Huh? You mean you expect me to row all the way out just to take a look at that place marked X on the silly piece of paper? Oh, you row fast, cause now I'll show the bird, the parrot. Come on in here. You what? Been bandaged and put in a cage ever since I come home and found him last night. Oh, yes, I had to. My poor little Cupid who stole the map. <coughs> Only look at him, Mr. Valentine, at his wing. Now, you're not going to tell me that X isn't exciting and important when the same day he was innocently stealing the map, my poor little bird got a hole in his feathers. Yes, somebody shot a Cupid with a gun. <coughs> How about leaks, Mr. Valentine? But it's been used lately, Mr. Jenks. I know Leaks that... like a sieve. Man practically drowned. What man? When was this? Man you... who used it, naturally. Wouldn't be anybody else. All right, but would you tell now, me... Now, my advice to you is to stay away from that Millie woman, her and that nuisance bird. 
Good advice for any man. But, Mr. Jenks, we want to know who it was. Man, but... that's all. Man who... Oh, go on. Let's hear some more. Just rented it for the day. Come in the night before... But where did he take the boat? I mean, George, he might have been the one who went out and he drew that... He bought some red pencils. I know that much. Uh-huh. That's him, all right. Now, look, what's his name? Come in night before. Yes, sir. Windy night it was. I remember that. Just a man. Short he was. Stucky. Just sort of there he was at the door, middle of the night. But but didn't you ask him anything about Spent himself? Spent the or... next day out in the boat. That's all I know. Oh, brother. First it's apparent with a map, and now it's a mysterious stranger in the middle of the night. Leave well enough alone, I say. What's mysterious? The man's name was Laver, Dr. Laver. You know how I found that out? He signed my register. See? Emil Laver. And you know where he is now? On his way to catch a bus out of town. Why should you interfere? Nothing to get excited about. Forget him. Forget the whole thing. Well, this must be where the bus driver met, Angel. Yes. There's the water tower over there. Where he dropped labor off, 12 miles from town. Only there's nothing out here, George, just sand dunes. This and... part of the shore is closer to the little islands, though. Sure, look, here's the tracks where the bus stopped. And the tracks of a man, George. Huh? Dr. Labor. Come on, they cut across the sand. Well, at least he doesn't have a wooden leg, does he? <laughs> but I bet he has a patch over his eye or Brooksy, a bandana. Brooksy, there's a perfectly logical explanation for all this Robert Louis Stevenson stuff. That's why I want to find Laver before I go galloping out after an ex. What is it? This logical... I don't know. I'll ask him. Up. George, there's the water. Yeah. And his footsteps. So you're going to ask him, huh? They just... Just walk right out into the ocean. Oh, now, wait a minute. They can't just... Hey, Brooksy, look. Hmm? Up the beach there, see? Man. Yeah, and they're working at something. Hey, stay here, would you? But, George... Hey, where are you going? Well... Hello there, friend. Sure, sure, I'm everybody's friend. Where are you going? Oh, just out for a walk, Skipper. What's it to you? <laughs> when a man is bigger than you oh, are... Oh, off that. I was looking for a guy named Dr. Laver. Hmm? Look someplace else. Why? You're off a ship, aren't you? Laver's tracks go down to the water there. Well, who picked him up in a small rowboat? You? Oh, now, look, friend, don't be so smart. Just go now away. Now you got a crew of men working up the beach. Yes, 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 of course I picked him up several hours ago. So what? Now he's out on my ship, and those men are loading water for my ship. Isn't that exciting? Well, it might be. And it might not. Goodbye. Might even be worth shooting a hole in a parrot. What? Tell me, is your friend Labor the kind of guy who draws maps? Does he go around putting X's on... I told you when a man is bigger oh, than... Oh, get off it, Buster. My friend, it's too bad you're so curious. George, look out! Now, wait a minute. But they just went off and left you, George. And you wouldn't wake up. They loaded water tanks into a boat and headed out for their ship. Wherever that might be. Around this next island, lady. Yeah, yeah, sure, Mac. Hey, can't you crank a little more speed out of this outboard? I'm gonna do all right. Turn in just a second. Daylight now. George, it's crazy to go banging right back out I'm here. I'm all when right, you... Brooksy. I tell you, I'm fine. I just slept through a couple of reels, and I want to catch up with that captain. But why? He's still bigger than you, and nothing has actually happened that you know he's mixed up in. Well, anything. maybe I just want to see that X underwater. Sing the ship as soon as we get out of the line of those trees. How do you know how exactly where this boat's anchored? Because well, I come out during the night, that's why. The night? What? Yeah, I'll hire for anybody, mister. Millie and that sleepy fella Jenks over Millie's Wharf. Well, what did you think I was doing over there with my outboard anyway? They gave me a call. I brought them both out here and then left him. Brother, I did miss a lot, didn't I? Half the feature. There it is, George. Yeah, that's her. Nice tub, ain't it? Yeah, and with practically everybody on board now, huh? Say, what's all that funny rig, you know? Oh, not sure. Diving, I think. Diving? Oh, I don't mean real deep sea stuff. But there's lines running down there, see? And, uh, well, that's a pump on deck. George, 
So it is a treasure yeah, hey, hunt. Hey, look, somebody's been below just now, just coming up. Look, a skinny guy in a helmet, see? Yeah. I wonder what he found down there. I wonder what the X really is. Look! Look! I found it! It's there! Emil, where are you? Leva! Hey, hey, wait a minute, friend. Oh, oh, of course. Of course. So glad to have you aboard, Mr. Valentine. Oh, excuse my trunks, Miss Brooks, but you see when I'm diving. Let's see what you found, Professor Schmidt. That's what interests me. Yes, our last trip we should get it. Down amongst those rocks, I knew we would. They're dangerous. They're so big. Look. You see? George, look what he was diving for. A a lobster. Oh, no, 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 Miss Brooks. No, not just a lobster, a type of crayfish. Yes, certainly, but... Up and down this coast we have chased, looking but never finding this exact specimen. You mean that's what you're here for, crayfish? Hey, what did you get? Look, look at him, Emil. Isn't he a beauty? (laughs) Oh, I'm sorry, permit me. Uh, Dr. Emil Laver, Miss Brooks, Mr. Valentine. Emil is the other half of our little expedition. Expedition? Yes, he's the marine botanist. Uh, crustaceans are my specialty. Harry, I think Mr. Valentine had a little different idea about our mysterious presence. Huh? <laughs> yeah, I've talked to that old harpy, that Millie. That... Oh, oh, yes, yes, that nonsense. Look, I know. Oh, but now see here, Emil, I found another one of those. What? Mm-hmm. I haven't scraped the stuff off. Now, wait a minute, there. M, L... Hey, wait a minute. Well, anyway, it's the year 1600-something. It's a coin. Yes. Rather interesting, isn't it? Minted by the Spanish, I should say. I think it's called a doubloon. Oh, now, wait. Let's get this straight. You guys are a scientific outfit, but you turn up Spanish coins. You make a map with an X on it. Now, tell... Valentine, please, please, there's an explanation And the captain of your boat takes a poke at me. Let's get him in on this explaining, too. Of course. Be patient. I suppose he's one of the eager beavers who jumped to the rail the minute that word doubloon came out. He's somewhere, perhaps in his cabin. George! George! There's the captain. There's enough light so that you can see now. X marks the spot, all right. What? In the helmet. See, the helmet underwater. He's down there, George, down on the bottom, only... Only the way his arms are moving, he looks more like he's dead. Listening to Let George Do It. Our adventure will continue in just a moment. And now back to George Valentine. You go to the town of Millie's Wharf. You meet a parrot that someone shot at. You meet a woman who is all excited over the idea of Spanish treasure and sunken galleons. You meet two scientists who seem to be a good deal more interested in the discovery of a new type of lobster. But if your name is George Valentine, the one person you met whom you'd like to meet again is the captain of the scientist's ship, the man who knocked you out and left you on the beach hours ago. Only now, in the water below you, the captain has just been found. He's wearing a diving helmet, but from his appearance, he's dead. Grab these lines, pull him up. Hurry now, get that winch going. (laughs) Oh, for heaven's sake, get that bird out of here. Don't you touch too, buddy. She's not doing anything, Mr. Schmidt. Nothing much we can do, Mr. Valentine. Oh, yes, there is, Labor. Come here, lady. I'm just watching, that's all. We're keeping air in this air hole. Now, let go of why me. Why did you come out here, you and that bird of yours? But you just up and disappeared. And then Mr. Jenks said he'd seen this ship from driving up on the hill. So the two of you hired a boat and came out, huh? Well, I've just been sitting here waiting for daylight. Sure, so you could see what they were diving for. No, 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 keep the air going. You may just be in trouble. No, I already knew about the money. The Spanish treasure. Here, you see? After you'd gone, I got looking around, and Cupid had brought it back, and it was hidden in here, the... Here, here, please. May I... You don't have to tell me. It's one of them pieces of eight. Cupid's stealing things again, huh? And that's why I'm here, and I'm going to stay, until every last penny of it's brought aboard. I'll have you know my third husband owned a lot of property around this bay, 
And if I haven't got some legal rights to own a ship, okay, then I okay. might as well... Okay, okay, join the gold rush, then. Hold hands with your friend, Jinx. With what? That's far as sleepy Oh, Oh, Skipper, will you any luck, Schmidt? Well, the winch won't pull his line up, Mr. Valentine. The current seems to have snagged one of those lines. Yeah, you could swing the boat around, Professor. Might be able to get a better pull from the other side. Let's tie it, Harry. Oh, try anything. Only step on it, will you? Get that guy up. So strange. He never liked to dive. He laughed at us for doing it. He was lazy. Just a hired captain. When we could pay him. He wasn't so lazy when he hit me. He'd already heard about that first doubloon, hadn't he? I guess so. Professor Schmidt found it last evening. We joked about it. it meant nothing to us. Curious. But it would drive a guy like the captain crazy. Look, didn't anybody know he was down there? That's so early before dawn. He was eager, I guess. The pumps are automatic. You just take a helmet and go over the side. Why did you draw that map, Dr. Laver? What? You did draw that map, didn't you? Oh, that. <laughs> of course. I, I draw them all, 50 or 60 this summer. Here, I could show you. Never mind, never mind. Just show it. Oh, well, sometimes I go ahead of the others. Sort of reconnaissance from our last place up the coast. I came down to this Millie's Wharf. I hired a boat. I found this place. It looked good. That map had nothing to do with well. Were these coins that drifted into the same place, huh? Well, there's no ship sunk there. I know that. But, yes, things drift on the floor of the sea, perhaps. Well, it's all the way around now, sir. Those lines are foul. That's why we can't pull them up. Hold it, Dr. Lever. Down on those rocks. You see them? I've had that same trouble Now, myself. what's the matter, Professor? Oh, I'm going down now myself. His ropes are all tangled. Uh, no, you were just down, Harry. Uh, I'll take a helmet. Well, there are two of them. That's right. You sit still, Professor Schmidt. Hmm? Come on, Lever. I'll help you get the captain. Well, it's easy enough, but if you're not experienced... Come on, let's do a little diving. George, can you hear me all right? Yeah, yeah, sure. Feels a little silly being lowered like this. These weights on the sandals. Well, the professor didn't want you to just climb down, but it's only 35 feet or so, he says. I know. For me, it looks like 70 Boy, it's sure getting darker. Can you see him yet, George? Yeah. I'm dragging these lines. It's a little hard. Well, don't get them tangled on the rocks like he did. Now, just take it easy, folks. This is so shallow, you can kick the gear off and swim up. The captain couldn't do it, could he? What? I didn't say anything. Oh, no, wait a minute. Uh, George, on the other phone. Dr. Labor says there's nothing wrong with the captain's lines. Looks more like he fell, and then they got tangled. Yeah, I know. Laver's right beside me. He's pointing. Yeah, I can see. I think he's right, Angel. George, you get there already? George? Captain's dead all right, Brooksy. Oh. I don't know what could have gone wrong. The air is still pumping into his helmet, but it's all crooked. Water got in, too. You mean he drowned? Yeah, I guess so. Nothing else wrong with him, though. Looks more like he fell, and that knocked his helmet cockeyed. Only I don't know how a man could fall underwater. It's all slow motion. Unless he was... Unless... Hey, Brooksy. Brooksy. Hey. What? What in the name? Get that cigarette away from there, Mr. Jenks. I didn't do anything. Well, it's all right, George. Oh. It was the air intake, but it's all right. Yeah. Oh, brother... Cigarette near the air intake, huh? Yeah, I heard, Schmidt. I was going to say a second ago, I guess that's how it was done. What? How the captain was murdered, Angel. Yeah, you heard me murdered. Only we'd never be able to prove it. Hey, listen. There's a pouch thing on the captain's belt. Yeah, yeah, Labor, I see him. One, two, three. The captain was down here collecting them all right. Eleven. Eleven more Spanish doubloons. Brooksy. Brooksy! Nothing to get excited about, Mr. Valentine. Huh? Jinx. Hey, where'd she go? Put her on. Man should stay in his element, though. Good advice. Hey, look, Buster. That's where you're staying. Below, I mean. Hope it don't get too cold for a while, Mr. Valentine. Put that 
gun down. Put it down, I said. For heaven's sake, Mr. Jenks. Never mind, Professor. It won't go off. You liar, Jenks. I'm warning you. Won't go off unless you open your mouth, Millie. Close it. You worm-turning chiseler. You've got no more right to the treasure. Millie, I warned you. Any more of your chatter and you'll have powder burns like that pesky bird of yours did. And if you don't shut him up, I'll get my aim better and hit him. So you're the one. You shot at him. You liar, Jenks. Stop it. Stop it. Both of you. That's what I say, miss. Words are a waste of thought. Can you hear me down there? Hello? Of course, yeah. Uh, Harry, what's Applies going on up there? to you, too. Just listen. We got a treasure now. A few piddling coins. We've stumbled into something that may turn out to be bigger than Fort Knox. And all I want's an agreement. Fair and square. Now's the time to make it. Now, isn't that reasonable, Mr. Valentine? Well? George? Valentine? Here, give me that phone. Valentine! On the surface. Hey, throw me a line, will you? Hurry up. No, no, here, I've got you. What, what happened? Oh, you got out of your helmet. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, yeah, it's like being thrown out of a jack-in-the-box, Angel. No, I'm okay. Well, hello, everybody. Oh, George, this crazy Mr. Jenks, he shot you with Mr. Valentine. He admitted it. All right, all right, he's got a gun. Leave him alone. George! Sure, just hold it steady, friend, that's all. You know, I kind of like you, Jenks. You give me ideas. Well, if that ain't... So you the... shot at the bird, huh? Nothing to be ashamed of in that. Piss stole that coin and the map from the rowboat the other day. Seen him do it. You got the fever bad, haven't you? Mr. Valentine, labor is still down there. Yeah, he's all right. On the phone, isn't he? Mm. Professor, how'd you guys get along with the captain? Somebody said you didn't pay him very often or something. Oh, no, no. He, uh... Oh, well, we did owe him money. He was trying to get possession of the boat, but really... I that... met the guy, not very pleasant, I can imagine. Here, let me have that phone. Well, it doesn't have anything to do That's with... That's not what... your idea, is it, Labor? Labor, can you hear me? Of course. I will come back up to deck. And... A helmet, a couple of lines, and a phone. Be almost impossible for a naval-bodied man to get in trouble down there. And he could always get out the way I did. Unless his lines were really tangled, which the captains weren't. Here, let me have that cigarette. George, you said the air If you're smoking, it's easy to make a man cough down there. Like this. Hey, what what is it? Oh, I'm sorry, Doctor. I'm coming on deck. Oh, now there, there, that's better. But a cigarette isn't enough to kill a man, even if he choked and had trouble with his helmet. You have to stand up in one of those helmets, though, don't you? To really keep the water out. I'm coming up. You're not coming up. Not even the way I did. What? I was dragging the lines for both of us, remember? For the time being, you're with the fish, Buster. I tied your lines. You're crazy. I want to try a lot of things in front of this air intake. Maybe I can tell by the way you act what you used on the captain. Was it formaldehyde? Gasoline? Ether? Valentine, what do you think you're trying... That's how you killed him, wasn't it? How you made him pass out down there so he'd fall and drown? (laughs) Fairly shiny coins, too, aren't they? Where'd you get them, a museum? What are you talking about? Well, a man couldn't dive down that deep from a rowboat and get a coin, could he? So where did the parrot steal that coin of his along with a map? Oh, and he's been bandaged ever since that day, so he couldn't have wandered around to steal it since then. Valentine, please let me... So if you had a coin that day, you didn't get it from the bottom of the ocean. You brought it here. You brought all of them here. Sure, and the map makes more sense that way anyway. You draw a map when you bury treasure, not when you dig it up. I always drew them. I told you I located the... Skip it. You saw to the ocean like you saw the fraudulent mine. And why? To get that loud-talking captain who'd never do any diving himself down there. To sucker him into a spot where you could commit a perfect murder. I didn't. <coughs> take that away from the antique. Buster, you started a fake treasure hunt. But too many people got excited over Spanish doubloons. That's what trapped you. Take it away. I can't breathe right when you... <laughs> Keep talking, friend. We'll be down to get you in a minute. But we'll haul up a confession first. Back to the conclusion of our Let George Do It adventure in just a moment. No, Angel. There was no gold in that bay. Labor admitted it when he wrote his confession. 
Stole 13 doubloons from the collection up north. Well, did he ever explain why he killed the captain, George? Well, he hated the guy. The captain did have a lean on the boat. Was going to take it away from the hard-working scientists. And I guess that's all they ever lived for, puttering around on the bottom of the ocean. But Professor Schmidt didn't have anything to do with it. No. George, wait a minute. Hmm? You said the confession said 13 coins. Yeah. But as I remember, when we added them up, there were 14. So? Now, listen. I mean, there really were Spanish ships in this bay, and... Well, where did the extra coin come from? Aren't you curious at all? Uh, uh, definitely. I'm... Oh, for... Oh, hey, say something, cute, but not just X, X, X. What a... Shut up, you skinny copper! I really <laughs> You have just heard The Treasure of Millie's Wharf, another Let George Do It adventure. Robert Bailey was starred as George Valentine, with Virginia Gregg as Brooksy. David Victor and Jackson Gillis wrote the story, with music by Eddie Dunstetter. Now this is yours truly, inviting you to another visit with Valentine, when you will again hear what happens when you let George do it. Personal notice, dangers my stock and trade. If the job's too tough for you to handle, you got a job for me, George Valentine. Write full details. Greetings once again, mystery lover. Time for another Let George Do It adventure. This particular yarn puts murder on a very high plane. It's called, Is Everybody Happy? And it chiefly concerns a rich old codger named Lorenzo, who had a fetish for constantly quoting Mr. Ted Lewis's hallmark. Namely, Is Everybody Happy? Now, of course, you know that nobody was. But why this condition existed is not for me to tell, but for you to find out. Is everybody frustrated? Madame Estefani. How's that, Professor? <laughs> Where I come from, we say, come and get it. Ha! Ah. Different, huh? <laughs> That's very good, Lorenzo. So, I'm learning. Put that in your pipe and smoke it, huh? How would that go in your pipe, Dr. Merkel? Hey, hey, what's that? Uh, no, 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 thank you. Uh, no soup for me. <laughs> uh. Listen to that. Still upstairs with his test tubes. Me, if I am ignorant. I could only invent a rose bush. Make a million bucks and smoke cigar. <laughs> oh, I, I'm sorry. I'm sorry, Lorenzo. What there was once say? was a doctor of sight. His mind, there was nothing like. More absent than present. Stop but... it, stop it, you answer and be quiet. Uh, pipe. pipe. I, I think you said something. Never about mind. Oh. Is everybody happy? Now is everybody happy? Well... That's the way you feel. I go back to my garden. No, uh, uh, no, no, of course we are, Lorenzo. You just ask it so many times, that's all. I know, I know, excuse me. But there never was a place like this, was there? There never was oh, I'm such... I'm only kidding, Lorenzo. <laughs> it's the house of Lorenzo the Great. No, 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 per favore. I only want you all to be happy. Besides, aren't we going to wait for that brother-in-law of yours? Uh, Ed? Uh, no, no, he is unimportant. He is not scholars like you are. Fred is nothing. We'll not wait for Fred. Forget him. Hmm. Whatever you say. So, there you are, Lorenzo. Everybody's happy. Eh? Hmm? Let's eat. No, no. Oh, wait. Professor Amy. Uh, 
What? <laughs> I should have noticed. I rang for dinner before she finished reading her letter. <laughs> now, what kind of a letter do you suppose a professor of romance language Oh, no, would... no, it's nothing like that. Well, she blushes. I mean, I mean, it, it's just one I was writing. So to her. she writes to someone. It gets better and better into every life. A little, oh, a little. Please, please, all of you. It's no one you know. I mean, it's just a man named George Valentine. Now, please. Everybody's happy. Let's eat. You are listening to Let George Do It. Our adventure will continue in just a moment. Now back to Let George Do It. And George Valentine. A little dark, you can't see much. It's certainly a beautiful place, isn't it? The House of Lorenzo. It's going to be one of the most unusual places in the world. I think Lorenzo must be one of the greatest men who ever lived. Well, he made one of the greatest piles of money. Oh, Mr. Valentine. I don't mean on account of that. But it is on account of that, isn't it? There are three of us here so far. Dr. Merkel, he's a research psychologist. Lorenzo's going to build him a laboratory later on. Then there's Mr. Hanson. He's a poet. A good one. And he used to have to work in an accounting office to earn a living. So you can imagine how much poetry he got written. Mm-hmm. How about yourself? Well, I taught romance languages. But translation is always what I wanted to do. I'm working on Francois Billon now. Everybody gets a chance to do what they want. Well, not quite everybody, Miss Brooks. Lorenzo is being very choosy about his gifts. But I guess eventually there'll be 30 or 40 here. <laughs> Sort of a one-man Guggenheim Foundation, huh? In a way. Lorenzo says that he always had to work so hard that, except for his roses, he never had a chance to do anything he wanted. So now he's giving all of you a chance. <laughs> oh, he's a little eccentric, maybe. Is everybody happy, he always says. I know people laugh about that slogan he stole from Ted Lewis. But then, why do you want me here? Suppose Lorenzo would permanently endow me with a fresh mystery case every week? He might. <laughs> I'm sorry. I was trying to be funny. What is it you're afraid of? Fred. Who? Fred Jeffries. He's one of those horn-rimmed sort of men. He's a lawyer and Lorenzo's brother-in-law. Uh -huh. Go on. Well, he's been here a week now, from back east where the company is. He... He thinks Lorenzo is crazy. Oh, oh I see. Yeah, I'm beginning to get it. Voice of reality, huh? And you're afraid he'll persuade Santa Claus to go back to the North Pole. Well, Lorenzo has a great deal of money. How he chooses to use it is... Well, I mean, it, it could cause unhappiness as well as happiness. Oh, now, please, don't stack the cards for me on who's right and who's wrong. I'm right, Mr. Valentine. I'll prove it to you. <laughs> Crazy, he said. Crazy. Yeah, that's just what he said. Dr. Merkel. You see, this Fred Jeffries came here, uh, oh, uh, maybe a week ago. The same day Nolan left. Who left? Dr. Nolan. A loafer. No good. Electronics man of some sort. But a, a, a putterer. And really not so much of an authority. Remember, I told you how careful Lorenzo is in picking his people to stay. Look, both of you, please. Yes, yes, we were the lucky ones. We stay. Well, you stay unless Fred interferes and blows the whole idea up, Right. Persuades Lorenzo not to sink his whole fortune into this place? I am a skeptic, too, Mr. Valentine. You have thought we are prejudiced, that we would persuade Lorenzo to endow us with his money, eh? <laughs> of course we do. But we don't persuade with talk of court orders. Uh, just what do you mean? I was trying to tell you. When Nolan left, an M.D. moved in. Fred brought him. His job was to see if Lorenzo couldn't be committed to an asylum. Well, 
be one way to keep him from giving his money away, wouldn't it? Obviously, he found Lorenzo was no more irresponsible than... And besides, uh, you scared the doctor away, I suppose. Eh? Well, you have quite an imposing list of degrees. (laughs) Yes, I did introduce myself. The doctor left. I think he agreed with me that Lorenzo could never be judged insane. He persuaded Fred not to bother calling any experts... Well, kind of a nasty way to try and stop Lorenzo's little project, but... Oh, why don't you believe me, Mr. Valentine? This Fred wouldn't stop at anything. Well, what does Lorenzo have to say about it? He's not the kind of man to talk about such things. And we are. And that makes us nasty and suspicious, I suppose. Oh, Professor Ridd. But I don't care. Sometimes a woman can tell things that a man has no idea. No, 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 Amy. We're dealing with a man. So we'll stick to the facts. Uh, Here. (laughs) Uh, Sorry my place is such a mess. Little too much equipment for such a small room. But uh, here on the desk, I have a letter from that doctor I spoke of. Uh, just in case you doubt what I've said. Oh, I don't doubt it. I just don't see what it amounts to. Uh, switch on the lamp there, Amy. Of course. Hey. Huh? What happened? Lights, lights, that's all. Blue fuse. I've known there was too much drain on the power. Now, just stand still, everyone. I'll run down. Yeah. It wasn't all that happened. It sounded like a shot. Oh, the light. Hurry, get the... Skipper, will you? That was a shot. It was outside. Come on. It sounded to me like it was in this direction. Nobody there, Angel. Lorenzo! Lorenzo! Oh, no. No, he's not in the Rose Arbor. That's where he always sits, but he hasn't come out yet, I guess. Roses are so thick a man could be hiding. Not in roses, Angel, not in those thorns. Besides, I just looked down those paths. Oh, maybe we were wrong. There's certainly nobody out here now. Hey, hey there. Dr. Merkel. <laughs> I fixed the lights. Lorenzo was mad because he spilled his cigar ashes into oh, his brandy. He's all right. Of course. Oh. And he didn't hear anything. Everybody is happy. You know, Fred has been doing some shooting. Almost every day he goes out into the woods and... What's the matter, Mr. Valentine? Do you think our imaginations are running away with us, too? Uh, Professor, let me make a couple of phone calls, will you? And then let me meet this ogre, Fred. So, you've made inquiries about me. Then I don't blame you. If you've been talking to the inmates of this squirrel cage for retired nuts... Now, just take it easy, Mr. Jeffries. I only wanted to get it straight who you were. Vice President, lawyer, nurse me to an old goat. That's what I am. Yeah, yeah, I know. And in between, you do uh, some shooting. Yeah. Smell that. Mm. Has this gun been fired in the last few hours? I work off steam shooting at squirrels, Mr. Valentine. But scarcely at night. Okay, okay. But I know what you mean. I heard that myself. Backfire, I guess. At least I ran out back and then around front and didn't see anybody. All right, all right, Skipper. No, I... I don't think I will. You know I tried to railroad Lorenzo into a booby hatch. That's what you really checked on? Sure, why not? And I find you did, but it didn't work. Correct. Mr. Valentine, I'm a practical man. To me, it's beside the point whether this throw-your-money-away stunt of Lorenzo's is good or bad. I have to fight it to protect the estate's interest. I'll try anything, but I'm not given to hysteria. Would you mind clearing that up? Now, sit down. Sit down, please. Lorenzo endows these people for life. Hasn't their interest in it occurred to you? Hasn't it... Uh, that was a shot. Out back, I'm sure it was. Come on. Rose Arbor. Amy, what in the name of... Oh, I was there with him. I couldn't see who it was. I couldn't see anything. Just somebody in the dark. Amy, Amy, stop that. Get a hold of yourself. Lorenzo. Yeah. He's dead. Shot to death. Single bullet, Brooksy. Big caliber, I guess. There was a gun flash, but I don't know where it was. Lorenzo was just about to sit down in that big marble chair, 
I was walking behind Professor, him. Professor, couldn't you see anybody? Or... Oh, I couldn't see anything. Whoever it was got away oh, before think, I... think, will you, Amy? Try to remember, but please. it startled me so that I, I couldn't notice anything. But somebody must have been standing over here by the entrance to the arbor someplace. Yes. The way Lorenzo's allowed these precious roses of his to grow over, well, a man could run down any one of these... Get away from there! Get away! What? Well, there might be footprints, mightn't there? Well, I... I don't see any. Have you searched him, Mr. Valentine? Search him quickly before he can get rid of the gun. Professor! He's been causing trouble for Lorenzo ever since he got here. Oh, Amy, stop it. I think you'd better know now that at the time of Lorenzo's death, Fred was with me. What? No. No! I don't believe Now, get hold of yourself, please. I've got work to do. I'll take her inside. Yeah, that's a good idea. Oh, Lorenzo was such a wonderful man. Do I call the police, George? No. No, I'll be inside and do it myself. Amy doesn't like you much, does she? No. Well, okay, I want to ask you a question, Fred. About Lorenzo's endowing these people for life, what people did you mean? Amy, the female professor, Dr. Merkel, Mr. Hanson... But there would have been others as time went on, a good many others. But if you've been able to make him change his mind, then what? Well, it's his money. Lorenzo could have changed their trust set up, taken it away from them again, and... Oh, but now he can't. That's what you're driving at. Uh-huh. Now you're not a menace anymore, at least to these three. Yes, with Lorenzo dead, their interest has been protected. Yeah, yeah. We have three very fine suspects for murder. You are listening to Let George Do It. Our adventure will continue in just a moment. Everybody happy. Those were the favorite words of Lorenzo. Lorenzo the Great. At least in the eyes of the few people to whose research he was devoting his money. Of course, to his brother-in-law, Fred, the man nobody likes, he was Lorenzo the Foolish. But if your name is George Valentine, he's just Lorenzo the Dead. And there are three very fine suspects for his murder. Yeah, that's right, Sheriff. And step on it, would you please? Hmm? Yeah, thanks. We have rather good police around here, I believe. Oh, you've done business with them before, Mr. Hanson, huh? Don't be ridiculous. <laughs> you still don't believe that I didn't hear that shot? I don't know. But I was in my rooms here. You can't hear anything from that distance. You were alone? Well, of course. A person doesn't write poetry in tandem, you know. Oh, never mind the sarcasm. I, I can't help it, Mr. Valentine. I'm very sorry that he's dead. Is everybody happy? You know, to Lorenzo, that was more than Ted Lewis's famous phrase. He actually believed we were happy. Oh, what do you mean by that? Well, people like us all want to do something, the opportunity to do it. He gave us the opportunity. And as I understand, now you'll all have it for life. Hmm. That's the ironic part. I've been here three months now, and it's no good, you know. It doesn't work out. Look, you don't make sense. Well, the routine, over and over, every evening, just the same. Merkel out puttering around, me in my room, Amy in hers. Lorenzo in his big marble chair where he could admire his roses. Oh. This is called being happy. Mr. Valentine, all I mean is that Lorenzo was a well-intentioned old fool. I was happier when I worked as an accountant and only had a very little time to write my portrait. Okay, okay. It's a good sales talk anyway. That's the truth. Where does this fall lead? The front part of the house. Why? Well, Mr. Hanson, if you're not even interested in Lorenzo's money, then I ought to be looking for his murderer someplace else. That's supposed to be your brand of sarcasm. I'm going to hold it. Well, there's no one in there. It was Dr. Nolan's suite when he was here. Valentine. Nobody in there, huh? You startled me, Valentine. I... Fred, the villain of the piece. Oh, shut up. As a matter of fact, Nolan hated Lorenzo, you know. And there's nothing that says someone from the outside couldn't be the person you're looking for. No, there isn't. Uh, 
But, Fred, what were you doing? Looking for Merkel, Valentine. I, I can't find him. Merkel? Well, he's always deep in his work at this time of night. His room's right here. He's not in there. I already looked. I'll try the other side of the house, Valentine. Yeah, but wait a minute. Listen. The door closed downstairs. I'll see you later. <laughs> Oh, it's you, Brooksy. Oh, yes. You came out just a minute ago. Amy's all right now. I saw a light and I thought it was you. Light? What light? Oh, I don't know now. He's out by the rose arbor. Out by the Come on. There was a man. I'm sure there was. I could see his shadow running around the other way out toward the front. What? From the arbor in here? That's where the light was. Matches or a cigarette light? Wait, wait. Let me have yours. Lorenzo's body hasn't been touched. George, look. Somebody's been trampling around over there where the roses are so thick. Yeah. Look closer, Angel. Right on the table here by Lorenzo's chair. The pocket flashlight. Oh, it's mirror. Pieces of wire. Copper wire. Why wouldn't he take these things with him? Real tricky mirror, too. See? See here. Steel frame to hold it in place. I mean, what place? L. M. Hmm? The pocket flashlight initial. Leon Merkel. Yes. He was the one I saw. Sure, sure. This makes sense, all right. Careful. I almost fell over him myself. Dr. Merkel, oh no. Blood on his head. Here, help me. He's dead. No? No, he's breathing, George. What? Just barely. That brick there. Somebody hit him with that brick. See the blood on it? Let's lift him. Get him back in the house. No, no, don't touch him. Brooksy, stay here with him. Valentine, are you crazy? Whoever did this is right around us somewhere, right here on the dock. Leave her. She'll be all right. The sheriff's car will come up that driveway in about one second. The sheriff's car is turning in now, George. But the murderer. Back to the rose arbor, Fred. Step on it. I'll get the murderer, all right. I'm sure the police have flashlights or lanterns. Never mind them. Their first job is taking care of Merkel, getting him in a hospital so he lives. Yes, yes, of course. Oh, oh. these thorns. What are you looking for? Well, the murderer will be pretty disappointed if Merkel dies. Or if he lives, I should say, one big blow and figured he was dead. Yes, but what was Merkel doing out here by himself? And I'll be pretty disappointed if he doesn't live. There's a real mild understatement, Fred. Don't you get it? He was running for help. What? Yeah, yeah, that's right. Now here's where the mirror was. It fits, see? Just about in line with Lorenzo, where he was shot, stepping in front of his marble chair there. Look, I asked you about Merkel, not Lorenzo. Merkel had a lot of the facts, and he had to play detective. He was out here doing the same thing I am. Only the facts aren't here anymore. What facts, for heavens? What's the matter? Listen. Just the police out in front, wasn't it? No. It was right close by. Now, you listen, Fred. Merkel noticed the same thing I did, that first shot. What? Sure, that's what I'm looking for on the chair here. There ought to be some. Yeah, here we are. The splintered place. You mean that first shot was fired here in the same place? Yeah, it looks that way. The bullet that is still in Lorenzo couldn't have done that. And over here, there ought to be... Uh-huh. Here's something. Well, what is it? Oh, Mr. Valentine. Mr. Valentine. Amy. Oh, oh, there you are. Yeah. The sheriff is taking care of Dr. Merkel. Yes, I know. What's that you're holding? Well, I'm not sure, Amy. A piece of black glass, a filter maybe, or is it red? What? Yeah, sure. It'd have to be an infrared light, or you'd have seen it, wouldn't you? Mr. Valentine, what on earth? I didn't see anything. I told you I but didn't... But there's another possibility. But there wasn't anything to see. But, but the man who fired the hey, gun... Amy, when the gun fired that first time, it happened when you switched on the lights, didn't it? Mr. Valentine... Take it easy, both of you, will you? I'll make sense. Professor, that guy who used to be here, that uh, Dr. Nolan, who didn't make the grade and got sore at Lorenzo, he was an electronics man, wasn't he? Well, did he have any equipment? Is there any of it still around? Equipment? Yeah, like maybe a photoelectric cell. What? You heard me. A photoelectric cell can be used to do anything from opening a garage door to setting off a burglar alarm. So why couldn't it be used to fire a gun? Mr. Valentine, I just don't understand. I do. Dr. Nolan. Yeah, at least that would explain the mirror and copper wire and the black glass. And it would explain what else Merkel figured out. That a short circuit when you switched the light would have fired the first shot by accident. Anything that interferes with the beam of the cell, its current, in other words, 
could very easily fire a gun. Magnet releasing the trigger, for instance. No, no, I don't follow you at all. And then the second time, after a reload, I guess, the gun fired when Lorenzo stepped in front of the beam. When he sat down in the same place he came to every night. Oh, but but if you can't find the gun or that cell thing... I know where to find it, don't worry. There's only one earthly reason for killing a person with a mechanical contraption. And that's to set up a perfect alibi. Well, don't look so blank, Fred. Sure, I know how upsetting it's all been. Merkel's still alive so he can talk. But it's a little ironic, too, isn't it? Set up a perfect alibi, Fred, and then get hung by the fact you're the only person with an alibi. Now, let's go upstairs and take a look at Dr. Nolan's room, shall we? You want to bet that's where we'll find the equipment? With your fingerprints on it? Well, Fred? Well, Busty, you've only got a couple of seconds, so make up your mind. Back to the conclusion of our Let George Do It adventure in just a moment. Yeah, right here, Angel. I'm busy. But the sheriff is through with Dr. Merkel now. You and the sheriff meet me upstairs, will you? Well, Fred, how about it? You coming? It would have been so different if you hadn't been here. Oh, sure, I know. Things kind of got away from you, didn't they? Mr. Valentine, look out! I suppose you might find the photoelectric cell upstairs, but I doubt if you'd find the gun. Oh, yeah. Didn't get rid of it yet, huh? No. So things kind of get away from you, too, don't they? George! Stand still, Brooksy! Hey, you! Stop there! And that was it. I suppose Mr. Jeffries was already so desperate after trying to get rid of Dr. Dr. Sure, Merkel, but sure, but a bullet in the leg just makes him talk that much faster. You know, I thought that since Lorenzo's money was already in your name, Professor and Dr. Hanson... That... There was only three, Angel. If Lorenzo had enough money to figure on in dying 40 or 50, then there was plenty left for Fred to try to hang on to by killing him. But now what'll happen? I don't know. But after this, I have a hunch the courts will let his endowment plan go right on through. He'll still be remembered as Lorenzo the Great, all right. Is everybody happy? It's a wonderful thing to try for, isn't it? Sure. No matter what kind of answers you get. But if you keep asking the question oh, long enough... Oh, don't be so serious, Angel. All it leads to is a song called When My Baby Smiles at Me. You have just heard is Everybody Happy, another Let George Do It adventure. Robert Bailey was starred as George Valentine, with Virginia Gregg as Brooksy. David Victor and Jackson Gillis wrote the story, with music by Eddie Dunstetter. Now, this is yours truly inviting you to another visit with Valentine, when you will again hear what happens when you let George do it. Chevron Gas Station invites you to Let George Do It. Brought to you by the makers of climate-tailored Chevron Supreme Gasoline and RPM Compounded Motor Oil. Valentine would be the last person in the world to take a job that was not exciting, even with a large salary attached. That's why he opened his office and advertised to solve any problem, for a fee, of course. 
Well, he's had his excitement, all right, sometimes more excitement than he bargained for. Right now, George, his secretary, Claire, and Sonny are driving along in his car. Mr. Valentine, why so much mystery? Where are we going? Just playing hooky from the office, huh, Mr. Valentine? We can't afford to play hooky, Mr. Valentine. You know that. Have you two ever heard of the Harding Bookshop? Not I. Never. Why? Should we have? Well, that's where we're going. To buy a book? Of course not, Sonny. Mr. Valentine has a book. <laughs> Here, bright girl, take a look at this newspaper clipping. What does it say, sis? Hmm. William Harding, ex- eccentric owner of the Harding Bookshop, died in his sleep last night. He leaves his widow Harriet and a nephew Frank. Mr. Harding had been in poor health. Okay, and... that's enough. Well, what about it? Man dies in his sleep. Where do we come in? Well, his widow phone. She wants me to meet her at the bookshop at 11. She made it sound urgent. Jeepers, I wonder why she wants to see you. An eccentric book dealer dies in his sleep. His widow is very anxious to see me. Kids, I don't know what it's all about, but it has all the ingredients for some real excitement. Oh, it's no use, Mr. Valentine. The bookshop's closed. Maybe Mrs. Harding hasn't arrived yet. Wait a minute. I think I hear someone in there. I'm sorry, but we're not open for business. The shop is closed. Oh, Mrs. Harding, I'm Mr. Valentine, and these are my assistants. Oh, of course. I've been expecting you. Come in. Supper and cats. Look at the place. Books scattered all over. Yeah. Somebody been searching for something, Mrs. Harding? You can see why I called you. Someone broke in here last night. Did you phone the police? No. Uh, no, I didn't. No? Why not? Because I think it was an inside job. The windows were securely locked. They don't look as though they'd been tampered with. Someone unlocked the door and walked right in. I see. You suspect someone in your family. That's why you didn't phone the police. Mr. Valentine, I won't try to keep anything from you. I suspect my husband's nephew, Frank. Did he have keys to the shop? As far as I know, my husband and I had the only keys. But you must have some reason for suspecting Frank. Well, he's always been a wild boy. I never had any use for him. My husband was fond of him. He even had Frank helping here in the shop. Uh, Mrs. Harding, just what was this person looking for, do you know? Money. Money? I'm not sure, of course, but I think my husband had some money hidden away here. Uh Uh-huh. You may have heard my husband was... Well, he was odd. It would be like him to hide the money in his shop. Then he mentioned some money to you? He always said that we'd be well taken care of in our old age. And yet he died penniless. I see. And uh, just what do you want me to do? If there's any money here, I want you to find it. I'll... Pay you, of course. Oh, of course. But the shop's already been searched. Maybe the money's been found. I don't think so. You see, I frightened the person away. Oh, then you saw someone. I just caught a glimpse of someone running away. It was dark, but I think it was a man. Mm Mm-hmm. Why did you come down here last night, Mrs. Harding? I, uh... I wanted to look around myself. Oh, yes, yes, of course. All right, Mrs. Harding, I'll keep in touch with you. Come on, kids. I'll be waiting to hear from you. Let's go, kids. What do you make of it, Mr. Valentine? Say, quite a girl, isn't she? Her husband dies, and that same night, she's down at his shop looking for any money he may have hidden. Well, why don't we stay here and search the shop? Because someone beat us to it, Sonny. Besides, I want to know a little more about this case. And a little more about Harding's death, too. Mr. Valentine, do you mean... Do you think he was murdered? Uh, I'm just guessing. Come on, let's go to the car. Hey, wait a minute. I want a word with you. Jeepers, I wonder who that is. Must be the nephew. I just want to warn you not to believe half of what my aunt tells you. She's... She's not herself. She's hysterical. Oh. Well, I don't agree with you, Frank. Your aunt seems unusually calm, considering. Calm? She called you in, didn't she? She knew what she was doing. Why would she call in a private investigator? How did you know I'd been called in? Well, you were, weren't you? Suppose she told you there's some money hidden away. That's a lot of baloney. Is it? You're just wasting your time. They said some money disappeared after my father died, too, but we never found any. There's always that kind of talk when some eccentric dies. Just when did your father die? Five years ago. Uh Uh-huh. Frank, were you with your uncle when he passed away? No. It was during the day. I was in the shop with my aunt. Miss Barry phoned us. Miss Barry? Alice Barry, the nurse. My uncle's known her since she was a child. Of course, she's a young woman now. Very attractive, too. Okay, Frank. See you again sometime. No, you won't. I'm going to tell Aunt Harriet to call you off. Yeah, do that. Do you think she'll listen to him, Mr. Valentine? No, she doesn't trust him. Claire, I want you to get all the information you can on Harding's death and meet me here. Here? Yeah, in front of the bookshop about 10 o'clock tonight in Sunny. Yes, sir. Get down to the Evening Express. Talk to Ben Steele. He's a friend of mine. He'll let you look through the old newspaper files. But what am I going to be looking for? Well, Frank's father died five years ago. Get what you can on it. 
Okay, Mr. Valentine. Hey, what are you going to be doing? Oh, he's going to talk to the nurse, of course. Why, Claire, how did you get? Oh, she's young and attractive. Naturally, you'd want to investigate that yourself, Mr. Valentine. Mr. Harding had been ill for years. There was nothing mysterious about his death. But don't take my word for it. Talk to Dr. Mark. Oh, I'd rather talk to you, Miss Berry. And I know Mr. Harding didn't leave any money. You're wrong about that, too. If you don't mind my saying so. Miss Berry, when a woman is beautiful, she can toss my theories into the ash can, and I don't open my mouth. I'll find that out after I get to know you better. Oh? You're going to know me better? Of course. What makes you think Harding didn't leave any money? Because he couldn't even afford to pay me a salary. He gave me this box of old phonograph records instead. I see. Uh, Miss Berry. Alice. Alice? Alice. Alice, uh, did Harding die in his sleep? Oh, yes. Then he didn't say anything before he died? Mm, well, he mumbled something. Mumbled something? What, could you tell? I suppose he thought he was a little boy again, listening to Mother Goose. Why? What did he say? <clears throat> Mary had a lamb. Mary had a lamb? Are you sure? Well, the words Mary and lamb were plain enough. Uh-huh. Look, here's my card. If you think of anything else, give me a buzz, will you? I'll give you a buzz. Oh, good. Say, uh, how does that verse go? Do you remember? Mary had a little lamb. Its fleece was white as snow. Oh, yeah, yeah. And everywhere that Mary went, the lamb was sure to go. <laughs> I was detained. By the nurse? Now, never mind. What are we going to do, Mr. Valentine? Well, we're going to get inside this bookshop. Hey, Mr. Valentine, where did you get those keys? They've opened lots of doors. See? Never fail. I'll try to find the light switch. Now, don't bother. I'll use my flashlight. Sonny. Yeah, Mr. Valentine? Stand near the window, will you? Let me know if you see anyone. Okay. Mr. Valentine, the books are all back in place. Well, Mrs. Harding must be a neat housekeeper. Come on, Claire. Now, we're looking for the section that has books for children. Then the nurse did give you a clue. Was she helpful? Oh, yes. Yeah. And beautiful. Really? Tell me about it. Well, I haven't time. Couldn't do it justice. Here we are now. Uh, let's see. Peter Rabbit, Alice in Wonderland. Hey, look for Mother Goose. Is she a blonde? Yes. Treasure Island. A natural blonde? Oh, Claire, will you concentrate on Mother Goose? Oh. Is this what you're looking for? Yeah, good, good. Now find Mary had a little lamb. Why? Oh, Claire. Oh, all right. Little Jack Horner, little Miss Muffet. Mary had a... Oh, here it is. Good, good. Now read it. Mary had a little lamb. Its fleece was white as snow. Uh -huh. And everywhere that Mary went, lamb was sure to go. Do you want all the verses? Well, isn't there anything written on that page? No. Well, maybe there's some more Mother Goose books. These are all there seem to be. Okay, hang on to it. Put your hands up. <gasps> oh, Mr. Valentine, softer and cats. Well, now, what are you doing here, Frank? Where did you come from? I was in back. I've been waiting for someone to show up. Why? What made you think someone would show up? Well, the place was ransacked last night. And you thought it might happen again tonight, huh? You can't tell. And Harriet says she frightened the person away. He might come back. Uh-huh. That may be why you're here. Or then again, you might be looking for the money yourself. I told you there isn't any money. Okay, Frank. Now put that gun away. You might hurt somebody. And get out of here, all of you. All right, we're going. Coming with us? I'm going to stay here and keep an eye on things. Say, that's a very good idea, Frank. Just keep an eye on things. <laughs> Fleece was white as snow. Everywhere that Mary went, the lamb was sure to go. I can oh, see Mr. Valentine, it's a little late to be reading Mother Goose. Well, look, here's what we've got so far, kids. Harding's brother, who's supposed to have money, dies, but he doesn't leave anything. On the other hand, Harding, who's supposed to be poor, tells his wife they'll be provided for in their old age. Oh, I see. You think he had his brother's money. And he hid it in his bookshop. That's what Mrs. Harding thinks. And so does Frank. Well, go on. Well, this Mother Goose rhyme should lead us to the money. Why? Because Harding tried to tell Alice about it before he died. Alice? The nurse. Oh, first name. Oh, definitely. Hey, who'd be phoning Mr. Sauer? Hey, get it, will you, Claire? Hello? Is Mr. Valentine there? Yes, who's calling? Alice Barry. Oh, just a minute. Your nurse. And she's not a natural blonde. I can tell by her voice. Oh, have it your way. Hello, Alice. Mr. Valentine, maybe I can help you after all. Yeah, what's up? Well, you remember that Mr. Harding left me a box of records? Yes. 
Well, I was looking through the box of phonograph records when suddenly I... Oh. Hello. Hello, Alice. Mr. Valentine, what's the matter? Something's happened to her. I've got to get over there quick. Well, it'll take George a few minutes to get to Alice's apartment. Meantime, I'd like to tell you about a conversation I had recently... One of my Chevron dealer friends asked me the other day what qualities I look for in a gas station. So I said that first of all, I looked for Chevron Supreme gasoline and RPM compounded motor oil. Well, that's easy, he said. Just keep your eye peeled for a cream green and burgundy station. That's your cue for Chevron. Then I told him that I'm a credit card user. Don't blame you, says he, and don't forget that Chevron credit cards are as good as gold at our stations. So then I told him my favorite gas station must be a friendly place where I can depend on getting good service for my car. The dealer laughed and said, sure sounds like a Chevron gas station to me. We all had plenty of experience before branching out on our own. Now that we're in business for ourselves, we know how to keep our customers happy by keeping their cars in good shape. I had to agree with my friend. Chevron gas stations offer just about everything a motorist wants. Try them yourself and see. Well, George was about to get some important information. The nurse, Alice Barry, phoned him, but before she could explain, something happened to her. Now it's a few minutes later, George is opening the door to her apartment. Alice! Alice! Oh, you poor kid. Here. Let's get you up on that couch. Oh. Now, take it easy. You've got to be all right. Oh, Mr. Valentine. Wait a minute. I've got to put you down here. There you are. Now, you better lie still for a few minutes. I'll get you a drink of water. No, no, please don't leave me. Now, don't be frightened. Hey, you've got a nasty-looking bruise on your forehead. Otherwise, you seem to be okay. How do you feel? Oh, like I've got two heads. Yeah, I'll bet. Want to tell me what happened? Well, there isn't anything to tell. I was talking to you on the phone, and, and then it happened. Somebody took a sock at me. Well, who was it? Don't you know? No. He must have crept up and hit me from behind. From behind? Yes. Oh, you didn't see him at all, huh? No, for all I know, it might have been a woman. Yeah, it might very well have been a woman. What about the records? No, I guess they're gone. They were on that table over there. That's bad luck. Oh, don't worry about them. It was just an old bunch of records. Believe me, if all those endearing young charms, who is Sylvia, and a few more like that. But I thought you discovered something about them. I guess the person who stole them thought so, too. No, Mr. Valentine, that's not why I phoned you. Feel like telling me about it? Of course. You see, while I was looking through the records, I got to thinking about Mr. Harding and, and what he'd said just before he died. Yes? I could almost see the whole thing all over again. He was moaning and, and tossing around in the bed. I ran to him and felt his pulse. Go on. I told you that he said Mary had a lamb. But now as I think back, Mr. Valentine, I'm almost certain he said, Mary Hayden Lamb. Mary Hayden Lamb. Mary Hayden Lamb? A woman's name? That's right. Do you think it means anything? Well, it must mean something. Yeah. It'll probably lead us right to the money. That is, if there is any money. Um, now, look, i got to beat it. But I want you to lock the door behind me, understand? Don't worry. After this, I'll always lock my door. Good. Better put some ice on that forehead. It's turning a beautiful purple. I'll be all right. Uh, Mr. Valentine? Yeah? If it does mean anything, will you let me in on it? <laughs> I feel as though I have a stake in this now. Oh, I don't blame you. Okay, Alice. I'll keep in touch with you. Hey, open up. Hey, Mr. Ward. Mr. Ward, hey, open up. Wait a minute, wait a minute. You, you out of your mind? What are you doing here at this hour? Well, I want to buy a book. Well, go away, go away. We're closed. Come back in the morning. Oh, now, wait a minute. Don't close the door, Mr. Ward. i got to have something to read tonight. Do you realize it's after 11? I know. I'm terribly sorry, but let me in, will you? Oh, all right. Come in. Other people have sane customers, but I suppose it's got to be a mystery with at least six murders <laughs> in it. <laughs> Mr. Ward, did you ever hear of a book called Mary Hayden Lamb? Never, no. Are you sure? I came here because you have a reputation for knowing every book that's ever been published. There's never been a book published by that name. Now, however, if you were to ask if there were ever a novelist by that name, I'd, I'd give you a different answer. A novelist? Hey, of course. Why didn't I think of that? Well, tell me about it, will you? Well, she was a local writer, and to my knowledge, she wrote but one book, thank heaven. Why do you say that? 
Because it's by far the worst trash that's ever been my bad luck to read. I see. What's it called? Isle of Love. It's about a girl and an island and a man. And if you want something to put you to sleep, I'll personally guarantee you your money back. <laughs> then you've got a copy, huh? One. Almost sold it this afternoon. Almost sold it? Is that so? Someone wanted it, huh? Well, ask me about it anyway. But evidently I had the good taste to turn it down. I found it on the counter when I was putting my books away. Well, who asked to see the book, Mr. Ward? Do you remember? Certainly not. I do a big business, young man, and I can't keep track of every customer who walks into my shop. Unless they make a special impression by getting me out of bed at this unearthly hour. <laughs> okay. Anyway, you've made a sale. I'll take Isle of Love. No, oh, you've made a bad choice. Yeah, here you are. Mark down 89 cents. And young man, believe me, I'm cheating you. Hey, Claire. Sonny, come on, wake up. Oh, oh hello, Mr. Valentine. May we go home now, slave driver? Oh, I'm sorry, kids. I know it's late, but we can't stop now. Don't dare take the chance. Somebody may be getting desperate. What do you mean? What do you expect to happen? Well, nothing, if I can beat them to it. Now, Claire, I've got a job for you. How are you in the charm department? Charm? Yeah, that's right. Have you got any? Don't answer that. Whom do I have to charm? Frank. The nephew? I quit. Hey, I knew he was suspicious. As soon as I saw him, I said to myself, now there's Shut up, guy... will you, Sonny? Claire, I want you to get Frank out of the bookshop tonight. So that you can get in there without his seeing. That's the idea. Think you can do it? Oh, it should be simple, even if my hair isn't blonde. Oh, don't worry, Mr. Valentine. I'll take care of Frank. <laughs> that gun down, Frank. It's Claire. Oh. You're Mr. Valentine's assistant, aren't you? What do you want? Well, Mr. Valentine's just down the street at your aunt's house. What do you want? Well, I was with them, but then they wanted to talk alone, so, well, they sort of left me stranded. Don't I look stranded? Yeah. Well, your aunt was giving Mr. Valentine an earful. She's not very fond of you, is she? You can't forget that I was once a wild kid. I, I have straightened out since then. Oh, I can see that. What do you want? I want to come in. Use the phone to call a cab. Why didn't you stop at a drugstore? Oh, well, all right, if that's the way you feel about it. Good night. Wait a minute. Hmm? It's pretty late for you to be wandering around. Oh, I knew you had fine instincts, Frank. Oh, all right, come on, I'll take you in my car. <laughs> Okay, Sonny, come on. The coast clear? Yeah, they just drove away in Frank's car. Now, don't turn on the light. Excuse me for asking, Mr. Valentine, but just what are we looking for? We are looking for a book. More Mother Goose? No, The Isle of Love. There ought to be a copy just like this one somewhere in here. But why do you want two copies? Don't you understand, Sonny? I've got to have Mr. Harding's copy of this book. Oh, no, I don't understand. <laughs> Never mind. Just start looking. Yeah, but Mr. Valentine, there's at least a thousand books in the shop. Let's see now. Mary Hayden Lamb was a local writer. Now, why would Harding choose her book unless... Well, wait a minute. I think I got it, Sonny. He must have known her. Well, what of it? That means it would be Harding's personal book, see? Oh! No, I don't see. <laughs> come on. There's a little room in back of the store. Remember? That's where Frank was hiding the last time we were here. Yeah, that's right. Well, come on. It's dark. Careful now. Here we are. I'll look around with my flashlight. Now, let's see. Hey, there's a desk, Mr. Valentine. Are there any books on it? Sure. Read the titles. Webster's Dictionary. The Complete Shakespeare. Cooking for Fun. And the Isle... The Isle of Love. That's it. Grab it, Sonny, and let's get out of here. Okay, Mr. Valentine. We'll take it back to the office. Hey, aren't we ever going to get to sleep tonight? We haven't time. Now, let's get to the car. Sonny, duck. Jeepers, what was that? Somebody took a shot at it. Mr. Valentine. It's all right, Sonny, you missed. Yeah, but let's get out of here quick. I don't think that person likes us. And then somebody started shooting at us. Oh, it was plenty exciting, sis. You're lucky. Frank's a bore. This conversation is brilliant. It's either yeah or yeah. 
I guess it was Mrs. Harding shooting at us, huh, Mr. Valentine? Because Frank was with Claire. Not for long. No? No, he just took me to a cab stand. Mm, I see. Run out of charm? Oh, Gee, good, Mr. Valentine, you've just about taken that book apart. Well, there's nothing in here. No secret compartment, no writing on the pages. I can't find a thing. Well, then let's go home and get some sleep. No, we can't stop now. Okay, kids, make yourselves comfortable. What are you going to do? Well, I'll have to start reading the book. Aloud? Certainly, I might miss something. You're going to read all of it? That's right. Here we go. The summer sun was setting in a blaze of glory, casting its light like a shimmering ribbon of golden orange across the lake. On the bank, her wavy hair streaming from her uplifted head stood Jennifer. Oh, I can tell this is going to be a classic. Perhaps her dream of love was to become a reality, for coming toward her was a canoe, and in the canoe was a man. Mr. Valentine, do you think Sonny's old enough? Oh, keep quiet, will you? Jennifer sighed longingly. <sighs> Sonny, perhaps her stay on the island was at an end. Her face was alive with expectancy. Weeks had gone by. Jennifer knew that this was her man. What choice did she have on a desert island? In spite of his aloofness, in spite of his air of mystery, Jennifer knew that she loved him. And then a wonderful thing. He knelt beside her and kissed her. Well, it's about time. <laughs> oh, she said, then you do love me. Naive creature, isn't she? Yes, he answered. I love you with all my heart. If you don't believe me, look carefully when the grandfather's clock strikes the hour of midnight. And I love you, too, she told Wait him. Wait a minute. What was that again? And I love you, too, she told him. No, no, no. Go back to where he loves it. Oh, yes, he answered. I love you with all my heart. If you don't believe me, look carefully when the grandfather's clock strikes the hour of midnight. Hey, that doesn't make sense. Hey, wait a minute, wait a minute. The printing on this page looks a little different. Yeah, so does the paper. Claire, get my copy of the book. Here it is. Okay, turn to page 82. Come on, come on. Okay, now read that part. Yes, he answered. I love you with all my heart. I swear it, Jennifer. That's enough. This is it, kids. Mr. Harding printed this page himself. Look carefully when the grandfather's clock strikes the hour of midnight. Mr. Valentine, there's a grandfather's clock in the bookshop. That's right, Sonny. And there's where that money must be hidden. Claire, get Mrs. Harding on the phone. Tell her to meet us at the bookshop right away. At this hour? And then phone Frank at the shop. Tell him to expect us. All right. Oh, and Claire, phone Miss Berry, will you? She wanted to be in on the kill. Oh, now you've got me phoning your blonde for you. Well, whatever you say, Mr. Valentine. <laughs> What are you waiting for, Mr. Valentine? Why don't you give me my money? You mean my money, Aunt Harriet? Now, don't fight over the money. We don't even know if there is any. Then why did you call us here? Then why bring Alice into this? Well, if there is any money, you'll have to thank Alice. She gave me the clue. Then it really was a clue, Mr. Valentine. That's right, Alice. It led me to a book. And in the book, I found some words that Mr. Harding printed. It said, look carefully when the grandfather's clock strikes the hour of midnight. The grandfather's clock? I'm going to see about that. Now, take it easy, Frank. Now, Frank, that's not your property. Get away from that clock. There's nothing in here. The clue didn't say there was something in the clock. It said, look carefully when the grandfather's clock strikes the hour of midnight. Well, it's striking 12 now. Well, what's different about the clock when it strikes 12 than at any other time? When it strikes 12, both hands point up. <laughs> Smart girl, Claire. Sonny, hand me that chair. Okay. You think there's something on top of the clock? No, above it. On the wall here. Yeah, you see? There's a false panel. Need any help? Oh, thanks, Frank. I think I could do it with the heel of my hand. That does it. What is it? Is there something in there? Yes, a package. What's in it? Just a minute, I'll see. Well, well, well. Bill, large denominations and lots of them. Let me have that. Now, don't rush me. Hey, there's a note here, too. What does it say? This is Harding. Is this your husband's handwriting? No. No, it isn't. That's my father's handwriting. You see, the money is mine. Not so fast, Frank. Well, what does the note say? It says, Dear Brother Bill, I'm leaving this money in your care. Frank is too wild to be trusted with it. When he settles down, you can give it to him. Then give it to him. Oh, wait a minute, there's more. There's a condition I attach to this. Frank must provide for you and your wife as long as either of you shall live. Is that all? That's it, Mrs. Harding. Then it is Frank's money. Give it to him. He doesn't have to provide for me. No, this money is for both of us, Aunt Harriet. Well, that's 
More than I deserve, Frank. You can stop talking right now and hand that money over. Alice! Miss Barrett! Give it to me, Mr. Valentine, and hurry up about it. I never argue with a beautiful woman, especially when she has a gun in her hand. Mr. Valentine, was she the one who was after the money all along? That's right. When she phoned me and got bumped on the head, I thought it was funny I didn't hear the blow over the telephone. And if she was hit from behind, why was the bruise on the forehead? Never mind the explanation. Hand that over. Then she's the one who shot at us. Certainly. She couldn't get in here to look for the book because Frank was guarding the place. First, she tried to put me off the track with that Mother Goose stuff. But she finally gave me the right clue. She figured if she told me the truth, I'd get the money and she'd tail me and pick it up. That's enough out of you, Mr. Valentine. Give me the money. Oh, certainly. Here you are, Miss Berry. But, Mr. Valentine... Now don't try to stop her, Frank. It's dangerous. You're right. It is dangerous. Stay just where you are. Don't any of you make a move. But, Mr. Valentine... Careful. But you're letting her get away. Not very far. The police are out there. Let's go! Let's go! It's okay, Mr. Valentine. They got it. Your money will be returned to you, Frank. Thanks, Mr. Valentine. I, I owe you a lot. That's right. But you'll get a bill in the morning. Come on, kids. Good night, Mr. Valentine. Good night. Good night. Well, I'm really going to sleep tonight. Yeah, so am I. Oh, too bad. Too bad it had to end this way. Huh? What do you mean? He's thinking about the nurse. Aren't you, Mr. Valentine? You know, Claire, I believe she was a natural blonde after all. George will be back in a moment. Meanwhile, it doesn't matter whether you sit in an office or ride a tractor. Life these days seems to be getting more complicated for everybody. Any convenience that makes living a little simpler is always as welcome as spring. Your Chevron dealer knows this, as any friendly businessman should. So he tries to make you his friend by making his cream green and burgundy station as convenient and efficient as he can. He'll make it a point to know your car and the grade of RPM compounded motor oil you use. He'll urge you to use a Chevron credit card because he wants to save you time. He handles Chevron Supreme gasoline because he knows it'll give you good going wherever you drive. He takes the trouble to know the country nearby so that he can give you good travel tips. When you get right down to it, at Chevron gas stations, you get the same sort of convenient service you expect from any other wide-awake home-owned business. Get acquainted with the one near you. You'll like it. Well, next week, George Valentine is confronted with a problem. A big problem. You'll probably hear something like this. Client or no client, Mr. Valentine, you can't keep a dog that big in this apartment. Jeepers, do you realize he eats six pounds of food a day? Six pounds? What kind of food? I'm not sure, but he seemed awfully fond of my head. <laughs> okay, Sonny. Go out and buy him a bone. Chevron Gas Stations all through the West invite you to be with us again next week for another chapter of Let George Do It, brought to you by the makers of Chevron Supreme Gasoline and RPM Compounded Motor Oil. Let George Do It, starring Robert Bailey as George with Francis Robinson as Claire and Eddie Firestone Jr. as Sonny, is written by Pauline Hopkins, produced and directed by Owen Vincent. Others in the cast were Jane Morgan as Mrs. Harding, Harry Bartell as Frank Harding, Evelyn Scott as Alice Barry, and Paul McVeigh as Mr. Ward. The music was composed and conducted by Charles Dant. Your announcer, John Heaston. Listen again next week, same time, same station, to Let George Do It. <laughs> this is the Mutual Don Lee Broadcasting System. Chevron Supreme Gasoline and RPM Compounded Motor Oil invite you to Let George Do It. The Adventures of George Valentine, brought to you on behalf of Chevron Gas Stations and Standard Stations throughout the West. Tonight's adventure begins as George, feeling very safe after making a special trip downtown to pay the premium on his accident policy, walks briskly down an isolated street to where he has parked his car. 
Suddenly, from the open stairway of a building, a cascade of small round pellets bounces to the pavement, followed closely by a young woman in great haste. There is a collision, and George hits the sidewalk with the force of a blockbuster. Oh! Oh! Are you hurt? Oh! You don't have an extra sacroiliac yak on you. Can you get up? I, I think so. Well, then, do you mind? Do I mind what? Getting up off the pavement. Well, if I'm in your way, couldn't I just slide over? You're lying on my pearls. Pearls? Oh, good. I thought those lumps were misplaced vertebrae. No. Hey, uh... Oh, thank you. Now, let me see. That makes 32, 33, 4... Yeah, here's a few in the gutter. Oh, good. Yes, 35... 36, 37. Hey, have you seen any teeth down there? They're mine. Oh, I'm sorry you fell down. 38, 39. Oh, here's one of my trouser cups. Thanks. 40. Oh, I see you, you little rascal. 41. 41. 41. Lots of 41s, aren't there? I've lost one. There were 42. I've lost one. Oh, good Lord, what'll I do now? They'll kill me for this. Oh, come now, lady. Where is it? Where is it? There were 42 of them. What have you done with uh, it? Well, I, I'm afraid I've kicked it down that sewer drain. What? You kicked my pearl down the... Where? I don't see it. Oh, over there, see? Here, through the grating. Oh, well, you lucky. Landed right in that Sunday cup. Oh, I see it. Oh, there it is. Oh, thank heaven. But how did we get it out of there? Well, it's a very delicate engineering problem. I need a long stick and, uh, and a chewing gum if you're through with it. Here. Thanks. Now, let's see. Oh, that's lucky. Here's a stick. That's why do it. Uh-huh. Can you reach it? Uh, no. No, not long enough. You know, that's quite a drop down there. Oh, good Lord, if anything happens to that pearl... Well, I hate to do this, but... Are you going down there? Uh-huh. Here, hold my coat, will you, lady? All right. There's a ladder in here. Don't fall down and hurt the pearl. Oh, thanks a lot. I'll be careful. Uh-huh. Got it. Oh, give it to me, quickly. All right. Catch. Oh. Ah, nice one. Thanks. Hey, wait a minute. What are you doing thanks with that ladder? Thanks a lot, Hazard. You've been very helpful. Hey, what is this? Put that ladder back. Uh-huh. The least we can do is leave things like we find them. Hey, come back here, you. What's the matter with Don't you? Don't worry, lover. A heavy rain out of thought you right up to the top. Sorry, I just can't stand saying goodbye or answering questions. Well, I'll be a... Hey, help! <laughs> Something for you, sir? Uh, yeah, yeah, this looks like the right place. Are you Mr. Zaghetti? To be precise, Bela Zaghetti. I am he. Oh, Mr. Zaghetti, I can see by the layout here you're a jeweler. Now, I wonder if... To be uh... precise, I am not a jeweler. I manufacture artificial gems. Uh, to put it this way, I do my small part to brighten the lives of those who otherwise are not very bright. Is this exact? Yeah, Probably. Well, what I want to know is, have you recently brightened the life of a young lady with a string of artificial pearls? To be precise, a blonde, Miss Dale Quillen. Yeah, that's right. I saw her coming out of this building, and I thought that... A uh... beautiful job. Smooth and pink and utterly perfect. Yes, yeah, she was. To correct myself, I refer to the string of matched imitation pearls. Ah. Pink ones. Forty-two on a row. She was pretty particular about the specifications. Oh, yes. They were a duplication of... But uh, if I may ask you a question... Sure, of course. Uh, to put the question in this way, why do you ask this question? Well, I, uh, I admired her set. I was interested in buying it, but she wouldn't sell. I wondered if you could arrange for me to have a duplicate set. Oh, it would take many months. How much would it cost? Uh, to be precise, $300. Huh. Well, that's a little too precise. She told me you made hers for 200 But no, it was the same. The price is no different. Oh, well, maybe I misunderstood. But I'd like to check. Not that I distrust you. But no, you, there but... is no doubt. I am an honorable man. Please, verify this. Yeah, I'll do that. If you'd like to give me her address. But, of course, I have a record of my sales. You will find out. That's all I want, Mr. Zaghetti. I just want to find out. <laughs> George, anybody who'd go down into a sewer pipe after a blonde deserves everything... Oh, now listen, Brooksy, I didn't follow her into the sewer. I was doing my good deed for the day, and she ran off with my coat and wallet. Hmm. 
What were you looking for? A merit badge? Oh, now, Brooksy, listen. Well, it's a nice way to meet a girl, I must say. Sprawled senseless in the gutter. And all she has to do is blink those big brown eyes Blue and... eyes. Blue eyes. And you go scurrying down the drain pipe like a... Like a... Rat. Rat. Thank you. And then because you're caught in your own trap... Well, that'll teach me to keep my trap shut. You come cringing back to me like a... Like a... Good puppy. Puppy. And you expect me to feel sorry for you. So she jilted you. Good for her. What were you trying to prove anyway? Well, I guess I was just trying to prove I was willing to start at the bottom and work up. Brooksy. What? You're not mad. Oh, George, of course not. But I hate to see a woman make a fool out of a man like you. Another woman, that is. Well, don't you worry. I'm going to prove to her I'm nobody's fool. I know you're not, darling. Yes. Huh? But I'm working on it. Hey, wait a minute. Here we are. Yeah, you're right. There's the number. Seven, seven, oh, oh. Uh oh, is right. Sure you want me to come along? Unless you're afraid of the competition. What? Oh, aren't you smug? Lead on, Macduff. Yeah, here's a name on the box. Miss Dale Quillen. I'd like to give her a piece of my mind. Now, Brooksy, let me do the talking. Yeah? Miss Dale Quillen? You're kidding? I mean, I mean, she means, is Dale Quillen at home? You're kidding? Well... Is he kidding? Well, someone is. Hey, did you get a look at that house? What? Through that solid wall of muscle? Well, the place is a wreck. Furniture turned over, paper scattered on the floor. Poor housekeeper as well as a crook. What are you going to do? What is this, a gag? Um, we've decided to wait. What are you, a mad character or something? Blow. Oh, come off it now, handsome. Anybody can see you've got a heart as big as all outdoors. Yeah? Then stay outdoors. Hey, character, get your foot out of the door, I'll chop it off. You know, you could be a lot of company for us while we're waiting. Yes, sir. A lot of company. Yeah? Give me your address and I'll drop you a postcard. If you want it any clearer, I'll step outside. Come on, I dare hey, you. Take it easy, Claire. I warned you, Joker. Oh. Uh, let it go, Nubbin. You're too quick with the fist. The old friends now. Yeah. Yeah, that's a great little equalizer you got there. It is small but persuasive. Bring him in, Nubbin. I think we have interest in common. Come on, you... In one come... piece, Nubbin. Perhaps you can take him apart later. Inside, kiddo. Easy. Yes, Nubbin is just a big, playful child. He loves to take things apart. But he has never quite learned how to put them together again. Now, shall we talk? Return to tonight's adventure of George Valentine in just a moment. Meanwhile, let's go from assault and battery to just plain battery. For thousands of Western motorists, October means a lot of weekend driving, like football games and hunting trips. But for the battery in your car, October means extra work and power drainage because of the colder weather and lots of stop-and-go driving. So let me give you a two-way economy tip. First, depend on the men at your standard station or independent Chevron gas station for periodic battery checkups. They have all the equipment and know-how for keeping up your battery's maximum power and for giving it longer life. Second, when you fill up your tank, ask for Chevron Supreme gasoline. Tailor-made for each different climate and altitude zone, high-octane Chevron Supreme assures instant starts, eliminates grinding on the starter, and drain on the battery. So for definite battery economy in colder weather, just remember regular battery checkups at any Chevron gas station or standard station and Chevron Supreme gasoline. And now back to the second part of 42 on a Rope, tonight's adventure of George Valentine. Well... It seems that George's curiosity following his strange encounter with a mysterious girl and a broken string of pearls has landed him in a tight spot. For minutes now, Baptiste and Nubin have been questioning George and Claire until... I've told you everything I know. This girl, this Dale Quellen, made me look silly. So I came here for an explanation. Now I feel even sillier. You have come here looking for something. So have we. Naturally, we are all sincere people. Perhaps we can help one another, uh, Monsieur... Valentine. George Valentine. And that depends on what we're looking for. Naturally. Pink pearls, no? 
42 on the rope, is it not? We're looking for Dale Quillen, remember? Naturally. Because when we find Miss Quillen, Baptiste Lavon also finds his pearls, n'est-ce pas? I wouldn't know. Who's Baptiste Lavon? Oh, my apology. It is I. Oh, I see. Well, what makes a string of phony oyster fruit so important anyway? Phony? <laughs> I do not know this phony. Ringers, fakes, dupes. Artificial, counterfeit, paste. Ah, the replicas. You refer to this fraudulent string, huh? Uh huh. Yeah, that's it. Where'd you get them? Uh, they were left by Miss Quillen at the check room of the Union Station. She sent me the claim check. At the same time, no doubt, boarding a train for some distant city. Why would she do that? Because they are worthless. Good imitations, no more. Value, perhaps $300. As you say, phony. You're trying to say she pulled a switch on you? Ran off with the real pearls, your pearls, and left you the ringers? That is correct. As always, Baptiste Lavon was sincere. I trusted her with 42 exquisite gems. Gems collected by no other than Louis XIV to give to his Antoinette. Tell me, Lavon, where did you get hold of Marie Antoinette's choker? Ah, spoils of war, Monsieur Valentine. As an officer of the Vichy government in France, my job was to appraise and catalogue war prizes for the victorious Nazis. Naturally, the sincerity and integrity of Baptiste Lavon were above approach. Naturally. So you held out the match picks. <laughs> Naturally. Oh, when the fortunes of war were reversed, Baptiste Lavon reversed too. Uh, Miss Quillen came to Paris with an entertainment unit, and uh, we became uh, friends. And she smuggled them into the States for you. Oh, that is correct. That'll teach you not to be so sincere. Are you kidding? Well, hello. Now, uh, you are friends of Miss Quillen. You see my predicament. Uh, I must know where she is. You will tell me? I've told you. I don't even know the girl. Your mode of entry contradicts you. You are her confederate. We are not quite fools here. Yeah, we ain't no dopes, you know. You do not help, Nubbin. Well, <clears throat> mm, they are stubborn. Now you may take the men apart. The girl adores him. She will weaken first. You may proceed. Yeah. I'll loosen him up first with my belt. Then I'll get technical. No, don't. He doesn't know anything. Let go of my arm, lady. Stop it. Let him alone, you fool. Can't you see he doesn't know anything? You won't let go, Baptiste. Hey, I would advise you to do as Nubbin said. Where? Better sit this one out, honey. I won't let them. I... Who's that? Uh, I don't know. It seems to be a messenger of some sort with a package. Package? package. I will not insult your intelligence by warning you to keep quiet. Answer it, Nubbin. Yeah. I've got a package here addressed to, uh, Handsome. <laughs> handsome, that's all the name it's got. That's me. I'm Handsome. You? Are you sure? You're kidding? Give me the package. Well, can you uh, identify yourself? Sure. Take a good look at me. Now, wouldn't you say I was Handsome? Yeah, yeah, yeah yes, sir. <laughs> you got pretty eyes, too. Okay, give me the package and dust. <laughs> handsome, is it? This is surely not Nubbin, nor is it Baptiste Lavon. Handsome, then, is Monsieur Valentine. Oh, no, not me. No, it's... Oh, yes, Monsieur Valentine. I will open the package for you. Sacre bleu. They're not here. It's nothing but a map. Yes, but a large map of the city with four small crosses marked on it. And these words, X marks the spot. But there are four X's. Yeah, one at High and 23rd. And one at Elm and Valley. And 14th and Underhill. And cast and granite. Four spots marked with X. What does this mean, Monsieur Valentine? Well, how should I Oh, know? go ahead, handsome. Tell them. They'll find out anyway. What? What are you... Oh, yeah, okay. Well, it's obvious, isn't it? She planted the 42 real pearls in different places. So even if you found one hideout, she'd still have three quarters of them hidden away at other places. Excellent. You know these hiding places? Naturally. Excellent. We will all go hunting. Nubbin, the young lady, you and I, and the gun. Please do not forget the gun. Well, here's the first stop. Costa and Granite. Where am I going to park? Pull up to the curb, Nubbin. Let us out. And drive around the block and pick us up here. Okay. 
Now, where? Where is it? Quickly. I cannot control myself. Well, you see that big office building there? Y- yes, yes. You see that window up there with the jeweler's sign? Well, I, I don't see it. Higher. Look higher. No, no. Where is it? No, it's higher yet. That's higher. No. Oh. Come on, Brooksy, run for it into that theater. Oh, George, we haven't been to a movie in ages. Oh, it's a cartoon. Good, I could stand a laugh. We didn't come in here for laughs, Brooksy. Do you think Laban saw where we went? I don't know. It's pretty dark in here. Can you see? Well, it is. It's crowded. <laughs> Maybe we'd better take singles. You leave me alone and I'll scream the place down. Okay, okay. Hey, that looks like two in the middle there. Good. Excuse us, will you? Pardon me. I beg your pardon. Oh, this is fine. We can hold hands. Oh, George, are you all right? I think so. Oh, 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 did you see that? That was very funny. The monster was run over by a steamroller. I know just how he felt. Shh. What's it all about, George? What did those four X's on the map really mean? I don't know, but I'm working on it. You think we're safe in here? Well, there are four X's and we're right in the middle. Wait a minute. Shh. Quiet, I please. got it, Claire. That's it. The four X's and us in the middle. Shh, quiet. What, you two? No, look, George. There's LeBon coming down the aisle. Yeah, and Nubbin's coming down the other aisle. Oh, I don't think they see us. Let's get out of here. Oh, George. Oh, gosh, now I'll never know how the mouse got out of the cement mixer. Anybody following us now, George? No, I think we've shaken them. Driver? Yes, sir? Got a map of the city? Yeah, hey, you are. Good, thanks. Say, pull over to the curb a minute, will you? Sure. What is it, George? I only hope LeVon doesn't figure it out as fast as I did. Hey, you got a pencil, Brooksy? Uh, yeah, an eyebrow pencil. Good, thanks. Hey, now look. You remember the four intersections where the X's were? Yes, now, I fold the paper here yeah. and draw a straight line from this X to this X. Fold it again and draw another from here to here. And you get a big X. Yeah, Brooksy. X marks the spot intersecting at DeLong and King Avenue. And that's where we'll find Miss Dale Quillen. You, you made it. Hello. And you did mean me. Of course, who else? I don't believe we've met before. I'm Claire Brooks, George's fiance. Uh, secretary. Oh, practically the same thing. Looking at you, I guess it would be. How'd you know I was in your house? How'd you know I'd get your message? I knew Baptiste and Nubbin were inside. I was watching from the vacant house across the street. I saw them take you in and knew they'd make it tough for you. What made you think I'd catch that X marks the spot routine? Well, you'd gotten that far with a lot less to go on. Also, I found your business card in your wallet. You're George Valentine, aren't you? Well, perhaps I should introduce you two. I figured you'd know the score because you're a professional troubleshooter. And rather have I got trouble. Well, if I can be of any help... Now, wait a minute. Remember the sewer, George. Oh, I'm awfully sorry about that. I was panicky. It it won't happen again. Darn white of you. Come on, let's get away from here. First of all, suppose you tell us what you did with Marie Antoinette's necklace. After you. I, I haven't got it. I don't know where it is. Oh, well, that helps a lot. Take off, driver. Any of it here. Now, wait a minute. Let me get this. All we know is that you smuggled the pearls into the States. Now you tell us you don't know where they are. Take it from there. I know I had them. Levon concealed the pearls in a bottle of wine. I saw him do it. They were stuck to the bottom of the bottle with wax so they wouldn't rattle. Then he filled the bottle and sealed the top. I paid customs duty on the wine and got them through. Very smooth. Go on. Well, when I, when I got here, the seal was still unbroken, but... Well, well, you won't believe this, but when I opened the bottle, the pearls were gone. Somewhere in the middle of the Atlantic, somebody had made a switch. You're telling me the pearls were hijacked from you? It's true, I swear it. But do you think Yvonne would believe that? He'd say I double-crossed him. Men are so skeptical. Do you believe me? Well... Say you do. Say you'll help me. All right, I do, and I'll help you. Oh, swell. Now, all we've got to do is find the person who stole the pearls from the girl who smuggled them in for the boy who stole them in the first place. Mr. 
It's okay, Dale. This is my office. You'll be safe here. Yes, I'll see to that. Come on in, Claire. And shut the door. Better lock it. Should I swallow the key? Why did we have to stop at the library? Why did you have to take out a book at a time like this? Well, I'll tell you. And listen carefully. Levon's desperate. We've got to have some answers ready for him before he catches up with us. Oh, I have a feeling he's close by. You don't know him like I do. He's closing in on me. I know he is. Look, Dale, look. Keep calm. He's not in the filing cabinet or under the desk. Hey, Brooksy, open the closet door and show Dale he's not in there pointing a gun at her head. Okay. I have a surprise for you. He is. Huh? Keep your hands away from that desk, Monsieur Valentine. Back up, please, both of you. Miss Quillen, remain where you are. Oh, no. No, I knew it. I knew it. Face the wall, both of you. Your hands high. Higher. Nubbin? Yeah, Baptiste? Keep them covered. If either one makes a move to interfere, squeeze the trigger twice. I'll do that thing. And that's no gag, Joker. And now, we come to you, Sherry. At long last, eh? Baptiste, listen. You've got to listen. You've got to give me a break. You made a fool of Baptiste Lavon once. For that alone, I hate you. Should you do it twice, I would hate myself. No, Sherry. Your luck has run out. I didn't double-cross you, Baptiste. I swear I didn't. No? What do you call these? Pills? You rotten little cheat. Don't listen. I had them made, but give me a chance. I can explain. No, Sherry. They're phonies. Phony like yourself. Baptiste, the pearls, they were, they were gone when I opened the bottle. Somebody took them. You've got to believe me. You carry the light to the end, eh, Sherry? <laughs> Your last chance, my darling. Where are the pearls? I don't know. Don't move. Stay just as you are. I want to remember you like this forever. Bonsoir, Sherry. Well, on. Quiet, Joker. I know where the pearls are. I said quiet. Wait. What was that, Monsieur Valentine? Call off your dog, Levon. I'm ready to talk. Don't listen, Baptiste. He's a kidder. You can talk, Monsieur Valentine, from where you are. All right. Your story about Marie Antoinette's necklace got me interested in famous jewels. I've been to the library and picked up a book. That's in on my desk there, the red one. Now, go on, open it. To the page I have marked. If this Wait, is a Wait, Nubbin. The book, yes. Jewels of history. Go on, read it. Read what it says. I am reading. What is it, George? It's Dale's life insurance, Claire. Uh-huh. I have read it. Well? Well, I guess you win, Valentine. Can we put our hands down now, Levon? <sighs> of course. Let them alone, Nubbin. You have very nearly made a tragic mistake. I thank you, Monsieur Valentine. Baptiste Lavon thanks you. I don't get this, Baptiste. Come, Nubbin. We've worn out our welcome. Monsieur Valentine, we will trouble you no more. You will never see us again. Bonsoir, chérie. Now I will remember you always as you were in Paris. <laughs> a miracle, that's all it was, just a miracle. What did you do to him, George? What was in that book? Read it, Claire, out loud. Oh, yes. Cleopatra's pearl. Cleopatra, to impress Mark Antony, once dissolved a pearl in vinegar and drank it to his health. Dissolved it? Now, wait a minute, listen. Go ahead, Claire. Pearls which consist of carbonate of lime are extremely soluble in weak acids. They will dissolve in vinegar containing 6% or more of acetic acid or in wine which has turned sour. It was the wine that did it, the wine in the bottle. According to the U.S. Bureau of Chemistry and Soils, pearls consist of 91 and 7 tenths percent. Never mind the rest, Claire. That's enough. Well, how do you feel now, Dale? Oh, completely dazed. Levine didn't have an argument in the world. He knew he planted the pearls in that wine bottle himself. He had nobody to blame but himself. I can't believe it. You saved my life and I... Oh, George. Now what? Now I have to go to jail. Well, it's going to be kind of hard to hold you there. Why? Well, technically, since there weren't any pearls in the bottle when you brought it through the customs station, you actually didn't smuggle anything in, even though you meant to. Levon filched the pearls from the Nazis, but I doubt if any of them will turn up to claim them. No, it was all a wild goose chase for something that simply didn't exist. Well, I'm going to confess my part of it and take what's coming to me. First. George. Yeah? May I kiss you? <clears throat> he saved my life, Miss Brooks. May I? Where I'm going, it'll be a long time between kisses. Well, things aren't much better around here, but... Oh, all right, go ahead. 
Honestly, I think I must be going loony. Goodbye, George. Uh, Dale. <laughs> Just a minute. Yes? Be a nice girl and hand it over. What? Oh, come on, Dale. You certainly haven't forgotten why I got into this in the first place. And if you think I'm going to let you walk out of that door with my wallet, you're loony. <laughs> If your family car is the kind that does all-around duty, like taking mother shopping, dropping the children off at school, picking up father after work, you can't choose your tires too carefully. That's why I'd like to talk to you tonight about Atlas Grip Safe Tires. The Atlas tire has a specially designed tread that actually grips the road and brings you to a sure, safe stop whenever you apply the brake. Tomorrow... Ask at your independent Chevron gas station or standard station about the built-in safety features of Atlas tires. Then try them on your car for extra protection and extra riding comfort. Best of all, when you buy an Atlas passenger car tire, you get a written one-year guarantee against the cuts, bruises, and blowouts that threaten the life of ordinary tires. While you're talking tire safety and comfort at the standard station or independent Chevron gas station... Ask for those two other motor car friends, Chevron Supreme Gasoline and RPM Motor Oil. Next week, when you tune our way for The Joke Was on the Killer, another adventure of George Valentine, you'll hear George saying, Some joke, I'd say. Brooksy, see what's happened to Mrs. Ralston, will you? Oh, well, sure, George. Glenn, he made me go through with this farce and shoot those blanks. Well, he's not going to do anything like that to you again, Agnes. Wait a minute. Listen, everybody. This man is dead. We've had enough of this vicious nonsense. You're part of this, too. This act, Valentine. Now I know it. And you, get up. Oh, leave him alone. Come and help me with Mrs. Ralston, George. Now stop this, all of you. What Just do you what do I have to do to make myself clear? This started out as a joke, but it's no longer funny. This man is completely, hopelessly dead. Clinic Care, Hospital Care, a visiting nurse in your home. They are made possible by funds from Community Chest. Thousands of persons, old and young, benefit each year from health services of Community Chest. So give generously this October for your community's health and welfare. Chevron gas stations and standard stations throughout the West invite you to be with us again next week for The Joke Was on the Killer, another adventure of George Valentine, brought to you by the makers of Chevron Supreme Gasoline and RPM Compounded Motor Oil. Let George Do It stars Robert Bailey as George with Francis Robinson as Claire. Tonight's story was written by Doug Hayes and directed by Don Clark. Also heard in the cast were George Sorrell, Jim Nusser, Betty Moran, Jack Crucian, Victor Rodman, and Dick Ryan. The music is composed and conducted by Eddie Dunstetter. Your announcer, John Heaston. Listen again next week, same time, same station, to Let George Do It. This is the Mutual Don Lee Broadcasting System. KHJ Los Angeles, memo from stationers. Here are ballpoint pens for every purse or pocket. Tonight, we again present the famous Mr. Chameleon of Central Headquarters in his most famous cases of crime and murder. For those who do not know who Mr. Chameleon is, we give a quick sketch of his character. Born of a well-to-do family and a college man, he tried from childhood to live up to the name he bore, Chameleon, by taking on the color of whatever situation in which he found himself, appearing in endless guises, 
finally entering the police force where he became known as Chameleon, the man of many faces, the underworld's most dreaded man. Throughout this series, the listener will invariably know who Mr. Chameleon is, no matter in which disguise he appears. But the criminal he's tracking seldom does. Tonight we give you Mr. Chameleon and the case of death and the dependent husband. It is late afternoon, and in the modernistic bedroom of her East 50s apartment, Andrea Shepard is packing. Packing and trying to give her sympathetic attention to her husband, John, who is stretched out on the bed. And she says to him gently, Oh, darling, please. Why must you torment yourself with all these doubts? You know I love you. I hate to leave you like this. But after all... After all, you... You have to bring home the bacon. You're Andrea Shepard, the successful fashion designer, and aren't I lucky that you are so successful? John. According to your friends, I, I'm the luckiest man in the world. They don't even believe I'm sick. They say I like having you support me. Well, I know better. John, dear, I should be back Friday morning. Cliff, that charming half-brother of mine, even accuses me of being in love with your secretary. Oh, certainly by Friday noon at the latest. The fashion show takes place on Thursday night, and if I can catch a sleeper back to New York, I will. Otherwise, I'll fly. Andrea, are, are you listening to me? Oh, John, you forget I've heard all this a million times before. But they all say... I don't care what my friends say. I don't care what your half-brother Cliff says. He's no good. You've lent him too much money as it is. Yes, and he hates me for it. He's, he's even threatened me. He says if you really understood me, you'd... You'd leave me. Well, I do understand you, and I shan't leave you. As for your being in love with my secretary, darling, well, I'm very fond of Louise Clark, but I really don't think she's a threat to our marriage. I must admit she's got quite a crush on me. She knows I'm sickly, that I don't just sponge on you. So do I, John. And now, please, will you stop thinking about it? Just take care of yourself until I get back. And before you know it, darling, I will be back. John, I'm home. John, sweetheart. Andrea. Oh, Andrea, thank heaven you're here. Well, Louise, what's the matter? He's dead. He's dead. Who? John. John. When I got here this morning to go over your mail, he didn't answer the bell. The superintendent let me in and we found him in the kitchen, slumped over the table. He'd, he'd been dead for hours, Andrea. He, he'd been poisoned. John, dead? No. Oh, no, he can't be... John! John! And now, at Central Headquarters in the office of the Commissioner of Police, we find the Commissioner restlessly pacing the floor. And with him is the famous Mr. Chameleon, the man of many faces, the scourge of the underworld, who at present looks completely mild and harmless as he smiles and says... You know, Commissioner, if you aren't careful, you're going to burst a blood vessel. Well, it's three months since John Shepard was murdered, and we haven't dug up enough evidence to hold anyone. Well, what about the half-brother and Mrs. Shepard's secretary? Uh, we had to let them go. Oh. What else could we do? Now, Louise Clark is an emotional, neurotic young girl who admitted she had an unrequited love for John Shepard. Unrequited love is a form of poison, too. Uh, sure it is, Chameleon. But Andrea Shepard stuck by the girl, just the way she stuck by her hypochondriac husband. As for Cliff Shepard, the brother... Well, he's a bad egg. Apparently, he lived off John. Who lived off his wife? Sound like charming people. Well, the brothers hated each other. The night that John died, Cliff was quarreling with him. Yeah, we had a fine case against Cliff. Uh -huh, uh -huh. But you had to let him go. And uh... We couldn't prove that Cliff had brought John those almond cakes in which we found the poison. The bakery that sold them had had 100 customers that day. So the poison was inserted later, eh? Well, nothing will kill the taste like almond flavoring. Exactly, Chameleon. Furthermore, we could find no trace of where it was bought. So we had to let Cliff Shepard and Louise Clark go. Mm -hmm. Now, don't start quoting that pet motto of yours, the innocent must be protected and the guilty punished. I'm not in the mood. It's still a good motto, Commissioner. I wish you'd been free at the time to take the case. After three months, the trail's pretty cold. Well, that has its advantages, too. After three months, the killer feels fairly safe. Hmm? Look, Commissioner, let's send out a story. 
saying the Shepherd murder is an unsolved case. That'll make them feel even safer. All right. Good. Meanwhile, I want to meet Andrea Shepherd, murdered man's wife and her secretary, and Cliff Shepherd. Let's see now, how'll I do that? What sort of a man would start courting a three-month's widow because he'd fallen in love with a picture in the papers? I'd say a fool, chameleon. Yes. No, that's it. Hmm? A fool, but an entertaining fool with money in his pocket. Maybe he works for a big chemical company. Yes, I can see him, Commissioner, a natty dresser who laughs all the time at his own jokes. Yes, sir, Larry Whitlock is quite a card. Is that going to be his name, Chameleon? That is going to be my name, Commissioner. From this point on, I am Larry Whitlock. <laughs> Darling, can hardly wait till tonight. Your witless friend, Whitlock. <laughs> How's that, Dave? That's not bad, eh? <laughs> you know, Mr. Chameleon, if you have to keep this up much longer, you're honestly going to start thinking those jokes are funny. <laughs> well, never mind, Dave. I'm making headway. Tonight, for the first time, I'm having dinner with Andrea Shepard. Took weeks of flowers and telegrams to do it, but at last I'm having dinner with her at the Coronet Restaurant. Alone? Dave, for a detective sergeant of police, you ask more questions. Alone? No. Philip Hawley will be with us. He's the dress manufacturer for whom she does most of her designing. Nevertheless, I expect to escort her home and finally meet that little secretary of hers, Louise Clark. Mr. Chameleon, tell me something. Aren't you working awfully slow? In this case, it's necessary. You see, we're up against a killer who's exceptionally clever. One false move, we'll never get him. Well, now that does it. Yeah, those roses should convince Mrs. Shepard that I'm an ardent admirer. Three dozen. You see, that's Larry Whitlock for you. Always a little too much of everything. Mm. Well, good luck tonight. Well, the same to you, Dave. Have a nice trip. And um, if you get that information, call me immediately. Oh, yes, I will, Mr. Chameleon. Dave, please. The name is Larry. Good old Larry Whitlock, who doesn't have the sense he was born with, but he's going to be the life of the party if it kills him. <laughs> Oh, really, Larry, your humor is certainly not subtle. I don't know why I even laugh at it. Do you, Philip? Well, he doesn't. I haven't heard Mr. Hawley laugh once. I don't have to, Mr. Whitlock. You make up for it. <laughs> not bad, not bad. It's not bad at all. <laughs> is it, Andrea? He has a nice wit, too. What do you, what do you mean, mean, too? too? Yeah. <laughs> Beat you to it, Mr. Hawley, or rather we came out even. <laughs> Mr. Whitlock, do you mind if I ask you a question? If you really work for that big chemical company... Well, don't you believe I do? Well, it's simply amazing to me that you ever stop laughing long enough to hold such a job. Philip, really, you're being very rude. Larry's my friend, and he's done me a lot of good. I, for one, can use a little laughter. I'm sorry, Andrea. You're absolutely right. Mr. Whitlock, I apologize. Your apology is accepted, Mr. Hawley. No, 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 seriously. You've, you've been extremely good for Andrea. And as her friend and employer, I appreciate that. I'm only sorry that I have to leave the two of you so early. But you'll see that she gets home all right, won't you, Mr. Whitlock? Oh, don't worry. Uh, though I warn you, I'll make love to her all evening. <laughs> well, that's all right, just as long as she keeps on laughing. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Andrea, I don't think he takes me seriously, but he will someday. He will, he will, he will. Now, uh, let's see. Uh, what do I want for dessert? Oh, yes, we'd better order it if Philip has to leave soon. Yes. I know... That cake with almond filling that they make especially of here. I'm simply crazy about anything with an almond filling. <laughs> I... Well, what's the matter? Oh, Andrea, oh, darling, I'm so sorry. How stupid of me. I completely forgot about your husband. Andrea, darling, are you still upset? Oh, Larry, of course not. Please stop talking about it. Oh, this is my apartment. You'll come in for a minute, won't you? Well, I'll come in for several minutes. <laughs> but um, I, I know that you've been upset. You've hardly heard what I said during the past hour. Well, Larry, I was a little upset. I loved John very much. He was both my husband 
and my child. Well, who do you think killed him? Surely not your secretary. Now, uh, you said you have her living here with you. Surely if you thought she'd killed him... Larry, Louise is a very tragic girl. But lately she's frightened me. She's even talked of suicide. No, oh. In fact... No, I won't do it. You had no business to come here and threaten me this way. No, What's that? What's Louise? And someone must be with her. I'll come here as often as I please. And you won't make trouble for me. Not after tonight. It's Cliff. John's half-brother. What's he doing here? How dare he come here this way? How dare he? Cliff! Well, Andrea, what a pleasant surprise. We didn't expect you home for hours. Louise, how did he get in here? He was here when I got back from the movies, Andrea. He let himself in with a skeleton key. What? Sure I did. I thought I'd take a look around. I'm trying to find out who killed poor John. You mean you were <laughs> after money? He asked me for money, Andrea. And then he started saying terrible things about John and me again. All of them true. John himself told me you were so crazy in love with him, you scared him to death. Be quiet and get out. Oh, I know. You're so loyal, Andrea. Just the way you were loyal to your chiseler of a husband. I said get out. I'm fully convinced it was you who killed John. It was just too bad the police couldn't hold you. Well, let me tell you something. I heard from, from certain friends of mine that a man named Chameleon has been put on the job. The smartest detective in the business. You never know when he's around. You never know. Anyway, somebody better start watching his step. And uh, what are you so scared of, old boy? <laughs> or shouldn't I ask? What? And uh, where did you hear this rumor? Uh, do you have friends in the underworld, eh? <laughs> who the devil are you? Andrea, who is he? This is a friend of mine, Mr. Whitlock. Larry, this is Cliff Shepherd, And this is my secretary, Louise Clark. How do you do, Mr. Whitlock? How do you do? <laughs> and as for you, old boy, I wish I could say I was glad to meet you, but I'm sure you wouldn't want me to tell a lie now, would you? Huh? <laughs> Very funny. Where'd you pick up this character, Andrea? Consoling yourself pretty quickly, aren't you? Listen, old boy. And don't call me old boy. I might suddenly decide to slap you down. Oh, really? You mean like this? Larry! Mr. Whitlock! What did you do to me? You threw me over your shoulder. How did you do it? Nothing to it, old boy. That's just something I studied in college. In fact, I majored in it. Uh, shall I uh, do it again? No, no. Well, then I suggest that you leave quietly. Andrea already has asked you twice. I, my friend, will ask you only once. <laughs> Really, it was just too funny. <laughs> I didn't expect it from you. I know, I know. I know. <laughs> Most people think I'm good for nothing except clowning, Andrea. You know, if I were you, I'd be afraid of Cliff. I am. I am. You also should be a little afraid of your secretary, Louise Clark. That's a very sick girl. You don't know which way she'll jump. Poor child. She's probably crying herself to sleep right now. Larry... You see that cigarette box on the table next to you? Yes, yes. Open it. Oh. <laughs> Plays a tune. <laughs> yes. That was John's favorite piece. Louise gave him the box. She spent a whole week's salary for it. She... Larry. What was that? It sounded like Louise. It came from her room. Come on. Louise. Louise, are you all right? It's Clark. Try the door. It's locked. Locked? Oh, no. Louise, open the door. Oh, what's happening in there? Larry, what's happening? Get out of the way, Andrea. I'm going to break in the door. Louise. Miss Clark, what happened? Who did this? Oh, she's ill. Look, Larry, they're on the dresser. Some of the almond cakes, just like the ones that killed John. Mr. Chameleon and the case of death and the dependent husband continues in just a moment. And now back to Mr. Chameleon and the case of death and the dependent husband. It is the following morning, and again we find Mr. Chameleon in the police commissioner's office. And this time it is he and not the commissioner who is pacing nervously about the room. I was Louise Clark. What's the latest report, Commissioner? I'm afraid she's still in a coma, Chameleon. I'm in her at the hospital, but she hasn't been able to talk, so we still don't know exactly what happened. 
Well, do they think there's a chance that she might die? Well, apparently there is. Hmm. What about Cliff Shepard? He's gone. I'm not surprised. We sent out an alarm for him right after you telephoned, but he'd already skipped. Did they uh, check on the almond cakes? Miss Clark herself had bought them. Mm. The baker was able to swear to that. He remembered her this time. She and Shepard certainly had a fatal taste for almond cakes. Well, Chameleon, you know as well as I do, it's the one thing that'll make that poison palatable. Quite right, Commissioner. Well, that's one way of killing yourself. You think that's what it was? Attempted suicide? Possible. Almost anything is possible now. Lord knows Cliff Shepard had plenty of time to put the poison in those cakes. Been there at the Shepard apartment for some time when Louise Clark got in from the movies last night. Well, Chameleon, does it occur to you that if Cliff murdered John Shepard, he might have hidden the poison right there in the apartment? Oh, of course. Well, Commissioner, I guess it's up to me to locate that poison. I wish you luck. The Shepard apartment was searched this morning. The boys couldn't find any trace of poison anywhere. If only Dave Arnold would get in touch with me. Well, apparently, Detective Sergeant Arnold is having his troubles, too. That's the most elusive poison I've ever come up against. I'd better get me a search warrant. Hey, wait a minute, Chameleon. Do you really intend to search Mrs. Shepard's apartment? I do. I have a hunch the poison's still there. And, Commissioner, I want to get my hands on it fast. But how the devil will you work it? Now, you're disguised as Larry Whitlock, a gay young blade who's employed by a chemical company. What reason could you give her for searching the apartment? Mm. The very best reason in the world, Commissioner. <laughs> I'm glad you find it so funny. I'm sorry. As uh, Larry Whitlock, I have acquired the bad habit of finding myself amusing. But uh, it'll pass. Mm. And uh, seriously, I'm going to search that apartment. And believe it or not, Andrea Shepard will let me go ahead and do it. You see, Andrea, I acquired an interest in chemistry at a very early age. And just between you and me, I... Darling, am I boring you? Because if I am, don't tell me. Oh, Larry, really? <laughs> I haven't gotten a single laugh out of you all evening. Well, there are times when people don't feel like laughing. You seem to forget Louise may be dying. Oh. Uh, did you go to the hospital this afternoon? Yes. She didn't even recognize me. I'm so frightened, Larry. I have a terrible feeling I may be next. Oh, no, darling. No, that's not possible. I'm here, aren't I? Uh, not that that would stop it. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Larry. Well, at least that got a little response. Andrea, I'm crazy about you. I'm simply crazy no, about please. you. No, please. No, I am. I am. Now, don't pull away from me. I may be a clown, but I make love very nicely. No, Larry, no. Oh, saved by the bell. Oh, you see, <laughs> you can't even be serious about your lovemaking. Honestly, Larry, I've never known such a character. <laughs> Hello? If that's Philip Hawley, hang up. <laughs> uh, uh, what's that? Oh, just a moment, please. It's for you, Larry, and Mr. Arnold calling you from Buffalo. Oh, well, thank you. I left this number down at the hotel. Hello? Dave? Yes? You did? Good. Huh? Huh? Okay, Dave. That means I can close the deal immediately. Bye. Well, that was a fascinating conversation. Business? Uh, yes, Andrea, a very big deal. And now, uh, where were we? Um, I was sitting with my left arm around Larry, you. Larry, wait, I have something to tell you. I shouldn't even have let you bring me home tonight. You see, my dear, I'm going to marry Philip Hawley. What? Yes. I'm not in love with him. I'll never be in love with anyone but John. But he's kind and, and so solid. Uh, oh, and I'm not solid. And hardly. Oh, you're fun and full of tricks that amuse people. But I want someone I can lean on. I'm sorry, Larry. Well, darling, now I'll tell you something. I'm Mr. Chameleon. Who? Mr. Chameleon. You mean the famous detective? The one that Cliff Shepard was talking about? Yes. Oh. What's the matter? <laughs> oh, I get the point. If I'm going to marry Philip Hawley, you're Mr. Chameleon. You really don't believe I'm going to marry Philip, do you? And you don't really believe I'm Mr. Chameleon. Fair enough. <laughs> well, I am going to marry Philip Hawley. And I certainly don't believe you're Mr. Chameleon, the famous detective. Well, then I'll have to prove it to you, darling. I'm going to search the apartment. Oh, Larry, you idiot. <laughs> yes, I am. Andrea, where shall I start? I wonder if the poison could be hidden in these books. Oh, now, listen, Larry, fun is fun. Oh, but... no, nothing in the books. Well, what about this vase? No, nothing in there either. Larry, how long do you intend to keep this up? You certainly run a joke right straight into the ground. I have to prove to you that I'm Mr. Chameleon, don't I'm I? I'm afraid I'll have to prove to you that 
I'm in no mood for jokes tonight. Will you forgive me, Larry, if I get you your hat? What? <laughs> go ahead, Andrea. Will you forgive me if I tap the woodwork to see if it's hollow? <laughs> oh, go ahead. <laughs> no, seems to be perfectly solid. Just like my head. Beat you to it, darling. Larry, where did you leave your hat? <laughs> Put it in the closet. Now, uh, let's see. Um, cigarette box. Musical cigarette box that plays a tune when you raise the cover. Nothing but cigarettes. Unless... Unless... Uh... What are you doing? What, dear? What are you doing with that box? Well, I'm going to examine it. Thoroughly, I might add. No, put it down. I... I won't have anyone touching that box. It belonged to John. Put it down. So that's where the poison is hidden. I thought so. Well, I'll have to pry off the top of the lid. Don't you touch it! My, 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 my. But we're getting excited, aren't we? Let's see, where is my penknife? Here we are. I warn you, if you touch that box, Larry, I will... Chameleon is the name... And I happen to have a search warrant right here with me. You won't need it, chameleon. Put it away. What? Philip. Well, if it isn't Mr. Philip Hawley, the not-so-solid businessman, my successful rival, or John Shepard's uh, successful rival, I might add, the two of you planned his death together, didn't you? Save your breath, chameleon. It won't do you any good. And drop that penknife. I... That's better. Andrea, search him. See if he has a gun. I haven't. Search him, Andrea. But, Philip, you, you don't think... He's not really Mr. Comedian. Of course he is. Oh, he fooled me, too. But you, Andrea, you little moron, you had to give it away. He, he guessed the poison was in the music Guessed? Box. You practically told him. Well, I, I couldn't help it. I was so nervous. Why shouldn't I be nervous? Why, that's right. It's poor Andrea who did all the dirty work. First John and then Louise, because Louise might suspect. As Andrea so rightly said, why shouldn't she be nervous? Aren't you just a bit nervous, Mr. Chameleon? You should be. You'll never get out of here alive to tell your story. I don't have to. What do you mean? Well, um, that phone call a moment ago is from Detective Sergeant Arnold, who was calling me from Buffalo. He called me, Andrea, to tell me that at last he'd managed to trace the sale of that poison. Let... See, I sent Dave to Buffalo because I knew that you had spent quite a lot of time there supervising your fashion shows. It was on one of your last trips that you purchased the poison, under another name, but the man who sold it will identify you. If he finds her. Also, needless to say, if anything happens to me, the police will know who did it. Philip, he's right. Yes, Andrea, but there's one little thing he's forgotten. At least if we get rid of him, we can make a run for it. How about it, chameleon? Isn't that true? Quite true. Philip, don't go so close to him. Don't be silly. You don't think I'm afraid of him. Oh. I have a gun and he has nothing. Nothing. Have you, chameleon? No. Just the same. Don't go too close to him, Philip! <laughs> well, that's too bad. Andrea never did get a chance to tell you I was an expert at jujitsu. Andrea, when I dropped that gun, why didn't you pick it up? She was too nervous, too nervous, Mr. Hawley. Anyway, I have it now, and I think the three of us will take a little ride to police headquarters. Uh-huh, you see, Mr. Chameleon? They hid the poison right here, inside the music box. Right under the edge of the lid. Hmm. Very clever, Dave. Oh, would you like to take a look at it, Miss Clark? No, please, Mr. Chameleon. I never want to see that box again. Okay, Dave, take it away. Yes, sir. Miss Clark, may I say something? You're all right now. The doctor's managed to save you from that poison. But there's more than one kind of poison, you know. You must try to forget this. You must forget John Shepard. I will. I made up my mind I will, Mr. Chameleon. I was afraid I'd be accused of murder. There's only one thing I can't understand. Oh? Why did Andrea kill John? Why didn't she simply divorce him? I suppose that only a psychiatrist could really answer that one. My guess is that Andrea Shepard had played a part for years, and she loved it. She loved being the noble young wife. People felt sorry for her. They admired her. They wouldn't have admired her so much if she'd uh, thrown aside a sick husband in order to marry Philip Hawley. You see, when I finish a job, I put aside my disguise. Andrea Shepard couldn't bear to put aside hers. And 
with these words, Mr. Chameleon concludes tonight's murder case. Wednesday night at the same time for Mr. Chameleon, the man of many faces, in The Vestibule Murder Case. The part of Mr. Chameleon is played by Carl Swenson, with dialogue by Marie Balmer from the original story by Frank and Ann Hummert. Music directed by Victor Arden. Your announcer is Howard Claney. Mr. Chameleon, the new mystery drama, will be heard in another performance next Wednesday night at this time. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. Tonight, we again present the famous Mr. Chameleon of Central Headquarters in his most famous cases of crime and murder. For those who do not know who Mr. Chameleon is, we give a quick sketch of his character. Born of a well-to-do family and a college man, he tried from childhood to live up to the name he bore, Chameleon. By taking on the color of whatever situation in which he found himself, appearing in endless guises, Finally entering the police force, where he became known as Chameleon, the man of many faces, the underworld's most dreaded man. Throughout this series, the listener will invariably know who Mr. Chameleon is, no matter in which disguise he appears. But the criminal he's tracking seldom does. Tonight we give you Mr. Chameleon and the case of the woman who sensed murder. It is nine o'clock at night, and there's a light burning in the office of the Commissioner of Police. He is sitting across the desk from Mr. Chameleon, the man of many disguises, the detective, detective who has been the nemesis of so many criminals. Well, here's the letter, Chameleon. Yeah. My dear Commissioner, I have thought long before writing this, but the time has come when, compelled by fear, I am forced to write. I am an old woman, but a sane one. And many things have occurred in this house which make me believe that some person in it has planned to murder me. Well, go on, Commissioner. I am writing to you, Mr. Commissioner, because my attorney, Mr. Huntington, is in Europe and I have no other place to turn. I have been reading about your Mr. Chameleon and I wondered if he could visit me. I knew his mother and remember him as a lad. And I'd feel rather safer in his hands than in those of an ordinary policeman. Signed... Helen Audrey. Oh, feel safer in your hands, Chameleon, than in the hands of an ordinary policeman. Well, well. Commissioner, I think that um, a letter like this from Mrs. Audrey may have a very, very black background. When are you going to see her? As soon as I can get there. Mrs. Audrey is one of the richest women in New York. She has a tremendous amount of money. Too many people stand to benefit from her death. Mm -hmm. You get me a squad car and have Detective Sergeant Dave Arnold meet me downstairs at once. That's the Audrey Mansion, Mr. Chameleon, and it's all lit up. Guess they're giving a party. Well, there's only one car. Dave, look at the license. That's a doctor's car. Come on. Now, this looks like the doctor coming out. I beg your pardon. Are you the doctor? Uh, I am Dr. Hammond, Mrs. Audrey's physician. Then Mrs. Audrey is sick? Mrs. Audrey is dead. Dead? Dr. Hammond... I am um, Chameleon of Central Headquarters. Yes, I've heard of you. Uh, tell me, Doctor, how did Mrs. Audrey die? 
the symptoms are those of an overdose of heart medicine. But I am willing to give no opinion further than that they are the symptoms of an overdose. Thank you, thank you, Doctor. I uh, wondered if you could uh, wait inside a moment. I may need to ask you some further questions. Gladly, Mr. Chameleon. I'll be in the library. Thank you. Dave. Yes? Not one word about the letter the commissioner got from Mrs. Andre. When I talk to these people, I want their guard down. Okay. I smell murder. Dr. Hammond, how did Mrs. Audrey happen to take that overdose of medicine? Wasn't she warned that an overdose would be fatal? I warned her repeatedly, Mr. Chameleon. I said only one tablet at a time. Oddly enough, when I just looked in the box, there was only one tablet missing. Yet she must have taken more. Who was with Mrs. Audrey at the time of her death? Not a soul. Mm -hmm. Servants were out. Her two sons were out. Even her daughter-in-law, Stella Audrey, was not at home. She says that Bobby, that's her 12-year-old boy, wanted to see a movie. It was uh, Stella Audrey who discovered the body, wasn't it, Doctor? Yes. Uh, when can I question her? Not till morning, I'm afraid, Mr. Chameleon. She's in a state of prostration. Oh. Very well, but that is the deadline. I must question her then. So you see, Mrs. Andre, it seems very, very strange to me that your mother-in-law should have died here completely alone. Strange? Oh, it was horrible. Simply horrible, Mr. Chameleon. I'll never forgive myself for going out last night. But I was positive that Joseph and Alfred were with her. Uh, those are her sons, I take it, the famous Audrey twins. Yes, that's right. If famous is the word for their cafe society antics. Oh, I know, but Mr. Chameleon, in all fairness to them, their mother treated them like children. Uh, what happens now? Do they inherit the Audrey fortune? Why do you ask me that? Because I want to know everything. Everything that you know. It all goes to me and Bobby. My mother-in-law gave all her love to my husband, Mr. Chameleon, and then to my boy, her grandson. Mrs. Audrey, could it be that your mother-in-law took this overdose of heart medicine purposely and dropped the curtain on her own life? Oh, no. No, it, it must have been an accident. And she couldn't have been murdered. Who was murdered? Sure, and what's going on here, Miss Teller? Oh, Nanny. And who might this be? And why is he bothering you? Uh, Nanny, this is Mr. Chameleon, the famous detective from Central Headquarters. And this is Nora Lowry, who's been with Mrs. Audrey for many, many years. Except the one time she needed me, God rest her poor soul. Uh, how do you do, sir? How do you do? And I'm sorry I spoke so sharp. But how could she be murdered when no one was here? And she couldn't have taken an overdose of that medicine on purpose. You think not, Miss Lara? Oh, no. But poor soul, there was an odd thing about her, sir. She was scared to death of dying alone like she did. Isn't that so, Miss Stella? Why, yes, that's true, Mr. Chameleon. Mrs. Audrey used to talk about it. It was a phobia, as if she had a premonition. <sighs> Just like the stupid phobia I have about being cut with a knife. Cut with a knife? Oh, it's childish, isn't it? When I was a little girl, I was badly cut one day while playing. Ever since that time, I've had a horror of a knife. I can't even pick one up. Well, that's quite understandable. All right, Mrs. Andre, um, thank you for your cooperation. And uh, you too, Miss Lara. Uh, then I'll get on with the packing, shall I, Miss Stella? Oh, yes, do that, Nanny. Packing? Does that mean that you're going away, Mrs. Andre? After the funeral, Mr. Chameleon. My mother-in-law had a summer cottage at the beach club. Oh. Now, especially, I want to get Bobby away from this house. What? Why do you look at me so strangely? I was just wondering whether it might not be better for you to stay in New York. Well, maybe not. Now, if you'll excuse me, Mrs. Andre, I think I'll join Detective Sergeant Arnold and the nightclub twins. Or didn't you know that your brothers-in-law are known about town as the nightclub twins? And who are you to ask us such personal questions? Wasn't the shock of Mother's death bad enough without having to put up with a couple of policemen? He means us, Mr. Chameleon. Uh, yes, I gathered as much, Dave. Mr. Chameleon! Mr. Chameleon, is that who you are? Yes, Mr. Joseph. Or are you Mr. Alfred? I'm Joseph Audrey. Oh, really, this is surprising. 
The famous chameleon working on a simple case like this. Which resulted in your mother's death. Poor mother, I Stop always... Stop it, Alfred. She... Mr. Chameleon, you're such a famous detective. I always pictured you as turning up in some impenetrable disguise and handling only big cases. Well, this may be a big one. Suppose I told you that it was murder. Then I'd say you were mad. Mother wasn't murdered. A heart attack is death from natural causes. Mr. Chameleon, whatever it is you're suspecting, I'd like to remind you of one important point. My brother and I are still quite penniless. Stella and Bobby inherited everything. Is that a fact? That is a fact, Detective Sergeant Arnold. However, I'm sure that Stella will be glad to take care of us. We expect to go with her and Bobby to the cottage, the beach club. Why not? Alfred and I are quite used to being parasites. We don't like it particularly, but we'll stand it if we have to. We police have the idea that where murder is the issue, people have to stand a lot. I'll tell you one thing, Dave. Joseph Audrey meant it when he said they didn't enjoy being parasites. Those two want money badly. And they're spending the summer under the same roof with Stella Audrey and her son. I don't trust those guys, Mr. Chameleon. But say, what about that heart medicine? That interests me very much, Dave. There were ten tablets in that box. Now there are nine. Yet Mrs. Audrey got an overdose. Where did the extra tablets come from? And who gave them to her? Yes, that's the point, Dave. Who? And a terrible fear that she had of dying alone. Stella Audrey with her fear of a knife. Why did she tell me that? Too deep for me, Mr. Chameleon. You know, the more I think of that summer cottage, the less I like it. Wait a minute, I have it. Hmm? Where's Madeline Evans? Oh, she's going on vacation. Hmm, how right you are. Nice long vacation at the beach club. What? A lady detective on a holiday. Such a beautiful detective. She can keep an eye on the Audreys. And are you going up there too, Mr. Chameleon? Well, now, let's see. I play tennis, I can swim, I can ride. You suppose that the uh, beach club, at the urging of the police, uh, would like to hire a sports instructor? A sports instructor named Michael O'Rourke. Gee, Miss Evans, that was a wonderful oh, shot. Oh, thank you, Bobby. You, uh, you like to play tennis, don't you? I like to play with you. You're terrific. Uh, would I be speaking out of turn if I uh, disagreed with the young man? What? What? Well, I've been uh, standing here watching you. And if the young lady will uh, forgive me, her backhand drive is very weak. She doesn't hold the racket properly. What do you mean? She's perfect. Who are you, anyhow? Well, my name is Michael O'Rourke, and I'm the new sports instructor. Oh, how do you do? My name is Madeline Evans, and this is Bobby Audrey. It's a pleasure, I'm sure. It'd certainly be a pleasure to teach a pretty girl like Miss Evans to hold her racket properly. You leave her alone. She's all right as she is. Oh, Bobby, I'm simply dying of thirst. Would you get me a glass of water? I'd do anything for you, Miss Evans. And you leave her alone, Mr. O'Rourke. Oh, I certainly will. I um, see that you've made a conquest, Madeline. Mr. Chameleon. When did you get here? <laughs> About two hours ago. Detective Sergeant Arnold will probably join us tomorrow. Right now he's checking up on old Mrs. Audrey's will and also investigating the private lives of the sons, Joseph and Alfred Audrey. Oh, those creatures. You're right about Bobby, Mr. Chameleon. I have made a conquest. Uh, how is uh, Bobby's mother, Stella Audrey? Oh, not so good. Oh. She looks like a ghost. She... She takes long walks all alone down by the sand dunes. Hmm. Nanny, who keeps house for them, you've met Nanny. Oh, yes, yes. It's for Nanny's benefit that I've worked hard on my brogue. Well, Nanny tells me she's worried sick. But then... Uh, Miss Evans, uh, surely you don't grip the racket correctly at all. What? Somebody's coming. Uh, now, the, the uh, uh, proper way to hold it. Miss Evans, Miss Evans! Why, it's Nanny. Uh, where's Master Bobby? I've got to find him. He mustn't come near the cottage. Not till the ambulance has taken her away. The ambulance? What do you mean? They found his mother two miles down the beach. She went on one of her walks and someone robbed her. They took her rings and they stabbed <gasps> her. They're afraid she won't live through the night. Stabbed with a knife. Oh, 
I wonder how Mrs. Ardry's getting along, Mr. Chameleon. Uh, O'Rourke, if you please. Mike to you, Madeline. Watch that. Oh, on a beautiful night like this, death seems very remote. No, not to Stella Ardry, who was stabbed with a knife. And death may be approaching us right now. Here comes one of the twins. Oh, that's Joseph. Mr. Ardry? Mr. Ardry? Yes, Miss Evans? How is your sister-in-law? Stella is dead. Oh, no. We're taking her body back to New York tomorrow. And uh, what becomes of the little lad? If you're referring to my nephew, my brother and I are his guardians now. We're taking him back to New York with us, of course. Good night. Good night. Mr. Chameleon, did you hear what he said? Those two men are Bobby's guardians. Yes, Madeline, I heard and I heard something else. Mrs. Audrey is dead, stabbed. Like her mother-in-law, she died in the way that she feared most. Now, doesn't that strike you as very odd indeed? And Madeline, doesn't it tell you something about the killer? Mr. Chameleon and the case of the woman who sensed murder continues in just a moment. And now back to Mr. Chameleon and the case of the woman who sensed murder. It is the following morning, and along a wooded bridle path come two horsemen, Mr. Chameleon and Detective Sergeant Arnold. Both men look extremely grave, and Mr. Chameleon is saying, So after Bobby's death, Joseph and Alfred Audrey would at last inherit the Audrey fortune. What do you mean after, Mr. Chameleon? I mean O'Rourke. You'd think the boy was already dead. I'm afraid it's only a matter of time. That was an interesting will, Dave. Very interesting. Makes me all the more interested in those heart tablets that killed old Mrs. Audrey. Yeah, but where's the guy that killed the old lady? Not a trace yet. See, that's the trouble. It may take time to break this case, and we haven't got time. Bobby hasn't got time. I wonder what he's afraid of. Oh, the kid? Yes. You see, his grandmother, remember, was afraid of dying alone. That's how she died. Stella, his mother, had a dread of being cut. She was stabbed to death. There's a queer sadistic pattern there, Dave. I know that boy may be murdered, but I don't know by whom and I don't know how. Mr. Chameleon, there he is, coming out of the paddock. Oh, he's probably waiting for Madeline. Uh, you better beat it, Dave. Okay, see you later. No. Well, hello there, young fella. Are uh, you waiting for Madeline? I'm waiting for Miss Evans. We're going riding together. You'd like to ride, don't you? You're not going along, are you, Mr. O'Rourke? Miss Evans told me that just her and me, that we could spend the day together. Oh, I wouldn't come near the two of you. But you know, Bobby, uh, you really have the makings of an all-round sportsman. You ride, you play tennis. Are you scared of guns? Oh, me? No. Ah. Did you ever go up in an airplane? Sure, often. We flew to California last year. Is that a fact now? Well, Bobby, you're a better man than I am. I wouldn't go up in a plane on a bit. I'm just a coward, that's all. You are? Oh, sure. All of us are about something. With me, it's flying. I'm not ashamed to admit it. Mr. O'Rourke, if I tell you something, will you promise not to tell Miss Evans? My Uncle Alfred says I'm a coward, too. And I am. Oh, I don't believe that. Yes, I am. Whenever I go in swimming, I stay close to the shore. I don't even swim to the raft because I'm scared of the water. Only I'm going to get over it. Well, Bobby... Yes, I am, Mr. O'Rourke. I'm going to make myself get over it. Someday soon, I'm going to make myself go out in the water beyond my depth. So there we are, Madeline. Now, at least I know the method of the killing. When... Early in the morning, no doubt, when there's no lifeguard on the beach. But, Mr. Chameleon, how awful. Because a child wants to prove he isn't a coward, he's going to be murdered. We can stop it, Mr. Chameleon. We can patrol the beach. Yes, but the murderer won't come to the beach with Bobby. They'll watch. Yes, but from a distance. See, the trouble is, if we save Bobby's life, they'll try again later on, when the boy's been taken beyond our reach. But you've got to save his life. We can't let him drown. No, no, Dave, but um, appearances can be very deceiving... Now look at me. Heavy tan, reddish hair, plus an Irish brogue, and I am Michael O'Rourke. Only I'm not, you see. 
But, Mr. Chameleon, what the heck has that got to do with the kid drowning? I don't get it. Well, you will, Dave, you will. Meet me at the beach at six in the morning. You better be prepared to get good and wet. For Pete's sake, Mr. Chameleon, how long do we have to stay here in the water? Uh, keep your head down, Dave. I don't want anyone to see us from the shore. We've been hanging onto this raft for hours. Oh, 15 minutes at most. <laughs> Bobby's coming. He'll come soon. Uh, we should have patrolled the beach. Oh, uh, they wouldn't do it, Dave. They must think that the child is dead. <sighs> oh, look, there he is. Bobby? Mm-hmm. Yes, he's alone. I thought he would be. Do you think they're watching him? Oh, I'm sure of it. Yes, he's coming into the water now. Starting to swim toward the raft. Yeah. Oh, Mr. Chameleon, what sort of a person is it who can stand by and watch while a child drowns? That question will soon be answered. He's slowing down. It's too far for him all the way out to this raft. Keep out of sight, Dave. I'll bring him round to the back of the raft. But that's a long way for you to swim underwater, isn't it? I'll make it. I've got to. Help! Help! There he goes. He's calling for help. Okay. Dave, keep out of sight as if your life depended on it. It's Michael O'Rourke, Nanny. The love of your life. Mr. O'Rourke, this is no time for joking. We're going back to New York to bury Mrs. Archie. Oh, I'm sorry. Now, that was stupid of me. Uh, let me come in for a moment, won't you? I'd, I'd like to say goodbye to the little lad. Well, uh, Master Alfred and Master Joseph are having their breakfast. Oh, let them. I don't mind. Well, all right. Come on in. I'll go and fetch Master Bobby. Who's that, Nanny? It's Mr. O'Rourke, the sports instructor, Master Alfred. I'll be right back. Fine, fine, Nanny. Well, good morning, gentlemen. What do you want? Alfred, there's no need for you to be rude just because other people have no manners. I, um, I came to say goodbye. To whom? To Bobby. And why the devil are you so interested in Bobby? Master Bobby isn't here, Mr. O'Rourke. His room's empty. What? But where is he? I don't know, Master Joseph. I can't imagine. Uh, would he by any chance have gone to the beach for a swim? <laughs> Not Bobby. He'd be scared to death to go in at this hour. Oh, wait now. His bathing suit always hung in that closet. I'll just take a look. What made you think Bobby might have gone swimming, Mr. O'Rourke? Oh, no reason. He's I, uh... gone. His bathing suit's gone. You're crazy, Nanny. He couldn't have gone for a swim. Well, he must have. Oh, heaven help us. What has the poor child done? There's no lifeguard there at this hour, Mr. O'Rourke, and he could hardly swim at all. Well, then why did you urge him to try to swim to the raft? What? Why did you tell him that he mustn't be a coward? That Miss Evans wouldn't like him if she knew he was a coward? What the devil are you talking about? Are you crazy, too? Oh, the man must be touched in the head. I never told Bobby he should swim to the raft. Yes, you did, Nanny. You told me just this morning. Who said that? Who said that? It was Bobby. He's here. He can't be. I, I imagined I heard his voice. You told me it would be good for me to swim to the raft, Nanny. Just like you told Mother to walk to that lonesome place down the beach. Stop it, sir. I won't listen. Look, Nanny. There in the doorway. Bobby. All dripping wet. It's his ghost come to plague me. He's dead. I watched him die. Yes, but he didn't die, Nanny. Detective Sergeant Dave Arnold and I saved him. Oh, you couldn't have. I didn't see. I, I mean, I... Uh, well, why should I do a thing like that to darling little Bobby? Well, I'll tell you why. Under the terms of old Mrs. Audrey's will, you receive $5,000 a year. Unless you outlive both Stella and Bobby. In that event, your yearly income is 25000 a year. How do you know this? Detective Sergeant Arnold brought me a transcript of the will. But I, I don't understand. What's happened to your brogue? Who are you? I'm Mr. Chameleon of Central Headquarters. And I arrest you, Nanny, for the murders of Mrs. Audrey and her daughter-in-law, Stella Audrey. No, no, I didn't do it. Well, here is the proof. Dave, come in, please. Here I am, Mr. Chameleon. Dave, that uh, handbag that uh, Nanny never lets out of her sight. Get that for me. No, no, you can't have it. Give it to me. Yes. Here are the rest of the tablets of death. <gasps> Nanny... For months, you stole them one at a time from old Mrs. Audrey, and then you murdered her with an overdose. Mr. Chameleon, you're a wicked man. I love Mrs. Audrey. If she were here, she'd tell you I loved her. Very touching, Nanny. But it won't go. See, first Mrs. Audrey wrote the commissioner of police that she thought her life was in danger. And then we found this note. A little safe even you didn't know she had, Nanny. 
and it ends this way. And should I be killed, the person I suspect is Nora Lowry. You've made it all up. My motto, you know, is the innocent must be protected, the guilty must be punished. And you come in on the last sentence. Dave, you bring in the state's witness, please. Okay. Come in, Mr. Smithers. Him! Him! Mr. Smithers, do you uh, identify this woman as the one who purchased from you this knife that kills Stella Ardre? I do. I identify her, sir. And I've already identified the knife. Oh, it's all against me. Mr. Alfred, Mr. Joseph, help me. Leave us out of this. You murderous. I was always afraid of you. But I did it all for you. I killed them both for you. No, you didn't. You did it for yourself. Come along, Nanny. We're going. Now that you've settled this case, Chameleon, what's going to happen to the boy, Bobby? Well, he's going out west to live with his mother's sister, Commissioner. Hmm. I understand she's very fond of him. And, if you please, he's being personally escorted there. Hmm. Madeline, you come in here, please. Yes, Mr. Chameleon, I just stopped in to say goodbye. Goodbye? Uh, Madeline is using the rest of her vacation, Commissioner, to see that Bobby reaches his destination safely. Well, that's very kind of you, Miss Evans. Not at all, Commissioner. I expect to enjoy the trip. Yes, and she will. You know, this girl is an expert at making conquests, and a woman doesn't have to be a detective to know that a train is a perfect setting for conquests. With these words, Mr. Chameleon concludes tonight's murder case. next Wednesday night at the same time for Mr. Chameleon, the man of many faces in The Case of His Brother's Murderer. The part of Mr. Chameleon is played by Carl Swenson with dialogue by Marie Balmer from the original story by Frank and Ann Hummert. Music directed by Victor Arden. Your announcer is Howard Claney. Mr. Chameleon, the new mystery drama will be heard in another performance next Wednesday night at this time. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. Tonight, we again present the famous Mr. Chameleon of Central Headquarters in his most famous cases of crime and murder. For those who do not know who Mr. Chameleon is, we give a quick sketch of his character. Born of a well-to-do family and a college man, he tried from childhood to live up to the name he bore, Chameleon, by taking on the color of whatever situation in which he found himself, appearing in endless guises, Finally entering the police force where he became known as Chameleon, the man of many faces, the underworld's most dreaded man. Throughout this series, the listener will invariably know who Mr. Chameleon is, no matter in which disguise he appears. But the criminal he's tracking seldom does. Tonight we give you Mr. Chameleon and the case of his brother's murderer.
Our story opens at Central Headquarters in the office of Mr. Chameleon, the most feared of all detectives, whose many disguises have made his name a byword among criminals of all kinds. But now he is relaxed. It is the well-dressed man sitting across from him whose pleasant face is strained and tense. Mr. Chameleon, I know I'm imposing on our friendship, our acquaintanceship, I should say, since we've only met twice, but I had to do something. I couldn't let things go on this way. I'm convinced that my brother Lewis is about to be murdered. By whom, Mr. Brenton? By Florence, his wife. Mr. Brenton, are you serious? Do you think for one minute I'd make a statement like that if I couldn't back it up? Have you any idea what it cost me to come here and, and, and tell you these things? I've always been fond of Florence. What has happened to her is a tragedy. But my brother Lewis comes first. Yes, naturally. You're uh, partners in the contracting business, aren't you? I had dinner once at your brother's home. It's a very beautiful place. Yes, it is. I'm living there now. I have been for six months. And I've watched this thing develop. I've watched it grow. This... this... Tragedy. Yes. You spoke of tragedy in connection with your sister-in-law. Oh, incidentally, I've never met her. She was... Uh away when I was there, but I hear she's very lovely. Oh, she is. I've always been deeply fond of Florence. That's why... Miss Comedian, she's losing her mind. For over six months now, she's been treated by specialists for a nervous disorder. But it's getting worse instead of better. Oh, that's very sad. Lewis has kept it quiet. He thinks it's something that will pass. I don't. Particularly not with Carl Robbins in the picture. Carl Robbins, the architect? That's the one. He's staying with them now, and Florence thinks she's in love with him. She's asked Lewis for her freedom, and Lewis won't give it to her. That's why I'm afraid, terribly afraid of what she may do to Lewis. In the mental state she's in, she may try to murder him. Mr. Brenton, it's the business of the police to solve a crime after it happens. But there's no reason, really, why we shouldn't try to stop one before it happens, if we can. Tell you what I'd like to do. I'd like to look over the situation. Do you think you could invite me to your brother's home for dinner? Hello. Chameleon? Oh, Hello, Commissioner. To what do I owe the honour of this call, may I ask? Or don't you know that it's exactly three minutes of 6 a.m.? Yes, I know it. Chameleon, you know Ralph Brenton, don't you? Mm-hmm. I'm having dinner at his brother Lewis Brenton's tonight. Oh, no, you're not. You're going up to the Brenton place immediately, but not on a social visit. Lewis Brenton is dead. What? Yes, he was stabbed to death with the scissors about 5 o'clock this morning. Oh, you see, I, I was too late, Mr. Chameleon, too late. If only I'd come to you a week sooner. Mr. Brenton, you did everything you possibly could. Uh, will you take me to your brother's room, please? I'd like to look around. Yes, yes, of course. The housemaid, Ida Webster, found him. I see. The bedroom door was open, which was most unusual, and she glanced in. My brother was on the floor, dead. Where was his wife? Florence claimed she was walking in the garden. At half past five in the morning? Uh, she said she couldn't sleep. She got up and went out. She wanted to see the sun come up. What about the other servants? They hear anything at all? I'll tell you the truth, Mr. Chameleon. We're short-handed right now. Lewis was expecting a new butler tomorrow, a Britisher named Arthur Leach. The former butler quit last week. Then uh, no one heard any outcry? No, no, no one at all. Carl Robin slept through it all, so he says. And so did I. And your sister-in-law was in the garden watching the sunrise. Mr. Brenton, what sort of a uh, scissors was used to stab your brother? Uh, a fairly small one. It was taken from Florence's dressing table. Oh, but here's the bedroom. Your uh, sister-in-law shared it with your brother? Oh, yes. Very strong smell of perfume. Perfume? Yes, don't you notice it? Very strong. So it is. Yes, that's strange. What's strange about it? Oh. I must have knocked over a bottle. Florence. I can't remember, but I must have. There isn't anything strange about it, and thus everything I do is strange. Well, Florence, my dear child, I didn't know you were in here. Of course I'm in here. It's my room, isn't it? Lois died here, but it's still my room. Florence, uh, this is Mr. Chameleon, the famous detective. He's taken over the case. How do you do, Mrs. Brenton? 
Very sorry about your husband. Lois was a good man. He loved me. He believed in me. And I must have spilled that perfume, but I can't remember. That's the terrible part. I can't remember anything. Let's try again, Mrs. Brinton. What time did you go out? I think it must have been about quarter to five, Mr. Chameleon. I'd had a dreadful nightmare, and then I couldn't get to sleep. How did I imagine it? I mean, is it possible that when I thought I was in the garden, it was simply a continuation of my dream? In that case, you never left this room. No, I, I never left this room. No, no, that's not possible. I didn't kill Lewis. I'm sure I didn't. Mrs. Brenton... There were no fingerprints found upon the scissors, but a pair of your gloves were rolled up tightly and thrown in a bureau drawer. Do you remember putting on those gloves? No. Where's Ralph, my brother-in-law? Oh, uh, he went downstairs. Detective Sergeant Arnold wants to question him after he's finished with Carl Robbins. That's right. Poor Carl, he's in this too. Mr. Chameleon, tell me something. Do I seem like the kind of woman who, who lives in a world of fantasy? The kind of woman, for instance, who imagines that a man's in love with her when he isn't at all? No. You're being kind. I can no longer tell the difference between reality and unreality. I, I can no longer trust myself. Mrs. Brenton, I understand that you've been under treatment for nervous disorders. Yes, I have. I even intended to go to a sanatorium. Carl, Carl Robbins thought I should go. Why? Uh, what sort of a, a mental burden have you been carrying that broke you down so that you needed a doctor? I can't tell you. If I did, you'd surely be convinced that I was mad. Well, you're quite wrong about that. Please believe me. Believe you, Mr. Chameleon. I don't believe anyone anymore, least of all myself. You in love with Carl Robbins? In love with him? No, but he... That is... He's in love with you. Don't be afraid to say it. That doesn't mean that the man's a murderer. Uh, let's go downstairs, Mrs. Brenton, if you don't mind. I'd like uh, to talk to you and Mr. Robbins together. Mr. Chameleon, you, you really don't believe, do you, that I'm the sort of woman who imagines men are in love with her? Mrs. Brenton, why do you keep harping on that? Because I... What's that? Well, that must be Mr. Robbins and uh, Detective Sergeant Arnold there in the library. You come along, please? No, no, wait, please. I, I want to hear what they're saying. Oh, very well. But um, if we must eavesdrop, let's get a little closer. There's only one thing I want to know. All I asked you, Mr. Robbins, was why you were staying here at Lewis Brenton's house. I've told you that. I was, I was designing a summer home for the Brentons. I happen to be their friend as well as their architect. Nice work, if you can get it. What? Mr. Robbins, there's a rumor going around that you happen to be in love with Mrs. Brenton. That's a lie. Carl. I'm, I'm sorry for Mrs. Brenton. She's been unhappy, and I advised her to see a psychiatrist. But I've never been in love with her, never said I was. If anyone thinks I am, they imagined the whole thing. Carl. Oh, no. Uh, Mrs. Brenton. Dave. Dave, will you get me some water, please? Mrs. Brenton has fainted. Why did she faint? I have a feeling, my dear Dave, that that is the number one question on our list. Probably Florence Brenton fainted because Carl Robbins' words proved to her that she'd imagined that he was in love with her. Probably, Mr. Chameleon? Oh, we mustn't forget. Carl Robbins might be afraid to admit he's been in love with her. You see, that could be a motive for him to murder her husband. Uh, she's wacky. She has that look in her eyes, you know. Dave, what did the housemaid... Um, tell you about the family relationship. Ida? Oh, Ida had plenty to say in between trying to get me to take her to the movies. Oh, oh, so that's the way it was. The irresistible Detective Sergeant Arnold, eh? Oh, listen, Mr. Chameleon, that babe Ida would go for anyone. Anyhow, she said the usual, that Mrs. Brenton was sick and the brothers Ralph and Louis Brenton were devoted to each other. Never a sharp word. Well, that's quite something when you consider they were business partners, too. Yes, um, 
Dave, do you think she might go for me? Who? Ida. The maid? Mm Mm-hmm. Now, sometimes servants know more about the inner workings of a family than the police can find out in a month of Sundays. If there were some way that I could get some real information from below stairs... Dave! Yeah? Ralph Brenton told me that they were expecting an English butler, Leach. Yes, that was it. Arthur Leach. Curly hair, rimless glasses, thick around the middle. Is that the way he described him? No, I'm describing myself, Dave. You mean you're going to turn up there tomorrow morning impersonating Leach, the new butler? But what about the real Arthur Leach? You can stop him. Find out where he is from the employment bureau. Take him to headquarters, explain the circumstances to him, and tell him that he will be compensated for anything that he loses. And meanwhile, the Brentons, whether they want to or not, are going to acquire a very unusual butler. Dave, did you take care of Arthur Leach? Yes, we headed him off about an hour ago, Mr. Chameleon. You all set? I swear I'd never know you in that get-up. Well, you better beat it now. Don't want anyone to think that I'm friendly with a common detective. Good morning. Good morning. I'm Arthur Leach, the new butler. Oh, come in, Mr. Leach. We've been expecting you. Mr. Ralph said to take you right up to your room. Might I ask... Just who is Mr. Ralph? Mr. Ralph Brenton, Mr. Lewis's brother. Mr. Lewis is dead. So I hear. I must say I find it rather odd to come into a house where a murder has been committed. Not accustomed to working for that type of person. Me neither. I'd quit, only they won't let me go. I don't know why they don't just arrest her and get it over with. What is your name? I? Ida. Ida Webster. We might as well know from the beginning, Ida, that I never discuss my employer's affairs. If Mrs. Brenton murdered her husband, that is most unfortunate, but I consider it her business and none of mine. It was her husband's business too, wasn't it? He got killed. Mm. (laughs) I could tell you plenty if I wanted to. Wouldn't you like to hear it? Wouldn't you like to have a cup of tea with me down in the kitchen? Afraid I don't care for American tea. Nor do I, Mr. Leach. I'll make it strong. <laughs> do you know something? I like you. I always go for men with curly hair. I'm flattered. Whenever I see curls like yours, I just want to run my fingers right through them. Oh, I say. Uh... So how about it, I? A nice little cup of tea. I could tell you things I didn't even tell the police. For instance, there's a secret closet hidden in this house, and yesterday morning I saw someone putting something there. Well, no. Secret closet, where is it? I won't tell you. Not unless you come downstairs for a cup of tea. Very well, Ida. In, um, 40 minutes, say. Tell you the truth, I'd like a spot of tea as long as it's strong, and, um, uh, you sit and talk to me while I drink it. Mr. Chameleon and the case of his brother's murderer continues in just a moment. And now back to Mr. Chameleon and the case of his brother's murderer. It is half an hour later and in the Brenton drawing room, Ralph Brenton is talking to Mr. Chameleon. Not that Ralph Brenton is aware of this fact. On the contrary, he believes he is addressing the new butler named Arthur Leach. And he says apologetically, I am very sorry that you had to come here under such unhappy circumstances, Leach. I can't even promise that we'll be able to keep you on. It's quite all right, Mr. Brenton, sir. I understand. Naturally, my sister-in-law is very much upset. My brother's death, you know. Well, there's no telling what will happen. Dreadful business, sir. Your American police aren't very quick, are they? The American police are doing just fine, Leach. I'd back them against Scotland Yard any day of the week. Everyone is entitled to his own opinion, sir. Also, we have a very famous detective working on the case, a man named Chameleon. Maybe you've heard of him. Oh, yes, yes. Um, chap who goes around in a uh, false face, putty noses and all that sort of thing. Rather silly. Well, everyone is entitled to his own opinion. 
But Comedian's a good man. I'm counting on him. Yes, sir. You suppose that um, I could see Mrs. Brenton? As a matter of fact, she's been looking for you, Leach. She went down to the kitchen. I think she's there now. Very good, sir. I'm on my way down there anyhow, if you'll excuse me, oh, sir. By the way, uh, uh, shouldn't you have dark hair? Beg your pardon? It's funny. It was Wilfred Dodd who recommended you, and I could almost swear he said you had dark hair. My hair is really brown, sir, and um, indeterminate brown, but um, I've been out in the sun a great deal and it's bleached it. I see. Not that it matters. I have a hunch that you're extremely good at your job, Leach. Thank you very much, sir. As good at your job as a butler, let us say, Leach, as Mr. Chameleon is at his job as a detective. <laughs> So I'm as good at my job as chameleon is at his, am I? Wonder what he means by that. All I can say is I'd better be a good butler. Devil is the kitchen. All these doors down here. And maybe this is it. But, Carl, don't you see... Oh. I beg your pardon. I, um, I thought this was the kitchen. Well, it isn't the kitchen. It's the jam cellar. Who are you? What do you want? I'm Arthur Leach, sir, the new butler, and I'm looking for Mrs. Brenton. I'm Mrs. Brenton. I, I'd like to talk to you, Leach. Oh, in that case, I'll clear out. I'll see you later, Florence. Carl, wait. Uh, Leach, that, uh, that was our friend, Mr. Robbins. He's staying here for the present. Yes, madam. Shall we go into the servant's sitting room? He'll be more comfortable there. Certainly, madam. Uh, first, if you don't mind, I'd like to stop in the kitchen. The kitchen? Why? Uh, which one of those doors is it? That one there, but... What do you want in the kitchen? Your housemaid, Ida, is brewing some tea for me. I'd like to tell her that I'll be delayed. Ida? Ida? Maybe she isn't there. Kettle's on the stove. Ida? What's the matter? Ida? Leach, she's uh, dead. Yes. She's dead, Miss Brenton. Been stabbed to death. Five stab wounds, Mr. Chameleon. Whoever did it sure wanted to make a good job of it. Poor Ida. Someone must have overheard her suggesting that I have tea with her. Tea and conversation. Both Carl Robbins and Mrs. Brenton were down in that basement. If you ask Leach, me, they... Are you coming with that coffee? Uh, yes, Mr. Brenton. Be right there, sir. Not that there's any hurry, but we can all use some coffee. So can I. Boy, I can still see that poor kid's face. And she wanted me to take her to the movies tonight. Well, you can have your coffee later. Go to it, Dave. You have your orders. Okay, Mr. Chameleon, but I'd rather stick with you. Someone in this house is awful handy with a knife. Are you sure you're going at this the right way? Dave, I've had a theory for quite some time as to what lay behind Lewis Brenton's death. Now I want facts, and I intend to get them. But, Mr. Chameleon, if you... Dear chap, will you please get out of my way? The people are waiting in the drawing room for their coffee. Oh, goodbye, Mr. Leach. I'll be seeing you again. So... Mr. Leach, you are Mr. Chameleon. But what you don't know is that I had my ear to the keyhole at just the right moment. Sugar, Miss Brenton? What? Oh... Yes, thank you, Leach. My dear Florence, your hand is trembling, so you'll drop that cup. Did, did you say something, Ralph? I say your hand is trembling. So it is. How, how stupid. Aren't you having coffee, Carl? I told you I wasn't. How many times must I say it? There's no need to be rude to Florence. Well, I'm fed up. There's a murderer on the loose in this house. I want to get out of here, but fast. So do we all, Carl, but the police say we can't leave. As a matter of fact, I'm very much surprised that we haven't accomplished more than they have. I... Uh... I'm disappointed in my friend, Chameleon. More coffee, Mr. Brenton? Uh, thank you, Leach. Yes, I must say I'm very much disappointed. Mr. Chameleon certainly hasn't been much help. We haven't been much help to him either. None of us cooperated. I, least of all... Do you mean that you lied to him? No, Carl, I didn't lie. I didn't kill Lewis. Only maybe I did. Maybe I did. Florence. I could have killed Lewis during a mental blackout. I, I could have killed Ida. 
All right, if I did, I want to be put away where I can't harm anyone again. You're hysterical, Florence. Yes, I am. But at least I know now what I want to do. I want to see Mr. Chameleon. I want to tell him everything. All the things I was afraid to tell him before. Leach. Yes, madam? Will you, will you please put through a phone call to the New York police? Central headquarters, I think he called it. Ask for Mr. Chameleon. Tell him to come immediately. No, uh, uh, wait. I'll make that call. No, Carl. Leach will do it. Don't you trust me, Florence? I don't trust anyone anymore, least of all myself. Leach, will you please make that call? Yes, of course, madam. But uh, first, um, might I be a bit uh, presumptuous and tell you uh, what I think of this tragedy, if I uh, might call it that? I think you might safely call my brother's death a tragedy, and Ida's too. Thank you, sir. But my theory is this. I'm not interested in your theory. I want to make that call. But my theory is very interesting. Leach, will you go and call Mr. Chameleon, or must I do it myself? No, Florence. Carl, let go of me. I want to hear this theory. This is rather amazing. What is your theory, Leach? Uh, that Mr. Brenton's murderer spilled perfume on their clothes. What? Are you serious? Yes, definitely, Mr. Robbins. I noticed the odor of perfume in the upper hall. I was told it came from Mrs. Brenton's room. Now, when the murder occurred, the bottle was knocked over. The clothes were drenched with perfume, but the murderer didn't have time to dispose of those clothes. They knew the closets would be searched, the whole house would be searched, so they had to hide those clothes until later things were quieter. You follow me? Yes. Yes, we follow you. About the maid, Ida. I'm uh, certain that she was murdered because she intended to tell me about a closet. A closet? Seems, Mrs. Brenton, that there is a uh, hidden closet in this house. Ida knew about it, and so did someone else, apparently. Ida told me that she saw someone carrying something to that closet. Don't you agree it must have been perfume clothes? Well, don't you? <laughs> that little moron was probably on the make for you, Leach. She was trying to impress you. Quite possible, Mr. Robbins. Nevertheless, I feel that I should report to the police, don't you? Yes. Now I'll uh, go and make that uh, phone call to your Mr. Chameleon. No! No, Leach! Come on! Don't you try to pull a knife! Very handy with knife. Easy easy enough. Enough. Oh, you drop it! Drop it! Oh. Miss Brenton? Drop it! Miss Brenton? You get to take the sergeant Arnold. He's upstairs looking for that hidden closet. But Leach! Leach! You're Mr. Chameleon. Definitely, Miss Brenton. And this fellow can't do any more damage with that knife. All right, Ralph Brenton. The game is up. Show us that hidden closet. It'll save a lot of time. You are feeling better, Miss Brenton? I feel awake, Mr. Chameleon. For the first time in months, I'm not groping my way through some hideous nightmare. When did it all start? About a year ago. Oh, was that uh, when your brother-in-law, Ralph Brenton, first told you that he loved you? Yes. At first, I tried to treat it as a joke, but it got worse and worse. He wanted me to leave Lewis. And then when I told Lewis that Ralph had to go, Ralph pretended that I'd imagined the whole thing. He convinced my husband that I was losing my mind. No, not quite, Mrs. Brenton. It didn't quite convince him. The two brothers must have quarreled about that when Lewis was killed. I'll tell you one thing. Ralph almost convinced me I was mad. And Carl Robbins. I swear to you he said he loved me. When I heard him deny it, I was sure I'd imagined everything. Even now, Ralph insists he didn't kill Lewis. We have no proof. I have proof that he tried to kill me. And I... Chameleon! Yes, Dave? Here it is. We've got it. That closet was behind the stairway that leads to the servant quarters. And inside, we found this suit. Miss Brenton, did you ever see this suit before? Yes. It's Ralph's. It smells strongly of perfume. And the trouser leg is soaked in perfume. There is your evidence, Mrs. Brenton. You didn't imagine that. And from now on, you need never doubt yourself again. And with these words, Mr. Chameleon concludes tonight's murder case.
Listen next Wednesday night at the same time for Mr. Chameleon, the man of many faces, in The Case of the Bloodstained Dollar Bills. The part of Mr. Chameleon is played by Carl Swenson, with dialogue by Marie Balmer from the original story by Frank and Ann Hummert. Music directed by Victor Arden. Your announcer is Howard Claney. Mr. Chameleon, the new mystery drama, will be heard in another performance next Wednesday night at this time. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. again present the famous Mr. Chameleon of Central Headquarters in his most famous cases of crime and murder. Now let me tell you just who Mr. Chameleon is. Born of a well-to-do family and a college man, he tried from childhood to live up to the name he bore, Chameleon, by taking on the color of whatever situation in which he found himself, finally entering the police force where he became known as Chameleon, the man of many faces the underworld's most dreaded man. Throughout this series, the listener invariably knows who Mr. Chameleon is, no matter in which disguise he appears. But the criminal he's tracking sometimes does and sometimes doesn't. Tonight we give you Mr. Chameleon in Mr. Chameleon's Pet Murder Case. Our story opens in the criminal courts, during that solemn moment when sentence of death is about to be pronounced. The room is very still. All eyes are fastened on the thin, cruel face of Sorato, the gangster. For the notorious Sorato has at last met his Waterloo. Will the prisoner now rise? Have you anything to say before this court pronounces sentence on you? Then I hereby sentence you to die in the electric chair during the week of... No! No, you won't do it! Silence! You'll never burn me! I'll never see the death house! I'll break jail! And when I do, I'll get Chameleon for his lying evidence that sent me here! So help me, I'll kill Chameleon! Silence! Silence! You hear me, Chameleon? I see you back there! I'm gonna get out! And when I do, I'm gonna kill you! Well, I'm a policewoman, Mr. Chameleon, but I never heard anything like the voice of that man Serato in the courtroom. He means to kill you. You're in dreadful danger. Oh, there are a lot of them in prison who've said they're going to kill me, Madeline. No, I feel very good. When you put an end to the career of a mad dog like Serato, well, it makes you pretty proud to be a cop. But suppose he did get out. Maybe that's just a woman's way of looking at it. Uh, let's go out to dinner tonight. And, um... Incidentally, I've always wanted to ask uh, why a beautiful girl like you ever got the idea of being a copper. My father was on the police force. He was killed by a hoodlum just like Serato. Oh, I'm sorry. I didn't know that. Very few people know. But I adored my father. Madeline, uh, look, about dinner. Dinner? Would it uh, spoil your appetite to dine with me? Oh, <laughs> Don't be silly, Mr. Chameleon. I'd love it. Good. That's a date. Um, are you going to come as Mr. Chameleon or in one of your impersonations? I just want to be sure I'd recognize <laughs> you. <laughs> just Chameleon. I'll go home and dress and pick you up at 7.30. You and I are going to celebrate Serato's conviction. Uh, 
Hello. Chameleon? Oh, yes, Commissioner. Chameleon, the impossible has happened. Serato has escaped. What? Yes, someone smuggled a knife to him, and he stabbed the guard and made a break for it. He managed to get away. No. Now you stay at your apartment. I'm sending over a police guard. Don't set foot out of the door. No, listen, Commissioner. Now, you I... know where that puts you, don't you? Right behind the eight ball. He and his whole gang are out to get you. I'm sending over two men. I don't need them, Commissioner. I'll take care of myself. Are you crazy? You heard Serato in court this afternoon. He threatened to kill you on sight. I heard him. But I'm coming right down to headquarters and no guard. This one is between Serato and me, and I think I'm quicker than he is. See you later, Commissioner. Ah, this should be interesting. Serato is hunting me, and I'm hunting him. Makes this even. Well, I'd better change. Better call Madeline, too. What the devil? Hello? Is this Mr. Chameleon? Yes. Is this Mr. Chameleon, the detective who goes around making like he's somebody else? What do you want? Who is this? Never mind who this is. I just thought you'd like to know we've got Madeline Evans. You don't need to look for her. You can't find her. Maybe nobody will ever find her. Unless you're willing to play ball. What do you want me to do? Take back the evidence you gave at Serato's trial. Say that you lied, that the whole thing was a frame-up. Give me 24 hours to think it over, Marty. Marty? You think I didn't know that voice? Marty the Moron, as Serato calls you. He never called me that... Tell him for me to take it easy with Madeline and give me a little time. I'll think it over. And tell Serato if he doesn't take it easy with Madeline that... Ask him how he'd like to digest a slug in the stomach. Chameleon, I'm telling you, your life isn't worth a nickel. Madeline Evans is in terrible danger. Not only is Serato himself after you, but you know as well as I do, his gang is organized. We're organized, Commissioner. Yes, but he has the advantage. You're out in the open. You can't see him, but he can see you. Now, if they could kidnap Madeline when she was on her way home... They won't try that with me. Not yet, Commissioner. Not as long as Serato thinks he can make a deal with me. Who is it? Tom Smith. Come in, Tom. Uh, Commissioner, you know Tom Smith, the Daily Chronicle? Oh, yes. I uh, told him to come over here. I have a favor to ask of him. Anything you say, Mr. Chameleon? Is there a story in it? Yes. Big one, eventually. Uh, right now, Tom, I wish you'd do me a favor. Uh huh? Write a story saying that there are rumors that new evidence has been unearthed in the Serato case. Say, is this on the level? You just write the story, Tom. You can quote me. I'm not sure that the evidence which convicted Serato was correct. I am working on new evidence, unquote. Hallelujah, this really will hit the headlines. What with Serato on the loose? Also, Commissioner, I'd like to have the boys bring in Jake Mallory for questioning. Mallory? You mean Serato's right-hand man? That's right. Commissioner? Okay, Chameleon. Tell the boys to pick up Mallory. That's another story for you, Tom. I have reason to believe that Jake Mallory is the man who really committed the murder for which Serato was convicted. Read all about it. New turn in Serato case. Rumors a new trial. Read all the... Bu- Paper, mister? No, thank you. I'll borrow my friends. Here. All about the Serato case. Read all about... Well, how about it, uh, Detective Sergeant Arnold? Can I look at the headlines? Mr. Chameleon, what is this? You don't think Jake Mallory committed that murder, do you? That, my dear Dave, is a leading question. I refuse to answer. But we had to let Jake go this afternoon. We couldn't hold him. I expected you'd let him go. Dave, uh, you know Lily McCarty when you see her, don't you? Serato's girlfriend. Oh, yeah, yeah, sure. She lives right in this block. But listen, Mr. Chameleon... I think I'll go and pay a call on her. And I'll go with you. No. No, Dave. Now, don't worry about me. Until Madeline is safe, I have to move in a certain way. I know exactly what I'm doing. You know, Mr. Chameleon, there's something about you that always gets me. What do you mean, Dave? The way you change... Ordinarily, you're an easygoing guy with a fancy education who's just as much at home on Park Avenue as at Central Headquarters. And then, like that, you're as hard and ruthless as a Serato. These gangsters are completely without mercy, Dave. They are enemies of society. They respect nothing and they trust no one. They trust no one. That is the thing that you must always remember. Hey, Mr. Chameleon, there she goes. Mm -hmm. Lily, Serato's girl. You gonna question her? No. No, Dave, believe it or not, I'm going to invite the young lady to dinner. (laughs) 
What do you mean you and me should have dinner tonight? You think I'd be seen having dinner with a copper? Why, Lily, I thought you might enjoy having an evening out. No, not with you I wouldn't, Chameleon. I wouldn't go with you if you'd take me to the... St. Regis. Funny you should happen to mention the St. Regis. That's what I was going with Madeline Evans. Where is she, Lily? I don't know where she is. I don't know where Serato is either, so help me. I'll meet you at the Montmartre restaurant at eight. I won't be there. Oh, yes, you will. I have enough on you to send you up for life. I know perfectly well that you were mixed up in the Rockman killing and the Millerstown holdup. I have got plenty of leads if I want to follow them up. Then why don't you, Chameleon? You meet me at dinner tonight or something very strange may happen to you. I got no business to be seen in a place like this with you, Chameleon. They'll think I'm leading you to Serato. I don't even know where he is. You know where Madeline Evans is. That sort of kidnapping is right up your alley, Lily. You've managed them before. i never even seen her. Well, in that case, we'll go for a little drive tomorrow. The country is so beautiful this time of year. No. No, I can't meet you again. I wouldn't dare. Do you mean that your pals don't trust you, Serato and Jake Mallory? Jake Mallory? Say, listen, he's fit to be tied... He thinks you and Serato have made a deal between you to railroad him to the chair in Serato's place. Dear me, what suspicious minds. Oh, why don't you lay off me, Mr. Chameleon? Leave me alone. Oh, I'm not hurting you. I'm simply giving you the pleasure of my company. Well, that's enough to make him kill me. You know, I might be more touched if I didn't know you for a thoroughly brutal murderess. The complete sadist. What's that? Something Serato called me? Marty Lewis went in one of his rages the other night because he says that Serato called him a moron. He says that's an insult, is it? A sadist is much worse. Come on, Lily, where's Madeline Evans? Or must you and I have another date tomorrow? I'm beginning to believe that the boys will get you if we do. There's a car behind us. I'm sure it's following us. Relax, relax, Lily, and enjoy the countryside. Oh, I shouldn't have come with you today. Now they'll be sure I'm talking. Tell me where they've taken Madeline Evans, and I'll turn the car around and take you right back to the city. Otherwise, you won't be able to get rid of me, Lily. Okay, okay. They got her in a little house over in Long Island City. I'll give you the address. And then let me go and don't come near me again, you dirty cop. This is the place, Dave. You all set? Yeah, Mr. Chameleon. We've got men posted at either end of the street. These crooks won't get away. If they're still here. Open up in there. Open up. We have to break it down, Dave. Okay. Here it goes. (coughs) Madeline? Madeline? Here she is in here, Dave. Bound and gagged. Got... Get this gag out of her mouth. Uh, are you all right, Madeline? Um, yes, I'm I'm all right, but thank heaven you got here. Where are they? They've gone. Less than an hour ago. Oh, am I glad to see you. They didn't hurt you? Not much, Dave. Who were the men? Anyone you recognized? Oh, no, just a couple of strong arm boys. So I thought. The big boys kept clear. They were the Serato, wherever he is. Mr. Chameleon, before they left, a car drove up and some men carried something into the other room and left it there. What? Was it? Yes, it sounded almost like a... something heavy. Dave. Yes? Come here. What is it? It's Lily. They killed her and dumped her body here. Mr. Chameleon. No, no, don't feel sorry for her, Madeline. She'd have done the same to you and enjoyed it. Well, that's one of them gone. Now, with you safe, Madeline, I don't have to consider anyone. What are you going to do, Mr. Chameleon? Serato and I can really have it out. Just the two of us. But it isn't just the two of you. He still has his gang. Minus one. Mr. Chameleon, what are you going to do now? Well, the usual. I have a pretty strong hunch that Serato is hiding out down near Chatham Square. I think I'll hang out there for a couple of days. But not out in the open. You mean you'll put on a disguise? Oh, yes, yes. That'd better be a good one. No, on the contrary, Dave. This time my disguise is going to be so transparent that anyone, even Serato, will recognize me instantly.
Mr. Chameleon will return in Mr. Chameleon's Pet Murder Case in just a moment. And now we return to Mr. Chameleon and his pet murder case. It is the following morning, and in the office of the police commissioner, we find Mr. Chameleon dressed in the shabby clothes of a man from the tenement district. I thought I'd patrol that neighborhood. You know those tenements, Commissioner, they're like rabbit warrens. The only thing to do is to smoke Serato out. Chameleon, I still say you're out of your mind. Serato's gunning for you, and if you show up down there, I'm... Come in. Uh, Commissioner, have you seen Mr. Chameleon? Oh, there you are. You mean you recognized him that quickly? Well, of course I did. He needs a shave, and his clothes are strictly bowery, but he hasn't really changed. Uh, you hear that, Chameleon? <laughs> yes, I hear it, Commissioner, and it's just exactly what I want to hear. Give me a dime for a cup of coffee, mister. No. Oh, please, mister. I'm kind of down on my luck. Beat it. Did you hear me? Beat it. Hey. Who are you? Who, oh, me? I know you. You're chameleon. What are you doing down here dressed like a bum? You can't fool me. I know you're chameleon. Well, good for you, Marty. So you're not a moron after all. Well, don't call me that. I'm as smart as anybody. Too smart to let anybody see me talking to you. What's the matter, Marty? Serato watching you from the window? Which one's he watching from? Get away from me. There's been too much talk that Serato's crowd is running out on them. If they see me with you, Chameleon, they'll... Marty, don't you try anything. If I'm found dead, the police have orders to bring you in. Me? Why me? We've got plenty on you, Marty, so it's healthier for you if I stay alive. Okay. But keep away from me. Well, all I want to do is walk a long ways with you. I always enjoy talking to you. Mister, can you give me a dime for a cup of coffee? What? Do you uh, mind if I sit down at this table and join you? Chameleon, I told you to keep away. Everywhere I go, you turn up. Where's Serato? Hey, listen. Serato don't want nothing in this world except to kill you. You're nuts to go chasing after him. Marty, I have found that when anyone wants to kill you, it's better to show them your face than your back. Well, leave me out of it. And get out of here, will you, Chameleon? Not until I have had my coffee, Marty. Hey, give me a dime for a cup of coffee, mister. Huh? Oh, no, not you again, Chameleon. Yes, you leave me alone. Why, Marty, have you been drinking? <laughs> you know Serato doesn't like that. They've been tailing me. They think I'm singing to you. Save your tears, Marty. When Rockman was murdered, he cried and pleaded too, and you just sat there and laughed. Where's Serato? I won't tell you, Chameleon. Everybody's run out on him except me and Jake Mallory. But I ain't got a squeal. Not even a Serato is a dirty so-and-so. I told him not to his face. Mm, my, you're getting reckless, Marty. Well, good night. Pleasant dreams. Uh, come in. Good morning, Commissioner. Oh, well, there's one thing I'll say, Chameleon. That disguise of yours gets better, or worse. You're beginning to look like a real Bowery bum. I'm beginning to feel like one, too, Commissioner. This keeps on much longer, but I... You know, I often think that the first requisite for a detective is patience, not courage. You'll need plenty of courage today. What do you mean? They got Marty last night. What? Yeah, his body was found on the waterfront riddled with bullets. You did your work well, Chameleon. Good. I've no pity for the Martys of this world. They live by the gun and they die by the gun. Well, that leaves Serato. And Jake Mallory. That's two of them. Two against one is still an uneven match, Chameleon. Let me send Dave Arnold with you today. No. Nope. Uh, Serato must be frothing at the mouth by now. Yes, I'm counting on that. No, Commissioner, I've got to go after Serato alone, and I'm going to patrol that neighborhood until he can't stand it. Until he has to come out and get me. Mr. 
Look at him, Jake. The knife of the guy. <laughs> Who's he think he's fooling with that phony disguise? Nobody, Serato. Nobody? He thinks he's fooling me? No. Are you screwy? Of course he thinks he's fooling me. No. Just stop saying no. Your yes men are gone, Serato. I took care of the last one last night. Remember? Are you trying to tell me that Marty didn't have to go, the rotten little squealer? Well, anyway, he's gone, along with Lily. Now I'm going to speak my little piece, Serato. Oh, yeah? Yes. I don't like what's going on. I don't like you blowing your top over Chameleon. If you're going to sense you, let him walk up and down out there till he drops. I'm going to kill that guy. I said I was going to kill him, and I never go back on what I say. Okay, but later, later, Serato. Hey, what's the matter with you, Jake? You giving him protection? Maybe you're making a deal with him, too. Well, that's a hot one coming from you, Serato. <laughs> Remember, they were after me. I was suspected of the murder that you were convicted for. I told you, Jake, I had nothing to do with but it. But I ain't so sure. Maybe it was you who made a deal with Chameleon, and you're anxious to go out there because you know that he won't touch you. That's a lie. Oh, is it? So what are you going to do, Serato? Shoot him down while he's walking up and down the street? Why, the cops would be on our necks in a minute. We'd never get out of here. So you're the one that's yellow. I thought that was it. You know something else, Jake? I think you told him I was holed up here. Hey, where do you think you're going? I'm getting out of here. I had enough. Oh, no, you're not. You're not going no place. Try and stop me. You think I won't? I don't take the double cross from anyone, Jake. Not from Marty or Lily or you. <laughs> Jake. Jake, you... You blasted fool. I... I didn't want to do that. Not to you. Now there's nobody. Nobody except... Chameleon out there. Except Chameleon. And I'm going down and get him right now. There he is. Chameleon. Thinks he's fooling everybody. Thinks he's fooling me. If I can only get him to come into this hallway, and he'll do it, because he thinks I don't know him on account of his disguise. And once I get him in here where it's dark and quiet, I'll... Hey, you. You there. Did somebody call me? Yeah. Come in here a minute, will you? What for, mister? You want to make a buck? Do I? Just ask me. I have asked you. Sure, I want to earn a buck. What do you want me to do? I wouldn't uh, kill nobody, and uh, not for a buck. Quite a comic, ain't you? <laughs> I, uh, I want you to run an errand, take a message someplace. Is that worth a buck to you? Yeah, it sure is. Then, come on in here. Well, come on, why don't you? I don't know, mister. Uh... Couldn't you give it to me out here? No, I couldn't. I gotta write the note out first. Oh, then go ahead and do it. I'll wait. Hey, don't you want your buck? Yeah, sure I do. I ain't eating 24 hours. Okay, come and get it. You can go and eat while I'm writing the note. You mean you trust me to come back? Sure. I trust you, and you'll trust me. I wish everybody was like that. You know, I can't see you in there. It's, uh... It's so dark. Where are you? Right here. Oh. Yeah, now I see you. Well, take a good look. It's the last thing you'll ever see, Chameleon, you dumb copper. Do you think you fooled me with that phony disguise? Uh, no, I didn't think I'd fool you, Serato. You should have known that you couldn't play cat and mouse with me, that once I got a line on you, I'd shoot first. Uh, I'm dying, you... You... Shot me like a dog. Yes, you're dying, Serato, but before you do, I have a little message for you to take along with you. Your girlfriend, Lily, did not squeal on you. I forced her to talk to me in the same way with Marty. He was loyal to you, too. No. And no. Jake. Where's Jake Mallory? I... I killed him. I thought that would happen, because that bird brain of yours, Serato, couldn't conceive of anyone being loyal. Not even your pals. You're a murderer, comedian. Well, you can argue that out with St. Peter when he turns you away from the gates. I simply went on the principle, if I can't get all the crooks myself, I let them kill each other off. Oh. 
Are you busy, Mr. Chameleon? Oh, hello, Madeline. No, I was just looking over the records of these criminals that I murdered, according to Serato. Lily, petty larceny, grand larceny, murder. Marty Lewis, assault and battery, arson, murder. Jake Mallory, he really had brains, which made him the most corrupt of the lot. And as for the late Serato, well... Mr. Chameleon, you put yourself in such terrible danger. What sort of man are you to... To go into that alone? I didn't do it alone. They helped, every one of them. You know something, Madeline? I thought of your father. That helped, too. Really? Mm Mm-hmm. Now, um, how about that dinner that was so rudely interrupted? Eight o'clock tonight at... Oh, wait a second. I want to call the commissioner. Hello? Commissioner Chameleon. Yes? Uh, What is the fee the public executioner gets up at Arsening? I don't know. Maybe. Why do you ask? I want to send him my check. You see, I'm afraid that um, I did him out of his money. Eight o'clock, Madeline. Eight o'clock at the St. Regis for dinner. And with these words, Mr. Chameleon concludes tonight's murder case. Listen next Wednesday night at this same time for Mr. Chameleon, the man of many faces... The part of Mr. Chameleon is played by Carl Swenson, with dialogue by Marie Balmer from the original story by Frank and Ann Hummert. Music directed by Victor Arden. Your announcer is Howard Claney. Mr. Chameleon, the new mystery drama, will be heard in another performance next Wednesday night at this time. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. Night Beat. This is Randy Stone. I cover the night beat for the Chicago Star. You know, stories start out in many different ways. Tonight's story started when I walked into a nice little guy's private world and it blew up right in my face. Night Beat, starring Frank Lovejoy as Randy Stone. When the streetcars and the subways fill out their thousands of tired ones who scurry off into a million directions to find home, that's when my job begins. I start walking, looking for my story so that you can read about it in your morning newspaper and feel good because it didn't happen to you. Tonight I got my story fast. Just walking down Madison Street, west, away from the center of things. I kept walking past the shooting gallery... The nickel arcade with the peep shows and the fortune-telling machines. The jukebox taverns. <laughs> Madison Street, the quick route to happiness with the world's worst hangover. And then straight ahead of me was Pop Gordon's training gym. That's where the public pays 30 cents to watch fellas training to beat each other's brains out. You know, when I got inside, it looked like just one of those fights. And then I heard one voice over the other. It was a voice I knew. Somebody call the cops and get that punchy loon out of here. You yell a stupid bum, tell you laughed at me. What's the matter, Pop? Me, Randy. Yeah. This crazy owl's gone clear off his rocker. Oh, that's Billy. Yeah. 
Somebody call the cops. Wait a second, Pop. He's all right. Sure, sure. Listen to him. I'll kill you. Anybody raise a glove on me gets killed. You'll Only have to one place for a loon like that in the bug house. Them. I'm going to get the cops and have this owl tied up. Oh, now, wait a minute, Pop. Let me uh, talk to him. Randy, stay away from that lug. Five of us couldn't hold him. He knows me. Randy, the guy's gone nuts. I've yeah. Yeah, like I said, everybody's scared of getting the same hey, Billy. ring. Hey, Billy. Billy. What? Hi, Billy. How's it going? Uh, you coming in with me? Oh, sure, sure. Make me a big man getting into the same ring with a champ. Well, that's me, champ. And you're a two-bit bum. Well, that's a thumbnail description if I ever heard one. Admit it. The truth. A two-bit bum. Admit it. I admit it. I admit it, Billy. Yeah, but you don't mean it. You're laughing at me like the rest of them. You're laughing at me. Billy, I never laughed at you in my life. You laughed? Well, I'll show you what happens to anybody who laughs at Billy the Kid. As the world flew away in all directions, I dimly remembered how the sports writers used to speak so respectfully of Billy's fast left hand. But brother, if they knew what I just found out about his right... When the fog finally cleared, Pop Gordon was bending over me, and there were a lot of other faces, too. But I didn't see Billy when I stood up. You okay, Randy? Oh. This is being okay. I don't want any part of it. He slugs you, but good. Where is he? Uh, he took off before the cops come. Took off before anybody could grab him. I don't blame him. Yeah. Uh, I let that bum come in at gym and sit around. Everybody else pays 30 cents but him. I let him free. What's he do, huh? What's he do? He busts loose. He blows his top. But Why? What happened to Billy? Oh, I don't know. Tonight, I catch him putting a bite on my customers. Two bits here, a dime there. Billy was panhandling? Sure. Like I said, I didn't like it, so I tell him. And then when? I don't know. I'm over at the other side of the gym. I hear somebody laugh, and the next thing I know, the owl's swinging like a windmill. He's going to kill everybody just for being around. He ought to be tied up. Uh-huh, just like that, huh? Yeah, he ain't safe. What do you want, the black Mariah to come around, cart him away like a load of rubbish? Yeah, but for his own good. Oh, Pop. Yeah. Remember when he was champ? He packed him in every club where he fought. He had a dollar or five dollars for anybody who held out a hand. So? What are you getting at? Well, now he's got no one, Pop, and now he's out in the cold. Uh, yeah. Oh, uh, I'll forget the cops. But we still got to put him away. Well, all right, sure, but let's do it as painless as possible. I'll, uh... I'll keep him with me tonight, and then tomorrow... We'll... You going after him? Yeah, which way'd he go? Uh, straight up the streets, but watch out, Randy. He blows his lid. Yeah, I know. Don't worry. I don't want any rematch. I'd like to know why he blew his lid in the first place, and my jaw in the second place. I'd known Billy a long time. A sweet, gentle guy who always seemed to be living in a world all of his own. A world that nobody else knew about and cared less. And now he was in trouble. In his mood, he might hurt someone. Or worse, he might get himself hurt. I must have walked for half an hour before I finally spotted him. He was standing on a corner. I stopped and watched him for a couple of minutes. I watched his hesitant and embarrassed panhandling. Then I walked over to him slowly. Hello, Billy. What? Oh, hi, hi, Randy, old pal, old pal, hi. You want some company? Oh, sure, sure. <laughs> good, good. <laughs> Randy, where, where you been keeping yourself? I, I ain't seen you for a couple of weeks. You haven't seen me for a couple of weeks? Well, I, I thought maybe you'd forget an old pal, huh? No, you're <laughs> not the kind of a fellow one forgets, champ. Mm-mm. Now, what was the uh, trouble back at the gym? Gym? What gym? Pop Gordon's. Pop's place? Yeah. Well, well let's go. I, I gotta help Pop. He, he's a good Joe, you know. He never charges me nothing. Wait a minute, hold on a second, Billy. Hold on. Yeah? Weren't you at the gym tonight? Oh, no, not tonight. I, I've been here. And you didn't, uh, massage my chin? You, you're giving me a rib? Well, what you looking at me for like that, Randy? Forget it, Billy. You, you was just ribbing, huh? Oh, sure, I'm just kidding. Yeah, I, I like ribs. I'm not giving a hot foot, nothing like that. But funny ribs that, that don't hurt nobody. Oh, no, sure. <laughs> Can I ask you a $64 question? Well, sure not. You, you can ask me anything, Randy, anything. I saw you a minute ago, Billy. What? I never seen you ask for a touch before. Uh, I, I, I ain't never gonna do it no more, but... But, Randy, I, I got it tonight. I, I gotta get a few bucks. Maybe 15 I already got $2. Maybe... Why do you need $15? What? I... 
I, I gotta get a new suit. A new suit? What's so special about tonight, Billy? What, that, that, that's something I, I gotta do. It. I just gotta do it, Randy. I gotta have 15, but... Hey, them Scott. Hey, is that you, Randy? Yeah. Oh, Sullivan. Yeah. Randy, don't let him pick me up for panhandling, please. No, I won't, please, Billy. Now, you wait here. Wait here. I'll be right back. Yeah. Hey, that's Billy back there, isn't it? Yeah, that's right, Sullivan. Why? Heard you had a little trouble with him back at the gym. Mm. Maybe we ought to put him in the tank for the night. Keep him out of trouble, huh? Look, uh, look, Sullivan. Uh. He's going away tomorrow for a long time. Oh, like that, huh? Yeah, that, that's it. This is his last night out. Yeah, yeah, I see. Okay, good. It's the way I do it myself. I see you around, Randy, but keep an eye on him. Yeah, I'll watch him like a hawk. Thanks, Sullivan. So long. Well, what they say, Randy, they, they ain't gonna pick me up for mooching out of here. They ain't gonna... No, 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 of course not. Uh, look, uh, Billy, how'd you like to come to my apartment for a while? Oh, I can't. I told you I, I gotta get 15 bucks. Well, we'll talk about it. Well, I gotta get it tonight. Now, I gotta get a new suit because... Because... Yeah, go, go on. Why? I, I can't be wearing this crummy rag when, when I see her. Not when, when I see her. I didn't know what he meant, but whatever it made him go crazy at the gym, whatever it made him hit me was tied in with her. Who she was, I didn't know, and I wasn't sure that he knew. I finally talked him into going to my place, and when we went in, I watched that slow, gentle smile come over his face. Hey, this place is a number one. Yeah. Sit down, Billy. Uh, I ain't got much time. Just a couple of minutes. Uh, yeah, okay. Uh... Uh, I, I'm awful tired, Randy. <laughs> Seems like a lot of things has happened tonight, you know. I, I, I'm kind of tired, sir. Want a drink, Billy? Oh, no. I, I, I never touch it, you know that. Yeah. And you never panhandled before. But I, I, I ain't gonna do that no more just tonight. I, I, I never bummed off of nobody. I paid my own way. Come anything, I, I paid my own way. Yeah, that's why I want to know why you're putting the bite on people tonight. I ain't gonna tell you. You, you. you laugh. I won't laugh. You will. So somebody else laughed when I told you. Some, somebody laughed. and well, when, when somebody laughs at me, I don't like it. I All right, easy, you, easy, I, buddy. I, easy, easy. I, Come on now. Uh, That's better. I, I tell you, I, I, I gotta get 15 bucks. Hey, hey, look. L look at this. What's that, Billy? I, I cut it out of the paper today. I, I seen it. Hey, you, you take a look at it, huh? You, you read what it All says. Right. Mrs. Walter Compton and her husband... Yeah? Yeah, go on. There's more. Prominent society leaders of New York will be in town tonight. They're staying at the Lake Shore and... I can't go there in this crummy rag. Well, why do you have to see her? What? Well, I, I gotta tell her something. Hey, it's getting late, Randy. I, I gotta get... I'll lend you the $15, Billy. You? Oh, no. No, I pay my own way. Well, pay it back whenever you get a job. No, I don't want any handouts. It's just a loan, Billy. It's a loan. What? <laughs> Uh, thanks, Randy. You, you're a champ. Now, now tell me why you got to see her. You, you ain't gonna laugh. I, I can take anything but that. Anything. I won't laugh, Billy. No, I, I, I guess you wouldn't. Okay. You, you remember once I was champ? Oh, right? everybody knows you were champ. Now, what about her, Mrs. Compton? Yeah. Well, it's one night after a fight, see? I ain't champion, but I'm punching right up to the top, see? Okay, but this one fight, she ain't there. So I go to see her at her place. She's there. She's there. And so when I... Who's that? It's me, Billy. Where are you? Yeah, out in a minute. Sure. Hey, I win tonight. I said I win tonight, didn't I? Yeah, I heard on the radio. Well... Well, what? It don't mean a thing? Sure. Means a lot, I guess. You guess. <laughs> a kid for a doll who's going to marry the next middleweight champ, you sure take things like a lump of ice. Yeah. Edna, anything wrong? No. Nope. Oh, there is. Okay, something's wrong. Have it your way. <laughs> you, you, you wasn't at the fight tonight, baby. I, I looked for you. It took me three, four rounds to get going because I didn't see you. You won. Oh. Uh, Kid, look at me. Sure. 
The eye got torn open again, huh? Oh, oh that's nothing. Collodion fixed it. Collodion fixes everything, huh? Get cut up, use collodion. That's nice. That puts you all together again. How long do you think you'll stay together? What, what's eating on you, honey? The last two, three weeks. The you, last been... two, three weeks. The last two, three years. Yeah, that's right. I hate it. You hate what? Oh, shut up. Oh, kid, kid, what's wrong? You and me. I don't get it. The only thing you do get is a measly few bucks for getting your head knocked off. Oh, I'm a fighter, So you're a fighter. All right, fight. But count me out. Oh, now, wait a minute. I've been waiting. I've been waiting for him to carry you home. Me? (laughs) Me? It can't happen, huh? Well, all of a sudden, you start blowing your top. It's not all of a sudden. You said it. You said there was something wrong for the last two or three years. Okay. Okay, spill it. I'm through, Billy. Washed up. Finished. What? You and me. Done. Since when? Since right now. (laughs) Oh, baby, it's just the eye. You see me this way and you... (laughs) The eye. (laughs) Don't laugh at me, Edna. Don't laugh at me. I take anything but being laughed at. It is a laugh. Oh, now listen, listen, honey... I don't care if you get punched all over the state. I don't care if you get your brains rattled so hard. It's Edna. me I care about from now on. Okay. So I'll be champ. So, so you'll get your fur coat. Not from you. you. Not from a guy who's beginning to look like a punching bag instead of a man. Look at me. Take a good look. I am. Yeah, I am. I got looks. I got class. I can do all right. I still don't get it. All right, I'll lay it on the line for you. Want me to? Go ahead. I'm not going to tie myself to a punchy character. I'm not going to have to walk in nice places with a guy whose face is... Well, look at her. Go on, take a look in the mirror. You see what I mean? You want me to quit? I don't care if you do or not, because it's too late, Billy. It's too late. Edna, you you shouldn't say things. (laughs) Please, Edna, don't... That, that's the way it was, Randy. That, that's the way it was. Yeah, I see. Look, Billy, you don't want to go and see her after that. Uh, I, I tell you, Randy, I, I got to see her. There's something I got to tell her. and It's got to be tonight because tomorrow she, she'll be gone. Billy, how do you know that she'll... Well, that she'll see you. Oh, I know, I know, because there's something I, I ain't told you. There's something, something I ain't never going to tell nobody. And... Uh, uh, Randy, please, please, don't don't try to stop me. Please, don't let nobody try to stop me because because if if they do, I'll, I'll kill them. Billy said he'd kill anybody who tried to stop him from seeing Mrs. Walter Compton. I looked at his scarred face and into his eyes. A wild fever you see in the eyes of a dog everyone says is mad but only wants a drink of water. And then... Uh, I guess I, I shouldn't have said that, Randy. Well, let's forget it for a minute, Billy. Now tell me, why do you want to see her? <laughs> you don't understand dames, huh? <laughs> No, my mother never told me. Well, well, she gives me the brush, see, like I tell you. She she gives me the brush, but but she does it for me, see? She she don't want me to get my brains knocked out, see? Yeah, I'm I'm beginning to see, Billy. Sure. But me, I got no sense, so so I don't see it her way. So I I, I let her walk out and I don't see her no more. Not until I get hold of that paper today. And tonight you want to see her. To say what, Billy? Well, but don't you see? She loves me. All these years she she never lets up, and I I I, I want to tell her it's okay that maybe her and me, we can start all over like, see? Uh, what's the matter, Randy? Nothing. Nothing, Billy. Look, don't let anybody kid you, pal. You're still champion. Oh, I ain't nothing. But uh, oh, I, I got to go now. I, I got to get 15 bucks for us. Now, look. Look, you're tired. You need a shave. Maybe take a shower. You thought of that? No. All right, now you wait here and take a shower and a shave, and I'll bring a suit back for you. Is that a deal? Oh, gee, you, 
You, you're a champ, Randy. You're a real champ. I might be gone for a little while, Billy, but when I come back, everything will be okay. Sure. Okay. There was only one thing for me to do. Go and see Mrs. Walter Compton. I made sure that Billy couldn't leave my apartment. I locked the door from the outside. I didn't want him picked up before he had the chance to see her. To see the woman around whom he'd built a whole world of fantasy in which he'd lived for so many years. I didn't want that world to come down around his ears. My newspaper pass got me in to see Mrs. Walter Compton in her suite at the Lakeshore. You're Mr. Stone? Yes, I am, Mrs. Compton. You're from the newspaper. Well, I'm not on newspaper business, uh, Mrs. Compton. Not tonight. This is more personal. Really? Well, what can I, um... Uh, do for me? Uh, nothing. Then please get to the point, Mr. Stone. My husband will be here shortly with guests. How soon? An hour. Why? Well, uh, because it concerns someone you used to know. Really? Who? Billy Candell. Billy Candell. As he was better known as Billy the Kid, once middleweight champion of the world. Oh, I'd forgotten. <laughs> and I was glad to. Uh, Mrs. Compton, he's coming here tonight to see you. What? He's coming. <laughs> How stupid can you get? Well, for a lot of people, it's not hard to be stupid <laughs> or uh, heartless. Yours must be a rather sentimental column, Mr. Stone. So. Uh, yes, it's about people. You better go. Look, uh, Please see, Billy, what can you lose? It's out of the question. Listen, all he wants is to tell you something. He wants to tell you that... that he knows that you still love him. What? Oh, oh no. Oh, now listen to me, please. <laughs> now, tomorrow he's going to... Well, he's going where he can rest. He's sick, Mrs. Compton. He's desperately sick. Let's not be so polite. The word is punch drunk, I believe. You want me to see a lunatic? No, he's not. And I'll be here when he comes. We'll keep it between us three. Do you know what you're asking? Yes, I'm asking you to give a guy a few minutes of his world. Make it real for him. Tell him anything. Tell him you still love him. Then he'll go away. After tomorrow, you'll never see him or hear from him again. You're asking me to receive that... that thing? And to bring him into this hotel where everyone can see him? Do you know what that means? Well, to him, yes. I'm talking about myself. Myself, Mr. Stone. Yes, I'd like to get off that subject for a it's moment. It's the only subject that matters. If you don't see him, he'll crack up all the way. That happened long ago. Good evening, Mr. Stone. Three minutes of your time. I said no. Did you hear, Mr. Stone? I said no. Okay, lady, I'm going. Uh, thank you for everything that's been lovely. You needn't be sarcastic, Mr. Stone. Oh, needn't I be? Look, Queenie, I got a little spot announcement for you. Billy owes you a vote of thanks. You'll never know it, but you gave him the biggest break of his life when you walked out on him years ago. Oh, really? Yes, Positively. Tonight you're giving him even a bigger break. Tell me about it, Mr. Stone. Yes, I'll tell you. <laughs> the only thing that poor guy's got left is his memory of a girl named Edna. Any resemblance between that memory and you was strictly coincidental. Goodbye. I was glad to get out into the fresh air. All the way back to my apartment, I kept thinking of what I'd tell Billy. How I'd tell him. Then as I walked across the lobby toward the elevator... Mr. Stone, Mr. Stone! What? Oh, what is it, Charlie? Here's a message for you. Okay. Here you are, Mr. Stone. Thank you. How long ago he leave this? Oh, what, just a few minutes after you left. <laughs> did you know you left him locked in? He called down. He asked me to open the yeah, door. Yeah, did right? he say where he was uh, going? No, no, no. Just that he couldn't wait for you any longer. Now, that is on the note. How'd he look? How'd he look? Well, I mean, anything unusual about him? No, I... He had on one of your suits, I remember now. That, that pinstripe one, he must have stolen. No, he didn't your... steal anything. Now, listen to me. Uh, I'm going to the Lakeshore Hotel. If he comes back here, get in touch with me there. Mrs. Compton's suite. Mrs. Compton's suite, yes. Oh, and listen, I think you'd better call the police. But as for Kalski, remember that Kalski? Kalski. Tell him to meet me at the Lakeshore Hotel and quick. I took a cab and I took the shortest way to the Lakeshore. I watched the pavements looking for Billy, but I didn't see him. He had some money on him and he must have taken a cab himself. And then I was back at the lakeshore talking with the clerk at the desk there. Yes, sir. There was a, a man here of that description. He asked that a call be put through to Mrs. Compton's suite. And was it? Well, sir, he he was a rather... Well, yes, he... yes, I, I know, I know. So he didn't get through. Oh, I called Mrs. Compton's suite myself and told her. That is, I described the man. I... Yes, go ahead. What'd she say? That on no account was I to put him through or send him upstairs. Oh, well. Okay, that's something. What'd he do then? He left immediately. Which way? Oh, I'm afraid I didn't notice, sir. I was registering some new guests, and I paid no attention. Okay, thank you very much. I had to find Billy before... Well, before what? What would he do? Where would he go? 
I ask myself those questions as I walk slowly along, watching for him, hoping to see that pathetic figure in my pinstripe suit, hoping I'd get to him before someone else stopped him. I was afraid of what might happen or could happen. And then I saw him, just past the Lakeshore Hotel, shambling slowly along, his shoulders hunched against the wind that cut in off the lake. I ran and caught up with him. Billy! Billy! What? Oh, hi, Randy. Hi. What, what you doing over here? Oh, I just, uh, looking around. Why'd you leave my apartment? What? Oh, well, well, you was gone so long and I had to get gone, see? Oh, sure. Come on, let's walk. <laughs> yeah. Hey, I, I borrowed one of your suits. It, uh, it's a, a real champ suit, all right. You, you mind, huh? You mind? No, no, Billy, none at all. Did you see her? Oh, oh, sure. What? You did? I, I see her. Billy, they wouldn't let you go up, remember? Oh, yeah, yeah, but, but, uh, I, I went up the back. The back, Billy. Now look at me. Are you sure? Oh, sure. And, and, and she still loves me, right? I, I said everything was okay. She's crazy about me like, like she always was. What did she tell you? Well... well she she didn't want to talk to me. You know how she is. But then I told her I love her and, and she loves me. Yeah. And, Billy. And, Billy. I, I'm tired, Randy. Lots of things happened tonight. Lots of things. Yeah, I know. What do you say we go someplace for coffee? Yeah, yeah, I'd like that. <laughs> I'm awful tired. And uh, when I get real rested good, I'll go back to see her. Her and me, we'll start over again. Hey, hey, this is where she lives, you know. Yeah. Look, I I got to see her once more, Randy. Maybe she'll talk to me this time. Huh? Not tonight anymore, Billy. No, but I, I want her to talk to me. Well, I don't she will. <laughs> yeah, she will. She loves me. Billy, now listen to me. You let me go up there first. I'll talk to her and fix everything, okay? Well, Tell her not to act like a kid. Tell her to talk to me. Yes, sure, sure. I'll tell her, but you must put... Hey, Stone? Yes, Conky? You put in a call for us? Oh, yes, I did. It's okay now. I found him. What'd she call the cops for, Randy? Oh, Kolsky's not a cop. He's a pal of yours. Huh? He thinks you're the greatest fighter that ever lived. He always wanted to talk to you about your big fight. Oh, sure, sure. But but we're busy now. I, I'll talk to you about it later, Kolsky. I gotta see somebody. Billy, I promised you I'd see her, remember? You... you... You're gonna tell her I'll be waiting? Sure, sure. Now, you just stay with Kulski here. Tell him uh, about the night you won the belt. Anything the matter, Stone? No, no, no. Just keep him here. I'll answer questions later. Now, Billy. Yeah? Promise me you'll stay right here. You, you won't stay long, huh? J- just tell her she loves me and, and and I want her to talk to me. Sure, I will. Okay, now you wait here. <laughs> I didn't think it would do any good to see her again, but I wanted to give Billy a good memory to take along. I saw her all right, but she didn't talk to me either. I went back downstairs and out to the street. I hadn't been gone more than five minutes, but they were the longest five minutes of my life. Brother, I was beat. Hey, hey, Rhonda, you see her, huh? You see her? Yeah, I saw her, Billy. What did she say? Uh, You tell me what she said, huh? Well, I told her. Hey, Stone, how long does this go on? This is a prowl car, not a bus. Yeah, we're coming along with you. Yeah, what's the idea? Get in the back, Billy. Yeah. I'm, I'm kind of tired. I, I'd kind of like to ride to your place, Randy. Sure. Take us to the precinct, Cousin. Listen, Randy. Did you see his girl? Yes, I saw her, but she didn't talk to me either. I guess she laughed once too often. She's dead. Huh? All right, now just take it easy, Skalski. The poor guy doesn't even know that he killed her. Four a.m. and the lights are going out all over the city. Even those neon signs on Madison Street. I've got to write my piece and put it in the slot. But what can I say? The story of a one-sided love... Well, if that's what love does to you, I'll stick to Pinochle. It's a funny thing about love, isn't it? Let someone get up and talk about hate, and he's hailed as a new leader. Let him speak of love, and he's ridiculed, he's spat upon, and even nailed to a cross. Love is the greatest thing, the oldest yet the latest thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Copy, boy. Now, 
starring George Raft, we bring you a world of adventure with Rocky Jordan. I'm Rocky Jordan. I run the Cafe Tambourine in Cairo. If you're ever out this way, stop in. I'll have Chris, my bartender, mix you one. You won't forget. The Café Tambourine in Cairo, crowded with tourists, camel drivers, women, chiefs, forgotten men down on their luck, the lonely and the lost. For this is Cairo, gateway to the ancient east, where modern adventure and intrigue unfold against a backdrop of antiquity. Tonight's Rocky Jordan story, The Man from Damascus. Hi, I'm Chris. I've been Rocky Jordan's bartender and best pal for years. He told me you might stop in. Sit down. Hey, Chris. Oh, excuse me a minute. Oh, yeah, Rox? Watch those two in the corner. They look like a couple of pickpockets I knew in Istanbul. I'll keep an eye on them, Rocky. And if they start moving around... Throw them out. Yeah. And, uh, Chris. Yeah? Take it easy on the conversation tonight, huh? Me? Oh, Rock, don't I always? <laughs> oh, sure. Uh, I'll be in the office, Chris. <laughs> okay, Rocky. Yeah, Rocky's a great guy. He tells me a lot of things. Oh, not everything, but a lot. He's hard as nails if he's being pushed... But with a soft spot in his heart. Well, for instance, you ever been in Damascus? Rocky met a man from Damascus once, was as twisted as they come. I remember it was a hot Wednesday evening just after the Moisin had called the natives to prayer. I was here at the bar serving up some arak to a sailor from Port Said. Rocky was up front watching it get dark out in the street. That's when the girl came in. hair was black and her eyes were wide and gray-green and plenty worthwhile. She had what it takes, and on Rocky, it took. He suddenly lost all interest in the street outside as she walked up to him. Pardon, you are Mr. Jordan, Rocky Jordan. Yeah, lady, that's right. I am Sandra Marr. I am new to Cairo. I arrived only today from Damascus in uh, Syria. Glad to know you, Miss Marr. Sightseeing? You may call me Sandra. And no, I'm not sightseeing. I came to your cafe expressly to see you. Oh, just to see me. I would like to talk to you. Can you give me a little of your time? Time? <laughs> That's the one thing I have plenty of, Sandra. Uh, shall we go back to my table? Thank you. You are very kind, Rocky. I will take but a few moments. Take as many as you like. Here we are. Thank you. Oh, uh, can I get you something, Rocky? Would you like a drink, Sandra? No, thank you. Oh, nothing, Chris. Well, uh, you said you wanted to talk. <clears throat> Have you a light for my cigarette? Oh, sure, sure. Here you are, Sandra. <sighs> thank you, Rocky. Now, uh, what's on your mind? I was told that of all people in Cairo, you were the one who could help me. You know Cairo, all of it. You have ways of finding things out. Maybe. Go on. I am looking for someone. Someone here in the tambourine? No, Rocky. But I must find this someone quickly, tonight. Oh, why come to me? I run a cafe, not a traveler's aid bureau. Oh, please do not make jokes with me. I'm not. Promise then that you will help me. I can be most grateful... Please, Rocky, promise for me. Look, Sandra, I don't know what your game is, but I like all the cards on the table. All my cards are on the table. No, they're not. Who is this someone? What's your angle? I, I cannot say. You can't or won't. Which? Oh, it's too bad. It could have been real nice meeting you, Sandra. But, Rocky, I must find him. He told me he was coming to Cairo on business, but I know that is not true. 
Kaczynski is in trouble, some terrible sort of trouble. Why don't you go to the police? The police? Oh, no. They must know nothing of this. Oh, great. You want me to find a guy who's in trouble. The kind of trouble you can't go to the police with. Uh-huh. No, thanks. Please, Rocky, I will pay for your help. I told you before. I want all the cards on the table. I like you, Sandra. And I'd like to help you. Now, uh, do you want to tell me what this is all about? Rocky, I cannot. You must trust me. Sorry, Sandra. I've been burned before. No information, no deal. She didn't say another word, just got up and started for the door. Rocky watched her all the way out, then he lit a smoke and headed for his office. I was cracking out another bottle of Arak for the thirsty sailor when we heard it. By the time I got clear of the bar, Rocky was already out the front door. The street was full of sounds and smells and people, but none of them was the girl with the gray-green eyes. Chris, I'm sure that was the girl who was just in here. Maybe she really did need help. Yeah, but Rocky, where is she? Oh, she can't be very far. I'm going to have a look. You better get back to the till. gone a good half hour looking for him. But when he finally got back, he was alone. Hey, Rocky. What is it, Chris? Did you find her? Mm, not a sign. I wonder what happened. I don't know. But I got a feeling that the night's not over yet. Oh, you're so right. There's, uh, there's a guy here to see you, Rock. He's in your office. He's what? Yeah, well, Rocky, it was like Chris, this. Chris, 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 no, I'll handle it, Chris. You take care of Sailor Boy there. Yeah, okay. All right, Sailor. I'll rock. Come on up. Hello, Jordan. Make yourself at home. That's what I'm doing. Pretty good liquor in your private stock. It's too rich for your taste, buddy. Put it down. Yeah, the perfect host, huh? Put it down. Sure, sure. Funny, figured you different. Everybody in town says you're a right guy. Maybe you've been talking to the wrong people. Well, what do you want? You. I've got 1,000 pounds here for you, Jordan. There. Go ahead, count it. What's that for? Partial payment for services about to be rendered. No, thanks. I'm not for sale. That 1,000 pounds is just a start, pal. There's more where that came from. There always is. Yeah. Come on, Zorton, you got an appointment. I can't make it. Now, that's a mistake, pal. You and me, we are working for the same fella. We are, huh? Well, bring him around sometime. He don't figure that way. You see, he's got... Look, that... take that money and get out of here. Get away from that door, Zorton, or I pin you to the wall. Seven-inch blade, pal. Damascus steel. Take it easy, Heavy. Sure. And it's double-edged, Zorton. You don't want to argue with this. You're right. I don't. Hey, come on, then. Let's go. Out the back way. The big monkey with a knife marched Rocky out the back door of the tambourine into a car parked in the alley, and they ended up at a sagging heap called the House of Sand that passed for a hotel. They climbed the stairs, and with the big guy's knife at his spine, Rocky was stopped in front of the door to room 12. Go on, knock. Who is there? Jordan. He's come for the rest of the dope. You're taking a lot for granted, Buster. You may let him come in now. Go ahead, Jordan. Meet your new boss. Hello, Mr. Jordan. Nice of you to come. You go leave us alone, please. Sure. You look shocked, Mr. Jordan. Sit down. I'll take it standing. Puzzled, perhaps, at what you see? My head completely wrapped in bandages? Who are you? You may call me the man from Damascus. That tells me a lot. Why the disguise? You mean my bandages? It is quite simple. I no longer have a face. Ever hear of plastic surgery? That will take a great deal of time and money. There is something I must do first. How about getting to the point? Very well. There is a man in Cairo I want... You are going to find him and bring him to me. <laughs> oh, what do you know? I turned down that same offer earlier tonight. And it was much more attractive then. Don't press your good fortune, Jordan. 
Now listen to me. The man you will bring to me is Alex Zarko. Alex Zarko? Why, the police have had a dragnet out for him for over two weeks. And I want to get to him before they do. Jordan, you know where a man like Zarko would hide and how to get to him. Sorry, you've got the wrong guy. Jordan, listen to me. I cannot go looking for him like this. I will double that thousand pounds. Jordan, be reasonable. I'm trying to. Zarko is wanted for attempted assassination and assorted murders. The Egyptian police have got him bottled up here in Cairo. Why, they've got the riverfront, every road, train, and flight covered. It's only a matter of time. Exactly. And I want him first. What have you got against Zarko? It was he, Alex Zarko, who took my face from me. Oh. Apparently, you cannot realize what it is to know that you can never walk the streets again without a covering over the horror that was once a face. Well, Jordan? No deal. You've got a private beef with Zarko. Keep it that way. Now, do I get out of here or not? This time you do, because I still need your help. Don't count on it. Jordan, wait. Now that you have seen me and know my purpose, you can be as much of a menace to me as a help. Consider that carefully, Jordan. If I do not hear from you again within an hour, I shall act accordingly. When Rocky come back to the tambourine, he didn't say a word. Just drew himself a beer, went over to a table in the back, and sat down facing the door. He was there for over an hour, like he was waiting for something to happen. And it finally did, but not what he was expecting. It was the girl with the gray-green eyes again. She walked right back to Rocky's table. But before she could reach him, Rocky was on his feet. Sandra. Rocky, please. It is not easy for me to inflict myself on you for the second time. But I have to. I'm sorry. Never mind the apology, Sandra. What happened? When you sent me away before, there was a man out there in the street. A big man who carries a knife. I had seen him before, only a few days ago in Damascus. He started after me, but I got away and hid. From both of us. Oh, I went to look for you myself. I'm glad you did. But when I left my hiding place, I saw you drive away from here with that same man. It is my belief he took you to the person I am seeking. The one who calls himself the man from Damascus, huh? Yes. Will you tell me now where the man from Damascus is? The answer still no. He's looking for trouble and you don't belong in it. But I do. I must help him. Help him? Maybe you don't know he's gunning for a guy named Alex Zarko. Oh, no, that cannot be true. Paul is not that kind of person. Paul... Paul? Paul Ma, maybe? Yes. Oh. I see. Paul. You'll find him in a place called the House of Sand. Oh, Rocky, thank you. Someday I hope I can explain. Well, you got what you came here for, Sandra. See you around. Rocky, please, you do not understand. But I, I, I must go to him. Don't let me keep you, Sandra. Oh, Rocky. Rocky watched the walk out for the second time in one night. And then he started to come up front toward the bar. I looked up just in time. Rocky! At the back door, a guy with his whole head in bandages. He's got a gun! Rocky, look out! <laughs> your hour is up, Jordan! You have made your decision! Now die with it! <laughs> Listening to The Man from Damascus, tonight's adventure with Rocky Jordan, starring George Raft. And now we take you back to Cairo and Rocky Jordan's adventure with. The Man from Damascus. When the man from Damascus cut down on my boss, Rocky, and splattered the glassware around with his 38 slugs, he made a lot of changes in the tambourine. All the cash customers disappeared in a hurry. Rocky was bleeding from a nick in his left shoulder. 
And for a topper, who should come walking in but Captain Sam Sabaya, Cairo Police. A gentleman with an awful lot of cop know-how under his red fez. Good evening, Jordan. Is it possible that I can be of some slight service at this time? I doubt it, Sam. The floor show is over. Better get a broom, Chris, and let me know how much stuff was broken. I'm going to collect damages in full. Yeah, okay, Rock. Uh, damages from whom, Jordan? I can't remember. Oh, here. Give me a hand with this handkerchief, will you, Sam? I've got a little scratch here. Oh, yes, of course, certainly. Uh, Jordan, the caller's name, what did you say it was? I didn't say. Jordan, who did this? I said I didn't remember. Oh, by the way, Sam, what brought you here so fast? Don't tell me you were just passing by and heard the shots. No, Georgia, no. I was warned the shooting would take place. I wish I could have arrived a little earlier. What's the angle, Sam? Care to name it? I will name it, Jordan. It is Alex Zarko. I am determined that he shall not get out of Cairo. At this time, he will not escape the law. Why come to me? Somebody say I was tied in? Precisely. Who? I can't remember, Jordan. Oh. Now, about the shooting, is Zarko connected with it? If you mean, did he pull the trigger? No. I mean what I said. Is Zarko connected with this? Maybe. But at the moment, it's a private matter. Violence is never a private matter. Now, for the last time, what is this shooting all about? Very well, Jordan. I cannot force you to speak at this time. However, I wish to warn you that if anyone else is injured in this private matter of yours, I shall hold you responsible. Don't worry about me, Sam. I'll be good. Just as good as the next guy. But no better. When Captain Sabaya left, Rocky waited just long enough to get a decent dressing on his shoulder, and then he headed back for room 12 at the House of Sand. But the man of bandages had checked out. Room 12 was as empty as a camel's future. It made the front desk the next stop, and there Rocky found the landlady, a relic older than the Sphinx, but a little noisier, completely engrossed in a U.S. comic book called The Phantom Menace. Say, lady. Lady. Hey, sweetheart. Front and center. Oh, oh Effendi. The Phantom Menace has just captured Brick Braun and is dipping him head first into a barrel of pickle brine 100 times. It is very funny. Oh, I'm glad you're having fun. But if you can get a hold of yourself for a minute, it might earn you a pound note. All the laughter has suddenly departed. How can I earn this magnificent sum? By giving me the forwarding address on the party who just vacated room 12. Oh, that would be a short, fat man with a bald spot. A seller of fly swatters. No, that would be a tall man with bandages where he should have a face. A seller of death. Death comes higher than fly swatters. Not always, but I'll go two pounds. Oh. The young lady offered me five pounds. Young lady? A brunette with gray eyes? The same. All right. I'll go five pounds. She resides now in room ten of this establishment. I think she loves the man of the hidden face. I think she waits on the vain hope of his return. Nobody asks you what you think. I'm paying you for what you know. Here's five pounds. Now, when did number twelve check out? Two hours ago. How did he leave? By taxi. I myself called it. Do you know the driver? I do indeed. He is a descendant of the evil dog. I want his name, not his pedigree. Harry Amar. Of residence 303 Sharia Shaman. Oh, it is worth his five pounds to but mention his name. Well, play like you're the fan of menace and he's Brick Braun. <laughs> I shall, and I will be bathed in ecstasy. <laughs> Rocky left the old woman cackling over her comic book and checked out that cab driver, Holly Amar. After a little uh, persuasion, he told Rocky he'd left the man from Damascus off at another termite trap called the Little Nile. The man with the bandages was holed up on the second floor. Rocky listened at the door, but he didn't hear anything inside, so he eased it open. First thing he saw was a guy in a chair across the room. It was the man from Damascus, all right. Second thing he saw was a little Italian-made gun in the guy's hand, pointed straight at Rocky's chest. What has kept you, Jordan? Oh, I didn't know you were waiting. It is close enough. Well, you have come, living up to your reputation perfectly. 
I knew that if I had not killed you in your cafe, you would come looking for me. Put down that gun. You're not going to kill me here. For one thing, Captain Sabaya knows you're after me. That does not worry me, Jordan. Maybe not. But for another thing, Sandra's in town. Sandra? That's right. She's in Cairo looking for you. She came to me for help. Right now, she's at the House of Sand waiting for you to come back. Sandra. My sister. Your what? My beautiful sister. The only person I have in the world. So you're her brother. Well, what do you know? And I took you for Mr. and Mrs. Sandra thinks an awful lot of you, Ma. She doesn't figure you could kill anybody. Me or Alex Zarko. Regardless of what's happened. Stop it, Charlton. Do not unnerve me. You and I are stalemated. You have a score to settle with me, but I am holding the gun. Now, if I drop the gun... You want me to drop the grudge, is that it? Yes. I do not want you dead, Jordan, because I can still use your help. I still want Alex Zarko, and if you can be trapped... You're crazy. I told you once, I'm not butting into a private feud. But I am, Jordan. <laughs> Sam. You will drop the gun, please. Drop it! You're really getting around tonight, Sam. I know you well enough, Jordan, to realize that you would not allow someone to shoot at you and then forget it. When you would not tell me who had done it, I knew if I followed you long enough, you would lead me to him. You usually do. Look, Sam, this is strictly between Ma and me. I have told you once, Jordan, violence is not a private matter. I will not allow killing if I can help it. And I will not allow either of you to interfere with the police capture of Alex Zarko. You have not found him yet. No, but I will. And you will not. Mr. Ma, you will please remove the bandages from your face. What? I said you will please remove the bandages. Very well. I shall step into the light, gentlemen, so that you may see all that is left of what was once a face. Rocky and Captain Sabaya watched Palmar unwind the bandages, uncovering first what should have been his chin, and then the battered purple skin on his cheeks the twisted mouth, the mashed nose, and then his eyes. A hard, waxy kind of a stare came from his left eye, an eye that couldn't blink because it had no lid. There. Now. Now you can see why I feel as I do about Alex Zarko. I... I'm most sorry I had to subject you to this, Mr. Marr. But I still cannot allow a personal revenge to interfere with my execution of the law. It is customary in Cairo in affairs of this nature to use the following procedure. There is a train leaving Cairo for Alexandria in one hour. You will please be on the train. From Alexandria, you should have no trouble securing passage back to Syria. Uh, Sam... And uh... you, Jordan, shall remain in my custody until Mr. Marr has left the city. You have then one hour, Mr. Marr. I will meet you at the Cairo station to make certain you have boarded the train. Now you may put the bandages back on your face. Jordan, you will come with me to police headquarters. Come on. Hello? Rocky Jordan, Sandra. Oh, Rocky. I'm calling for police headquarters. Police headquarters? Is it about Paul? Yeah. I know the man from Damascus is your brother. I also know he's leaving Cairo. My hunch is he's going to Damascus. What? How do you know this, Rocky? You have seen him again? Paul will tell you about it if he wants to. He's a pretty mixed up guy, Sandra. He's going to need a lot of help. He says you're the only person he's got. I know. There is no one else. Then I guess it's up to you. Yes, I must go. But, Rocky, someday when Paul is himself again, perhaps I can come back to Cairo? Yeah, perhaps you can. And, Rocky, when I do, I... When you do, you know where to find me, Sandra, at the tambourine. Now get going and throw your things in the suitcase and see if you can keep them out of trouble. And, Sandra... Yes, Rocky? Good luck. Rocky and Captain Sabaya got to the train station. There weren't too many people there at that hour of the night. But standing down at the end of the platform under a light that made his bandages look extra white was the guy they were looking for, 
Paul Mark. As Rocky and the captain walked up to him, his eyes blinked at them through the slits in those wrappings around his head. Well, Mr. Ma, you will be leaving Cairo in a moment. If after a year has passed you wish to return to our city, write me a letter explaining your reasons, and I shall see what can be done to make Cairo available to you once more. Well, that's it. So long, Paul. Take good care of Sandra. Well, that is that. <laughs> a dangerously unhappy man there, Jordan. Not one word of goodbye. Yeah. Well, he's got reason, Sam. He's... Wait a minute. Sam! What is the matter with you? What? Where are you going? To catch this train. Hey, you better come, too. Come on, let's get it. They had to run for it, but they both made it. Rocky first, and then Captain Sabaya, wheezing and red-faced one car later. Rocky started up through the train, looking for the guy in the bandages, and finally found him. The guy saw him coming and tried to get away, but Rocky nailed him hard. By the time Sabaya got there, the guy in the bandages was just coming, too. Jordan, you will please explain the meaning of this. They can peel off those bandages. That'll explain it. Go on, Sam. You will please remove the bandages, Mr. Marr. Take them off, buddy. Or I'll do it for you. That's right. A little more. Let Sam see who you really are. Jordan, what is this? There you are, Sam. He's not Paul Marr. He's the guy you've been after for weeks. Sam, meet Alex Zarko. You see, it was all a fancy plan of that Zarko guy to get out of Cairo disguised as Paul Marr. And he framed it up with Marr to deliberately create a fuss, you know, like shooting up the tambourine, which he knew was just enough to get him run out of Cairo. It almost worked, too, except Zarko couldn't control his eyes. He blinked once, and once was enough because Rocky remembered that Paul Marr's left eye couldn't blink. But when they finally got back to headquarters, Captain Sabaya had some questions. Uh, Jordan, where would you say Paul Marr is now? Probably the house of sand with his sister. You realize that I must send men to apprehend him. You understand that Marr will have a jail sentence to serve for aiding a criminal. Yeah. Why, Why do you suppose he tried to help Zarko escape? Well, put yourself in his place. A face like his. A lot of desperation. It was a business deal. Money any way he could get it for a plastic surgery job. Hmm. You are aware, Jordan, that I must confiscate the money Zarko gave him. I'm aware that you might be able to take the dough. Unless you happen to forget that he's got it. Surely you're not suggesting that I deliberately overlook a financial arrangement that existed between criminals? Yeah, something like that. Jordan, I have always suspected you are a man without scruples. Sure I am. Remember the time I tried to sell that Monte Carlo swindler a half interest in the tourist concession for the tombs of the Memlo? <laughs> uh, remember? Yeah. No. No, I do not believe I do. Oh. Huh. My memory is not at all what it used to be. I, I seem to forget things uh, very quickly these days. Thanks, Sam. See you around. And that's what I mean. That's what I was telling you about my boss, Rocky Jordan. Hard as nails when he's being pushed, but he's got a soft spot in his heart that, I don't know, kind of pays off. Say, Chris. Oh, excuse me. Yeah, Rock, you want me? Yeah. Now time to close up. Okay. I'll throw the lock on the back door. Well, folks, we're closing up for the night. I hope that bartender of mine didn't bend your ear too much. When you're in Cairo again, don't forget to stop in here at the Cafe Tambourine. You're always welcome, as long as you don't ask too many questions. Good night. It's CBS again at the same time next week for another story of adventure and intrigue when we take you back to Cairo and the Cafe Tambourine, run by Rocky Jordan.
George Raff stars as Rocky Jordan. This program is produced and directed by Cliff Howell with original music by Richard Arad. Tonight's story by Adrian Janto and Larry Roman was prepared for broadcast by Robert Mitchell and Gene Levitt. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. Now, starring George Raft, we bring you a world of adventure with Rocky Jordan. I'm Rocky Jordan. I run the Cafe Tambourine in Cairo. It's been said out this way, love strikes the speech dumb, the ears deaf, the eyes blind. Yeah, I've seen it happen. It's what you might call really losing your head over a dame. The Café Tambourine, crowded with tourists, camel drivers, women, cheats, forgotten men down on their luck, the lonely and the lost. For this is Cairo, gateway to the ancient East, where modern adventure and intrigue unfold against a backdrop of antiquity. Tonight's transcribed Rocky Jordan story, Valley of the Dead. Hiya. Remember me? Chris, the barkeep at the tambourine. Also the general dispenser of information. Yeah. Yeah, Rocky Jordan and me have been buddies for years. And usually things go kind of smooth between us. Not always, though. I'm thinking of that Valley of the Dead deal when the blow-up between us sounded like the echo of an A-bomb. And, well, listen. It was one of those quiet evenings around the cafe when it began. The crowd had thinned out, and a sad-faced legionnaire sat at the bar, staring into his half-empty glass of wine. A few locals were scattered around, lapping up some arak and... In the back booth, one of the more handsome young guides around Cairo was whispering into the ear of a sweet-faced tourist, and she was giggling. Then Rocky came in. Call me one, Chris. Uh, anything wrong? Call me one. Yeah, yeah sure thing, right? You, um, been for a walk? Yeah, I've been for a walk. Well, was wondering. Hey, yeah. Rock, you drink? Oh, yeah. Thanks. Yeah. Things have been kind of slow tonight. I was thinking maybe we could close up early. Julie's coming by. You two getting sort of serious? <laughs> yeah. I... Uh-uh. A couple of cops just come in heading this way. Good evening, Jordan Bay. Oh, hello, boys. We are looking for someone. A man wearing a dark suit. We thought perhaps he might have come in here a few moments ago. I haven't seen him. Sorry. No, nah, no, nah, nobody come in the last few minutes except... What's that... happened, boys? There was a shooting at a small hotel several blocks from here. Oh, shooting, huh? Anybody get hurt? We are certain the man in the dark suit was wounded. We picked up his trail, lost him near here in the native quarter. Oh, that's too bad. Yes. Thank you, Jordan Bay. Come along, Amit. I'm going back to the office. Close up whenever you want. Yeah. Yeah, sure. <laughs> I watched Rocky as he walked to his office. He opened the door, took just one step inside, and then fell flat on his face. I got over there on the double, locked the office door, and hauled Rocky to the couch. And that's when I saw it, the blood trickling down his hand. I put in a fast call to a doc who would keep his mouth shut, and while he was patching up the rock shoulder, I went out and closed up the cafe. A half hour later, when I got back to the office, the doc was gone and Rocky was all business. Chris, you know a gent named Brizak? Brizak? Bri... Bri... No, no. How about a guy named Fabian? Risto Fabian. Well, do you? Uh, no. Are you sure? Yeah, yeah. For a minute there, I thought maybe I'd heard the name someplace before. I guess not. Here. Take a look at this. Check, huh? Uh, 20,000 pounds. Boy, that's... Hey, Rocky, this check is... It's made out to you. I thought you didn't know Fabian. Well, I don't. Then why would he write you a check for 20000 Look, I don't know. Honest, Rock. Say, does this have anything to do with... 
What happened back at the hotel? Yeah, but we don't have time for all that now. You got to get out of here. Lay low for a few days. Oh, now, wait a minute. Don't argue. Here's 50 pounds. Get moving. Not until you tell Look, me what... You said you didn't know Brezak. You don't know Fabian. All right, I'll take your word for it. Now you take mine. Beat it. Now listen, Rod. And don't take your fiat. You'll be spotted too easily. Uh, it's probably Julie. She must have come around the alley. I'll get it. Hello, Rocky. Come on in, Julie. Sorry I'm late, Chris. Oh, hello, baby. Well, what's the matter, darling? Oh, ask him. You two boys been having a quarrel? Out of the blue, just like that, get out of town, he tells me. What? Rocky, what is this? Well, if you want your boyfriend to stay alive, you better tell him to do as I say. Where's the Fiat, Julie? Well, parked out front. Leave it there. Here. Take the keys to my car. Get Chris up to Dave Amunia's place. I'm going to walk down the police headquarters and have a talk with Sam Sabaya. <laughs> Mr. Jordan. What's on your mind? I'd like to have a little chat with you. Sorry, I have an appointment. My name is Fabian. Mr. Fabian. Fabian? That changes things. I thought it would. Get in. Okay. I've been sightseeing before, so don't knock yourself out. Mr. Jordan, why did you go to that hotel tonight? Brizak's invitation was extended only to your bartender. I know, but Chris wasn't around when Brizak's messenger showed up. So I was asked to pass along the invitation. Which you did not do. That's right. Knowing Brizak as I do, I couldn't uh, resist going myself. The fact that the messenger mentioned 20,000 pounds, that had something to do with it, too? You think I'm trying to cut in? That is exactly what I think. Suit yourself. Fabian, what is this all about? All I got from Brezak was double talk. And a bullet in the shoulder. He resented the fact that I took the check from him. I shall only have to write another one. Really, Mr. Jordan, it is a simple business deal. I wish to pay Chris for information which he has acquired. I'm not convinced. If you ask me, that check was just a come on to get Chris and Brezak together so that killer of yours could do his work quietly. Mr. Jordan, if you are as concerned over Chris's welfare as you seem to be, you will do as I say. For the police would like to know more of a certain death which occurred here in Cairo a month ago. A man named Griswold was murdered, a geologist. I read about it. The killer got away in a small car, a yellow Fiat. That wasn't in the papers. Neither was this. Brzezak arrived a few moments after the killing. He heard someone running out the back door, saw the yellow Fiat race away into the night. Brzezak fired after the car, succeeded in breaking one of the tail lights. That's quite a story, Fabian. It happened. You can ask your friend Chris, but I doubt if he would admit that he was the one who murdered Griswold. Oh, we seem to have driven right back to your cafe. You can let me off here. But I thought you had an appointment. I've changed my mind. Yes, I can appreciate your dilemma. Oh, there is the yellow fiat. I suggest you examine the tail light closely. Good night, Mr. Jordan. Jordan. What? Oh, uh, it's you, Sam. Admiring the little yellow car? What are you doing here? Waiting for you. What happened at the hotel tonight? What hotel? Jordan, when my men spoke to you in the cafe earlier this evening, they were not fooled. However, they thought it wise to confer with me before taking any steps. I don't know what you're talking about, Sam. Brezak, the shooting in the hotel room. What were you doing there, Jordan? And what is your connection with this man, Fabian? Fabian? Yes, Fabian. You never heard of him, eh? You stepped out of his car a few moments ago. Well, what have you to tell me, Jordan? Sam, I'm kind of confused. I can't tell you anything. Jordan, already there has been violence. I cannot allow... I can't tell you anything now, and nothing's going to make me, Sam. You'll have to give me some time. Jordan, tell me. Are you protecting someone? Or yourself? A little of each, maybe. Don't press me, Sam. I won't give. Very well, Jordan. I shall bide my time. But if there is any further violence, I shall hold you personally responsible. Sure. 
Now, tell me something, Sam. Who is this Fabian guy? Risto Fabian. Bachelor, age 52, found of horses and American women. Citizen of Greece. Permanent residence, Athens. You seem to know a lot about him. He is not an unimportant man, Jordan. Have you ever heard of the Valley of the Dead? Sounds familiar. A great stretch of land in a country to the east, owned by Mr. Fabian, and now on lease to the Egyptian government. On lease? Oil? Oil. Thanks, Sam. I think you've given me something to go on. Jordan, after all, I am only a government clerk. And this is all I know about the matter. Griswold was hired by the government to do a survey on the Valley of the Dead to determine if the land had further oil potential. According to his report, it did not. So the government has decided not to renew the lease, which expires in a few months. And Griswold expired, too, after he made the survey. Why? Do not ask me. I have lived long enough to know the value of minding my own business. The wills are played out and the lease is dropped. Fabian is left with a lot of worthless land and no income. Yes. What's missing, Allie? You don't go gunning for a guy who's supposed to have some information if what he's got isn't worth anything. What? Gunning? Allie... How can I get my hands on a copy of Griswold's report? Griswold's house, perhaps, if there is anything left of his belongings. Or perhaps the girl who worked for him, uh, Miss Ware, Julie Ware. Julie? You know her. Yeah. Thanks, Allie. Night. Good night. Rocky, look out! Look out! You are listening to tonight's adventure with Rocky Jordan, starring Mr. George Raft. Dr. Christian's unique success with his patients is due as much to his keen understanding of people as to medicine. Every Wednesday evening on CBS, Gene Hersholt stars as kindly Dr. Christian of River's End, bringing you stories full of warm understanding. Listen for Dr. Christian for another drama of real life, your next program over most of these same CBS stations. Now we take you back to Cairo in tonight's Rocky Jordan story, The Valley of the Dead. The shots from the moving car tore some big holes in the front of Ali's house, but none of them caught the rock. He'd spotted the car, dove for cover. Well, he picked himself up knowing full well it had been Fabian and Brizak. And ten minutes later, he walked into a low-slung apartment building not far from the tambourine. First thing he caught was the low wail of a sax. He listened for a minute, and it took him back. But then it stopped, and he walked down to room 212 and knocked. He tried again, and a door came open. But was the one at the next apartment. And standing framed in the archway was a redhead with a neckline that looked like it was diving for pearls. Hello. Hello. Looking for Julie? Yeah. Friend of hers? In a way. Want to come in and wait? She might be back soon. Well, thanks. Maybe I will. Mona Clark, USA. You're an American, too, aren't you? Uh-huh. Rocky Jordan. <laughs> Shake. It's not that I don't like far-off places. You just want to see something familiar once in a while. Yeah, I know the feeling. I've got a pot of coffee fixed. Want some? If you got enough. Plenty. I'll get right away. Where are you from, Rocky? I mean, in the beginning. St. Louis. Good town. New Orleans, myself. Been there? Well, lots of times. Oh, do they still serve coffee and donuts in the French market? They did when I left. Gee, I miss it. Well, home next month. Never no more to roam. Until next time. Here. You and Julie pretty good friends? Pretty good. 
I'm trying to find out about a fellow named Griswold. Griswold? Definitely a meatball. One of those guys who live on a steady diet of vitamins, always with the play. Yeah, I get the picture. Julie worked for him, you know. He's been up here a couple of times. Julie's boyfriend caught up with him here once and knocked him down the stairs. Tall, sandy-haired fellow named Chris. Now, that's the one. I thought he'd kill Griswold. He was so sore. Of course, Griswold never bothered me. He knew I'd wrap him with my sacks. Sacks? Was that you playing just now? Uh Uh-huh. First sax, Billy Baxter's all-girl orchestra, world tour. Give a listen. Light? Mm, Very good. How about this? Oh, now, tell me something. What kind of work was Julie doing for Griswold? He did an oil survey on a place called uh, the Valley of the Dead or something. She typed up all the reports for him. I see. Julie uses Chris Yella Fiat quite a bit, doesn't she? Uh Uh-huh. Why? Just wondering. Thanks, Mona. Leaving? I... I'd like to finish that song for you sometime. Don't worry, baby. You'll get a chance to. Chris. Hi. What are you doing back at the cafe? You're supposed to be up at Dave Amunia's place. I'm not going any place until you tell me what you found out. All right. As near as I can make out, it goes like this. Risto Fabian thinks you killed Griswold. For information about the Valley of the Dead. Oh, Rocky, you don't believe that, do you? No, but Fabian does, and that's why Breeze acts gunning for you. Chris, where's Julie? Well, staying with a friend at the island house in Bullock. Is she in trouble, too? More than she knows. What do you mean? Chris, how did the taillight get broken on your Fiat? What's that got to do with it? Answer me. Well, I did... Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, I remember. Uh, Julie had the car that day. She said some kids broke it throwing stones. Sure. Chris, I'm going to tell you something you're not going to like. But I wouldn't say it unless I thought it was true. Well, go ahead. I'm listening. I think Julie's the one who killed Griswold. Rocky. It's lousy, I know. But it all fits. She typed Griswold's report on the Valley of the Dead. She's in the know. She drove your car that night. Not you. Don't you see you're playing a fall guy for a double-crossing, two-timing... Rocky, I'm... I'm sorry. I didn't mean to hit you. Forget it. But that doesn't change what I think. I'm going over to Bullock's seat, Julie. No, you're not. You go wandering around, you'll pick up a bullet. I'm going, Rock. You're not going to stop me. I guess I'll have to. <laughs> Cairo Police, Captain Sabayam. Sam? Rocky? Yes, George. I just caught my bartender, Chris, dipping into the safe. I want him locked up. Hello, Julie. Oh, Rocky. Can I come in? Well, I... Packing? Yes, vacation. I thought I'd go up to Karnak for a few days. Kind of sudden, isn't it? What's that big envelope in your suitcase? Well, nothing. Just something I'm going to mail. Oh, let me see. Rocky! Oh, addressed to Julie Ware. American Express. Athens, Greece. I thought you said you were going to Karnak. Well, I... Fabian lives in Athens, doesn't he? What's inside of this, Julie? Leave it alone. You have no right to open it. Yeah, I know I haven't. Well... Griswold's report on the Valley of the Dead. This report any different from the one the government got? No. Give that to me. Take it easy. The other report said there was no oil in the Valley of the Dead. This one says there is. Give it to me. This is the correct one, isn't it? This is why you killed Griswold. (sighs) Rocky. Yeah. Don't be angry with me. You don't understand how big this is. I don't. All right. Let's work it out. 
Griswold did the survey on the land, found oil, and prepared this report. He was about to send it in, and I got smart, Rocky. I stopped him. What good would it do him to have the government pick up the options on Fabian's land? But if Griswold made a deal with Fabian to turn in a false report... The government would drop the option. Fabian would get his land back. Yes. Oil's worth a lot these days to a lot of different people and countries. Price is high. Fabian could make a fortune. So Griswold went for your idea. Yes. Fabian went for the idea, too, because he'd already been approached by a representative of a foreign power. But that's when Griswold began to act like an idiot. He said he'd settle for 20,000 pounds. <laughs> 20,000 pounds. That's less than $50,000. Fabian stood to make millions. So you and Griswold talked it over, and he ended up with a letter opening his back. You all saw for the right report. Then you contact Fabian yourself and make a new deal. Yes, Rocky. And it can still be done. You and me, we can hit Fabian hard. A partnership and billion-dollar business. Where's Chris? In a nice, safe place. Why don't you get him out where it's not so safe? Fabian thinks he's the one who killed Griswold and knows about the oil. He'll be over in a minute. Fabian will go back to Athens satisfied. And then what? The day before the option comes due, you and I take a trip to Athens to see Fabian. We'll have partnership papers all drawn up. Fabian will have to sign them. It'll be too late for anything else. What do you say, Rocky? Lady, you're a louse. Rocky, what are you doing? Phoning the police. Oh, no, you're not. Put down that poker. Oh, Your shoulder hurts, doesn't it? Oh. So long, stupid. What? Do not let my gun startle you, my dear. Uh, Fabian. Hey, may I come in? I have been following you, Mr. Jordan. For at length, I have devised a method for bringing Chris, uh, shall I say, into the range of Brizak's gun. Chris is out of reach, Fabian. He is in jail. I know. You will telephone Captain Sabaya and tell him you made a mistake. Tell him to release Chris. So Brizak can be picked off coming out of the station? Yes. He's standing across the street from police headquarters now, waiting. Let him wait. Mr. Jordan, you will take the phone and do as I say. Sure, I'll take it. There! But... You pulled it out of the wall. That's right, and you can't find much use for it now. Mr. Jordan. Go on, pull the trigger. That'll get you nothing. Mr. Fabian. Yes, my dear? I know how to get Chris out of jail. If it would be any help to you. And why should you want to help me? Because I'm afraid you will be angry with me. Through no fault of my own. All this and no music? Why should I be angry with you, my dear? Because I have this. Look, I believe this is something you want. Griswold's original report on the value of the debt. Where did you get this? Chris gave it to me to hold for him. She's lying, Fabian. Silent. My dear, have you read this document? Oh, good heavens, no. It's full of such technical language I wouldn't understand it for a minute. Fabian, you're not going to go for this, are you? Chris doesn't know anything about this report. He didn't kill Griswold. She did. Oh, how can you say that, Mr. Jordan? Oh, he's lying, Mr. Fabian, to protect his friend. Yes, my dear, I understand. Tell me, how would you get Chris out of jail? Well, Chris and I have been quite friendly. It would be a simple matter for me to bail him out. Uh, excellent. My car is downstairs. Mr. Jordan, you will drive. I shall sit by you with my gun in your sight. Come, let's get started. <laughs> Slow down, Jordan. This is as close to the police headquarters as I want to be. Stop there by the alleyway. Rezak is just... Yeah, I see him. Rezak. Rezak. Yes, Mr. Fabian? This charming young lady here will go into the police station after our men. They will come out together, but she is not to be harmed. I understand, Mr. Fabian. She will not be harmed. Mr. Fabian, I think it might be better if I came out of the police station a few moments before Chris. So Mr. Brezak doesn't shoot me by mistake. An excellent precaution, my dear. Everything is clear, then? Yes, quite clear. Brezak, 
I know. She is to die also. Correct. Now take up your position across the street. Uh, we will time it to pick you up as soon as you have fired. Well, as you can see, a lot was going on while I cooled off in the Cairo jail. The first thing I knew about anything was when Julie suddenly showed up and bailed me out. Then, while I was picking up my wallet and things at the desk, she waltzed out the front door ahead of me. Well, that struck me kind of odd. I moved after, out the front door, and started down the steps. And that's when all Hades broke loose. A black convertible up the street took off with a sudden jerk. First jump in the ground! It was Rocky's voice, and I didn't ask any questions. Slugs him across the street, sail over my head. And then I saw Rocky behind the wheel of the car, and the joker beside him almost went through the windshield as Rocky grabbed the back of his neck and shoved. With his other hand, he yanked the wheel, and the car headed right to the spot where the gunman stood frozen in his tracks. Chris, grab Julie. Don't let her get away. Well, by then, I didn't need anybody to draw me a picture. I caught up with Julie halfway up the block and hauled her back. Captain Zabaya and a flock of cops had piled out of headquarters and taken over. And when Rocky got through talking, they had it all. A little later, Rocky, Zabaya, and me were heading along the street on the way to the tambourine. I uh, guess I did it up good this time, huh, Rocky? Forget it, Chris. No, no, I don't want to forget it. I played the prize, though. Um, I'm sorry. I apologize. Well, it's nothing to apologize over, Chris. It's one of those things that happened. Jordan is right, Chris. It happened. Why? Nobody knows. But nonetheless, it does. So many men, one time or another, are attracted by women of evil. You trying to tell us something, Sam? Well, as a matter of fact, Jordan, when I was a younger man, there was a dancer from Algiers who... Hmm. <laughs> you too, huh? Yeah, thanks, Captain. I'll uh, turn off here, Rock, and go on home. See you at opening time as usual? Sure. See you then. He will be all right, Jordan. Do not concern yourself over him. Sure, Sam. He'll be all right. <sighs> Observe, Jordan. A new day. The city of Cairo awakes. Yeah, and the tourists will be pouring out on the streets before long. And already the vendor is striving to attract them to his shop. Ah, Jordan, listen. The call of the East. What? What is that? <laughs> that, Sam, is the call of the West. Excuse me, Sam. I'll see you around. Our star, Mr. George Raff, returns in just a moment. The flood victims of Kansas, Missouri, Oklahoma, and Illinois are depending on you. Those whose lives have been jeopardized, whose homes have been destroyed, urgently need your assistance. The President of the United States has asked the American public to contribute at least $5 million through the local chapters of your American Red Cross for the relief of these citizens. So it's up to you. Give generously through your local Red Cross chapter. Help the flood victims. They need you. Now, here again is the star of our show, Mr. George Raft. Thank you. Well, Julie was quite a doll. Tall, big brown eyes, honey-colored hair. As far as Chris was concerned, she was out of this world. The law being what it is, she soon will be. Well, see you next week at the tambourine. Until then, Saida... Rocky Jordan stars Mr. George Raft with Anthony Barrett as Chris and Jay Novello as Sam Zabaya. Also heard in tonight's cast were Donald Morrison, Gene Bates, Ted Osborne, and Gloria Blondell. Our original music is composed and conducted by Richard Arant. Production and direction by Cliff Howell. Rocky Jordan is written by Larry Roman and Adrian John Doe. Bob Lamont speaking. This transcribed program came to you over CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. The F.W. 
Fitch Company presents Dick Powell as Private Detective Richard Rogue. In Rogue's Gallery. Rogue speaking. Well, tonight we meet a sort of an unusual girl. Her name is Muriel, and she's quite a personality. The name of the story is Murder with Muriel. But before we get into our story, here's Jim Doyle, the man from the Fitch Company. Are you looking for a smooth shave, men? Then try Fitch's No Brush Shaving Cream. It'll give you the kind of shave you want because 40 years of experience have gone into the making of this product. Fitch's No Brush contains a special skin conditioner ingredient that takes the work out of shaving. You won't have to struggle and scrape against stubborn whiskers because the skin conditioner prepares your face beforehand. It holds the whiskers up so your razor can zip them down closely and quickly. Even against the grain of a tough beard, your razor will glide swiftly, never nicking or scraping. Pitches No Brush is a boon to sensitive faces because it lubricates gently, keeping that tender skin from being irritated. After this quick, easy shave, your skin will feel cool and refreshed wonderfully smooth. And if you prefer a lather cream, try Fitch's Brush Cream. It forms a rich, abundant lather when applied with a brush. This lather stays moist all during the shave. Fitch's Brush Cream also contains the special skin conditioner for sensitive faces. Fitch's Brush and Fitch's No Brush Shaving Cream are available in handy 25 and 50 cent sizes. For a shave you like, switch to Fitch. Thank you, Jim. Now I'd like to tell my story. Okay, here's Dick Powell as Private Detective Richard Rogue in another personally conducted tour through... Rogue's Gallery. I was sitting at my junior executive type desk one day a few months ago, trying to get a studious gander at the racing form for the next day. I had planned to attend and contribute a quick 48 bucks outside to the improvement of the breed of thoroughbreds racing at the track. 48 bucks, that's uh, six across the board, eight races, six eights. That's right, uh, 48. Well, anyway, I was working on a case for an insurance company... And they had assigned a big company detective with his brains at his feet to help me. His real job was to watch me. And he did. His girl was mad at him, and he spent all his time writing torchy poetry to her. I didn't mind that. But the big goon read it to me. That made it personal. Hey, listen to this one, will you, Rogi? Oh, no, I'm busy. Can't you see, Joe? <laughs> this will put her in her place. Listen. Gee, Cupid stupid. His dart in my heart, I trusted. Now, my heart's busted. He sent me an Aphrodite, who's awful flighty. Don't trust Cupid. He's stupid. <laughs> That's a dilly, ain't it? I I'm going to send it to Rose's special delivery. Mm. That ought to bring her right back to you with a club in her hand. Why don't you give the dame up, Joe? Oh, you don't understand, Rogie. I love her. Oh. I'm looking for Richard Rogue. Yeah? What do you want? I've got a message for you. I want to talk to you. Uh, privately. Okay, okay. Come on in here. Look, I'm a busy guy today. What do you want? What's your name? I'm Joe Layton. Have you had a letter from Duke Dickerson? No. Nope. You know him, don't you? Well enough to lend him money. That answer your question? Well, he needs some dough. Tough. He still owes me. He's got some stashed in a tin box out in the valley. He wants it. He wants us to get it for him. Go on. He's planted the dough out in the valley. Yeah? Get to the point. Well, uh, he's mailed half of a map to me and the other half to you. A map showing just where the dough is buried. We're to go get it together. I get the 2500 he owes me, and you get the 100 he owes you, plus 1000 for the job. And Duke gets the rest. Okay. Mm -hmm. Sure, sure. I'll take a drive out into the valley for 1,100 skins any time. But I haven't got the map yet. Well, he mailed it day before yesterday. It should be here. Well, it isn't. Drop around about noon tomorrow. Maybe it'll come in the morning mail. The Duke needs the dough pretty bad. 
He's got himself in a bit of a jam in Kansas City. We'll get that dough tomorrow, huh? There's something about money I like. I think maybe it's the feeling of power it gives me when the rent is paid. Anyway, this, uh, this spook shoved off, and I went back into the outer office where Joe Black was poisoned, penning some more poetry. The phone rang, and I thought twice before I answered it. It was almost six o'clock, and I had plans for that evening. But I finally gave in to its yammering. Rogue Detectives, Richard Rogue speaking. Hello, Mr. Rogue. I must see you right away. Hmm, sorry. It's a matter of life and death, Mr. Rogue. I'm afraid. What's the matter? What's your name? Muriel Scott. Please, come to the Rialto Theater. I can't be seen talking to you. I'm in the aisle seat, center aisle, three rows down from the rear of the theater, on the right-hand side of the center aisle. The seat next to mine is vacant. Please meet me there as soon as possible. Please, hurry. Okay, wait there. Who was that, Rogie? Oh, now, look, Blackie, it was private business. Why don't you run along home now and get some rest? Oh, no. The boss told me to stick with you. And that's what I'm going to do. You're tricky, you know. We don't trust you. Oh, look, I... Oh, hello. What are you doing here, Urban? Just dropped in to ask you a few questions, Rogue. Good evening, Lieutenant Urban. Hello, Blackie. Go wait in the hall. I want to talk with Rogue. Yes, sir. Oh, now, what's on your mind? You know a guy by the name of Layton? Joe Layton? Hmm. Yeah. Name sounds familiar. Why? He just left here, didn't he? Well, he's been here. What's that to you? What do you want to see you about? Well, I don't see how that could possibly affect you, old man. He came to see me on private business. That's all the talking I'm going to do. How'd you know he was here, anyway? I just took a card off him. He had your name and address on it. What did he want to see you about, Rogue? He didn't mention your name. How come you'd be shaking Joe Layton down? Is he pinched? No, no, he isn't in any trouble with the police, Rogie. I picked him up about a block from here a while ago. He'd been robbed and murdered. Well, this was a fine time for Joe Layton to get dead. Just when he meant 1100 bucks to me. I went down to the morgue with Urban to look at the body. What I really went for was a quick look through his personal effects. There was no sign of half a map. That's all I wanted to know. Urban put me on the fire for a while, trying to get me to tell him all I knew about Layton, but I didn't crack, and I left about 10.30 to drive back to my office. My shadow Blackie was right behind me. When I walked into the office, the phone was ringing. Rogue Detectives, Richard Rogue speaking. Mr. Rogue, you didn't come to the theater. Oh, I'm, uh, I'm sorry, Muriel. Something else came up that demanded my immediate attention. But I must see you right away. It's a matter of life or death. Uh, but I can't. There's, there's a $500 fee waiting here for you for just a few minutes' work. Please, Mr. Rogue. Huh? Oh, where are you? I'm at the Shady Glade Motel out in the valley. You know where it is? Oh, sure, sure. I've passed it a thousand times. Will you come right out? Please. Cabin number four. Uh... You say there's $500 waiting there for me? You got it there? Yes. Please hurry. I'm frightened to death. Well, I just had 1,100 skin shot out from under me, and I decided I couldn't afford to be too temperamental about a sure 500. So I ran down the stairs to my car and took off for the Shady Glade Motel... And the lady with the seductive voice. It was a long drive from my office, and I spent my time trying to figure out how I was going to get in touch with Duke Dickinson and deal myself back in on that buried treasure deal. I couldn't tell whether Blackie had managed to tail me on this trip or not. There was so much traffic on the pass. Well, uh, anyway, I pulled up at the Shady Glade and knocked at the door of cabin number four. You're Mr. Rogue? Yeah. Come in. Well, uh, get it off your chest, lady. Please, sit down. Okay, but uh, I'm in a kind of a hurry. Let's make this as brief as possible. All right. Would you care for a drink? Well, I'd love one. But look, you were tearing your hair out a half hour ago. I got here as soon as I could by breaking a few speed laws. Now, before we get social, what's the deal? I'm in trouble, Mr. Rogue. I'll take it from here, Muriel. Huh? 
Oh, oh, a reception committee with artillery, huh? Well, how about giving me a quick rundown on what's the deal? What do you want from me? You know a man by the name of Joe Layton? Yeah, I knew him. And I know what happened to him. You wouldn't want it to happen to you, would you? I don't insist on it. Get out of here, Muriel. I'll stay. Get into the other room. Go on. All right, Chef. All right now, Rogue. Let's get down to business. You had company today, didn't you? Layton was up to see you. That's right. Everybody seems to know that. What do you mean? Well, the cops came to see me later. Took me down for a little questioning. You see, they knew Layton called on me, too. Mm-hmm. Yeah. When you shook him down for that map, you should have taken that card with my name and address off of him. And he can't think of everything. I want your half of that map, Rogue. I don't have it. Don't lie to me, Rogue. Just give me your half of the map. I don't have it. But even if I did, name me a reason why I should give it to you. Where is it? I don't have it. That's all I know. I'll give you $5,000 for it, Rogue. Huh? <laughs> why should I sell it to you? I had to kill a man for half that map. I don't want to have to kill you unless it's absolutely necessary, Rogue. Believe me, I hope it won't come to that. Now, look, pretty boy. I don't have the letter, and killing me or keeping me here won't make you much of a score. Where is the letter? Why should I tell you? Ah, let's face it, chum. There's is it no... in your office? I haven't received it yet. It'll probably be in the morning's mail tomorrow. This is not getting anybody someplace. I'll do the worrying about that. Yeah? Well, while you're worrying, take a look behind you. You got company. Oh, no, no. I'm surprised that you try to run that old bluff like that on me. <laughs> you think it's a bluff? Hey, Blackie. Drop that gun, mister. I couldn't miss you from here. You better drop it, pretty boy. My friend Joe Black is a very nervous type. Yeah. Drop it. Okay. Oh, that's a nice guy. Look, Blackie, I'll hold a gun on this citizen. There's a girl in the bedroom. Go get her. All right, Rogie. What are you going to do with me, Rogue? I haven't made any plans yet. You'll be taken care of. Don't worry. Why don't we keep this to ourselves, Rogue? There's play. Hey, Rogue, there's no dame in here. What? The window's open and she's gone. I, I heard a car pull away just as I came in here. Oh, that's fine. That's great. Well, well, it isn't my fault, Rogie. I, I did what you told me to and... You really got away, huh? That's right. She got away. But we've still got the main attraction. That's you. Look, Rogue, there's no reason why we can't make a deal. I'm perfectly willing to cut you in for half the money. <laughs> How big of you. You have to watch those generous impulses, Shep. Next thing you know, you'll be giving away the sleeves out of your vest. Hey, Blackie. Uh, yeah? You just declared yourself in on five bills, okay? Sure. What do I do? Shake him down. I want half of a hand-drawn map. There's no point in us working against each other, Rogue. Shut up. Yeah. I'll get it for you. Keep your hands away from your pockets. Yeah, just keep them up in the air, and I won't have to break your thick skull. Uh, toss me his wallet, Blackie. Uh, Quit squirming, you. Uh, yeah. There. There you are, Rogie. And a nice wallet it is, too. Uh, uh, maybe you'll let me have it, huh, Rogie? Uh, after you've taken a map out, of course. <laughs> That's what I love about you, Blackie. You have such big ideas. Ah, well, quite a bit of dough here. And the driver's license. Glad to see that you're a law-abiding citizen, Chef. Oh, now, here it is. A little piece of paper worth 25 grand. Now, look, Rogue. Suppose I work with you. Just cut me in for five grand. A little late for that, Shep. Blackie. Yeah? I'm afraid our friend Shep might be a burden. Uh, you'd better put him to sleep for a while. Uh, you mean like this? Oh. You're so enthusiastic, Blackie. Now let's get him tied up and slip him under a bed until we need him again, shall we? Of course. Uh, hey, uh, hadn't we better call in the cops, Rogie? Well, I didn't want the cops in on this deal yet. They get so inquisitive about murderers. I knew that Shep was as safe as a royal flush against three deuces. So I left him there all tied up like a bow tie. I gave Blackie the slip and went to my apartment to get a little sleep. I opened the door and walked in... into a surprise party. Hello, Rogie. Where you been? What are you doing in my apartment, Urban? Waiting for you to get home. You got a warrant? Oh, now, Rogie, are we going to get technical? What do you want? You decided to tell me what you know about the killing of uh, Joe Layton? No. You might be making a mistake, Rogue. 
You know, sometimes you need a guy like me. What are you working on? I don't report to you, Urban. Go away. I've known you for a long time, Rogie. You're declaring yourself in on Leighton's murder. I don't think you did it, but uh, I think you know more than you're talking. Now, look, I've got a stake in this case. If I crack it, I'll let you know in time to get your picture in the papers. Will you settle for that? You're on the level, aren't you, Rogie? Well, you know I am. I've worked with you this way before, haven't I? Have I ever given you a bump pitch? No. Good night, Lieutenant. Good night, Richard. If you have any ideas of slipping me a double cross, Rogie, forget it. I've got a cell waiting for you, and I'm not above framing you. Remember that. I knew Urban wasn't kidding. And I had an impulse to call him back and tell him about the murder I had put away for him in that motel. But I thought better of it. As the door closed behind Urban, I heard another door open behind me. Hello, Mr. Rogue. Muriel. Why, honey, this is... Put up your hands. I'm going to get that map if I have to kill you. We'll return to our story in just a moment. But first, I'd like to tell you that glamorous women the country over are using Fitch's saponified shampoo for greater hair beauty. Here's what lovely Bess Meyerson, recently awarded the title of Miss America of 1945, told us in an interview. A long time ago, I discovered that part of being beautiful was being clean. So I keep my hair clean by shampooing it as often as I feel it needs it. I use Fitch's saponified shampoo because it does not dry my hair or make it difficult to manage, no matter how often I shampoo it. Yes, beautiful women everywhere use Fitch's saponified shampoo. It does not dry the hair because it's made from mild vegetable and coconut oils. Even in hard water, it gives lots of rich, fragrant lather. It cleanses efficiently and gently. And here's a feature all women will cheer. Fitch's saponified shampoo contains its own patented rinsing agent. This rinsing agent works with the plain rinse water to make your hair sparkling clean. No particles are left to dim the luster and highlights of the hair. Best of all, you won't need to bother with a special after-rinse. Give your hair a treat. Use Fitch's saponified shampoo. You can get a professional application at your beauty or barber shop or ask for an economical bottle at your drug counter. Richard Rogue is involved in an affair concerning $25,000 in buried treasure. There's a girl in the affair named Muriel Scott, and right this minute, the lovely Muriel is an uninvited guest in Rogue's apartment, where she's holding Rogue at the end of a 45 automatic. I love girls, especially girls with Muriel's gifts. She had the kind of a figure that you'd like to add to your income tax. And a little baby face that made me want to hold her on my lap and tell her a story. But that gun changed everything. It ruined the intimate, romantic atmosphere that I would have preferred. Take your revolver out of the holster and drop it. Come on, I know how to use this gun. Okay, okay. Now back away from it. You know, uh, I have a strange feeling that you've lived through this before. I have. Keep backing. Okay. Mm. Now what? Sit down. Thanks. How'd you get in here? Through the window, the one in the fire escape. <coughs> now, what time is the first mail delivery at your office in the morning? Oh, it's about 9.30. I heard you tell Shep that the map would be there in that mail. I'm expecting it. Good. I'll get it then. What did you do with Shep? Well, he's okay. Is he in jail? No, he isn't. I want my hands on that dough before I yell for the cops. Uh-huh. I want my hands on that dough, too, and I'm going to get them there. Are you, uh, comfortable? Yeah, don't worry about me. Look, baby, I I want some coffee. How about you? Just stay where you are. Oh, but look, beautiful, it's only 11.30. It's 10 hours before the mail arrives. I can stay awake 10 hours at $2,500 an hour. Easy. Mm -hmm. Ah, It's too bad you're so hard to get along with. What a very beautiful dame, you know it? Yeah, I know it. Just keep your seat, Mr. Rogue. I don't know whether you're going to like coffee the way I make it or not, Muriel. It'll be all right. Are you sure you don't want me to hold the gun while you make the coffee? Go ahead, make the coffee and stop talking. Uh, okay, okay, beautiful. 
Yeah, but you'd let her, better listen to my proposition. Ah, we could do a lot together with 25 grand. Ever been to Rio? More toast? Thanks, Richie. You know, you make pretty good coffee. And you make pretty good toast, Angel. Lots of butter. And you know that costs points? We won't need them in Rio, will we? No. <laughs> ah, we're going to make beautiful music together, baby. You know it? How did you ever get mixed up in a deal like this, anyway? Oh, he came through Pittsburgh. Mm, I know the town well. He spent a lot of money on me, and I thought I was living. Ah, you're too nice a girl to go around pointing guns at people. What did you do with that cannon, anyway? I left it on the kitchen table. Oh. You comfortable? Uh-huh. A few more hours and you can go pick up that money, huh, baby? Yeah. Twenty-five grand. You know something, honey? What? I can just barely remember Shep. It's 9 o'clock, honey. Let's get going, shall we? Oh, uh-huh. we'll just about make it, huh? Yeah. Hmm? Well, I hope that map's in the morning mail, don't you? Well, it will be, don't worry. Come on, I'll help you with your coat. Mm-hmm. Hey, where'd you get it? It's a nice mink. Shep stole it for me. He was a petty larceny guy, wasn't he? Ah, let's not think about him, Angel. Come on. We we're on our way to the office in that letter. And Rio? Could be. Over here. Now, you stay in the car. I don't know whether there'll be any cops up there or not. And if I'm not back in five minutes, shove off. And I'll meet you in the lobby of the Hotel Bellevue in an hour. Oh? You're not going to take me to the office with you? No. Then leave me the half of the map you took from ship. I want to know you're coming back. Oh, sure. Sure, baby. Yeah, here you are. Now, are you happy? Yes, I'm happy. Hurry, though, will you? I'll be back in a minute, beautiful. If I'm not, remember what I told you to do, huh? I'll be in the lobby of the Bellevue if you aren't back in five minutes, right? If that letter was in my office, I had this case whipped like Simon Legree had Uncle Tom. Then my wishbone was in my throat as I rode up to my office. The elevator had always seemed slow, but this morning it seemed to be going backwards. With just a few more breaks now, I'd be back at home, home base like the third fleet. I walked into the office, and there sat my shadow, Joe Black. I pitched him some fast double talk about ditching him last night, ran through the mail, found the letter from Duke Dickinson with a map. While I was jumping up and down and clapping my hands, I told Blackie what I wanted him to do. And then Muriel and I took off for the treasure hunt with a spade. Are you sure this is the right path? Sure. I've got the map right here, haven't I? Look, uh, look up ahead. There's the big rock he's got on. See? Uh-huh. And uh, there's the tree. Look, Roby. Oh, the gun. You put it back. Do you have any plans about taking this money yourself? Oh, will you cut it out? Put that I rock back in I just want you to know I've still got it and I can oh. use it. Oh, but look, baby. Remember me. Oh, I suppose I'm a chump. I'll put the gun away. Just for you. You big, handsome cutthroat. Well, I paced off the location of that hidden treasure, just like it said on the map. Feeling a little like Captain John Silver as I did it. And then I exposed my poor, aching back to the unaccustomed labor of making a hole in the ground with a spade. I will never be a fan of digging. I like my spades five at a time. Preferably running from the ace down to the ten with a lot of dough in the middle of the table instead of in the middle of the pasture. But I dug. Are you sure you're digging in the right place? Sure. Decided in on that tree and that big rock. And if that petty licensee crook of a Duke Dickerson thinks this is funny, I'll personally hit. Hey. Hey, hey, pay dirt. Hear it? Yes. Hurry, Rogie. Dig it out. Well, you want the shovel? I'm digging as fast as I can. There it is. I see the top of it. Be there. Be there. 25,000. 
Well, baby, there it is. Twenty-five grand. You want to count it? Let me have it, Rogie. Here, baby, you, you take care of it for a while, huh? Put it in your bag and let's get back to town and celebrate, beautiful? All right. Just hold that pole. <laughs> Both of you, hold it. Hey, hey, what is this? Shut up. Give me your bag, lady. Come on, lady. I don't want to have to shoot any holes in that pretty dress you're wearing. Come on, give me that bag. No, I won't. <laughs> Next time I slap you with this rod. Now, give me that bag. Get your hands away from that coat there, mister. Thanks. Now, march. You look familiar to me, tough stuff. Yeah? Maybe I'd better put you away, huh? Hmm. Duke Dickinson must have sent out a bullet into all his friends. Shut up. Lay down on your faces, both of you. Now. <laughs> Shut up, lady. I just shot a couple of holes in your tires, that's all. Now, just take it easy and don't move until I'm out of here. Thanks for the dough. <laughs> Come out in the office, baby. Now, buck up and stop crying. I don't suppose you're going to pay any attention to me now that the money's gone. You'll probably forget me as soon as you can. Oh, baby. Oh, hi, Urban. Hello, Rogue. Who's this? A cop. What's he doing here? He's here after you, baby. Oh, oh Richard. He wouldn't turn me into the... Hate to interrupt, but... Uh... What's the score, Rogue? Uh, this little girl helped to kill Joe Layton. The guy who worked with her is under the bed at cabin number four at the Shady Glade Motel. How could you do this to me? After all the things you said and... and... It's... Well, it's... It's uh, not easy. But you see, baby, I don't approve of murder. Especially not in this neighborhood. Gives a block a bad name. Oh, no. No, Richard. Better take her away, Urban, no. before I take her away from you. <laughs> She's a beautiful oh, girl, isn't she? Richard. Oh, Richard. Richard. Well, that's the story. Of course, you recognize my old friend Joe Black as a hold-up man. You see, I figured that when Muriel and Shep were on trial, I would have less explaining to do if they thought some stranger had finally come up with the 25 grand. I gave Joe his 500 like I said I would. He beefed a little, but he took it. And then I took the hundred Duke owed me and a thousand for the job that was agreed on. And then I took the 2,500 that Joe Layton was supposed to get and sent it to Muriel's mother. Layton didn't have any use for it in the morgue. And I sent the rest to Duke in Kansas City. Made a nice score altogether, but oh, I still wake up in the middle of the night when I dream of Rio and Muriel. And that trip we were going to take. The money spent... But the dreams linger on. They're wonderful. This is Dick Powell again, ladies and gentlemen. Hope you noticed that I didn't get hit on the head in tonight's story. It was nice for a change. I hope you liked the yarn. Ray Buffum wrote it. Lee Stevens composed and conducted the music. And D. Engelbach produced and directed. I want to remind you to make a date with us the next Thursday night. We're going to get mixed up in a... Strange affair about a photograph. We call it photo finish. Be on hand for the developing, will you? Thanks for listening and good night, all. Now, here's Jim Doyle. Don't forget to tune in again next Thursday, same time, same station, when you'll again hear Dick Powell as Richard Rogue in Rogue's Gallery. Remember, if dandruff is your problem, ask for Fitch's Dandruff Remover Shampoo. Removes dandruff the first time it is used. Fitch's Dandruff Remover Shampoo is the only shampoo whose guarantee to remove dandruff is backed by one of the world's largest insurance companies. This statement can be made by no other shampoo. Ask for Fitch's Dandruff Remover Shampoo at your drug counter, barber, or beauty shop. Fitch is spelled F-I-T-C-H. The F.W. Fitch Company presents Dick Powell as private investigator Richard Rogue in Rogue's Gallery. Laugh a while, let a song be your style. Use Fitch Shampoo. Don't despair, use your head, save your hair. Use Fitch Shampoo. 
F.W. Fitch Company, makers of Fitch's dandruff remover shampoo and ideal hair tonic, presents Dick Powell as private investigator Richard Rogue. In Rogue's Gallery. Rogue speaking. This Saturday night, I'm going to spellbind you, Vogue. Caught me while spending a week and the fee for my last case in zestful living at a summer hotel, which was so swanky that the help hardly spoke to the guests. For $25 a day, I had one of the 50 bungalows on the hotel grounds. For 30, I could have had one with a window. Well, anyway, there was a girl up there. <laughs> Isn't there always? She was named Janice Cole, a sort of a social secretary to the hotel. She was about 28. Her eyes were so big and blue they made you think of mountain lakes, and her hair was as black as a jealous rage. She had a figure that made you think you'd seen her before in a swimsuit. Oh, she was real quality. Much to my high blood pressure, she was engaged to a society playboy with a dollar for every suntan in Florida, and his name was Clint Hayes. There was dancing going on in the ballroom of the hotel, and Janice was dancing with Clint. But she was watching me. I thought I saw fear in her eyes. They finished their dance right in front of me. Well, I certainly enjoyed that exhibition, Clint. Glad you liked it, Rogue. Dancing with Janice is a wonderful way to spend an evening. I believe that. Well, how about the next one, Janice? Oh, uh, I, I can't, Richard. I, I don't feel very well. Oh, really, darling? <laughs> yes, I, I think I'll go to my cabin, Clint. I, I have a terrible headache. Well, I'm sorry to hear that, dear. Is there anything I can get for you? I've got some aspirin. Oh, no. I, I think I'll just lie down for a while. I'll be back as soon as I feel a little more like enjoying the party. After Janice Cole left, I ducked Clint and mingled with the crowd, fencing in and out of polite conversation and keeping up a gay front to cover the worry which was stampeding around in my mind. I couldn't forget the lost look in the eyes of Janice Cole, a look that was so full of fear and hopelessness that it haunted me. I decided, after sweating out 30 minutes of wondering why she was so frightened, to drop by her bungalow and have a fatherly chat with her. I casually worked my way along a chain of conversations to the open door and faded unobtrusively out into the night. There was a light in Janice's bungalow. I walked rapidly toward it. The door was ajar. When I knocked on it, it swung open. And I saw Janice lying there, a red pool expanding on the Navajo rug under her head. I took a few steps into the room. Oh! I was on the inside of a giant bell, clinging to the clapper with a strength of desperation. It swung through eternity like a giant pendulum. And at the end of every arc, the universe was shattered by the sound of the tolling. I couldn't stand the noise. I let go on the tremendous upsweep and was catapulted through space at a terrifying breathless speed. The ringing of the bell grew fainter and fainter. And then, oh, there was quiet. I drifted peacefully for a while and landed as gently as a snowflake on a sparrow's wing. And I rested on cloud eight in the blackness of complete oblivion. <laughs> hey, Chiefy! Chiefy! You better come out of it! Oh, go away, you go. Or go away. I'm not well. I've been hurt. There are things going on that you ought to know about, Rogie. I don't care. I'm on my vacation. You're in trouble, Rogie. Bad trouble. Remember that dead girl? Yeah. Yeah, I remember. Well, what are you going to do about it? Let him get away with it? Oh, I don't want to talk about it. Let me alone. Well, well, I guess you've been hit on the head once too often, Rogie. Lost your nerve, huh? What do you mean, midget? No fight left in you. Hmm. Too bad. I've got plenty of fight left in me. What's going on down there? Well, you better go down and see, Rogie. Come on. I'll help you over the side. Okay. Come on. Give me a push, Ugor. 
Oh, you're a fine alter ego, and I'm proud of you. I try to take care of you, Chiefy. Over you go, Rogie. Over you go. <laughs> I dreaded opening my eyes because I remembered that dead girl lying there. But I opened them at last. And what I didn't see made me think I'd lost my mind. Where the body had lain, staining the Navajo rug, there was a Navajo rug, but no stain and no body. I wobbled to my feet. My knees were made of soup. I grabbed the bed for support and threw my massive intellect into high... There were strange things happening here, and they were happening to me. I decided to stay mum and get back to the dance to see what I could discover from the behavior of the inmates. I took out my pocket comb, dressed my hair around the bump on my head so I wouldn't look like I had two, wiped the bed and the doorknob clean of my fingerprints, and looking much better than I felt, rejoined the party. Clint was talking with Nancy Bowman, another luscious lady on the hotel social staff. Hello, Rogue. We've been looking for you. Oh, hi, Clint. Hello, Nancy. Hello, Richard. Where have you been? We're getting a little fresh air. How about this dance, Nancy? Can't. I promised Clint. Oh, go ahead. I'll be noble. Janice should be coming back soon anyhow. Well, all right, then. You're on, Mr. Rogue. Oh, for you, my dear, both of them. See you later, Clint. Bye. <laughs> You know, Nancy, that Clint's a lucky man getting a girl like Janice. She's what the boys in the back room call a dish. Ah, I suppose Janice isn't lucky getting a man with a million. <laughs> Not my type. Now, I don't have the million, but no, I Well, then a... let's just dance. Oh. Now that Janice has her millionaire, I'm out to get mine. You girls old friends? No, I've worked up here with her summers for a couple of years. She's a grand girl. Everybody loves her. She's engaged to this, uh, this creep with the millions? Yes, they're going to be married in two weeks. Don't you ever read the newspapers? Oh, I guess it wasn't on the sport page. Probably not. Though the way Janice stopped him, it could have been. Kitty, 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 kitty. May I cut in? Hi, Frank. That's up to you, Richard. Well, I never give up beautiful ladies to strangers. You don't know Frank, the ladies' home companion? That can be taken care of. Introduce me, Nancy. Mr. Rogue, this is Frank Pitts, friend of Janice. Oh, glad to know you, Mr. Pitts. Thank you, Mr. Rogue. Where is Janice, anyway? She promised me some rumbas tonight. Well, uh, she wasn't uh, wasn't feeling very well. She went to her bungalow to get a little rest. You insist on cutting in? Unless you have some very fine arguments against it. Well, I, I guess I haven't. Nancy, I hope I'll see you later. Uh, you will. This is a temporary thing, Richard. <laughs> well, what happened to your dance, Rob? A man cut in on me. Oh, uh, that's Frank Pitts. He doesn't belong here, Rogue. He's all shoulders and no money. Mm -hmm. I understand that he and Janice are old friends. That's right. Frank Pitts has been in love with Janice for years. They're from the same town back east. No kidding. Oh, yeah. well, he was in love with her too, huh? Desperately. But I don't feel sorry for him. He's not good enough for a girl like Janice. No, no, Clint. A girl's entitled to old friends. You seem to be the jealous type. Oh, I used to be a little like that about Betty Callahan. I'm not I... jealous, Rogue. You just hate to see a girl like Janice making a fool of herself over a no good like that Pitts. And since he arrived today, she's been moody and dejected. Oh, that's and... the way it is. Oh, that's the way it is, huh? You and Janice had a spat over the old plane. We and... did not. You're being most impolite, Mr. Rogue. Janice and I are happen to be Mr. in love. Rogue. Yes? There's a man outside who would like to talk with you for a minute. Why? It's most important, Mr. Rogue. Please come with me. Okay, excuse me, Clem. Well, you look a little upset. What's the matter? Oh, it's horrible. Horrible. May, may I ask what you're talking about? No, I, I can't tell you, Mr. Rogue. But in all my years in hotel management, this is the most terrible thing that's ever happened to me. Here he is, Mr. Mills. Mr. Mills is our district attorney, Mr. Rogue. Oh, oh well, I'm glad to know you, Mr. Mills. What can I do for you? You're Richard Rogue, the private investigator from Los Angeles? That's right. Why? Well, I'd like to talk with you, Mr. Rogue, about a murder. Oh, yes. Why, sure, sure, Mr. Mills. Always glad to lend my talents to law enforcement. That's nice of you, Mr. Rogue. Because you can help a lot on this case. Why did you murder Janice Cole? We'll return to our story in just a moment. First, dandruff on the shoulders and coat collar of a well-groomed person is as out of place as snow in July. 
That's why so many persons who want to have a smart, well-groomed appearance use Fitch's dandruff remover shampoo regularly. For Fitch shampoo has a special solvent action that dissolves unsightly dandruff. When you apply Fitch's to your hair and scalp before adding water, this solvent action goes to work. So it's important to remember not to wet your hair before the shampoo is applied. After massaging your scalp briskly for a few minutes, then apply water. An abundance of cleansing lather will form to carry away the dissolved dandruff. Then the lather rinses out easily and completely, leaves the hair immaculately clean without a trace of dandruff. Yes, Fitch's Dandruff Remover Shampoo is a real aid to good grooming. Use it regularly. You can buy an economical bottle of Fitch's Dandruff Remover Shampoo at your drug or toilet goods counter or have a professional application at your beauty or barber shop. Now, back to Dick Powell as private investigator Richard Rogue in Rogue's Gallery. My guilty conscience was calling me names and giving me bad advice as I stole out of the ballroom with the D.A. He had accused me of murder. And I knew who was murdered. I'd seen her in her bungalow, dead. Janice Cole. The D.A. was as quiet as a grave during that walk and not a bit more cheerful. I made a couple of abortive attempts at conversation, but I might as well have been talking to a totem pole. I couldn't understand why he was heading for my bungalow until he opened the door, and I saw Janice lying there on that blood-stained Navajo rug, just as I'd seen her a half hour before in her own bungalow. I tried to say something, but the words couldn't get by the lump in my throat. I just stood there, my mouth hanging open, and my stomach frozen in a hangman's knot. I could feel the DA's eyes boring into the back of my head. Well, Rogue, why'd you do it? Well, I didn't. I didn't kill her. How do you explain the fact that she was killed here in your cabin? She wasn't. Now, look, Rogue, you better organize yourself, huh? You're supposed to be a smart investigator. Give me a gun. I haven't got it on me. It's in that drawer there. Yeah, we found that one. This girl was shot to death with a twenty-five automatic. Any prints on it? <laughs> We're going to take yours for comparison. Am I under suspicion for this murder? At the moment, that's all you're under. I finally hope you'll be under arrest for it the next half hour. Oh. You know, Mills, in a homicide, you usually have to have a motive. Be- hey, what's that? Why are you waving those newspaper clippings in my face? What are they? Uh, the motive. You were blackmailing Miss Cole, Rogue. We found these clippings in your briefcase. What do you mean I was blackmailing her? I didn't even know her. Now, look, Rogue, you're smarter than that. Here's a whole envelope full of clippings covering Miss Cole's trial for the murder of her first husband back in Passaic, New Jersey. Her name was Jane Sherman then, and she was released for lack of evidence. Remember the trial? Of course I do. Poisoning. But what's that... So you found out that this Jane Sherman, now known as Janice Cole, was all set to marry a million dollars... And you've been blackmailing Oh, I don't know anything about it, I tell you. I don't know how those clippings got into my briefcase. It must have been planted there when I was knocked out in Janice's bungalow. It's a switch, Rogue. You were knocked out in her bungalow, eh? When? Uh, look, Mills, I, uh... I know this whole thing's gonna sound fantastic, but I want to tell you the whole story. I came up here on my vacation. I never saw Janice Cole or whatever her name was before tonight. Disbelief walked across the DA's face as I unspun the web of circumstances which tied me into this murder. As I listened to my own story, I knew I wouldn't believe it myself if I hadn't been there. I showed him the bump on my noggin. He just nodded. I talked on, and as I talked, I realized that I was acting like every murderer I'd ever questioned. I know my face was red, my eyes were shifting as I browbeat my brain and was trying to think of some circumstance which would at least give me the benefit of a reasonable doubt. Finally, I, I stopped talking. He took my fingerprints, and we went to Janice Cole's bungalow. There I got my first break. All right, Rogue. Now, where was the body lying when you first saw it? Right here. Right here. Come here. Look, look, look here. Look under this rug. Uh-huh. And blood on the floor where it seeped through the rug that's now in my bungalow. Do you see it? Yeah. Blood all right. Well, Rogue, that's the first thing that's made sense since we got together. I suppose there is an outside chance that somebody's trying to frame you. Enough of a chance so a conviction would be hard to get, Mr. D.A. Look, you know me. I've got a little standing in my profession, a little substance. Give me 24 hours to get this thing hung around the white man's neck. All right. 
I don't have you locked up tonight, will you try and have the right man for me in the morning? I'll have him. Now, tell me, who knows about the murder? Well, the maid who went into your cottage to turn your bed down for the night. And the manager. Well, I've told them both to keep quiet until I get them to go ahead to talk. Then none of the guests know about it yet, except the killer. That's right. As far as I know. Oh, okay, Mel. Okay, now. You keep it that way until morning, and I'll come up with a guilty man for you. Big talk. I had been framed with loving care, like a sweetheart's picture. The DA shoved off to take care of the grisly details of moving the body from its temporary resting place on my bungalow floor, and I started shaking Janice Cole's bungalow down. There were particles of curved glass on the floor near where the body had been lying. I picked them up carefully and fitted the larger pieces together. They could only have been the crystal of a small, square wristwatch. It might be the clue to the killer. I went back to the main hotel building. The Saturday night party was still going strong. I rejoined the merry throng and looked for Frank. He seemed to me to be the logical suspect. He was from Janice Cole's hometown. He would have known about her trial for murder. I found him talking with Nancy in a corner, and he had on a large, round wristwatch. Nancy's watch was a dainty <laughs> diamond and ruby affair, small and oblong. Hello, Rogue. Nancy's been beating the bushes looking for you. I have not. I just was mildly curious about where you disappeared to. I wanted to get rid of Frank and finish that dance with me. Well, this is as good a time as any. May I have the next one? You may have all the rest of them if you like. Well, what's the matter, Richard? You have a pensive look. Well, I was, uh, just trying to figure something out. Oh? I was supposed to have a dance with you at 9 o'clock. Where were you? I was here. I got here just at 9. Didn't I, Frank? Don't try to prove anything by me, baby. I don't know. At 9 o'clock, I was having a drink with Clint Hayes in my bungalow. Hmm. Well, <laughs> there goes your alibi, Nancy. You weren't here. Alibi? Why would I need an alibi? I was here. You weren't. I looked all over for you. Oh, now, let's not argue about it. Let's have the next one, huh? I'll be right back. Okay. No tricks now. <laughs> Hi, Clint. What? Oh, how come you're sitting this one out? Oh, I am. Uh... Hello, Rug. Oh, I'm sorry I startled you. I was just in the deep fog. Hmm? Nancy come back yet? No. Nancy, uh, I just changed her name there, if you don't mind. Yeah. I'm kind of worried about her. Well, she's subject to headaches like this, poor kid. Maybe you'd better run over and have a talk with her, huh? Oh, I hate to bother her when she's feeling bad. Look, uh... Clint, just to settle a little argument, yeah. were you and Frank Pitts having a drink in his bungalow at 9 o'clock? Oh, yes, as a matter of fact, we were. How'd you know that? He just told me. Just a silly little argument. I wish Janice would hurry back in time for the last dance, at least. Clint Hayes had on a large, square wristwatch. And he and Frank had unbreakable alibis. Nancy had none. They were my three prime suspects, and it looked to me like Nancy was about to be elected. I was sitting there looking for Nancy and carrying on a pointless discussion on headaches, their cause and cure, with Clint, when Nancy came running over. Come on, Clint. You too, Richard. We're all going down to the pool for a moonlight dip. And I, I don't think I want to, Nancy. Oh, come on. Just because Janice is feeling rocky tonight, there's no reason for you to be grumpy. Come on, Richard. Get your swim trunks and give the girls a treat. Huh? All right, all right. I'm in. Come on, Clint. A little dip will do you guys. No, I, I don't oh, think Oh, come I... on, Clint. Oh, might as well, Clint. Sounds like a good idea, doesn't it? Well, Nancy, we got it all organized. Yes, Richard and Clint are crazy about the idea, aren't you? Oh, okay. I'll join you for a while. Mm, nice man, Clint. Hurry up now. See you at the pool. <laughs> We'll continue our story in just a moment. First, a word to the ladies. Are you planning to have a new permanent to help you achieve that cool, crisp look this summer? If you are, here's a good point to remember. Shampooing with Fitch's Dandruff Remover Shampoo will put your hair into grand condition for that cold wave or permanent. That's because Fitch's Dandruff Remover Shampoo is such a thorough cleansing agent. It gets the hair immaculately clean and dandruff-free. Then, since it's completely soluble in water, it rinses out easily, leaving no dull, soapy film. Your hair is left radiant with no dirt, dandruff, or soapy film clinging to the hair strands to obstruct the work of the waving solution. Yes, permanent wave equipment manufacturers, such as the Realistic Permanent Wave Machine Company, E. Frederick Incorporated, and Duart Manufacturing Company all agree that really clean hair is the first requisite to a successful permanent wave. 
For a soft, natural-looking wave, prepare your hair first with Fitch. F-I-T-C-H. Fitch's dandruff remover shampoo. Then use Fitch's regularly to keep your wave looking lovely. Now back to Dick Powell as private investigator Richard Rogue in Rogue's Gallery. My performance in the pool that night made Nero's fiddle solo in the light of a burning room seem like the height of propriety. Here was Richard, the fall guy rogue, swimming and laughing with Frank, Clint, and Nancy, a bunch of murder suspects. A matter of hours before the law put a pair of stylishly plain bracelets on me and claimed me for its own if I hadn't solved the murder of Janice Cole. But there was method in my madness. That swim gave me the information I wanted. In fact, it gave me the murderer. I left before the swimming party broke up and went to one of the guest bungalows. An open window made the job of getting in as easy as falling in love. I found what I was looking for in a chest of drawers. Then I sat down and waited for my victim to come in and turn on the lights. Rogue, what are you doing here? Waiting to talk with you about a murder, Clint. Shut the door. Come in and sit down, Clint. I want to know all about what happened to Janice. Janice? Something's happened to Janice? Yes, Janice, and don't act so innocent. What do you know about her murder? I didn't kill her. What makes you think I killed her? I didn't say you killed her, but I'm sure you know something about it. You know, you shouldn't get involved in murder, Clint. It's too complicated. <laughs> You're just talking, Rug. You killed her. You were blackmailing her and you killed her. Ah, now, 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 Clint. You weren't supposed to know anything about that. In fact, you couldn't have known anything about it unless you were the guy who framed me so nicely. I'm a little mad at you for that, you know. And I'm going to get a confession of that murder out of you some way or other. Now, do you feel like talking, or do I have to beat it out of you? What makes you think I did it, Rogue? Take off, uh, take off your wristwatch. Now. Now. Look at your wrist. What? You see that small square of white skin where you used to wear your small square wristwatch? That was the giveaway, Clint. You see this watch here, the one I found hidden under the shirts in that chest of drawers there? The crystal's broken, Clint. And it was broken in the struggle with, with Janice tonight just before you shot her. The broken glass was found on the floor of the cabin right where the body was before you moved it to mine. Now, do you feel any more like talking, Clint? Why did you kill her? I didn't kill her. I didn't kill her. Hmm? I got until morning for you to start talking, and I've got more socks in a ten-story laundry. Now, let me know when you want to start singing. You know what happened in that room, and you're going to tell me. I didn't kill her. I didn't, I swear. I didn't, Rogue. I was there. Sure, I was there, but well, I... you didn't kill her, who did? I can't tell you. Come on, Clint. You're not smart enough to work out that frame on me. Who was in this with you? I wouldn't answer that if I were you, Clint. Drop the gun, Rogue. Oh. Uh, oh, hello, Frank. Well, you're mixed up in this, too, huh? Well, maybe we can arrange a double execution. I didn't tell him anything, Frank. I didn't tell him a thing. I know it. I was listening. Sit down, Rogue. Sure, sure. Glad to, glad to. You were the brains of this deal, weren't you, Frank? It's pretty obvious that that quivering mess over there wasn't, isn't it? It's a good thing I was keeping my eye on him tonight. You see, Rogue, when he opened the door and turned on the lights, I saw you sitting there, and that's why I came in the back way. I was afraid that Clint would talk too much. You think of everything, don't you? I try. What are we going to do now, Frank? This, this Rogue, he, he knows I was there when Janice was murdered. Knows you were there? Well, you might just as well know that you shot her then, huh? You did, you know. Well, it was an accident. Was it? I'll decide that. Aren't you forgetting me, fellas? Oh, no. No, we're not forgetting you, Mr. Rogue. It really doesn't make any difference who killed Janice as long as uh, you disappear with all the evidence pointing to the fact that you did the job. No, 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 Frank. I don't want any more killing. Shut up. I'm handling this affair. I'm going to keep you out of the gas chamber, Clint, if you'll just shut up and do as I tell you. Take Rogue's necktie off and tie his hands. We're going to knock him off and throw him over a canyon where he'll never be found. Well, you are? Well, I might as well take a crack at it. <laughs> Give me that gun. <laughs> Grab him, Clint. Grab him. <laughs> well, hey, well, well, thanks, Clint. You were very handy with that chair. How come you hit him? I couldn't. I couldn't let him kill you. I just couldn't. Oh, all, right, all right, all right. Take his necktie off and tie his hands with it. We're going to take him for a ride down to see the district attorney. I killed her, Rogue. I killed Janice, but it was an accident. I swear it was an accident. Well, you'll have a dandy chance to explain that to a jury, Clint. Now, come here. I've, uh, I've got something for you. Oh. That's for helping to frame me. 
Oh, brother, is that DA going to love me? Well, that was the end of the case. Frank had been blackmailing Nancy, uh, Janice Cole ever since her engagement to wealthy playboy Clint Hayes was announced. And that night, when Frank went to Janice's cabin, Clint followed him. When Clint arrived on the scene, jealousy took over. Frank drew a gun, and Clint jumped him. In the struggle which followed, Janice was shot while the gun was in Clint's hand. Helpful Frank accused scared Clint of the murder and talked me and talked him into framing me. Frank saw lovely visions of many happy years of blackmailing a millionaire. That broken watch crystal was the only thing that kept the frame from working. So I get my brains beat out. I put the arm on a killer and blackmailer. My vacation is broken up like a drop light bulb. And I didn't make a dime. Oh, well. <laughs> Let's face it. If I hadn't been so clever, I'd be doing a life sentence instead of Clinton Frank. I would like that. No. I've heard... I've heard that stone walls do not a prison make nor iron, iron bars a cage. But it's hard to illustrate the truth of that old saw to a guy who's behind the former looking through the latter. You know what I mean? This is Dick Mushmouth Powell again, ladies and gentlemen. Hope you enjoyed our story tonight. Ray Buffum wrote it. Leith Stevens composed and conducted the music, and Dee Engelbach produced and directed. Be with us again next Sunday, will you? We have a story for you about a doctor, a dentist, and a miserly old lady who comes up dead. We call it, Where There's a Will, There's a Murder. Thanks for listening, and now here's James with a hair doyle. Listen again next week at this same time to hear Dick Powell as private investigator Richard Rogue in Rogue's Gallery. By the way, Dick will soon be seen in his newest Columbia picture... Johnny O'Clock. Laugh a while, let a song be your style. You switch shampoo. Don't despair, use your head, save your hair. You switch shampoo. After and between Fitch shampoos, you can keep your hair shining and manageable by using a few drops of Fitch's Ideal Hair Tonic every day. Fitch's Ideal Hair Tonic is not sticky or greasy, yet it gives your hair that well-groomed look. 